Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 1 A young man with a whitish blonde hair blinked repeatedly as he stared at the scenery around him. Wherever he looked, as far as he can see, it seems there is nothing but the vast waters of the sea. The dazzling sky-colored sea reflected in his eyes as he felt the indescribable freedom it offered. There was just one problem though. Why the hell am I floating in the middle of nowhere? Lucas shouted in frustration. All right Lucas, think. What was the last thing you remembered? He closed his eyes in a desperate move to recall the events that took place before this. I was at home. Reading mangas as usual. I think there was an update in One Piece but I don't remember reading it. Ah! Lucas exclaimed as he started to remember. Right. I was about to start reading it then. Ah, uh, I can't remember. I think I fell unconscious. Wait, am I in a dream? Just as he was about to start panicking, suddenly, he felt something grab onto him and was pulled out of the waters. Eh. 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 As soon as he turned back to see what had grabbed him, he saw an overstretched arm actually latch onto him. What the hell is going on? Lucas screamed once more as he flew through the air with the arm attached to him and speedily retracting. Meanwhile, a few distances away, a ship was sailing the waters. At the helm of the ship was a figure of a sheep's head. On top of it sat a young man with a red open vest and a straw hat. You guys! I think I caught something. Whoa! I didn't expect your Goma Goma no fishing to actually catch something luffy. Another young man with a long nose and goggles on his head exclaimed, seemingly excited. Shishishishi. -shi -shi. I told you I'd catch something us up. Sanji. Get ready for today's lunch. A curly eyebrowed man rolled his eyes at the side. Luffy, you better not catch anything too weird. Maybe it's a treasure. On another side, a small reindeer standing on its two legs started to shine his eyes. Ha! Huh. Chopper, if this is a treasure, I'm keeping it. Nami! I'm the one who caught it so I should keep it. The straw hat-wearing boy shouted at a young girl with orange hair with a pinwheel and orange tattoo on her shoulder. ZZ! As usual, ignoring everything in his surroundings was a green-haired man with three swords at the side was sleeping on the side. Um. Guys, I don't think it's a fish or a treasure. Quack. A blue-haired young girl standing beside a large bird said as she pointed towards the incoming arm. What are you saying Vivi? If it's not a treasure or fish, what is it? The straw hat-wearing boy tilted his head in confusion then turned to look at his own arm that's still retracting. Everyone else on the ship also did the same. A.A. Hmm. I think I heard something. A.A. Boom. The retraction of his arm came at great speed causing it to recoil and smash to deck along with whatever he caught. When everyone took a look, they all glared at the straw hat-wearing boy. Luffy. Look who you just kidnapped. Eh. It's not a fish. Where's my treasure? Sanji. Can we eat him? Hell no. As the rest started to shout among each other, the blue-haired girl came to the unconscious man's side and examined him. He seems unconscious. I think we should at least treat him for now. Eh. We need a doctor. Where's the doctor? The small reindeer panicked exaggeratedly and started to shout. Seeing this, the long-nosed boy slapped his head. You're the doctor here. Ah, that's right. After a few bustles here and there, they finally managed to settle the unconscious man to a room inside. Well, I guess I'll go cook something from what's left for when he wakes up. Sanji. Mine too. Yeah yeah. Hearing about food, the straw hat-wearing boy immediately ignored everything and demanded for food. To which the curly-eyebrowed man can only nod helplessly. Usopp, let's use Kuro as bait. Maybe we'll catch something this time. Hey! It was at this time that they seemed to have passed through a steamy hot spot and encountered a weird person. 
the person dressed weirdly and had the ability of the main main no me. The clone clone devil fruit. When he touched someone, he is able to save their image for him to copy when he touches his own face. The ability was, in a sense, incredible as not only the image is copied, but even the physique of the person. Be it a boy or girl, he can become them so long as he wished. By the time he left the ship, Lucas has just awakened. When he woke up, he was now inside a wooden room but there was no one in it at the moment except for him. Where? Lucas muttered and suddenly heard voices from outside. What's wrong Vivi? You look serious. Nothing. It's just that. One of the man's faces he showed earlier. Was my father. Eh. You mean the king. I think the person we just met is the man called Mr. Two from Baroque Works. Bon Clay. What? It wasn't just them who shouted in exclaim. Lucas also shouted as his eyes turned wide and his mouth almost dropped to the floor. Seeing him out of the room, everyone else also looked towards him. Lucas wondered if he was still in a dream. After all, the ones in front of him right now are. Oh, you're awake. Shishishi. That straw hat. Straw hat pirates Captain Monkey D. Luffy. Oi Luffy. You better have a good explanation to him for suddenly kidnapping him like that. That long nose. God you sup. Ah, are you feeling better now? That tanuki-sized reindeer. Cotton candy lover chopper. I wonder if we should charge him with berries for the treatment. That orange hair. Cat burglar Nami. Achen. Oh, lunch is over there. Eat it if you're hungry. That curly eyebrow. Black like Sanji. Huh. Who's this guy and why is he on our ship? That green hair and three swords. Santoryu Roranoa Zoro. You should rest up if you're still not feeling well. Quack. Eh. That blue hair and princess like Aura. Alabasta Princess Vivi Nefertari. And Kuro. Lucas was confused. It seems that he is in the world of One Piece now. But these two shouldn't be a part of the crew. Hold on. These looks. Robin, Frankie, and Brooke are also not here. Eh. Could it be? The start of the Alabasta arc. This. This is when Luffy is finally recognized as a great threat. The time he defeated Crocodile. It took some time but Lucas finally managed to get a hold of himself. I. Growl. Lucas blanked out for a moment and suddenly blushed. Eh ah ha ha. I guess I am hungry. Ha ha ha. Come on then. Let's eat. Luffy. You just ate. As such, Lucas joined everyone to eat. Right, what was your name again? Lucas. You can call me Lucas. Lucas huh? I'm Luffy. I'm the captain of this pirate ship. Pirate. Is it? Ah. Oi Luffy. Don't just go running around saying you're a pirate. Usopp quickly admonished Luffy for his carelessness. Lucas just smiled wryly and pointed at the logo on the sail. It's alright. I already figured as much when I saw that logo. You guys seem different from the normal ruthless pirates so I don't have any issues. Ah, you're right haha. I'm called Usopp. But you can call me Captain Usopp. Hey. I just said I'm the captain. Don't mind those two idiots. Say, where did you come from? Ah, uh, by the way. My name is Nami. Nami rolled her eyes at the two then smiled at Lucas. Lucas was dazed for a while at her beauty. He knows just from the drawings that she would be beautiful, especially so after the two-year time skip but meeting her directly was another thing. Realizing that he has been staring for a bit longer than he should, Lucas coughed and averted his gaze. I'm not really sure. When I came to, I was already floating in the middle of the sea. Then I was pulled and... Well, I guess you know the rest. Hmm. That's really strange. And you don't remember what happened before that? How I got there? 
No, I don't remember. The last thing I remembered was that I was still at my house. Eh? Where is that? Lucas thought for a moment before finally deciding. Anyway, this is another world, there was no use if they knew where he came from. That. I think I'm from another world. Everyone went silent at that before laughing. Ahaha. Ah. What do you mean another world? Hey kid, are you still asleep or something? Lucas can only smile wryly at their reaction. He placed his hands on his pockets to see if there was something. Sure enough, there was indeed something. His smartphone. When he pulled it out to see if it was still working despite having been submerged in the water a while ago, it turns out that it was indeed still working. Thinking he was just lucky, he tapped on the camera button and snapped a picture of Nami's laughing expression. Hmm. What's that? Being suddenly pointed at with a weird object, Nami stopped laughing and asked. Lucas smiled and showed her the screen. Eh. This is. Me. Nami Swan. Sanji, seeing the beauty of Nami's smiling face captured immediately had hearts as his eyes. Wow. What's this thing? This is a smartphone. It's a gadget from my world. You can use it to take a picture, video, play games, and a bunch of stuff. He. I guess you are from a different world. I don't think technology like this exists here. Even in the Grand Line. Usopp nodded as he looked at the smartphone from all angles. Nami took the smartphone and started fiddling with it along with Vivi. After a while, they discovered that they can touch the screen and the image would change accordingly. They also found the other pictures saved on the phone. This is. That's my house. Those are my family and friends. Lucas looked at the pictures and sighed thinking he may never see them again now that he is in this new world. However, he didn't stay depressed for long as he quickly snapped out of it. After all, this is the world of One Piece. In here, maybe his dreams would come true. Alright. Back to the original topic at hand. Zoro spoke in a deep voice. About that mister. Two just now. I think we're lucky that we met him. Now we can use countermeasures. After some planning, they all continued their journey as the sea drifted them off to the Sand Kingdom, Alabasta. Suddenly, a strange cat-looking fish appeared from behind. Meow. What is that? A sea cat. Let's eat it. No. Vivi shouted as she smacked Luffy, Sanji, and Zoro who were about to kill the sea monster. You can't eat it. In Alabasta, sea cats are sacred animals. Lucas laughed as he heard that. Truly the world of one piece. Nami walked towards Vivi and said. Vivi, the wind and temperature seem to be stabilized. Yes, we've entered the Alabastan climate zone. The sea cat is more proof. I bet those things behind us are even more proof we're close to Alabasta. Zoro grinned as he looked behind. Vivi and the rest also looked behind and exclaimed. Ships. Right. Behind them, numerous ships lined up with a unique logo on their sails. Hey, they all have Baroque work signs on them. All the members are coming together. Those are probably the billions. Servants of the officer agents. Everyone looked solemn as they looked at the number of enemies behind them. Stop getting worried. They're nothing. Zoro grinned and Sanji nodded as well. Yeah. All is lost if we lose sight of our true objective. There's only nine of us. Nine. Lucas wondered if he had already begun to change the story. This time, it wouldn't be just eight of them who will attack Crocodile, but nine. And that included Lucas. Lucas began to think of everything he could change in the story. And people he can save. His resolve to stay only grew. Right, what do you plan to do, Lucas? Nami asked Lucas as they began to tie up bandages on their left arms. Hmm. I mean. You don't really have any part in this. I bet you don't even know what's going on. It would be dangerous if you stick with us. Right. In the beginning, this was my fight. 
It's selfish enough that I asked Luffy and the rest to help me but. You are totally unrelated to this. In fact, none of the officers of Baroque Works knows about you yet. Vivi added as well. Hearing this, everyone on the ship looked at Lucas silently, waiting for his response. Lucas smiled and looked at the bandage on his left arm. I know. You guys are probably about to fight this big war. And that the enemies would have mysterious powers or something. He paused for a while then finally sighed. As I told you before. The world I came from is very much different from this one. There's no devil fruits or any kind of power. Heck, I haven't been to any kind of fights. It's a completely normal world. He touched the bandage covering his left arm and said. I'll. Keep this for now. In case we happen to meet each other. At least you won't think I'm a fake. But I'll be separating with you guys once we land it. Everyone was silent for a while but Luffy just laughed. Shisha shishi. Then that's that. Let's meet again sometime, Lucas. He brought forward his hand and shook Lucas. Lucas smiled as well and said. Yeah. But who knows. Maybe that would be sooner than you think. Huh, maybe. Luffy looked into the horizon and saw the island near them. Vivi also looked and pointed to a direction. We're coming up to the harbor. Let's stop in that inlet to the west. We need to hide the ship. Luffy grinned and stretched his fist forward. Knowing what he wanted to do, everyone smiled and did the same. Lucas only smiled and watched from afar. Nami saw this and pulled him closer. What are you doing? Come here. But. Shishishi. Don't sweat the details and show your fist. Lucas can only smile wryly and brought his fist forward as well. Okay. Whatever happens from now on, this left arm. Is proof of friendship. Lucas was excited to be a part of this. He felt that he really is a part of the team. A part of the Straw Hat Pirate crew. Now. Let's get on to dry land. To a restaurant. Then Alabasta. Shut up, you idiot. While the crew made a ruckus, both Vivi and Lucas touched the bandage on their left arms and smiled. As soon as they reached land, Luffy immediately jumped off and ran. Restaurant. Wait. They tried to stop him but who was Luffy? He just ran off and ignored everyone as usual at his own pace. What should we do? Nanohana is a large town. It will be very hard to search for Luffy. Don't worry Vivi-chan, we'll look for the noisiest spot in town. He'll be there. Sanji assured Vivi who sounded concerned. Nami sighed as well. Anyways, I wish he would pay more heed to the bounty on his head. Especially in a big country like this one. Just let it take care of himself. Let's go eat. We can think things through after that. Zoro said and was about to move when Vivi noticed a strange ship near them. Wait. That's Mr. Three's ship. You mean. He's not dead. That ship can only move through the Doru Doru fruit. He must be in the kingdom. Vivi was worried but Lucas knew what will happen so he didn't mind it too much. Well, I guess this is where we will part ways everyone, Vivi, I wish you all the best of luck. With a curt bow, Lucas smiled and headed elsewhere. Everyone looked at each other and sighed. Do you think we'll still see him next time? I don't think so. Unless. Zoro looked at the distant back of Lucas and trailed off. Unless. No, it's nothing. Chapter 2 While Luffy started to meet Ace and being chased by Smoker and the Marines, Lucas headed east of Nanohana. According to the original story, Luffy and the rest would head to Yuba to talk to the rebellions and hopefully convince them to stop the impending war. However, upon reaching it, they will no doubt find nothing but sand and ruins there except for Toto and that the rebel army had already moved to Katoria, a city east of Nanohana. Lucas knew about this but didn't say anything to them as he didn't know how else to explain it. Say that in his world, their whole future is already written and drawn. Lucas doesn't think that that revelation would not cause anything and Lucas didn't want Luffy's heart to be shaken because of it. 
he can only help them to the best they can. After walking for a bit, he finally saw Katoria. Lucas looked at the surroundings and saw a few people moving cargoes here and there. Of course, the contents of the cargoes are covered but those were definitely weapons for the rebel army. He only looked at the direction they were going before heading there himself. Please sir. No. Lucas heard a child scream at a clearing in the front. Why not? I'm fit to join the rebellion. I hate the king. Let me fight with you. The child shouted but the man sitting in front of him still shook his head. Show him Falafra. Right. The man beside him nodded and took off the upper part of his clothes. What was revealed was a gouged out shoulder and a missing right hand. He got those wounds protecting me during battle. You want to see the hospital and graveyard too? I'm not afraid of that stuff. The child shouted still. One of my friends in the town next to Irumalu is sick. I know. That it's gonna dry up, just like Irumalu did. It's all his fault for stealing the rain. I want to fight too. I'm not afraid of being hurt or dying. Lucas watched the situation unfold and can't help but sigh. Then. Go home. Our opinions disagree. We're all afraid. We don't want to fight. Then why are you fighting? Are you nuts? Because the battle has started. The country wished it to happen. We don't want to fight, we have to fight. I don't care whether you understand or not. Go home. Be but. I told you to leave. This isn't the place for kids. The man snapped and finally shouted at the kid. The kid let out tears at the corner of his eyes but didn't cry out as he ran away. As he ran, he passed by Lucas who was watching at a distance, this caused him to be noticed by everyone else. Who are you? Are you, by chance, the leader of this rebel group? What of it? Are you looking to join as well? If so, forget it. Just one look at you and I can tell you haven't been to fights before. You're not even a local here. What do you want? Lucas smiled wryly, thinking that he really looks as normal as it gets except for his white hair. I am not here to join you. I came here to stop you. What? Koza, as I see it, if this person intends on stopping us, then he's an enemy. Suddenly, the rebel group raised their weapons and pointed at Lucas. Lucas gulped at the sight of those weapons pointing at him. After all, this is the first time he was pointed a weapon, he can't help but feel overwhelmed. Koza seemed to notice this so he raised his hand to stop everyone. The weapons were lowered but the rebel group was still vigilant. Lucas let out a sigh and felt relieved. Thanks. Don't thank me yet. I may just change my mind. Ha <laughs> ha. Lucas can only let out a dry laugh at his statement. Speak. Just what do you intend to do by stopping us here? Can you even stop us? I can't. Koza frowned when Lucas shook his head. But someone else will. The reason why I am doing it instead is. Because she thinks that you are still in Yuba. And that she is headed there right now to stop you. She. Is there a quiet place we can talk? Lucas looked around at the various rebel group gathered here and remembered how the Baroque works had already infiltrated both the rebel group and the royal guards. Fine. In the tent. Koza. Some of Koza's close friends shouted, obviously not agreeing with letting the two be alone. You can come with if you want. If it's your close friends, they should be safe. Koza and the rest looked at Lucas weirdly before nodding and headed into the tent. After they settled inside, Lucas finally spoke. Princess Vivi Nefertari. I think you know her. Koza and everyone looked in shock. This was a name they haven't heard in a long time. Where did you hear this name? Lucas sighed and explained. You have no idea what this princess has been through and the things she had to do for this kingdom while you guys are here fighting against each other. You. One of Koza's friends snapped again but Koza held him back. As I said, right now, she's headed towards Yuba with information to stop you and the rebels. She wanted to end this war before it reaches a point where it can no longer be returned from. 
What information? About that incident with the dance powder. What about it? That incident was staged to frame the king. The truth is, Crocodile wanted this kingdom for his own and had been staging for him to capture it. Once the people stopped believing in the king, and once the rebel group and the royal guards kill each other, he would appear to be the hero who will save this kingdom. Koza and the rest were too shocked hearing this information. You don't have to believe me right away. I know that to you, I am but a stranger. Honestly, this should have been Vivi's role but she's headed to Yuba now all I want is just for you to listen. What you do next? Is still up to you. Speak. How did you meet Princess Vivi? Lucas nodded. I was drifting in the seas when Luffy and the rest found me. Vivi is also in their ship. Luffy? Yes. Otherwise known as the captain of the Straw Hat Pirates. Pirates. Hearing this word, they frowned immediately. I know you wouldn't believe this but I didn't want to lie. Yes, they are pirates, but right now, they are the only reason why Vivi is still alive. Vivi has been working undercover under Baroque works to find out their leader and why they are plotting against her kingdom. It took her a long time and she had to do things she regrets doing just to keep her cover safe. But she found out in the end about Crocodile. Lucas continued. Naturally, this kind of information doesn't come freely. Crocodile knows that she knows and had been sending assassins to kill her every step of the way. Even now, as we speak, assassins are still after her life. Hearing this, Koza and the rest were solemn and continued to remain silent. Look, as I said. I'm just a stranger. To you and to Vivi. I mean, seriously. They literally picked me off the sea. I didn't know any of them until earlier. But they gave me food even when they are already out of it. They took me in their care and said I was their friend. I'm weak. That's why I stayed out of this fight because I know I'll be a burden to them. From the point of Koza and the rest, they would think that Lucas had already separated with Vivi and them when he found out that the rebel group was actually here in Katoria and not in Yuba. By the time he found out, Vivi and them are already on the way to Yuba and there was no time to chase after them which was why he decided to confront them now. Of course, the truth was that Lucas already knew that they are in Katoria but didn't know how to tell Luffy and the others and how to explain why he knew about it. But I still wanted to help. Somehow. In some. Way. That's why I'm here. A guy like Crocodile will no doubt have spies on both the rebel and royal guards. Koza, I know it's a lot to take in, especially now that it had reached this point. But this is the truth. Lucas looked at Koza in the eye with utmost sincerity and seriousness. Everyone else also looked at Koza, awaiting his decision. After a while, Lucas saw that Koza still remained silent, he sighed and decided to leave anyway, there are plenty of ways he can try to help Luffy and the others without fighting. Just before he left, he said another detail to them. Right now, after Vivi finds out that you are not in Yuba, they will no doubt head towards Rain Base and attack Crocodile directly. Even with Luffy and the others are there, I don't think they can beat him just yet. The day after tomorrow, a fake king will arrive in Nanohana and start the war. You must not give in to hatred, Koza. Lucas left and started to plan out. He was just one man and he can't be everywhere at once. Judging by the time, Mr. Three had already gone to find Crocodile, as a result, he now knows that Luffy and the others are still alive. As for Luffy and them, they should have arrived in Yuba by now and Kuro is almost at Alyabarna to deliver the news to the king. By tomorrow, Luffy and the Royal Guards would be heading towards Rain Base in an attempt to attack Crocodile while the rebel army heads towards Alyabarna. The day after that will be when Crocodile launches his plan Utopia. Next would be to head back to Nanohana. Where the fake king will make things worse. Lucas looked as the sinking sun and decided to leave quickly to rest in Nanohana. The distance of Katoria and Nanohana isn't that great and could be reached within the day. By the time he reached Nanohana, it was already nighttime. Lucas looked for a place with covers to sleep in. He doesn't have any money so he can't afford an inn. He can only rest in a shade somewhere in the city. 
It was cold at night but Lucas ignored it and let himself sleep to get ready for tomorrow. When the sun rose again, he got up and started to warm up. In this world where the strong rules, he can't always be too weak. He needed to start training his body now. He started with 20 push-ups and 20 laps around a park. Before this, Lucas didn't bother exercising at all so his limit was absolutely low. After resting for a bit, he started training again and added five more push-ups and five more laps. He was nearly unable to complete it but managed to do so with sheer will. He was dead tired after that but forced himself not to sit down. Damn, I'm really pathetically weak. At this rate, how long will it be till I can train hockey? In order to deal with Logia Devil Fruit users like Crocodile, it's a must to learn armament hockey. Observation hockey can also greatly impact his future battles and that's an absolute must as well. If he wanted to become strong and stand out, he would definitely need to have these two hockeys. As for the Emperor's hockey. That's something only a few people have and not everyone is born with it. It was useless to hope for him to have it. Naturally, it's best if he has it. Alright, that's enough rest. One more. This time, he added another five push-ups and five laps. His arms and legs felt weak and frail afterward due to him pushing his limits to the extreme. Lucas was no longer able to force himself to stand up and so he collapsed to the ground. Still, he was able to force himself to remain conscious. What happened next surprised him. A warm feeling started to flow throughout his body and the pain in his muscles started to soothe. Lucas felt refreshed and suddenly, he was no longer tired. He sat up and looked at his body in confusion. What was that? Lucas asked out loud but there was no one to answer his question. He thought for a while before finally giving up as he truly had no answers. He can only resume his training now that it came to this. As usual, he added five more sets on his next training but the strange thing was, even after completing them, he was still completely fine. Lucas was confused but still had no answers for it. Adding more and more sets, Lucas discovered his limit is now at 50 push-ups and 50 laps. He collapsed again after hitting this new limit but still forced himself to stay conscious. The warm feeling came again and his body was refreshed. Lucas sat up again and felt his body. Afterward, he broke into laughter. Ha ha ha. I don't know what's happening but this is my chance. Lucas pushed on his training endlessly. There was nothing else he can do at the moment but wait anyway. The main event starts from tomorrow onwards. Till then, he would try his hardest to upgrade his strength. Night fell and morning came. Lucas did not bother to eat as he didn't have money. He simply trained like a madman and ended up being able to do 1000 push-ups and 1000 laps. After waking up. He looked at the far distance and muttered. Luffy and them should be captured already by Crocodile along with Smoker. But Sanji's there and he isn't captured so they should be good. Lucas then focused on the events that will happen here in Nanohana. Just as he predicted, the king made his rounds in the city and announced something. I have an apology to make. I am the one who stole this country's reign. The crowd was in disarray at this revelation. And in order to forget this annoying dance powder controversy, I am going to destroy Nanohana. H. How can this be? Your Majesty. Everyone started to panic as the soldiers started to begin their move. But before they could start hitting people, a person appeared on the scene. What the hell? Do you think you're doing? Koza has appeared with a horse. The king saw him and calmly answered. I have come to apologize. Be silent. Enough with the insults. Koza shouted but the king continued without minding him. The one who dyed up this country with dance powder. Was I. I told you to shut up. You filthy piece of crap. Koza tried to attack him but was held back by the guards. Seeing all these unfold, Lucas sighed and stepped forward. Your Majesty. Huh. Who are you? You. The king looked at Lucas in confusion while Koza was surprised to see him step out. Lucas was calm and pointed at his own left cheek. Your makeup is showing. 
Ah. Uh. The king inadvertently touched his face with his left hand in surprise but soon regretted it. The main may know me. Once the user touches someone with their right hand on the face, they can copy that person's appearance. But once they touch their own face with their left hand, well, they revert back to their original appearance. Everyone's eyes went wide as they saw their king suddenly change face. Ah. They found out. Mr. Two. Immediately panicked went pale. Koza saw this and his whole body started to tremble. This was it. This proof is enough. Hear me. Citizens of Nanohana. Koza shouted with a loud voice that resounded to everyone's ears. Take a look and see this fake king. He and his people are the ones responsible for destroying our home. For drying our land. For shaking our beliefs. Streams of tears started to flow on Koza's face as he remembers everything he had done and how foolish he was. No more. This is where we stand up and fight. It is our time to defend our king. Defend his reputation. His people. His kingdom. Long live King Cobra. Kill those bastards for destroying our peace and framing our king. Everyone's eyes went red as they all felt selfish and foolish to doubt their king. Even when they didn't admit it, they knew in their hearts that they began to doubt the king. Now, seeing this revelation, they can't help but be mad at themselves. Koza, especially, is angry at himself. Mr. Two saw this and immediately grimaced. He turned towards Lucas who had caused this incident. You. Who are you and how did you know about this? Lucas grinned and raised his left arm with the bandage. My name is Lucas. I am. Straw Hat Luffy and Princess Vivi's. Friend. Mr. Two gritted his teeth and wanted to kill him but saw the human wave rushing in rage. He thought for a while before deciding to run away. He needed to tell Crocodile that the plan has changed. Suddenly, a huge ship came crashing from the shore. Lucas saw this and turned towards Koza. Koza, don't mind them for now. The people need a leader to guide them. Put out the fires first. Koza saw the retreating Mr. Two and the panicking people. He bit his lip and decided that Lucas was right. People's lives are more important now. Meanwhile, a distance away. A strange turtle with a hat was dragging along a carriage through the desert. What? You revealed your image. Miss Doublefinger shouted at Mr. Two. How was I supposed to know there was another person involved? The intel was wrong. To think that they had someone in Nanohana. It's as if they know our plans. Mr. One frowned. Either the opponent is really smart. Or there's a traitor in our midst. We need to tell the boss. The three went silent for a while before deciding to finally call Crocodile with the Den Den Mushy. As the one who caused the failure, Mr. Two was the one who rang. After a while, an annoyed voice resounded. Mr. Two, how goes the mission? Why don't you tell Princess Vivi here what her father just did? At this moment, Luffy and the rest along with Smoker are trapped in a cage made of sea stones and unable to get out. Princess Vivi was also captured and is forced to seat with Crocodile. Vivi heard the name Mr. Two and can't help but remember his ability. Her face paled as she feared for the worst. T that, Zero Chan, the plan failed. Ha! Huh. Instantly, Crocodile's expression dropped. There was a kid named Lucas there with the rebellion's leader, Koza. He knew who I was and my abilities. Who's this brat? He said. He's a friend of Straw Hat Luffy and Princess Vivi. Hearing the name Lucas, Vivi and the rest were all surprised. Lucas. Lucas still hasn't left. He met with the rebellion. Vivi was surprised that this boy they met in the sea had actually been the one to turn the tides. Hearing how he's with Koza now made her heart at ease. Luffy grinned and laughed. Shishishi. You guys are in for it now. Crocodile's hand trembled in rage and destroyed the table. He looked at Miss All Sunday and shouted. Get me this Lucas and kill him. What about the plan? 
doesn't matter if the rebel group is no longer against the king. The plan continues. Miss All Sunday nodded and left the building. Vivi and the others saw this and can't help but be worried. Luffy grinned at them and said. Don't worry. He's smart. He'll be fine. Zoro chuckled as well and continued to lay back. Heh, he sure is something. Seeing them like this, even Smoker can't help but feel intrigued about this Lucas person. Just what kind of man be able to put a dent on Crocodile's plans? Chapter 3 Back in Nanohana Lucas watched as Koza took the stage once the fires were put out. Listen, rebels. From now on, we will no longer be the rebellion. We will now fight for the king. We shall crush the person responsible for destroying our kingdom, the Shichibukai, Crocodile. Defend the king. Defend Alyabarna. Ya. Yeah. Long live the king. As Lucas saw this, he can't help but smile. In the original story, this was supposed to be the part where Koza attacks Alyabarna. Yet now, they are acting to defend it. With this. Maybe we can end this war with the least amount of people dying. Lucas knew about Vivi's naivete about wanting a war to end without anyone dying. He knows that such a thing is impossible in a war. The best he can do is hope to minimize the casualties. Lucas joined Koza and the rest as they rode horses straight to Alyabarna. The distance was great but due to their urgency, they still arrived within the day. Koza, Vivi and the others should be reaching here soon. But Crocodile's men are already here. They're strong. Right now, only Luffy's crew can defeat them. What about Crocodile then? Luffy can defeat him. Definitely. Koza saw the surety in Lucas' eyes and smiled. It seems you really trust this person. Yeah. He will one day become the Pirate King after all. Lucas laughed. After a while, they finally had Alyabarna in their sights. Koza. There's someone in front. Someone pointed out and caused Lucas to look as well. He frowned as he saw the person in front of him. That black hair and figure. The devil's child Nico Robin. Everyone stopped as they reached her. Step aside. We are in a hurry. Koza shouted but Robin merely smiled and was still calm. Koza, head first. I'll deal with her. You sure? On. Go. And remember. There is a bomb in the clock tower. If it explodes, it will wipe out the whole city. Hearing this, Robin squinted her eyes in wonder. She truly doesn't know how Lucas even knew of this. The bombs guarded by two of Crocodile's men. Find the Straw Hat pirates first. They can deal with them. I understand. Let's go. Koza went solemn as he heard this. He gritted his teeth and believed Lucas as he ordered his men. Robin did not mind them and focused only on Lucas. You seem to know a lot. I can say the same to you too, Miss All Sunday. Or is it Nico Robin? Fufu, you even know that. Despite being surprised, Robin only chuckled and remained calm. Lucas sighed as he looked at the distant Alyabarna. Why are you even on Crocodile's side? You know that he doesn't think much of you right? If you don't give him Pluto's location, he will kill you without any hesitation. And the history Pondliff you are looking for is not here in Alabasta. This time, Robin's calm expression fell. Lucas watched Robin remain silent so he asked. How's Luffy? He should be with that birdman. Still alive. Lucas sighed in relief. In the original story, Robin had indeed saved Luffy from the brink of death without Crocodile knowing. But this time, there was him and she also came here for him. He was worried that because of this, she didn't get to save Luffy. Well then. Are we going to fight? Because honestly, I don't think I can beat you. So you're giving up already? If you were an enemy, I won't. You're saying I'm not the enemy? Yes. Robin was silent for a moment then waved her hand. Suddenly, a pair of hands appeared from behind Lucas, instantly binding his hands. I'll let Crocodile decide your fate. 
Lucas shrugged and followed her. You don't need to do this you know. I'll still end up going the same way. It's kinda hard to ride a horse with my hands like this. Robin stared back at him with half-closed eyes and sighed, finally deciding to remove her powers. Lucas rubbed his hands after being freed and smiled at Robin. Your powers. There's a lot more to it than you imagine. Robin was still emotionless but in her mind, she can't help but wonder what's wrong with this guy. For a while now, he has been treating her like a friend who's simply playing as the enemy. It was a weird feeling for her but at the same time didn't feel repulsed by it. In the distance, Lucas heard explosions here and there. The fight has started but Lucas wasn't worried. He knew the power of the Straw Hat Pirates. They will definitely win. Robin also didn't mind the explosions as they walked calmly to the palace where Crocodile, Vivi, Shaka, and King Cobra are. Robin, you're finally here. And I see you brought someone with you. Lucas. Vivi turned to see Lucas behind Robin and can't help but worry. Lucas just smiled at her as if everything's okay. Vivi, we meet again. Lucas, why are you? Humph. So this is that Lucas guy that disrupted my plans from the start. Crocodile heard his name and immediately rushed towards him as his lower half dissolved into sands. Seeing this, Vivi thought to herself how stupid she was to say his name. Now Crocodile knows. Lucas will definitely be in trouble. Lucas. Run. However, Lucas didn't move and let Crocodile clutch his neck as he looked directly into his eyes. Crocodile smiled and chuckled. Hee hee, that look in your eyes is annoying. Why don't I get rid of it? His right hook moved closer to Lucas' eyes in an attempt to scare him but Lucas was still calm. Crocodile, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Robin? What's the meaning of this? Crocodile frowned as he saw Robin stop him then noticed how Lucas came without any injuries or binds. Robin was still calm as ever as she answered. He knows about the Pluto. This time, Crocodile and King Cobra's eyes went wide. Lucas gave a wry smile when he heard Robin speak about it. Give me a break Robin, I only know what it is but not where it is. Era, is that so? Lucas rolled his eyes when he saw Robin's teasing look. The Pluto. I've heard that using it once would be enough to make a whole island disappear. With the name of a god, it's the most evil ancient weapon. That thing should sleep somewhere within this country. Crocodile smiled as he glared at King Cobra who was nailed to the wall. My original purpose was to own it. As long as I got it, I can build the strongest military country here. A weapon? That kind of thing? In this country? Is it something that is passed along the crown? Both Vivi and Shaka were visibly shocked at this revelation. King Cobra gritted his teeth. The world government will not allow that to happen. Therefore, I need a bigger military force. I don't know where you heard that name, I don't know where that thing is, and I don't know if it even exists or not. King Cobra said as he stubbornly refused to give out any information. Crocodile didn't mind it though, he has another way of letting King Cobra speak. Ichim. That's right. Of course, I know the value of it is dubious, but the force gathered in front of the palace ground this afternoon, at 4 o'clock, 30 minutes from now, a very powerful cannon will aim here. You. King Cobra and the rest glared at Crocodile with utmost hate. It has been specially made, allowing nothing in five kilometers to grow anymore. So from here, the scenery might change a little you see. Thirty minutes from now. Five kilometers. If you do this. Vivi's face paled as she thought of what would happen. Isn't it great? With one blow, both the rebel group and you all will die a painless death. How can you do this kind of thing? What wrong have they done to you? Vivi shouted at Crocodile but he ignored her cries. Boring. While they had this farce, Robin took a sidelong glance at Lucas who knew about this already. Lucas saw her look and brought his index finger closer to his lips in a shushing gesture. All right. Mr. Cobra. Back to the problem before. Where is the thing that has the true history written down? 
Cobra was surprised that he even knew this. He thought for a while then spoke. If I take you there. Hmm. King Cobra was silent for a moment then sighed. Father. All right. I will take you there. Ha ha ha. Indeed it's King Cobra. He knows his job. Crocodile laughed but at the side, Shaka can no longer hold it in as his hands reached for his weapon. Princess Vivi. I cannot bear it any longer. However, before he could start, more people arrived at the scene. Please wait. General Shaka. Who is it this time? Crocodile frowned hearing all the noise. You guys. The Duck Claw Squad. Robin was silent as a wound started to appear on her hands. It seems that they had passed through the barricade she had made with her hands at the gate. Though it seems that hope had arrived, King Cobra did not believe so as he believes they cannot beat Crocodile. Please stay away. Do not make him angry. Your Majesty, protecting you with our lives. That's our job. How could you tell us to stop? Your Majesty. We must protect you. Release the king now. To fight against one of the Shichibukai. We shall show no fear. Crocodile only snorted as he heard this farce. You guys have good spirit, so I'm letting you go. Hurry up and get lost. How could we? We can only go forward for one reason. Reason? Suddenly, strange marks started to appear on their arms as their muscles started to bulge and grow. Chaka paled as he saw those marks. Your arms. Could you guys have? Shaka. What's wrong with them? Vivi asked as she saw the changes in their state as well. In order to gain temporary strength, they drank the water which reduces life. Hero's water. We can't save them now. They only have a few minutes left. Vivi's face paled even more as she heard this. Why? Ha ha ha. I knew it. In order to fight me, you don't need your lives. Even then, Crocodile just laughed it off. Lucas also sighed. He knew this was going to happen but he truly doesn't know where this hero's water is, to begin with nor did he know when they took it. But he can take this situation as his advantage. Just as the four from the Duck Claw squad charged, Lucas also charged along with them with a dagger in his hands. Lucas. Ha ha ha. So now you're also attacking. Lucas gritted his teeth and stabbed towards Crocodile just before he could turn to sand. Humph. What fools. Crocodile's face changed as he saw the dagger actually stabbed into his body. How? He shouted but saw that the four from the Duck Claw squad also nearing him, he immediately tried to retreat. Still, one of the blades had hit him at that time and he was injured again. As he retreated, his eyes glared at Lucas who held the dagger. Lucas grinned and took out his water container and poured it at his blade. Could it be? Heh. Crocodile. The only reason you're cocky is because you know that in this half of the sea, there will be no one who can touch you. Well, you're wrong. Crocodile's expression fell as he knew what Lucas meant. But despite this, he was only injured for a bit. It wasn't enough to kill him. Seeing as they managed to at least injure Crocodile, the four Duck Claw squad smiled as they collapsed because of the effect of Hero's water. Crocodile laughed at the sight of them with ridicule. What stupidity! You damn bastard! Shaka saw his men being ridiculed despite being dead and really unable to hold it in anymore as he charged towards Crocodile. His body transformed with the power of the Inu Inu no Mi. Model, Wild Wolf. Shaka. Lucas thought that if he had at least injured Crocodile, Shaka would see sense and not charge in like in the original story but it seems that some things can never change. Hey. Use the water. However, Shaka did not pay attention to anything they said and simply charged in. Heh, like an animal. Wolf fangs. Crocodile sneered at him as his body dissolved into sand once more as he was struck. The result was as everyone expected. With Shaka lying on the ground covered in blood and Crocodile standing over him. After half killing Shaka, he set his eyes on Lucas who injured him just now. 
you're next. This time, he didn't let Lucas have enough time to attack him as he immediately dissolved into sand and rushed towards him. His right claw swung and stabbed at his chest. G.H. Not so tough without your water huh? He wasn't over. With his powers, he actually still drained Lucas, revealing a shriveled dried up corpse. Lucas. Vivi cried as she saw Lucas drying up like a mummy. Thud. His body collapsed to the ground beneath Crocodile's feet. Crocodile glared at the body. Being weak. Is a sin. Chapter 4. As Lucas lay to the ground, he saw his life flash before his eyes. His life in his homeworld. His friends, and family. His meeting with the Straw Hat Pirates. His first meal with them. His left arm which carries the mark of their friendship. Am I. Gonna die now? Lucas thought to himself and wondered if it was not okay to die. No. I can't die yet. There are still. Many things I want to experience. Many things I want to change. And many more. I want to meet. Suddenly, somewhere in his body, a warm flow started to emerge and spread throughout his body. This change can only be felt by him and not everyone else. This is. I see. So this is. My power. As Lucas began to explore this newfound power, another figure appeared at the scene. Koza. So it really is. Koza looked at Lucas who lay dead at Crocodile's feet and sighed. Lucas. Vivi heard him and can't help but feel saddened again. Robin also didn't want to look at Lucas' body, for fear she may feel something and expose herself. Heh, if it isn't the leader of the rebellion, Koza. It's nice meeting you for the first time. Crocodile. You will pay for this. Stop it. Koza. King. Koza was about to charge at him but King Cobra stopped him. The only thing you can do is to leave here now. Go back and save the lives of the people. As many as you can. Within thirty minutes. The palace square will be blown up. Shaka uttered as he continued to lay on the ground. So you're still not dead. Crocodile snorted and dealt another blow at him. Vivi covered her eyes while Koza gritted his teeth. It's too bad. Huh? Crocodile frowned seeing Koza's reaction. He had expected him to dash off and try to evacuate people but he actually did not move. Lucas told me about your plan. And the location of the bomb. Koza sneered at Crocodile. That bomb, we had long since pulled it away from here. Even if it detonates, it will only destroy the desert. Then multiple figures appeared from behind Koza. Zoro. Nami. Sanji. Usopp. Chopper. Lucas. No. Bastard. You will pay for this. Damn it. How dare you kill our friend. Lucas. Crocodile's face started to twist. He was truly enraged now. Never would he have thought that the insignificant insect he just killed to have known so much and continued to disrupt his plans even when he's dead. Vivi's eyes started to pour tears again as she saw the crew. You guys. After realizing what Koza meant, her eyes turned towards Lucas who laid on the ground motionless and even more tears flowed. Lucas. Just as everyone is about to fight, a loud voice came from above. Crocodile. Riding on top of Pell who had changed into a bird. Luffy. The straw hat guy. Crocodile's face went black in anger. This guy. This guy again. Why is he still not dead? Pell landed in front of everybody along with Luffy carrying a water barrel behind his back. Weren't your wounds mortal? How are you still alive? Crocodile frowned but Luffy ignored him and focused on the body lying down beneath Crocodile. Seeing Lucas dried up corpse, Luffy's face turned angry as he glared at Crocodile. However, he didn't charge at him just yet. Sorry, I lost to that guy once. So this time I can't lose. Hearing him apologize like that, everyone else just smiled. Hurry up with it. 
If you can't win, who can? Luffy's eyes stared dead at Crocodile with resolution. I'll finish it now. All of it. Saying this, he started to charge at Crocodile. Crook. No matter how many times you try, you guys can't hit me. Crocodile sneered but Luffy still charged at him. So you want to be impaled again eh? His body started to dissolve again but before he can do so, Luffy's fist knocked on Crocodile's face. Still, he wasn't finished. His hand stretched and grabbed Crocodile's shoulder as his body rotates. Gomu Gomu no. Buzz saw. The moment his feet left the ground, he performed a spinning kick at Crocodile's face. Shishishi. King Cobra and Robin both looked at Luffy in surprise as they saw Crocodile hit the ground. Luffy wasn't satisfied yet. Stand up. I know your weakness now. That's why you keep on taking the rain. You're scared of it. Water is your weakness. As long as I use this, I can beat you up. The show is just beginning. Crocodile sat up and laughed. What? Do you really think you can beat me? I am one of the Shichibukai. One of the seven gods of the sea. Huh? You're one of the seven gods. So what? Then I'll be. The eight god. Nami and the rest can only facepalm as they heard this. The fight soon continued with Luffy throwing punches here and there and developing new techniques. Enough. Sandstorm. Crocodile release a sandstorm that blew Luffy and his water barrel away. Water barrel. Luffy hurriedly catches on the barrel before he landed. Ha ha ha. You really are into this fight eh? If you lose your water barrel, you're out of tricks. In that case, how are you different from last time? You're right. It wouldn't be any different. Luffy frowned as he knew Crocodile was right. Then how about this? If it's like this, I'm different from the last time. You're not serious. Crocodile's face twitched as he saw Luffy's current form. Water Luffy. Burp. Boing. What Luffy did was. To drink all the water from the barrel. Revealing a fat bouncy Luffy. Nami and the rest collapse to the ground. It's over. Their captain is a huge idiot. Oh no. I'm leaking. Is this kid serious? Damn, drank too much. I shouldn't drink too much water. Ha 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 ha. Robin couldn't take it anymore and laughed. Crocodile was even more pissed. You damned kid. What the hell are you joking about? Luffy looked back at Crocodile and pumped his arms then spitting a ball of water towards Crocodile. Now his whole body is drenched in water. Who's kidding? I'm always serious. Luffy's arms stretched all the way back. Gomu Gomu no. Rocket punch. The insane force was enough to make Crocodile spit blood and be blown away, crashing at a small building behind him. How's that? Crocodile? King Cobra could not believe his eyes. I can't believe it. Right now's not the time just to appreciate it, Mr. Cobra. Robin waved her hands and took off the nails stuck on King Cobra. You should hurry up and take me to the place where the true history is written. Why do you want to see that thing? What are you planning? It doesn't matter to you. Take me to that place. Robin then turned to Luffy and the others. Ha ha ha, your good luck ends here. No more time left for you. Hurry up, Nico Robin. If you don't want to turn dry too. I am freaking pissed. Crocodile stood up from the rubbles and shouted at Robin. As you wish. Robin immediately retreated away with King Cobra. You think we'll let you get away? Father. Vivi and the others tried to stop her but with a single wave, numerous hands appeared beside their feet and hands, instantly binding them in place. Straw Hat, you listen. Every rock on this earth. Will be destroyed. Crocodile exerted his power to the ground and the grass started to shrivel and die. The grass turned yellow. The trees too. The surface of the ground got dry. Cracks started to appear on the ground and begun to collapse. 
Seeing this, Luffy hurriedly shot more water towards Crocodile as he fell. But Crocodile wasn't someone who would fall for the same trick. He moved his hand forward and touched the water with his hand. The water immediately cried. He used his hands and absorbed it. You think you took away my ability, Water Luffy? Then you're wrong. You see, this hand can make anything dry without limits. Even trees, rocks, or dirt. The ground and everything around him started to turn to sand after being dried to the extreme. Turn everything back into sand. Ah! My sandals too! Luffy hurriedly shook off his sandals as it slowly turned into sand. Everything touched by my hand. Will dry into sand. Eh! Luffy, Nami, and the others all paled as they heard this. Mass erosion. Luffy immediately grabbed everyone and jumped off the walls but was caught by Crocodile. The others fell but with Pell with them, they managed to land safely. Crocodile now had Luffy at his grasps. With his hand, he dried his body up just like Lucas. But before be dried up, Luffy managed to shoot some water balls up in the air. This time, you lose again. Straw Hat Luffy Crocodile released his hand and caused the shriveled Luffy to fall to the ground. Time to go. Looking at the direction where Robin left, Crocodile dissipated into sand once more and flew away. At this time, the water balls that Luffy shoot up managed to fall back to himself, immediately hydrating him. Puha. I thought I was dead for sure. Luffy. The others immediately surrounded him. Where did that croc go? He went that way. I am not letting you go easily. Let's go. As Luffy and the rest ran after Crocodile, back at the palace, a man that once laid down the ground, thought to be dead. Opened his eyes. Lucas' body started to expand. His previously shriveled corpse now looked completely normal. He sat up and looked at his hands. I see. This power. Was from that fruit I ate back home. I thought it tasted weird at that time. Just before he got to this world, he indeed ate a strange fruit in the fridge. Mainly because there was nothing else to eat and he was too lazy to cook anything so he just ate it. He doesn't really know why that fruit was there but he understood that it was the reason why he arrived here in the world of One Piece. When he arrived here, he was already submerged in water. So if it was a devil fruit, then he should have drowned. So what is it then? Lucas watched as his own hand turned into water. From what he remembers, there is no such thing as a Logia water devil fruit. Such a thing shouldn't exist since seawater is the devil fruit's enemy. How come he suddenly has it? Lucas knows. This power. It was created to counter crocodile's sand power. His power is to create powers that will counter anything that can cause harm to him. This explains why he got healed after breaking his limits every time. It was as if his body is supplying what he needs immediately. Water counters crocodile sand. This created a new Logia power in Lucas. The power of water. This isn't all. Lucas touched the ground with his hand. The previously dead leaves and trees suddenly shone and grew. While crocodile sand can decay everything to sand, Lucas water can. Give life to them. Lucas turned to the four duck claw squad and thought for a bit before deciding to try it out as well. Their bodies glowed a dim light and their breathing. Was restored. Still, they had remained unconscious due to their previous state. They should wake up in a few minutes. Lucas can't really bring people back to life. These four were just severely wounded but they still had a small breath in them. It was enough for him to save them. After he was done healing the four, Lucas looked around and saw no one else was there. If they're not here. They should be at the temple by now. Lucas wasn't worried. He knows Luffy is there and is enough to deal with Crocodile. What he needs to do now. Is to save this country. He raised his hand high up and shot a stream of water into the sky. Drip. It started small. Then it grew into a drizzle. Then the rain started pouring. At the same time, a figure shot out to the sky. Crocodile. 
Luffy had done it. He defeated Crocodile. It's over. Though there was never a war this time. But nonetheless. Everything. Is over. Lucas looked over the city filled with people celebrating under the rain and smiled. Chapter 5 Inside the Palace Vivi watched the rainfall from the window inside the room where the rest of the Straw Hat Pirates slept. Igarim, who has just returned, patted her shoulder. Can't sleep. No, I can. It's just that I wanted to watch the rain for a bit longer. Lucas walked towards them with a smile. It's over Vivi. Crocodile's gone. No one will steal the rain anymore. Lucas. Vivi let out a tear as she saw Lucas. In truth, when she saw him again earlier, she had also cried for a long time and even embraced Lucas making him no idea what to do. Really, I. Cannot thank you enough. If it weren't for you. I already told you, Vivi. I was simply in the right place at the right time. If it were you who had met Koza earlier and not me, things would be much simpler. Lucas laughed. He looked towards the sleeping Luffy and the rest. Really, the ones that saved the day were these people. Vivi laughed. For a while, there was this strange atmosphere between them but Lucas didn't notice it as he simply looked out the window as well and watched the rain. Truthfully, this rain just now was no longer the rain he had made. His rain was supposed to only last for a while but a real rain came afterward. Still, he wasn't too concerned about it. He knows that even without his help, there would still be a rain anyway. All he did was to call it earlier than scheduled. Igarim noticed the subtle atmosphere between them and patted Vivi again before leaving quietly. Vivi blushed and glared at him as he retreated. Lucas looked at her and saw that she had her head down as if worried over something. He thought for a while and patted her head. Vivi was surprised and looked up to him. You don't need to worry too much, Vivi. I know you will become a great princess. And someday, a great queen. Vivi was silent for a while then asked as she looked straight at his eyes. How can you be so sure? Lucas was taken aback then laughed. Well, some people are just meant to be great. Just as Luffy is destined to be the pirate king. You are destined to be a great ruler. Vivi pouted at his answer. But how can you know? Ie. I if you aren't by my side, how can you know I'll be a great queen? Ah. Lucas didn't know how to answer or what she was trying to say but a strange thought came to his mind. Vivi, you don't need me to become a great queen. You are fine as you are now. Vivi started to pout even more as she glared at Lucas. With a wry smile, he placed his hand on her head again. Vivi, I. Can't be with you. There must be a reason why I was put in the path of Luffy. I want to go with them and sail the seas. I want to make Luffy the pirate king. You just said that Luffy is destined to be a pirate king. You don't need to be there too. Air. Lucas was now at a loss for words. He truly doesn't know what to say. Though the idea of staying and be with Vivi did tempt him, he still wanted to sail the seas and have adventures. Vivi sighed and dropped her head. I know you wouldn't stay. As well as Luffy and the Restits just. I will miss you guys. Well, I will also miss you of course. The others too. I'm sure they will miss you in fact, they are probably thinking that you will join them now. But. I can't. I know. For a long time, the two went silent as they both quietly watched the rain. Several days had passed by. The others soon woke up and began to busy themselves with preparing while Luffy still slept. Whoa! I slept very well. Finally, Luffy woke up. Ha! Huh. Hat! My hat! I feel very hungry. Where is my breakfast and my hat? It's already dinner time. Also, your hat's here. Wow, thanks. Lucas handed the straw hat to Luffy with a wry smile. Luffy took the hat and put it on then looked at Lucas again. He stared at him for a while before suddenly screaming. Ah! Lucas ghost. I'm still alive Luffy. 
What? Oh, that's good then. You just accepted it. Usopp smacked Luffy with an incredulous expression. Back when they woke up and found Lucas still alive, they raised a fuss and barraged Lucas with questions non-stop. Yet Luffy just accepted the fact like it was normal. Oh, Luffy, you're awake. Zoro. Long time no see. Long time no see. Zoro came into the room and looked a bit tired. Ah. Uh. Hey. Don't tell me you went to train again. Chopper immediately made a fuss as soon as he saw Zoro taking off his bandages without his permission. Long time no see. Lucas laughed and explained seeing as how Luffy is still confused. You've been asleep for three days now, I guess that's why you felt that way. Three days. Which means. I missed fifteen meals. How come you can count those kind of things so fast? And he counted five meals a day. Vivi laughed at that. Don't worry. Dinner's ready. It wasn't long when the whole crew was guided to the dining hall and mountains of food were lined up on the table. Luffy, seeing all these foods, immediately began to devour them all. There wasn't anyone who minded their table manners at all. Eat faster. Before Luffy takes them all. Luffy. You just took my plate. Seconds. Is that still counted as seconds? Lucas laughed at the sight of Luffy and the rest eating like there's no tomorrow. Suddenly, he thought of something and pulled out his smartphone and began taking pictures and videos of everyone. At first, the soldiers at the side looked at them with contempt due to their improper table manners. But after a while, when most of the food was already cleared out, Usopp began balancing a stack of plates on his long nose which made everyone laugh. After some time, they were led to the bath. That's the best meal I have ever had. I thought of a quiet and tidy meal but wherever you all are, it would turn into a party. King Cobra laughed. At the side, Luffy and Usopp both stood beneath a lion's mouth where water was pouring like a waterfall. Zoro. Look. We can do training. What training? Meanwhile, Sanji asked Igarum. Hey. Where is the girl's bath? Eh. Eh. As if I would tell you. It's over that wall. Your Majesty, you crook. Seeing this, Lucas laughed and joined in on the fun as well. Anyway, even the king is going to look, Lucas didn't want to miss out. Just as they looked over from the top of the wall, Nami and Vivi turned and saw them. Hmm. Hey, what are you doing? Vivi screamed but Nami just sighed. Those guys. She stood up with the towel still on but only for a moment as it dropped off. Happiness punch. That'll be 100,000 from each person. Nami. Luffy and the rest immediately spurted blood from the nose and dropped down including the king. Lucas just laughed and gave Nami a thumbs up before dropping off as well. Nami was stunned at that. Surprisingly, Lucas handled himself well. Thank you all. While laying on the ground with blood still dripping from his nose, King Cobra suddenly said which made everyone look at him weirdly. Perverted old man. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the country. While still sitting cross-legged, the king. No, Cobra Nefertari bowed to Luffy and the rest. Hey hey, is it alright for you to do this as a king? Cobra, your majesty, this is a big matter. Kings shouldn't bow their heads. Igarum, status exists if you wear your clothes. But here is the bath. There isn't a naked king. I am thinking as a father, with a citizen's heart. To thank you. Thank you, everyone. Shishishishi. Luffy grinned and laughed in response. Nighttime. The rest of the crew along with Lucas and Vivi gathered in the room. I think this is the right time to go. What do you think? Yeah, the marine has started moving too. Luffy, it's up to you. All right. We should have another Alabastan meal before we go. We must go now. Idiot. Yua. Vivi was silent as she watched them plan on leaving. In truth, she wanted to go with them. She really wanted to go on an adventure and sail the seas with them. 
The times when they were together were short, but those were memories that she cannot let go of. Lucas saw her struggling, he sighed, and placed his hand on her head. There's no need to think so much. No matter what decision you make, I'm sure it would be the right one. Vivi sank in her thoughts more. Lucas sighed again but already decided on himself. It should be the time now when the new bounty posters for Luffy and Zoro to appear. With this new bounty, the marines would be moving in on them. Suddenly, a call from a den den mushy came in from Mr. Two who had taken going Mary to a safe location. After thinking that it is probably safe to trust the guy, they all began to leave. Everyone. Tell me, what should I do? In the end, Vivi still doesn't know what to do as she still feels conflicted. Vivi. Listen up. We'll give you twelve hours. When we get our ship back at Sandora River. Then at midday tomorrow exactly, we will pass through the east coast. I'm afraid we can't stop there but forget it. If you like to come to travel with us again. That's the only time you can come aboard. When it's time, we'll welcome you, but it's pirate's adventure. Nami explained as everyone got ready to jump off the window. Hearing this, Lucas made a wry smile and shook his head. Seeing as everyone has gotten off, Lucas also prepared to jump out the window when Vivi called out to him. I. Lucas, I. As Vivi began to hesitate, Lucas' expression also kept changing. Finally, he sighed and turned around. Whether you decide to be a pirate or queen. Our feelings wouldn't change. The future is up to you. After saying so, Lucas didn't wait to hear Vivi's response and jumped off the window. Vivi watched as Lucas and everyone else safely land and run off quietly out her window. Her cheeks puffed as he glared at the back of a certain man. Humph, just you wait. Meanwhile, on the marine side, Black Jail Hina has begun her preparations. Miss Hina. We found their ship. They docked in the upstream of Sandora River. H.N. Prepare for battle. Time passed, Lucas and the others from the Straw Hat Pirates along with Mr. Two set sail along the seas. As expected, the marines had already surrounded them and began firing metal spears instead of cannons, making Luffy quite pissed. Fire. Fire the cannon. Damn it. Just fire the cannon. I will bounce them back. Don't joke around anymore. If these metal spears break the hull, the ship will sink in no time. Nami shouted. It's coming. Everyone glared at the incoming metal spears and did their best to prevent it from hitting the ship. Lucas frowned and jumped on the railings on the edge of the deck. Humph, shall we test out this new power of mine? Focusing on his water powers, he found that not only can his body turn into water, he also has the ability to control the surrounding waters. And this included the sea itself. Lucas' palms both faced upwards as he swung it up with all his might as if he was flipping a table. Sea flip. Then, a huge wave erupted in front of him and descending outwards onto the enemy ships. W what is that? A tsunami. The huge wave instantly swallowed tens of marine ships. It was a pity that none of those ships was the one that Hina was riding. Otherwise, he would have immediately defeated a strong enemy. Well, it did sink a certain iron knuckled marine and hypnotizer. Wow. Lucas, you're great. Holy God. Luffy's jaw dropped along with Usopp. Lucas smiled wryly with a face that was a bit pale. Ahaha, that expended more out of me than I thought. It seems I still need to properly train after all. As he said, after that big move just now, about 70% of his energy seemed to have been drained and it was impossible to perform the same move again in a short while. Hearing this, everyone sighed in relief. Damn, if this ability gets further developed. Just who will be your match in the sea? Other devil fruit users are afraid of the seawater, but you're the exact opposite. Shishishishi. That's Lucas for you. Just as they were feeling relaxed, Mr. Two's men reported. Mr. Bon Clay, bad news. What is it? It's Black Jail. Black Jail Hina. She is the commander of the marine around here. We better run. She's a tough one. 
Mr. Tu shouted but Lucas and the others didn't steer away. What are you doing? Let's go. If we head south, we have a small chance of getting out. If we go forward, we will sink. You all just go whichever way you want. We go this way. Luffy answered. But why? We have a meeting at twelve on the east coast. We have no time left, we must go. Hey! Really troublesome. Is there any treasure there worth waiting for? Just go and die for all I care. We are going there to pick up our friend. Chapter 6 A Friend Mr. Bon Clay Mr. Two's subordinates shouted as they saw him seem to stay in the Straw Hat pirate ship. If we run away now, we're not worthy of being Okama. If we're not able to sacrifice ourselves to help our friends. We will not rest in peace. Mr. Two begun his pose while tears streaming down his eyes. Straw Hat Luffy and the Rascals, listen to me carefully. We will be your decoy and draw them out for you. Bo and Chan. Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper were all crying as they watched Mr. Two transform his face into Luffy's and jumped off to his ship. At the distance, the Marines noticed the two ships separate and immediately reported to Hina. Miss Hina. Their two boats have left their course. The duck ship is going south. Is the duck ship a decoy? No. That's. Straw Hat Luffy and his crew are on the duck ship. The going Mary is a decoy. Hina took the binoculars and indeed saw Luffy in the duck ship. Chase them quickly. Full speed ahead. The marine's ship are all top-notch, naturally, it wouldn't be any slower than a small ship like the duck ship of Mr. Two. Soon, they were able to surround the duck ship and noticed that Luffy wasn't truly there. In the going merry, Luffy and the rest saw the marines starting to attack Mr. Two's ship. Bon Bon. We. We will never forget you. Lucas sighed. He knew that Mr. Two will survive this but will be sent to impel down in the future. Maybe he can still change this a bit. But if he changes it. And Luffy still ends up going to impel down in the future. He may not be able to get out without Mr. Two there. Lucas looked at Luffy and the rest then at Mr. Two. Eventually, he shook his head and sighed. Forget it. I'll think about the future once I get there. Lucas stood on the deck once again and raised his hand in a chopping stance. He glared at the sea ahead and gritted his teeth. Ocean. Splitter. He swung down his hand. And the sea split in half all the way to the marine's ships. The marine's and Mr. Two's ship immediately separated. Using this chance, they sped away from the marine's as fast as they can. Seeing as they were able to get away, Lucas sighed in relief and collapsed to the ground. Nami, who was closest to him just now, immediately caught him as he fell. Heh, that. That was something huh? Lucas weakly laughed as he savored Nami's embrace a bit. Lucas. That was amazing. Are you alright? Doctor. Where's the doctor? You're the doctor. Ah, that's right. Even now, in this situation, they were still joking around. Or is it that they're not quite right in the head? In any case, seeing their expressions which were worry, excitement, proud. Lucas felt a sense of belonging in this small ship. In his heart, he thought to himself. I want to see it. The day Luffy becomes the Pirate King. I. Want to see him reach it alongside him. At this instant, the resolve in his heart grew. Meanwhile, back in the island. Vivi had begun her speech. Tens of thousands were gathered in front of the palace to see her and listen to her voice. But she isn't there. Instead, she began her speech while standing on the edge of the island. I recently went on an adventure. It was an adventure over deep oceans and dark tides in search of hope. The ocean that I faced was vast the day I left this country. It is full of unbelievable islands which hold many things. There are creatures I had never seen, incredible sceneries, and sounds of the waves. They are sometimes so peaceful. It's as if they were trying to cover up all the trouble around us. 
but sometimes they are so violent, as if they were laughing at the weak. But in the darkness and storms, I found a tiny ship. That ship pushed me forward and told me, can you see those lights? That ship will always find its way out of the darkness. An unbelievable ship indeed. It's as if it was dancing, sailing through gigantic waves. Even though it seems like they're just drifting, they only go forward, even going against the wind. In the end, it will raise its finger. And say, look. There is light. Even if history will make this light seem like an illusion, they will always be real to me. And with that said. Vivi's voice trailed off as she saw a familiar ship in the distance. Let's go. It's almost twelve already. She will come, I know it. She is definitely over there. Let's dock and look for her. Luffy insisted, still hoping of having Vivi join his crew. Hey. Bad news. The marines caught up with us. Usopp pointed over to the marine ships approaching while Zoro began to make preparations to leave. How many are there? Let's sail now. Full speed ahead. Forget it Luffy. She is different from Vivi that was with us. Lucas looked at Luffy and stood up again. Ah, uh, Lucas. You can't move too much yet. You're way too exhausted. I'll hold off the marines for a few more minutes. What are you saying? Any more of that power and you really will collapse. Lucas ignored them and was about to make another big move when suddenly, a familiar voice shouted over from the island. Everyone. Looking over, they all saw a blue-haired woman wearing a beautiful dress along with a large duck. Vivi. Kuro. Look, she came, right. Let's turn back. Quick. Vivi. The marines are closing in. Though Luffy and the rest rejoiced, Lucas looked at Vivi's expression and sighed. He knew that Vivi wouldn't be joining them. I'm here. To say goodbye. What did you say? Kuro, give me the speaker. Kuro quaked and handed over the speaker she was using just now. I. Can't go with you all. In the island, everyone was confused as to who the princess was suddenly talking to. Thank you all for what you have done for me. Even though I still want to go with you. But right now I. Really love this country. So I can't come along. Vivi shouted with all her heart. Hearing this, Luffy was silent for a moment before smiling. Really? I. Even though I. Want to stay here. But if there is one day where we meet each other again, will you all take me as a friend? As soon as she said that, the marines who also heard her began to panic. Did you hear that? The princess is Straw Hat Luffy's friend. The princess has pirates for friends. No way. Luffy didn't care about all this and was about to shout back but Nami held him back. Idiot. We shouldn't answer her. The marines already saw her. If they found out we're friends, they will mark Vivi as a criminal. Let's just part quietly. Vivi naturally knew what they were worried about but the tears in her face still kept dropping. However, this didn't last long. When she looked over, all seven of them. Luffy, Nami, Sanji, Zoro, Usopp, Chopper. And Lucas were all raising their left arm and had taken off their bandages, revealing the X marks beneath. Seeing this, Vivi and Kuro also both raised their left arms as they thought back to the time they all made this mark. From now on. No matter what happens, the sign on this left arm. Will forever be the sign of our friendship. Let's sail. Just as Luffy and the rest sets off, Vivi shouted at them once more. Lucas. Just you see. I'll become a great queen. When the time comes, I'll definitely not let you get away again. Lucas staggered as he heard her declaration. Panic occurred in the cities who heard this as well. Lucas? Who's that? I don't know but he seems to be an important person in the princess heart. Kaya, I wonder what sort of man he is for the princess to like him. Damn it. The princess is already taken. No oh. Not only the citizens, even King Cobra had began to flare up. Chase. Chase that damn bastard. 
why your majesty, we can't. They just saved our country. I don't care. How dare that bastard woo my daughter. It was the same in the marine side. Damn it. Which one of those bastards is that Lucas? Shoot. Shoot him down. Kill him. Quickly find out what we know about that bastard. Eh. He was the one responsible for the huge wave and the water splitting earlier. Make a call to HQ. Raise his bounty. But of course, nothing can be said about the chaos in the Straw Hat pirate ship. Lucas you bastard. What did you do to my Vivichan? Eh. Eh. Did something happen between you two that we didn't know? Quickly tell us. Shisha shishi. Does that make Lucas the future king then? No. -oh. Fully aware of the ruckus that she had created, Vivi chuckled and tied her hair back as she turned around. Let's go back. To Alyabarna. Quack. Some time had passed, Luffy and the rest finally broke free from the Marines' pursuit and they all laid on the railings while sighing. Zoro and Lucas sighed as they looked at them looking so lonely without Vivi. Well, don't be too down. I'm sure our paths will cross again in the sea someday. More importantly. I think you should focus on the stowaway in the ship. Lucas shook his head and resumed a serious expression. Stowaway. Just as they were about to ask, the door leading to the cabins opened up and revealed a familiar black-haired beauty. At last we're out to sea. Good work. As soon as they saw her, they all sprung into action. Zoro grabbed his swords, Sanji was being his usual pervert self, Nami, Usopp, and Chopper all began to panic. Only Luffy and Lucas were not as excited. What? It's you. You're not dead. Don't point these dangerous things at me. Didn't I tell you that before? Hands. Robin Simple smiled and swung her hands, summoning a hand on Nami and Zoro as she swiftly slapped their weapons away. Since when did you board this ship? I was here the whole time in the cabin, reading a book and taking a bath. These clothes are yours. Lend them to me. Nami was pissed and immediately retorted at her but Robin paid her no mind. You didn't forget what you said, did you? Huh? Lucas blanked out. What was going on? This didn't seem quite right from the original story. Ah. Hey Lucas. What did you say to this beautiful lady? Sanji immediately freaked out and grabbed his collar as he shook him. Hey. I didn't say anything. No, I remember clearly. You better. Take responsibility. Hearing this, Sanji began choking Lucas and shaking him even harder. Luffy glared at her with an annoyed look. You're really weird, what do you want? Let me. Join your crew. Eeh. Chapter 7 Well, it was Luffy who convinced me to live even when I wanted to die, but it is still partially your fault, Lucas. How am I still at fault? Lucas can only swear in his mind. I have nowhere else to go. So let me stay on this ship. Oh, it's like that there's nothing I can do. It's okay. Luffy. Shishishi. Don't worry. She's not as bad as you all think. Luffy's word ended the conversation. It was clear that he won't care for any objections. Everyone else looked at each other before sighing and simply accepted their captain's decision. While Luffy and Chopper played with the hand that sprouted on the deck, Usopp wasn't convinced and interviewed Robin. I began as an archaeologist at the age of eight. Archaeologist? It's my family's tradition. Then I had a bounty put on my head. So for the next twenty years I was chased by the government. Being just a child, I couldn't survive out on the sea alone. That's why I've been with various villains, protecting myself. That's why I'm good at certain operations. Hmm, you seem pretty confident. What kind of operations? Assassination. Robin smiled sweetly as if the word she said was similar to saying, I love you. Usopp's face went pale and teary eyed. Luffy. According to my investigation, I came to the conclusion this woman is too dangerous. 
Though Usopp yelled, Luffy didn't bother listening at all and was busy playing and laughing at the hands on the deck. Are you guys listening? Really, they are useless. At the top of the stairs, Nami spoke with a cautious tone. I still remember you used to be the vice president of an evil organization. You were Crocodile's partner. You can fool Luffy, or that Lucas, but you won't fool me. If I see anything suspicious, I'll get rid of you. Hee <laughs> hee, okay I'll remember that. Robin acted as if she didn't care and simply giggled. Suddenly, she brought out a small bag that jingled as it landed on the table. In that case I'll keep these jewels for myself. Wow. I really like you miss. Hey. The sudden 180 degree turn of Nami caused Usopp and Zoro to be dumbfounded. Lucas' face twitched when he saw this as well. Then, Sanji appeared from the kitchen. His whole body swayed as he twisted and twirled on the deck while holding onto a large tray of food. Ah, it's love. Flowing love, I am nothing but a blackened log, drifting on the current of the river. Struck by lightning commanded by you, which sent me into a river, ever flowing down a waterfall. Here is a snack. Oh, thank you. Once again, the three watching were dumbfounded. It seems we are the castle. Those guys really need someone to take care of them. Usopp had just said a manly thing when Luffy called him. When he turned, he saw Luffy with two hands sprouting from his head. Chopper. PFT. Soon, he was laughing and playing along with Luffy and Chopper. Zoro's face blackened at that. This is not that bad. Are they always this cheerful? Yeah, they're always like that. Really? Robin let out a genuine smile. One she had thought to have forgotten to make since a long time ago. Still, Zoro didn't let his guard down at all. Lucas smiled wryly and patted on Zoro. Just let it be. In any case, having an archaeologist on board is necessary. Plus, she can fight well so it would be a nice addition to the team. It's enough to keep a close eye on her if needed. Zoro shrugged and went back to train. Right, Zoro, are you interested in getting even stronger? You see, I was reading something interesting back in the royal castle a while ago. Just as Lucas was about to explain, suddenly, the sky felt a bit dark. Hmm. Is it raining? It's not rain. Is it hail? No, something is falling from. Ha. Huh. They say that everything that humans can imagine is a possibility in reality. This was said by physicist Willie Karen. But as they look at the scene in front of them, many cannot believe their own eyes. Even Lucas who had transported to this One Piece world and knew this would happen still can't quite believe it when he saw it with his own eyes. Above them, a huge galleon which was tenfold the size of Going Merry was falling from the sky upside down. Boom! The impact and waves it brought to the sea caused their little ship to rock violently. Wow! Everyone grab hold of the ship. What? What's going on? It's a dream. It must be a nightmare. Nightmare. What a relief. There's still more falling. Be on guard everyone. Sanji shouted with a pale face. Turn around. Turn around. How can we do that with these waves? Lucas felt his power and tried to calm the surging waves. I'll calm the sea as much as possible. Zoro. Stir the ship. Sanji. Luffy. Kick those debris that are still falling from the sky. Sanji and Luffy desperately kicked off the debris falling from the sky while Zoro attempted to stir the ship away. After some lively shouts and desperate moves, the sea finally returned to its original calm state. Everyone sighed in relief seeing as there's no more pieces falling from the sky. Why did a ship fall from the sky? Too weird. There's nothing up there. Luffy and Rest let out a cold sweat as they looked up in the sky in wonder. Wah! Nami shouted. What's wrong, Nami? What do we do now? The log pose. It's broken. It's pointing up and not even moving around. Hearing this, Robin was surprised. That's not right. 
There's another magnetic field. How? It's changing the direction of the post. If it's pointing up, it means. It must have locked onto. A sky island. Lucas finished her words and looked up in amazement as well. Finally, I get to see a real floating island. He thought as he looked forward to seeing an island in the sky. Meanwhile, everyone else was shocked by what they heard. Sky Island. What is that? Can an island really float? But there's nothing that looks like an island. They all looked up and only saw the clear blue sky. Well, I've only read about them in the royal castle before. I didn't know the specifics. Regarding this, maybe Robin knows more. Hmm, rather than an island. It's more like a floating sea. Sea. That's even more confusing. Nami and Sanji were confused but Luffy and Usopp had sparkling eyes instead. Is there really an island floating on top of a floating sea? Alright, let's go. Everyone, upward we go. Full speed ahead. Robin covered his mouth since he was getting too loud and was spouting nonsense. It's impossible for a ship to go up captain. To tell the truth, I've never seen a sky island. I don't know much about them. That's right. It's impossible. Floating islands and floating seas. The log pose is just broken, that's it. Nami panicked. As the navigator, if the log pose is broken, they won't be able to move forward. Lucas shook his head. Nami, what you should worry about now is not the log pose, but how to get up there. Robin nodded as well. No matter how many times this ship is in a strange situation, whatever danger we find along the way, the one thing that we can count on is the log pose. It's a rule in this sea. No matter where the log pose points to. There will be an island there. Lucas concluded. Everyone looked at each other and had no choice but to accept it. At this time, Luffy spoke. Why is a floating island and a floating sea so hard to believe? Even Lucas is from another world. That's a whole different world. With different meats. He has a point. Also, does he really need to stress out that meat part at the end? Zoro's eyes widened as well. You're right. They have different alcohols there as well. That's what you find surprising Oi. Robin was the only one who heard this for the first time and was visible shocked. Another world? What is this about? Ah, you're right. Come to think of it, there's been a lot going on with Vivi, Crocodile, and Alabasta that this whole other world thing just went over our heads. Nami sighed and pressed her palm on her forehead. Usopp's eyes started shining. Hey. Hey. Lucas. In your world, is there like a robot? Robot. Lucas. You have a robot. Robot. Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper's eyes started to shine. It's as if they all had completely forgotten about the huge ship falling from the sky. Lucas sighed and thought it may be fine to let them relax for now. Soon, they will be facing Enel too. He thought for a while then took out his phone. I don't have a robot but I do have this Gundam back at home, let me just find the picture. Oh, here it is. When Lucas showed the picture to Luffy and them, their eyes seemed to turn into stars and raise the phone up high as if to worship it. Gundam. Robot. It has wings. Seeing the trio act like that, everyone else could only smile wryly. Curious, Robin took the phone and asked. What is this? Black box. Ah, that's a smartphone. In my world, everyone has it. We usually use it to contact each other, take pictures, videos, or play games. I see. So it's like a den den mushy then. Dead dead mushy then. Lucas thought this phrase sounded funny and couldn't help but repeat it in his head. Aware that his thoughts are getting sidetracked, he cleared his throat and nodded. Yeah, basically. Interesting. These. Pictures too. They are of your world. Yes. It's true, I don't recognize all these. Architectural structures and techniques. 
either you came from an extremely secluded island detached from the rest of the world. Or you really did come from another world. Hearing her say that, everyone looked at Lucas curiously. In truth, the idea of there being another world is still completely foreign to them and they didn't know what to think of it. Still, Lucas is here, that phone thing is here too. They have no choice but to believe in such a thing. Well, just as Luffy said. I can exist here, means that something like a sky island. Must be possible as well. Lucas only smiled and looked up, seemingly looking for the island in the sky. Nami was silent as she had another question in her mind. Don't you want to go back? To your home world? I do. But I don't know how. That's why I'm here. Figured I might as well search for the way back while accompanying you. Who knows, maybe the way back is in the final island where One Piece is. Or maybe it's written in one of those poem glyphs. I truly do want to go back. I still have my family there after all. But I also wanted to see this story end. No matter what. Luffy laughed as he declared. Shishishishi. Shishi shishi. Don't worry. I'll get you to the final island. After all, I'm gonna be the Pirate King. Heh, I will take you up on your words, Pirate King. Lucas grinned and bumped fists with Luffy. After some time, Robin had Sanji bring together the pieces of debris that fell on the ship and a coffin with a skeleton inside as well in hopes of figuring out the history behind the ship and why it fell. It may also lead to a way to go to the Sky Island. While Robin does her thing, Zoro came to Lucas. Hey, earlier, before that thing fell. You were saying something about getting stronger. Hmm. Ah, that's right. Lucas looked at Robin and the rest and figured they would take some time. The two moved to another corner in the ship as he began to explain. The library in the royal castle back in Alabasta is really something, I managed to obtain information that is not known to a majority of the people. I know that history and stuff bores you so I'll quickly get to the chase. The truth is, Lucas never went to the library before but figured it would be a good excuse to the knowledge that he knows. After all, Alabasta is still part of the world government and houses information regarding Pluto, they are bound to have this information as well so it wouldn't be too suspicious. You are aware that there are two parts of the Grand Line, correct? Un, they are divided by this thing called Red Line in the middle. Back then, we had to go through the Reverse Mountain to start our voyage in the Grand Line. That's right. Right now, we are in the first half of the Grand Line. In the second half, people call it the New World. Because the level of power in that half is largely different from the first half. Hmm. Is it so different? Lucas nodded. In the New World, there seems to be a unique power called Hockey. One can say that you can only be considered strong if you have this power. Hockey. Zoro was confused, it was the first time he heard of this. There are two types of hockey. Armament hockey, and observation hockey. Lucas proceeded with the explanation. Everyone has hockey in them, they just don't know how to use it. Simply put, armament hockey covers your body or weapon with an invisible armor, causing it to power up significantly. However, the most important aspect of this type of hockey is that it can also hurt specific devil fruit users. You mean? Right. Just like how you can't punch Luffy since he's made of rubber. If you coat your arm with armament hockey, it will still hurt him. The same for Logia users like Crocodile who can turn into sand. In fact, he probably knows this which was why he is terrorizing the first half instead of going to the new world. Zoro nodded and pondered on this power. Truthfully, he never felt so powerless whenever he's facing those special devil fruit users. He always thought that no matter how hard he trains in his sword, he will never be able to cut down people like Crocodile. Now, it seems there is this power that he can use. If he can use it, he will definitely be many fold stronger than before. You mentioned another type of hockey. The observation hockey. This is sort of like the sixth sense. Simply put, it allows you to see even with your eyes closed. They say that high level of attainment in this power allows you to even see a few seconds into the future. I see. That is certainly troublesome. 
Un, I figured telling everyone else as well but. Lucas looked at the side and saw that they were still busy with investigating. Even Luffy and Usopp were exploring the fallen ship. Well, I don't think they'll listen for now. To these guys, especially to Luffy, it's best if they see it for themselves first before believing it. You're right. I told you since I wanted you to keep an eye out for these strange powers as well. They only say that most people in the new world knows this power but never said that no one in this half will have it. Anyway, truth be told, I still have no idea how to train these two powers. Though I have a bit of an idea in the observation hockey, can you help me out? Zoro nodded. Just then, Luffy boarded the ship again and showed a piece of paper to everyone. Hey everyone. Look what I got. I found something really cool. The paper looked old and tattered but you can still make out the letters written on it. Skypea. A map of. Sky Island. Skypea. Does this mean there really is an island up there? Seeing as they were about to get all riled up again, Lucas gave a wry smile and turned back to Zoro. Guess we'll continue this some other time. After some discussion, it seems Nami decided to salvage the sunk ship to get more clues on the Sky Island. Usopp had made an impromptu diving suit with barrels and a tube at the top connecting to the surface. Are you sure this is going to work? Nami. I will find the thing that will bring us up to the sky. Lucas looked at Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji wearing the barrels with worry. Honestly, it feels like it will break apart easily. How about I head down with them instead? I'll just create an air bubble or something. It's fine, leave them be. More importantly, if they all die, at least there's someone strong enough left to defend us. Alright, sink them chopper. Chapter 8 Just as the trio was sinking down the ocean, a huge ship arrived near them as well. At the deck, loud voices could be heard. Is this the location of the sunken ship? Aye aye sir. Boss. Hearing this, Lucas froze. Right, he forgot that these people would show up here. Salvaging King Masaira. Current bounty, 23 million belly. Of all times, why must it be now that these weirdos come? Hey, what are you guys doing here? This here is my territory. Territory? That's right, every sunken ship around here is mine. You didn't mess with my stuff right? Masaira said in a serious tone but for some reason, Nami and the rest can't take him seriously at all. Looks like he wants to salvage it too. Hmm, that's what he said. So what? This is our chance. Stop blabbering. Answer my question now. Seeing as they were ignoring him Masaira squealed loudly like a monkey. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Nami didn't care and asked instead. You have something to ask. Alright, go ahead. Where did you come from and are you going to scrape a ship up here? Scrape. Hey, do I look like a complete monkey? Like a monkey? Like a real man? Do you really think so? Nami was dumbfounded. H huh? But I didn't. Ha <laughs> ha, thanks for noticing. So, are you guys here to salvage? Of course I'm here to salvage it. I'm a man who will salvage every single ship that sinks. I don't care how wide or long the ship is, there isn't a single ship we can't salvage. Masaira proudly exclaimed. So. Can we watch how you do it? Huh? Ah, uh, I see. You guys have never seen it done before. Alright, just watch how we do it. Nami and Usopp sighed in relief when they heard that. It seems that this weird guy was reasonable to speak with. However, before they sighed, something came up. Boss. Big trouble. Our crew that went under with the hook. Was it a sea monster? No, it seems he was punched by someone. What? Is someone else down there? Nami and Usopp both let out a cold sweat. Of course, they know who the culprit was and it was obvious as well. Sue. Hey you. Masaira pointed at them immediately, causing the two to jump back half a step. Underwater, it looks like there is someone down there. Be careful. Luckily he's an idiot. 
Secure the hook. Begin salvaging. Suddenly, Masaira started waving at Nami in the rest. As Nami and Yusup didn't want to look suspicious as they pump air to Luffy and them, they could only wave back at Masaira awkwardly. Masaira didn't notice at all and turned back to his men. Hey, listen up crew. Just pretend that those people are pumpkins. Just because there is someone watching don't hijijiji. His lips started to tremble then turned to a weird grin. Don't be so nervous alright. Yeah. Lucas' face twitched, he didn't want to watch this any longer so he went back to the cabin. Might as well continue to train while these guys goof off. As Lucas continued to train, he could hear several exclaims from outside and the swaying of the ship. When he looked out the window, he saw a huge turtle, the size of an island. After being dumbfounded for a while, he smiled wryly. Truly the world of one piece. Seeing it with my own eyes is totally unbelievable. There seemed to be some wreckage of a ship in its mouth but Lucas didn't care. He knew that Luffy and the rest are safe anyway. But what he didn't expect was that his presence in the ship made things different. He may not care about it, but the others cared about it greatly. Suddenly, the door was pushed open and Nami jumped to his embrace. Wow! Lucas! Luffy and the others are dead. Save me! Right now, Lucas was topless as he was training and Nami sticking so close to him. Caused some reactions to his body. Nami felt it too as she blushed but she was still too scared of the giant turtle to let go. For a while, they were stuck in awkward silence. Lucas sighed and forced himself to calm down as he placed his hand on Nami's back to soothe her. It's alright Nami. Luffy and them are tough. Even Crocodile can't beat them, how can this giant turtle do so? Ah. Why you're right. Nami finally let go and looked down. Seeing her line of sight, Lucas blushed and hurriedly turned around. Lucas, that. Nami was about to speak when suddenly, the skies darkened and they heard something crash on the deck. Hi. Still a bit afraid of the huge turtle outside, thinking that their ship was also just eaten, Nami shrieked and clung back to Lucas. What's worse was that she hugged him on the waist this time as her legs gave out in fright. With her face buried on Lucas' stomach, her chest area was naturally touching Lucas' lower area. Wow. Lucas. We're going to die. We're going to die. Ah. And Nami. Stop that. Quickly get off me. Lucas blushed in shame. Nami, Luffy, and them are probably back already. Stop panicking. Look, aren't we still fine? You you. Nami finally opened her eyes and looked around curiously. Sure enough, even though it's dark outside, they were indeed still alive. Did we get eaten by that turtle? Are we in its stomach now? I say, Nami. Your imagination is too much. Why don't we go out and see? Okay. But. Lucas sighed when he finally convinced Nami to get out. Still, Nami looked down again and blushed. She looked back at Lucas with a teasing look. Heh, can you even go out? This is your fault. F fine. Stay behind me then, I'll cover you. Nami wasn't used to this reaction. Though she knows that men would tend to show such reaction in their bodies, her crewmates are all either blockheads, idiots, or an excessive pervert. She is normally quite bold and would not mind showing off her skin from time to time but Lucas. Normal. Reaction had put her in a tough spot. But she is still Nami after all, so she spoke. You still owe me 100,000 belly from the bathhouse for peeking. This time too, that will be another 100,000. Hey! But I didn't even do anything. You were the one who approached me. Lucas grumbled and remembered a scam from his world where a person would pretend to get hit by a slow-moving car and lie on the ground so that when the driver gets out, he would ask for compensation. He had seen such videos on the internet and laughed at how stupid those guys are. As if anyone would fall for such a trick. But here is Nami, attempting the same thing but only with her body. Her very sexy and soft body. She would really do anything for money huh? Wait, do anything? 
Lucas' thoughts kept overflowing with dirty ideas. No good, I should quickly raise some money. With my knowledge of the other world, I would rake in millions of belly and then. Lucas quickly shook away his impure thoughts. If he continued to think about it more. He was afraid that he would really tempt himself. Nami pouted and turned around. Humph, since this is your first time using my services, I will let you go free. At this point, Lucas wasn't relieved at all. He was frustrated. Damn it, if it was going to be free then he should have done more. Nami knew what he was thinking and laughed slyly as she stuck her tongue out. No doubt, she was thinking. These men are so easy to handle. Lucas sighed. The feeling of being teased and cheated had already calmed him down. There was no need to hide behind Nami anymore so they left the cabin and came out. When they came out, they saw Luffy and Masaira arguing with each other but then noticed something behind them. It was. Large shadow silhouettes hidden behind the misty clouds. Everyone froze. Masaira and Luffy no longer dared to fight as they looked at the towering figures in fright. Only Lucas had a somewhat surprised expression as if he wasn't frightened at all. Nami, who was standing beside him, froze up and he could see her body shaking. Lucas thought it was a good opportunity for payback and looked cool so he held her hand. Nami noticed his hand and gripped it tightly. She looked at Lucas with tears appearing at the corner of her eyes and her lips were pursed, as if she was hesitating or deciding on something. Finally, she opened her mouth to speak but. Lucas. I. Nami. Whatever happens. Remember that I am here. W. What? Lucas. It was a pity that Lucas didn't notice her intentions at all. Lucas let go of her hand and sprinted to the deck just as the colossal shadow figure raised his spear to strike. With Nami's shout, the others also snapped out of it and quickly tried to stop Lucas from charging but they are a step too late. Lucas ran and jumped off the ship, seemingly facing the colossal figure on his own. He controlled the water to push himself upwards even further. Luffy and the rest shouted as Lucas was about to be struck by the spear. With a punch, Lucas secretly manipulated the water molecules in the cloud to tear a hole in the sky. Heaven Piercer. Lucas only thought of the name and didn't shout it as he felt it would be too much. Also, this move had no practical use at all. Other than clearing the weather for sunbathing. There was no use to it in a fight. On the ship, Luffy and the rest watched on as the huge towering figure's chest suddenly gained a hole and dissipated. Their jaws dropped to the ground. Robin was the first to snap out of it and once she saw Lucas fall from the sky, she swung her hands and summoned a line of hands that stretched all the way to Lucas, pulling him to the ship. She made more hands to catch his fall and after seeing him safe, she sighed. As everyone looked down at him with dumbfounded faces, Lucas noticed something and grinned. He raised his hand up to the sky and pointed. Luffy. There it is. The island in the sky. Only now did they all look back up again and saw. An island. It was faint, and the sun behind it was slightly making it unrecognizable but. The silhouette is certainly like. An island. Usopp used his goggles and zoomed in. Though it can't zoom so far up, he was still able to see more than the others. Aye it's true. There's. Trees. And buildings. We're too far away but. It's there. It's really there. Everyone was even more shocked. They looked back at Lucas curiously. Knowing their thoughts, Lucas smiled as he explained. Well, when I was a kid, there's this show that I would watch often. It was just a simple shadow puppet show where they hide behind a thin fabric and shine a light behind them, showing their shadows on the fabric. This incident reminded me of that so I wanted to take a closer look. Sure enough, when I got close, I found that these giants aren't really giants. Just shadows. Lucas continued to explain. I wondered why it suddenly got dark. And then there's these shadows. So I thought. Maybe, just maybe. The Sky Island. We must be under the Sky Island now. And those giant shadows. There. 
residents of the Sky Island which just happened to be in front of the sun's light. Robin and Nami exclaimed. With this, the others naturally understood as well. Seeing as everyone started to get it, Lucas nodded. Right. Unfortunately, my powers don't work so far away so I had to shorten the distance. As they showed an understanding look, they all sighed, thinking it's good that such huge creatures doesn't exist, even in the Grand Line. At the side, Nami was silent. Her fist was trembling slightly. She walked towards Lucas and swung her fist to his head. Ah! Lucas saw it coming and didn't understand why she was angry but knew that it would be bad if he didn't solidify to let her hit him so he can only grit his teeth and accept getting hit. You! Idiot! I thought I! We had lost you again. You keep pulling off stunts like this and you'd really end up dead. I! Ah! Humph! Don't bother me. Now I have to figure out how to get us up there. After saying that, she angrily slammed the door to her room with a bang. Lucas blinked dumbfoundedly. Not knowing what just happened. Only after a while did he seem to understand something and broke into a cold sweat. Damn. Did I. Overdo it. Looking at the closed door, he sighed and decided to let matters take its course. Inwardly, he couldn't help but curse. First it was Vivi, then Nami. What am I going to do? Sigh, it's too hard being handsome. This must be what Hancock feels like. The author, reading this, felt like punching his own main character. This damn narcissist. Dare to compare yourself to Hancock. The author also stared at this line for over an hour before deciding to leave it here and was too lazy to remove it. Anyway, Back to the story, when Luffy learned that the Sky Island was real, his eyes started to shine even brighter. Onwards. To Sky Island. Ah, uh, Luffy. We still don't know how to get there. I can probably shoot us up with the water but something that far and this big would probably kill me before we would end up in the sky. Don't worry, no matter what happens, remember that I am here. Fuck. Zoro. You were listening. Lucas blushed furiously. Such a cheesy line, Zoro unexpectedly heard it as well. Behind the scenes, the author cheered for Zoro as well. Yeah. Roast that bastard. He dares to take Nami from me. Sky Island. Suddenly, Masaira shouted. Lucas and the rest looked at him oddly. Did he just snap out of it just now? He's too slow in the head. Masaira didn't mind our looks and quickly jumped back to his own ship. Men. Head back to the island quick. It seems as if he's in a hurry. Lucas knows that he wanted to inform Cricket immediately and sighed, wondering if this would also affect the future greatly. Still, it shouldn't be too big of a change. Lucas looked back at Luffy. So, anything you found under there? Lots. Well. I'll go get Nami then. Scratching his head, Lucas walked towards Nami's room and knocked. Nami? What? She's still mad. Berm. Luffy and the rest are about to show the things they got from the ship. There may be some clues there to get to the Sky Island or treasures. Bam. Lucas had just completed the word treasure and the door had completely swung open. Caught unawares, his head was hurting from the impact but Nami didn't care about him anymore as she made a beeline to the pile of treasures that Luffy brought. Lucas cursed again in his mind. This money-loving woman. Though Lucas knew that he can get her out of the room by saying the word treasure. He still underestimated Nami and didn't think she would immediately open the door like that. Lucas swore in his heart. Next time. Next time I am activating my Logia powers. By the time Lucas came back to the deck, he could see Nami scolding Luffy and the other two. Where's the treasure? All you brought back was trash. And there's not even anything about how we can get to the sky. Luffy ignored Nami and simply played with wearing the rusty armor he found. Zoro shrugged. There was nothing else in it. Yeah, that's true Nami-san. Sanji puffed out a smoke with a sigh as he remembered the scattered weapons and skeletons in the ship. 
that ship had obviously been attacked. Either that or there was some sort of disagreement that caused them to turn on each other. If that's so, then information is even more crucial. Don't you get it? If we went into the sky right now, whatever happened on that sunken ship could happen to us too. Nami is still being as cautious as ever. Frustrated, she stomped on the pile of treasures. Ah! The info we have can mean life and death. Look at this stuff. Rusted swords, foodware, octopus. What I need are things like a diary or sea charters, not this junk. Nami ignored Zoro and Sanji and turned to Luffy. And what's that, Luffy? Armor, to protect me from harm. Ah. The armor is smashed to bits. Angered, Nami had actually destroyed Luffy with a single punch. How was that supposed to protect him from harm? Too scary, this Nami. However, it seems that Sanji didn't care at all and presented a shell to Nami. Nami-san, I brought back a beautiful shell for you. I don't want it, you idiot. Nami sighed as she walked back up to the helm. Robin, who was sitting at the side, handed something to Nami. For you. Wah. This is an eternal log pose. How did you? I stole it from that monkey's ship. Nami was in tears as she held on to the lock post. You you. The only one who understands me is you. Seems like you've been putting in a lot of effort. Even Robin pitied her. Lucas smiled wryly and walked over to look at the eternal log pose. Sure enough, the next island they will visit is written on it. His eyes gleamed as he thought of a certain man who they will find on that island. Jaya. Will I finally be able to see Blackbeard next? Lucas couldn't wait. Chapter 9 Jaya Nami read the word written on the eternal log pose. It must be their headquarters. Jaya? Are we going there? Luffy asked while eating takoyaki that seemed to come from nowhere. Wait, did they already eat the octopus they found? Lucas can only laugh wryly at how relaxed these guys are. Nami was also angered as she shouted. Shouldn't that be for you to decide? Okay, turn toward Jaya full speed. Luffy was easy to talk to and immediately gave the order as the captain without thinking too much about it. To Jaya. Full speed turn. Though Luffy shouted, the others had no idea where to go. Lucas laughed and added on while looking at the eternal log pose. Turn left. Oh, chopper. A hand here. Okay. To Jaya. Full speed ahead. Luffy did not mind anyone and continued to shout as if it meant something. Suddenly, Usopp noticed. Ah. Hey, wait a second. If we just go directly to Jaya. Won't the record be overwritten when we're there? In other words, we wouldn't be able to get to the Sky Island. Ah. Stop moving toward Jaya. Realizing what Usopp said, both Chopper and Luffy panicked and stopped his order. Luffy turned to Nami for an explanation. Hey Nami. What's going on here? Going to Jaya was your decision right? Yeah, that's right, but I didn't think that the situation would turn out like this. You didn't think, it's your fault then. The log pose has always been like that. Yeah, you're right. Luffy was silent, then nodded. All right. Listen, I'm the captain. So I'll decide where we go. I want to go to the Sky Island. Nami shrugged. Sure, how will you get there? The fastest way is to just ask around for info. Usopp also seemed to be thinking. Then, Luffy decided. Right, we can ask around in Jaya. Well then, head for Jaya. All right. To Jaya, full speed. Hey. We just went back to where we were. Seeing them, Lucas laughed. These guys, are they doing stand-up comedy or what? Robin finally calmed them down by suggesting that they can just leave before the record is set. In the meantime, they can ask around the island. All right me mateys. Let's go. To the kingdom of meat. Don't daydream. Lucas laughed again. This Luffy sure has wild imaginations. 
As the ship began to travel to Jaya, Lucas finally had some time to train with Zoro. Zoro also remembered what Lucas told him and came to look for him. You mentioned earlier about training that observation hockey thing. NN, the idea is being able to see without seeing and predicting the opponent's attack ahead of time. I have some ideas on how this may be trained. Good, let's get to it. Lucas nodded and took out a piece of cloth and covered his eyes. Basically, one side will be hitting, the other side will be dodging or receiving while blindfolded. Have you tried this before? Yeah, but it's a bit annoying and cumbersome. Well, I'll start first. Zoro, just use one sword for now. Lucas smiled and picked up a piece of wood and held it forwards, readying for Zoro's attack. Here goes. With the blindfold, Lucas was unable to see so he used his other senses. Mainly his hearing and touch. Hearing a brush of wind above him, Lucas held the wooden stick horizontally and parried the attack. Ah, uh, I got it right. Well, I slowed down for you. Next. Zoro began to quicken his pace. Though Lucas could parry some of his strikes, he was unable to dodge or defend most of the time. It can't be helped. Prior to this, Lucas doesn't even have any fighting experience. The two of them decided to switch per hour. When the hour was almost over, Lucas felt a warm sensation flow through his body again like before. Suddenly. He felt like he can see again. Confused, Lucas touched his face and found that the blindfold is still there. Before he can think of anything else, Zoro's swords flashed and were about to strike him. Wait, swords. Damn. I said use one sword first. Why are you using two? Huh, you know. Zoro didn't strike his swords at the same time so as to create an illusion that he was only using one sword. But he didn't expect that Lucas would figure it out. Again, one last time. You can use both. I won't parry, just dodge. Lucas felt something so he dropped the wooden stick and stood there calmly. Zoro was silent before lunging towards Lucas. However. It was as if Lucas already knew where he would attack, his body swayed left and right, dodging his strikes by a hair's breadth. Zoro grimaced and took out his third sword. Oni. Giri. As he launched his signature move, Lucas picked up the wooden stick again and extended it forwards, accurately hitting on the meeting point of all three swords. Lucas actually stopped his swords. While Zoro was still shocked, Lucas grinned and removed his blindfold. So this is hockey. What a fascinating feeling. It was absurd. To think that he had already awakened observation hockey in just an hour of training. Even Luffy had spent several months to master it. Zoro, watching Lucas stop his swords, trembled in excitement. This is it. If he can have this power as well. His swordsmanship would go through leaps and bounds. He. Can still get even stronger. It's my turn. On, Zoro, let's change the times. From now on, your turn would be five hours while I would have an hour. No need. I'll master this fast. It's not as easy as it looks like. Lucas smiled wryly, he knew what Zoro was thinking. Really? Looked pretty easy to me. Well, just try it then. Seeing Zoro so stubborn, Lucas can only give in and accompany him to train. He wasn't like Zoro who just simply swung wildly earlier and even cheated by adding another sword. Instead, he was patient and more like a teacher. Memorize this sound and the feeling. I'll do ten strikes overhead at different speeds. Just get to it. Since Lucas had said so beforehand, Zoro was able to parry the strikes easily but was still not used to the varying speeds of the strike. After ten strikes, Lucas swung to the left this time. Then the right, diagonal, front, and back. Only after completing this set that he began to wildly hit Zoro. In truth, Lucas wanted to continue those simple and basic strikes, but he knows Zoro, he's stubborn and didn't have the patience for something so repetitive and boring. Zoro can repeatedly do push-ups or other exercises himself but this was different. He saw Lucas achieve it immediately so he wanted to do so fast as well. In terms of sword sense, Zoro was better than Lucas. 
and with the warm-up he gave him before, Lucas was only able to land a handful of strikes. But this is only due to experience. Zoro was still unable to sense the mysterious power of hockey. You're used to fighting with swords, but this has also limited your own vision. Let's step it up a notch. Lucas thinks that Zoro is relying heavily on his experience with swords to judge where the strike would be, but this makes him vulnerable to anything else. Else, with his talent, he would have already mastered hockey even before the two-year time skip. Only when he was so badly bruised and fought against those crazy monkeys at Hawkeye's Island for nearly two years did he master it. That's why, Lucas decided to stop using weapons and instead, use his power. He controlled the water outside and shot it toward Zoro. Completely caught unawares, his whole body was drenched. Zoro's face twitched and he took off his blindfold angrily. What was that for? What? You were the one who used two swords when I only said one. Also, you can't just get used to swords. You need to predict the unexpected. How the hell are you supposed to predict the unexpected? Actually, even Lucas wasn't sure how the hockey training is supposed to be. That's what we're learning here. Sigh, never mind. You said that it's easy so I thought you can do it faster, it seems I overestimated. Hearing that, Zoro's face twitched again and picked the blindfold once again. Come at me with all you got you bastard. You said it. Lucas grinned and began attacking Zoro with water pillars. At the side, Luffy and the rest looked at them curiously. What are you guys doing? Hmm. Oh. We're playing a game. After thinking for a bit, Lucas decided to fool Luffy. Game. Looks fun. Let me join. Really? This is a hard game you know you need to have a blindfold and I'll be attacking you with seawater. You'd lose immediately. What's that? You dare make fun of your captain. Usopp. Get me a blindfold. Lucas showed another grin as he tricked Luffy into training observation hockey. He saw Sanji sneer and laugh at Zoro getting drenched. Zoro, you lasted five minutes now with me attacking from all sides, that's good, I think no one can do any better. When Sanji heard that, he stopped laughing and tossed his cigarette. Oi. Get me a blindfold too. I'll definitely last longer than this moss head. Heh, someone like you wouldn't last a second, curly brows. Bastard. I'll show you. As the two of them started to fight while dodging and defending from the water pillars while blindfolded, Luffy was busy getting hit by the water, then being weak, then unable to dodge the next, then repeat. Lucas knew that Luffy's an idiot and he won't get it immediately so he just let him continue at his own pace. Nami saw Lucas grin while torturing the three strongest members of their crew and cold sweat appeared on her temple, it was unknown what she was imagining. Meanwhile, Robin looked at Lucas curiously, seemingly understanding something. The training demeditor continued on for an hour. At this moment, Zoro seemed to have felt something and unconsciously moved his head to the side, dodging the water pillar in the nick of time. Lucas' eyes gleamed as well as he felt that Zoro's dodge at that time was different from before. He was about to test the waters more but then Sanji's leg kicked over to Zoro. Zoro, who was still trying to recall that feeling before, was caught unprepared by Sanji's kick and was struck. Dan Cook. Pissed, he took off his blindfold and began to hit Sanji. Seeing the two of them begin fighting again, Lucas was dumbfounded. Did he imagine it? Lucas began to regret dragging Sanji into this. Both Zoro and Sanji were knocked out by each other as they fell. Lucas turned to look at Luffy who was the only one left standing. Though he looked even weaker than the other two. But he was still standing. Figuring it was a good time to end the training, Lucas cleared his throat and spoke to Luffy. Well, congrats captain. You won. Ah. I won. Woohoo. Luffy took off his blindfold and celebrated, completely not reading the mood. He went over to Zoro and Sanji who were both exhausted and started to make stupid faces on them. Both pissed, they dragged Luffy and began their three-way brawl. Lucas just ignored them and walked over to Nami who was busy relaxing at the deck. He saw a glass of orange juice at her side and took a sip. 
who, really makes me thirsty. The next moment, he saw an orange-haired demon raise her fist and smacked his head. Lucas rolled on the ground while clutching his head painfully. Damn it. I really will turn to water next time. This demon. You're lucky I don't turn into water and sneak into your bath. Wait a sec. This seems. To be a good idea. While Lucas was thinking about this seriously, Nami saw that he was still not getting up and thought he was still sulking. She knew that if he wanted, her fists would just go through him. But Lucas still respects her and didn't want to make things harder between them so he still solidified even if he knew he would be hurt. Nami sighed in her heart and spoke softly. Does it hurt? Huh? Oh, no. Not much really. I'm fine. Surprised at her sudden question and behavior, Lucas stuttered a bit before answering. Humph, that's what you get for. Hey. Your nose is bleeding. Ah. Uh. Lucas let out a confused sound and touched his nose. Sure enough, there was blood flowing out. But this wasn't because Nami hit him, instead, this is due to blood rushing to his head as he kept of all sorts of things earlier. Fully aware of his own thoughts, Lucas blushed and quickly wiped off the blood. Ah, uh, T this is. Ah, uh, I am probably too fatigued from earlier, hence my body is weak. Yep, that's it. You. Nami was about to say something when Lucas jumped off the ship in a desperate attempt on washing the blood off. Stupefied, Nami's fist clenched and glared at Lucas hatefully. In the sea, Lucas sighed in his mind and wondered what to do with Nami he is a selfish guy, he may like Nami but he also likes Vivi and Robin and a bunch of One Piece girls. It can't be helped, who told Oda to draw them all so sexily. Of course, with the exception of other characters like Lola or Big Mom. Actually, Big Mom can be considered as the one true. Harem Queen. She has a bunch of sons and daughters from different races. This is the dream of all men. And she accomplished it as a woman. It's too bad she looks like an old witch hag now, maybe she was hot back in the day, but definitely not anymore. Well, that three-eyed daughter of hers is pretty but Lucas thinks her character is a bit annoying. Anyway, after some reflecting and meditating under the sea, Lucas came back up to the deck cautiously. Looking around, he didn't see Nami but saw Robin sitting at the side. Nami's back in the room. Oh, you're back. Yes, she just went back and slammed on her door while cursing about a pervert. Robin is as frank as ever. With another sigh, Lucas leaned on the rails and looked at the sky, wondering how he suddenly became a pervert in her eyes when he hasn't even done anything to her yet. Robin just watched him with her ever-curious eyes. Lucas noticed her looking and felt weird. She had a look as if he's looking at an animal inside the zoo. What? Nothing. I'm just very curious about you. Heh, careful there, you might just fall in love with me. Lucas laughed jokingly Burr Robin only smiled slyly. Oh, what if I did fall in love? Are you going to stop pursuing Nami? You know. With my powers, I have hundreds of ways to make you feel. Satisfied. Hearing Robin's soft and seductive talk, Lucas froze before laughing weakly. Ha. Ha. I bet you do. Ah, uh, good talk. Lucas felt that it would be bad to continue this conversation so he quickly fled. While looking at the fleeing Lucas, Robin giggled and turned to a corner of the ship. You can come out now, Nami. Chapter 10 Nami came out from the corner and looked at the direction Lucas left with a complicated expression. Humph, such a cowardly pervert. Robin chuckled at that. Actually, I quite like him already. He's very interesting. Robin smiled slyly. Hearing that, Nami was as if a cat whose tail was stepped on. You can't. Oh. Nami blushed when she realized she was too anxious. But Robin didn't mind. Instead, she raised up four fingers. Shall we make a bet? After four islands, if I still can't make him fall for me. I will not bother the two of you anymore. W.I. should I make a bet with you? Oh, so you want to share then? No. Nami blushed again. 
but this time, she glared at Robin with fire burning in her eyes. This vixen dares to steal from me. Wait, since when was Lucas mine? It's not like I. But it's annoying if he and this vixen get together and be flirty all the time. Though Nami had to admit that she lacks in certain areas when compared to Robin. She didn't want to lose out at all. Humph. Fine. But a bet is only a bet when both wages are equal. If I lose, I will also. Not mind you both. Fufu, shall the best woman win. Oh, it's on. With a final glare, Nami left Robin alone and went to find Lucas. Looking at Nami leaving as well, Robin let out a soft sigh and looked back to the ocean as she muttered. For more islands. By that time. Who knows if I would still be here. This silly girl. Back on the front of the deck, Lucas was completely unaware about the bet that seemed to decide his love life. If he was better at using his observation hockey, he might have known something but as he is now, he still hasn't grasped the full use of it. At the front, Lucas saw Usopp and Chopper looking into the distance with Usopp looking through his binoculars. Still can't see it, Usopp. I haven't seen it yet. Zoro also walked towards them after finishing up his training. It shouldn't be so far away right? That monkey man said that the area back there was his territory. Seeing as Nami isn't here, Lucas added while looking at the sky. The weather has been steady for a while. We are probably in Jaya's weather area. Luffy laid down on top of going Mary's head comfortably. Jaya must be a spring island. So warm, feels good. Chopper looked to the sky and saw seagulls flying freely. Spring is such a good season. Those seagulls seem to be feeling well too. Suddenly, the seagulls that Chopper mentioned landed on the deck with blood spilling out of them. Ah! They were shot. Ooh, barbecue material. What? Shot. I didn't hear any gunshots. Chopper was frightened but Luffy and Usopp didn't believe him. As if to prove his point, Chopper took out a pair of tweezers and took out a bullet from a seagull's body. Look, a bullet. Judging from the angle of descent, it was fired from the direction in front of the ship. At this time, Nami finally appeared and heard their conversation. She looked to the front but didn't see even a hint of an island. Shooting from an island that we can't even see yet? Chopper, that's impossible. But I was watching them. Sanji. Seagull. Luffy didn't care about it at all and simply cared about food. Well, he is a rubber man, he is naturally the one who doesn't care about bullets. Huh, if that's true, with what kind of eyesight, using what kind of gun, and what kind of technique does that shooter have? They probably got hit before and just happened to fall down right now. Usopp was still unconvinced but Lucas knows that Chopper is right. Those seagulls were indeed shot down. This is the work of Blackbeard's crew. Lucas frowned and stepped in front of Nami just in case. He knew that the shooter won't shoot again but he still wanted to be cautious. Nami saw this little action of his and pouted. She pushed Lucas away and made sure that they were still heading in the right direction. Being pushed away by Nami, Lucas sighed again for the nth time. After making sure the direction is okay, Nami looked at Lucas and was about to say something but when she turned to look, Robin had unknowingly latched herself to Lucas already. Robin seemed to be asking Lucas about his phone and how to use it. The two of them were also smiling and laughing together. Pissed, Nami came over and snatched Lucas' phone away. Ah. Nami. Stop fooling around and prepare the ship. We are nearly there. But, we can't even see. Lucas froze when he saw the orange-haired demon raising her fist again and hurriedly left to prepare things though he has no idea what exactly he needed to prepare. Nami glared at Robin again and left for her room as well. Humph, I shouldn't have agreed to let that vixen stay on this ship. Then, she noticed that she still had Lucas' phone in her hands. After thinking of something, she smiled slyly and tapped on the camera icon on the screen. Lucas had already taught her the ins and outs of the phone and could be considered as experienced already. After opening up the camera app, she proceeded with taking lots of pictures of herself. 
she wanted to flood his gallery with only herself so Lucas won't look at other girls. Of course, she wouldn't delete pictures that were already there. She wasn't that mean. After about a hundred or so pictures, she wasn't satisfied yet and took another picture of herself with more skin revealed and changed it into the phone's wallpaper and lock screen. Hee hee, let's see if you can still think of other women. Satisfied, she took the phone and was ready to give it back to Lucas. Suddenly, she froze. No good. It's too embarrassing if she directly hands it over to him. After thinking about it, she decided to leave it on the table near Lucas and hid nearby, waiting for his reaction. After some time, Lucas was still doing his work and didn't notice the phone. Nami was already getting impatient. Just get your phone already. As she is thinking this, Sanji entered the scene and noticed the phone on the table. Hmm. Ah, this is Lucas' phone. Sanji looked at Lucas who seemed busy at the moment and remembered that his phone was fun to play with, so he decided to open it and play. However, just as he was about to see the lock screen, something struck his head and knocked him unconscious. Nami wasn't satisfied and repeatedly hit Sanji with the chopping board and kicked him a few times. Lucas, who heard the noise, turned around just in time to see this scene. His body shivered. A demon. There's a real demon. Nami's appearance is truly frightening. He didn't know what Sanji did but he prayed for his soul to hopefully ascend to heaven properly. And Nami, calm down. Sanji doesn't have a bounty yet. Killing him won't give you any rewards. El Lucas you bastard. Ah, it seems that Sanji was still conscious but this was all he could utter before finally losing consciousness for good. Once Nami was satisfied, she stopped and glared at Lucas. Lucas felt the killing intent behind her eyes and was confused. Just how did I offend this demon again? Nami didn't mind his reaction. She grabbed his phone, fiddled with it and deleted all the photos of her. As expected, it's too embarrassing after all. Once done, she tossed it back to Lucas and left with a puff. Still confused, Lucas looked at his phone and wondered what Nami did. He opened the phone and found that there were no changes. He thought of something and used an app to recall deleted files. Sure enough, when he recovers the recently deleted images. It was filled with pictures of Nami. She actually took selfies in all sorts of angles, poses, and... There's hundreds of them. It's a good thing I didn't tell them I can recover the images. This Nami is really bold. Lucas raised his thumb in approval in his mind and savored the pictures especially the one with more skin revealed. Next, he moved them all in a folder named Treasures and placed a password. The password is actually Ilovanami. Of course, he wouldn't dare tell this to anyone. This phone is now his sacred treasure which he can worship every night. He looked at Sanji who was bruised all over and unconscious. Sorry, Sanji. Thank you for your sacrifice. With that, he left and headed back to the deck as well. On the way, he met Nami again who acted like she didn't do anything and just directly ignored him. At this time, they finally saw the island of Jaya. Hey, hey. It looks like a vacation resort. Usopp was excited while looking at the pleasant city in front of them. A resort? Speed up Mary. Yup, I feel like staying around for a few days there. Nami was also excited and couldn't wait to land. Suddenly, Usopp noticed the ships docked nearby. Um, those ships at the dock look like pirate ships. Am I just worrying too much? Usopp, think. How can a pirate ship openly dock in public place? Ha! Huh. That's right. Just as they were happily talking, a loud scream was heard. Murderer! What's wrong with this city? Lucas smiled wryly and remembered the original manga. The city on the west side of Jaya is a gathering place of chaotic people where there is no law. Here, people attack, sing, and laugh with each other. It's the city of mockery, mock town. Upon landing, Luffy and Zoro grinned. Seems like there are all kinds of people here. Looks to me like a fun city. While looking at the two, Nami, Usopp, and Chopper's faces were pale. It just can't be done. 
it's impossible for those two not to cause trouble. Yeah. This city has enough trouble brewing already. Absolutely impossible. After much deliberation, Nami finally decided to accompany them, hoping that with her presence, there would be less trouble. Lucas looked to the side and found Robin had disappeared as well. As he looked at the others, Lucas also decided to leave quietly. He looked around and found a ship. This must be his ship. Blackbeard, Marshal D. Teach. Lucas wasn't worried about Luffy and the rest. He knew that although they will be insulted, they would be fine. He waited on the ship for some time and finally. The man he was looking for had arrived. Ha. Huh. Who are you? Blackbeard asked upon seeing a stranger on his ship. Blackbeard, Marshal D. Teach. It's good to see you. I am Lucas, a member of the Straw Hat Pirates. Lucas gave a curt bow. Straw Hat. Ah, you mean that kid huh? What are you doing on my ship? His eyes narrowed and a faint killing intent could be felt from him. Oh, I am here to kill you. Zeha ha ha ha. What an interesting brat. Many have tried, yet I am still here. What makes you think you can do it? Lucas just smiled and slowly approached him. Blackbeard just stood there as if he wanted to know what Lucas would do. Unfortunately, that was his mistake. Lucas' hand turned to water and shot out to Blackbeard. Surprised at his ability's nature, Blackbeard tried to step away but was too late. W. What? Is this? Power. A water devil fruit shouldn't exist. Heh, you think your dark fruit is the only one which can counter devil fruits? Well, just stay still and drown. It's pointless to struggle. Blackbeard's eyes finally showed fear as he was slowly being engulfed in water. Why? Why do you want to kill me? Lucas grinned. It's a secret. You. B.S. Tard. Unable to even summon his power, Blackbeard's eyes slowly dimmed as he was out of breath. Soon. His heart stopped. Lucas let Blackbeard's body go and was silent. With this. Ace should be safe now. There's no reason why he would get caught and that war would not happen anymore. And Luffy. Luffy wouldn't feel so sad anymore. Blackbeard was supposed to be a tough opponent, but he underestimated Lucas which caused his death. Though there may be unforeseen changes from now on, Lucas still decided that this is for the best. Blackbeard. Must die. Suddenly, Blackbeard's crew appeared. Seeing the body lying down, they were all angered and charged towards Lucas. Bastard. What did you do? Lucas only looked at them with dead eyes. After killing someone for the first time, his heart was cold and tranquil. He didn't know if this was because it's his nature or if it's also because of that fruit's effect on him. In any case. He doesn't mind killing Blackbeard's crew as well. While pointing his finger at them, high-pressure water shot towards them. Water gun. This is one of the moves that Lucas had come up in his free time. But it wasn't over. The water pierced their bodies but stayed inside. With his control. He burst their bodies open with the water inside. Looking at their dead bodies, Lucas cut off their heads and raided the ship. His total gain was about 500,000 bellies. These Blackbeard pirates at this time are dirt poor. He has no idea what Blackbeard and his crew's bounty is at the moment but still decided to turn it in. There should be a marine office here too. After asking around, he found the marine office and turned in the heads. Lucas has no bounty on himself at the moment and is not classified as a pirate so he intended to make good use to this. Though he thinks that this marine office is quite pointless to be here. Look at how chaotic this place is. These marines should be quite corrupted. But after some mild threats here and there, Lucas was able to get their bounties. Total bounties. 878,556,000 bellies. It's lesser than he thought. Well, Blackbeard's bounty only increased to 2 billion after the summit war. Also, his crewmates aren't that well known yet as they haven't made their debuts. Together with the money from their ship, 
Lucas now has 879 million on him. Lucas grinned when he thought of Nami's reaction to this. Maybe he can buy her. He quickly shook the thought away and silently prayed in the photos of his goddess in his phone. Wait, that goddess is also Nami. While thinking of such idle thoughts, he left and went back to the ship. As soon as he reached the ship, he heard some yelling. You guys. What's with those wounds? What happened? Nami-san. Are you alright, Nami-san? Ah. Doc. Doc. Doctor. Doctor. You're the doctor. So go give them some first aid. Usopp saw that Chopper forgot about his own role again that he slapped the back of his head. Lucas smiled wryly and walked towards them. While Chopper was fixing up their wounds, Lucas also used his water's healing capability to heal the two of them. My healing powers don't work great on devil fruit users but it should be enough to stop the bleeding, I will count on you to patch Luffy up, Chopper. Leave it to me. At the side, Nami was frustrated. Even if all of you want to let go of the past, I am still angry. What kind of response was that? A real man would pulverize any challenger to dust. Arg. This city is pissing me off. Why didn't you bash it into bits? Just a little while ago, you were saying. That was the past, don't bring it up. If you do, I will beat you to death. Aren't you the one who just said that you can't let go of the past oi? Oh, did you guys discover any clues about the Sky Island? Chopper asked, seemingly excited. However, upon hearing the word, something seemed to have triggered inside Nami and looked at Chopper with a black face. Sky Island. I don't care anymore, geez. Sky Island, when I mentioned it, everyone in the bar just laughed. Is everything that I say always so funny? Is it because I said it? What did I do that was so funny? Something seemed to have snapped inside Nami as she was like a mad cat hissing at everyone. Usopp and Chopper were scared that one of them pretended to be dead while the other used his defense point to guard against Nami. Lucas smiled wryly and patted her head. Nami jolted from his touch and was about to hiss at him as well when Lucas showed her a sack. Well, don't be mad. Calm down. Here, this should cheer you up. Confused, Nami calmed down and opened the sack. Instantly, her eyes turned to bellies. H how much are these? Should be about 879 million. Kaya. I love you so much Lucas. Lucas was shocked. True enough, Nami is really so bold. To just go and hug him like this so tightly in broad daylight with everyone looking at them. Though he can see Saji's eyes burning from jealousy, Lucas ignored him and savored the soft mounds on his chest. Usopp was also shocked and looked at the sack of bellies and asked. Just how did you get these, Lucas? Don't tell me you robbed a bank. Hmm. Well, I don't have any bounty yet and this place seemed to be full of pirates. I just knocked a few of them or so and turned them in. I thought with how beat up the ship is, you could use the money for repairs. Kaya. I love you so much Lucas. Oi. Why? Why are you also hugging me Usopp? I'm not into men so get the hell off. Lucas' face blacked and immediately kicked Usopp away while still holding Nami. So cruel. Lucas ignored him as well and savored Nami's embrace a bit longer. Hmm. She smell of oranges though. Chapter 11 It is said that when choices are made, whether good or bad, follow you forever and affect everyone in their path one way or another. With the death of Blackbeard, many changes began to occur. When a devil fruit user dies, their devil fruit returns back to the earth and would reappear once again somewhere in the Grand Line. This was also true in the case of Blackbeard. Upon his death, many days had passed, on a certain island somewhere along the first half of the Grand Line, a young man with white hair was walking unsteadily in the forest. His skinny look and body full of bruises are enough to tell you that this young man had not lived a good life. Often, he is bullied and beaten up. His parents are dead and he has no money to eat. As he was walking in the forest, he saw a strange-looking fruit in front of him and hesitated. 
He has been looking around for a day now and did not see a hint of food anywhere. Probably, those bullies of his had taken everything already. Just as he was hesitating, his stomach growled again. He no longer cared and took the fruit and ate it. He ignored the weird taste and simply eat his feel. Once he was finished, he felt a strange power emerge from him. Looking at his hands, it suddenly released a black mist and he immediately understood. What he ate was. Death. He wasn't a person who knew a lot. He didn't know the existence of devil fruits. As such, he could only think of such things. To him, that strange fruit was definitely poisonous. For him not to die. Means he conquered death. And for him to gain such powers. Means he now controls death. His mouth twisted into a weird grin. A few hours later. The city that had tormented him was engulfed in darkness. Soon. It was no more. Later on, he would venture into the sea and feared by all. As the Black Death. Back to the present, in Jaya. While Lucas was busy embracing Nami, at this time, Robin appeared. Hmm. Sounds like something exciting just occurred. What happened? Ah. You're back Robin Chan. Would you like to eat first or take a bath first? Sanji, who was still feeling jealous of Lucas, immediately started his advance on Robin instead. Of course, he was just ignored by Robin. Luffy finally noticed that Robin had left as well and asked. Where did Robin go? I went to buy some clothes. I also tried to find clues about Sky Island along the way. Hearing the word Sky Island again, Nami was about to snap but Lucas quickly calmed her down by jiggling the sack of bellies. As if charmed by the sound, Nami's eyes turned to bellies again and melted in bliss. Lucas was speechless. Looking at the two of them, Robin was confused but still calm, as if it did not matter to her at all. Lucas remembered what she told him before and let out a cold sweat. Not minding Lucas, Robin walked over to Luffy and handed a piece of paper to him. Ooh. It's a treasure map. It's just an ordinary map, where is this place? Usopp asked. It's this island. The city on the left is where we are, Mock Town. On the other side. Do you see the X mark on the east coast? I heard that a very special person from Jaya lives there. When Robin explained, the two were even more curious. A very special person. His name is Montblanc Cricket. He was exiled because he kept talking about his dreams. We should be able to talk about similar interests. Lucas smiled. So you think if there's anyone on this island who would know about Sky Island, it would be him, correct? Exactly. Robin nodded and gave Lucas a smile. Nami saw this and immediately pinched Lucas' waist. Ah. Though it didn't really hurt, Lucas still acted like it did to satisfy this little demon when he remembered what she did with Sanji before. And so the crew began to set sail once again to reach the other side of the island. While sailing, Lucas stayed in the cabin and focused on training his observation hockey. They would go up against Enel soon and his people's mantra. It would be troublesome if he can't make good use of his own hockey. As Lucas continued to train, the crew met with the brother of that Messira guy from before, who looks like an orangutan, and made a ruckus. Lucas frowned upon hearing the noise and stealthily drilled holes into their ship. Anyway, none of them were devil fruit users so they can drown safely. How he controlled the water from within the cabin was due to his application of observation hockey. He can now see the area around him within two meters. It's still small but if he only directs it to one side, it would be longer. Since the other side was too noisy, knowing their general direction was pretty easy. Once they noticed they were sinking, they quickly fled instead of causing any more trouble. At the deck, Luffy looked at them in confusion. In the end, just what does that orangutan want? Dunno, anyway those monkey brothers are idiots. After a few minutes, they finally arrived at their destination. This is the place on the map. What's his name again? Montblanc Cricket. The man who talks of dreams. Gah. That's so cool. Nami, Usopp, and Luffy looked at the place in disbelief. 
what they saw was a giant castle. It didn't look like a place of an exiled person at all. Is that his house? He's filthy rich, isn't he? However, Zoro and Sanji weren't amused. Stupid, look clearly. Hmm, a man who dreams. More like a man who wants attention. What are you talking about? Chopper was confused but then noticed it as well when they neared it and appeared at the side. Ah. It's just a board. What? At this time, Lucas had also come up to the deck and smiled wryly upon seeing the house. To put it simply, Mont Blanc Cricket's house is just half a house. The other half is just a board with the outer side painted to look like a palace. Seeing this, Nami asked Robin. What dreams did he speak about when he was exiled? I don't know all the details, but... He talked about a large amount of gold hidden here on Jaya Island. Gold. You mean like a pirate's treasure? Everyone was excited. Especially Nami. Dig fast chopper. Dig out the gold. Just dig and we'll find it. Chopper immediately believed Nami and started to earnestly dig on the ground. Meanwhile, Luffy was still being himself and went on with his own pace. Hello. I'm coming in. Hey. Don't just walk in there. Usopp panicked but of course, Luffy didn't listen at all. Hmm. No one seems to be home. Hello. Luffy stopped that. What if he's a bad guy? While Luffy explored the house, Lucas went over the table and sat as he picked up a picture book that was laid there. Nami noticed him and saw the book in his hands. Ah, a picture book. It's a really old one too. King of Liars, Norland. Hee <laughs> hee. Looking at the title, Nami laughed. Usopp appeared suddenly as if someone had called him. Oh. That sounds like a very interesting book. Lucas thinks that Usopp is better suited for the title King of Liars though. King of Liars, Norland. That brings back old memories. I used to read it a lot. You know about this book Sanji. But it says it's published in North Blue. Nami asked curiously. Yeah, I was born in North Blue. Didn't I tell you? First time you said anything about it. I thought you were from East Blue. Usopp said but due to some background noise of Chopper digging, Nami got pissed again. Chopper, what are you doing? Be quiet. Poor Chopper was shocked. It was obviously you who made me dig. Ignoring Chopper, Sanji continued. I grew up in East Blue. But this story is pretty popular in North Blue. People say it's just a kid's story, but I've heard that this Norland guy really did exist. Lucas did not mind them and simply read the picture book. Basically, it's a story about Mont Blanc Norland, an explorer who always spoke of past adventures. One day, he came back from an expedition and went to report to the king. He said he discovered an island across the mighty seas that has a mountain of gold. Naturally, the king wanted to see this himself. So he commanded two thousand soldiers to come with him. After going through many hardships, they arrived on the island. But only saw an ordinary jungle. Norland was blamed for this and was sentenced to death for all his lies. But his last words were. I know. The mountain of gold sunk into the sea. However. No one believed in him anymore and thought that he could only continue to lie till his death. And the pathetic liar died. Without becoming. A true warrior. Of the seas. Nami read these last few lines out slowly while looking at Usopp. Knowing what she meant, Usopp was angry. Don't look at me. And stop making up all that stuff. Well, yeah. Those last few lines weren't really in the book. Wah. Wah. Luffy fell into the water. What are you doing? As Nami said, Luffy did indeed fell into the water as someone had pulled him down. The next moment, someone emerged from the water and looked at them. Who the hell are you people? This is. None other than Mont Blanc Cricket. Lucas already knew he would arrive and was ready to use his power to pull Luffy back up. You punks got a lot of guts to enter a man's house without permission. 
This area is my territory. Usopp. Go save Luffy now. It's alright Sanji, I already pulled him out. Upon returning to the surface, Luffy coughed and glared at Cricket. Hey. What was that for? You guys are after the gold right? Then prepare to die. Cricket didn't care how he got back up so soon and simply attacked. He extended his leg and kicked towards Luffy. Still pissed, Luffy didn't bother to dodge and let Cricket hit him. Sure enough, with a body made of rubber, the kick didn't really hurt him at all. Cricket was surprised but was still calm. Seeing as his attacks didn't work, he used his gun and shot at Luffy. That's not gonna work either. Just as Luffy was about to give him a knuckle sandwich, Cricket suddenly fainted. Ha. Huh. Eh. Hey. After a while, Chopper did his work as a doctor and tried to heal Cricket. Disparism. Zoro asked when Chopper mentioned what happened to Cricket. Ah, uh, you mean he's sick? Luffy, who obviously had no clue about such terms can only ask like that. Lucas added in. Basically means decompression sickness. It's something diverse experience sometimes. Yes. But it's not a long-term illness and should pass. Chopper continued. It happens on a diver's descent. When excess nitrogen enters the body's blood and tissue. Then on the ascent, the chemicals diffuse out in the form of bubbles causing various symptoms. Yeah, weird sick stuff. Luffy was no longer able to comprehend anything that came out of Chopper's mouth and could only look out the window and stare at the distance. He must have been diving every day. Not letting the bubbles to dissolve properly. Why would he? I don't know why. But it is very dangerous. In some cases, it can be lethal. Chopper said solemnly. Seeing as everyone turned silent, Lucas spoke. Well, his name is supposed to be Montblanc Cricket. The same surname as Montblanc Norland. And Norland's claim about the gold under the sea. Do you think they may be related? As he said that, the others looked at each other and thought that it was indeed possible. But. Isn't it supposed to be just a story? Nami asked but Lucas just shrugged. Hey, some stories can be real. After all, this is the One Piece world in Lucas' world, this is also. Just a story. Suddenly, two monkeys. Air, two people appeared at the door. Boss. Are you alright? Ah. They're here to kill us. Though Luffy and the others just stared at the two silently while they also looked at them in confusion. Usopp, Nami, and Chopper panicked. What are you doing here? What did you do to the boss? The two monkey brothers shouted, preparing to attack. We're taking care of him, so leave us alone. They wouldn't listen. They are beasts. Everyone, escape through the window. Luffy just answered them frankly but Usopp was still afraid. Nami also quickly hid behind Lucas subconsciously. They're such great guys. Ah. They listened. Lucas feels like Usopp is doing some kind of comedic skit here. It was funny reading it in the manga but looking at Usopp. Lucas felt his head hurt. Since everyone had calmed down and ready to talk, Luffy asked. Do you two live out here too? Actually, our boss home, is also the headquarters of the United Primate Armed Forces. Is that, primate, supposed to be a pun for pirate? However, we usually live on our ships. This house is too small for us. You two are big. But compared to the giants, you're like ear wax to them. Seeing Luffy get along well with the two monkey brothers, Usopp asked Zoro. How can they get along so well? They're just simple-minded. After a while, Cricket was finally awake. Mr. Diamond Head. I want to ask you something. Luffy grinned as he entered the house. He called him Diamond Head because Cricket had this weird pointy thing on his head. Frankly, it looks more like the bottom of an acorn than a diamond. Thanks for your help and sorry for all the trouble. I thought you were like those fools trying to steal the gold. Hearing the g-word, Nami's eyes turned into bellies again. Gold. You have gold. Don't act like those fools. 
Usopp immediately chided Nami to stop. You wanted to ask me something, what is it? We want to go to Sky Island. Please tell us how to get there. Chapter 12 Sky Island Montblanc Cricket's face looked serious when he heard that but then broke into laughter the next moment. Jaya ha ha. You guys actually believe that? Nami was about to hit him for laughing but Lucas held her still. Air, calm down Nami. He's sick. Sky Island doesn't exist. Luffy asked, still confused. He he. I don't know either. But I knew a man who said it does. He was known as a great liar though, someone who was always being laughed at. Hearing Cricket say that, Luffy turned to Usopp in disbelief. It's not me. You mean Norland right? You are. His descendant? Right. He was my great-grandfather. It's an annoying legacy that goes so far back. But there isn't a trace of his lineage in me. The whole Montblanc family was exiled to a life of shame. Even now, we are still bad-mouthed. Cricket sighed. However, nobody hates him for it. Why not? Because Norland, out of all things, was a very honest man. Since it seemed as if Cricket was about to start explaining from the start of his backstory, Lucas cut in, kinda annoyed with how drawn out it was already getting. Ah, no need for the backstory. We saw the Sky Island already. Right, that monkey guy also saw it so you can ask him. Cricket's mouth went agape. At first, he was annoyed that someone had disrupted him but then heard what he just said. Did someone call me? As if having heard they were called, the monkey brothers appeared again from the door. Masaira, these guys said they saw Sky Island. Hmm. Ah. Right. This was what I wanted to tell you earlier boss. Masaira started to talk non-stop about the incident from before. His spit keeps flying around as he talked but Lucas redirected those to his orangutan brother who now had a black face. Seeing as Cricket was silent for a while after Masaira finished, Luffy was impatient. As I was saying. I want to go to Sky Island. Do you know a way or not? Cricket smiled wryly at Luffy and took a book from the side. Nami saw the cover and was surprised. Captain's Log. Could it be Norland's? Yeah, read that line aloud. Ah. Wow, a 400-year-old logbook. Year of the Sea 1120, June 21, clear weather, I set sail from the lively city of Villa following the direction from the log pose, we went northeast, straight out of the dock. Nami continued reading from the logbook. It told of a strange small boat that can travel without the help of the wind called Waver. Nami seemed to have taken a liking to that boat. Continuing on, the waver's source of energy seems to only exist on Sky Island. There were also mentions of a living sky fish found in the Sky Island. The log expressed that though their ship was unable to travel to the island, as a sailor, he wanted to travel to the Sky Island someday. When Nami finished reading it, they were still excited. Sea of the Sky. Just like what Robin said. And judging from the text, it is without a doubt that Sky Island still exists. Chopper was too excited he can't say anything. Lucas smiled wry seeing the Luffy and the rest so excited and wondered if they did indeed find a way for him back to his world, would they also want to visit? As he thought of such fantasies, Cricket had left the room already and talked to the Monkey Brothers. Now listen up. Do you like them? Why are you asking? They seem to want to go to Sky Island. But there's only one way to reach Sky Island. If they do it alone, they will die for sure boss. Cricket grinned and crossed his arms as he faced the sea. Well then, should we give them a hand? Once they decided, Cricket decided to tell Luffy and the rest everything he knows regarding the Sky Island. In some parts of the sea during the day, it would suddenly become dark as if it's nighttime. Dot. Ooh. I've seen it. I've seen that happen. Right. Yeah. It suddenly becomes nighttime, then those shadows appeared. Then Lucas punched a hole in them and we saw the sky island behind it. Luffy and Usopp nodded. P punch a hole. 
In those giant shadows, Cricket's jaw fell to the floor and looked at Lucas in disbelief. Lucas laughed sheepishly as if saying it was nothing while Nami was angered again and pinched his waist. Lucas was speechless. Why am I getting pinched again? Ignoring the two, Cricket continued. In regards to the sudden arrival of night, it is caused by shadows cast by a very dense cloud. Nimbostratus. Clouds like that don't cause the sky to turn completely black. Surprised, Nami asked while Lucas, Usopp, and Chopper added on. Mister, you're so stupid. Days with lots of clouds are just cloudy. Yeah, just cloudy. Yeah, cloudy. Be quiet and listen. Cricket was pissed. His head hurt from explaining to these idiots. He sighed and continued. Millennium cumulonimbus is the name for that piece of cloud. It does not ascend or rain. But when it appears in the sky, the sunlight gets blocked completely. The daytime on the ground becomes nighttime. Dot. Some say that the Millennium Cumulonimbus has been in existence for millions of years, it wouldn't change form and it continues to float around in the sky as if a cloud fossil. So it's an impossible cloud? That was all that Luffy can take from the conversation, but Chopper seemed to be impressed by him. More or less, it's something that still can't be explained. Luffy, so smart. Lucas sighed and added on. Basically, what he's saying is, we can find the sky island inside that big cloud. Only something like that kind of cloud can possibly carry a whole island. Right. Luffy nodded as if he wanted to say what Lucas just said. Chopper was still impressed. Luffy, so smart. Lucas gave up. Ignoring them, Luffy raised his arm excitedly. All right. I got it. Let's get onto that cloud. Zoro, wake up. Huh. It's morning. Everyone, man your positions. Turn the ship towards the cloud in the sky. Thanks for telling us those things mister. We don't know how to get there. How many times do I need to tell you that? Nami was angered again and shouted at Luffy's impulsiveness. Rather than that. Just what was Luffy thinking? Did he seriously want to turn? Upwards? And just sail like that? Lucas was amused at the thought. As Nami pummeled Luffy and Usopp, Cricket spoke again. The real deal is just starting now. I'll warn you first, you need to risk your life. Lucas stared at the two with bruises on their faces. No need to worry, they just did. Cricket continued. The current that shoots upward. If you can get on this current, you can get to the sky, understand? Really? We just need to get blown to the sky, on top of the cloud. Ha ha ha. Luffy seemed to be quite excited. Nami was a bit doubtful. But then, I heard that the ships that get blown into the sky will crash back down into the sea. I heard it in Mock Town. Normally, that is the case. The key here is timing. The more Cricket continued to explain, the paler Usopp's face became. Eventually, he became more afraid than excited. He didn't want to go to Sky Island anymore. Lucas sighed and know that this is just temporary and he would still go anyway. Since it seemed like they will take a while more to plan out, Lucas headed to the forest as he remembered something. Soon, Luffy and the others came back noisily as ever, as he demanded for food and drinks. Sanji quickly brought in the food and drinks and the party began. As everyone ate and drank, Robin was the only one who remained reading. Seeing this, Cricket approached her and read the last line of the book she's reading. In the skull's right eye, gold is seen. Gold. Nami's ear twitched upon hearing the word. The page that has teardrop on it, is Roland's last words. His sentence was carried out that day. I still don't understand what that passage means. Cricket drank some more wine, completely intoxicated. The skull's right eye. Is that a city that was here before? Or is it hinting his death? It's all blank after that. That's why we need to go underwater. Daydream on the bottom of the sea. Yup, woo. Yoha. We're going to fly. Fly into the sky. Oh. 
the crowd becomes all excited after drinking and screaming their dreams. After that, the partying became even louder. In a good mood, Cricket showed off one of the gold they got underwater, a golden bell. Take a look at this. Whoa! Golden bell. Nami's eyes turned to Belly's once again and held the golden bell close to her face and rubbed it on her cheek repeatedly. So the golden city does exist. Cricket showed them another piece of gold. A strange bird holding a bell. The bird is called the South Birds. They still exist on this island. Speaking of South Bird, ever since long ago, the sailors. Damn it. Cricket suddenly shouted as he noticed something. What? What happened? This is bad. You should go to the forest quickly. Go to the forest south of here. Huh? What are you saying? Are you stupid? Luffy asked, still confused. Catch one of these birds right away. What? Why? Bird. What for? Cricket explained in a solemn tone. Listen carefully. The knock up stream that exists directly south of here, how do you think you will get there? Just sail south. No. This is the Grand Line. Once you set sail, you lose all sense of direction. Nami's face paled as she remembered this. That's why you need this bird. It is said that some animals contain some bio compass enhancing their direction sense. Hmm. I heard that pigeons also have this ability. So Zoro, you are worse than some animals. And who are you to judge? Luffy said to Zoro but was pissed that it was Luffy who pointed this out to him. Cricket ignored them and continued. Among those animals, South Bird has the best sense of direction. No matter how far away you move the bird, it'll always point in the right direction. In other words, you can't do anything without a bird like that. You wouldn't be able to even try getting onto Sky Island. Ah! Everyone panicked. At this moment, the doors opened and Lucas appeared. Hmm. Everyone's here. Lucas. Where were you? Also, hurry and get out. We need to catch a bird. Luffy ordered. Bird? Oh, speaking of bird, Sanji, see if this is edible. Can you cook it? Cho. Lucas appeared oblivious to the situation but was in fact just playing dumb. He knows that these guys will forget about this and would rush it so he just went ahead and captured one ahead of them. The bird Lucas was holding was indeed the south bird they were looking for. Right now, after hearing Lucas wanted to eat it, the south bird panicked but still faced its head to the south. Look, this thing seems tasty. Cho. The south bird flapped its wings in panic but was unable to break free from Lucas' grasp. Cho. Quiet, or I'll deep fry you. Cho. At this time, everyone finally reacted. The south bird. Lucas. You're amazing. Nice one. Lucas continued to act confused and let them explain. Once they finished explaining, Lucas sighed and looked at the bird with disappointment. Too bad, and it looks tasty too. Maybe just forget you saw this and we can go grab one more. After we eat this one. C-O-H. Naturally, they didn't agree and just directly placed the south bird in a cage. Seeing everyone so excited, Lucas smiled wryly. There was another reason why Lucas captured the south bird earlier than scheduled. Because at the moment when Luffy and them leave to find the south bird in the original story. He will come here. Sure enough, in a few minutes, his crew arrived. To rob treasures that others worked so hard to acquire. It's such a unique sensation. Let me tell you what people call me. They call me, the, hyena, ha 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 ha. Hyena Bellamy. Lucas knows that this bastard had insulted Luffy and them back in Mock Town. Though he knows that Luffy didn't want to fight at that time, the truth is, Lucas was still unsatisfied. It was time for revenge. It's you. Nami exclaimed when she saw the crew. One of Bellamy's crew was a man named Sarquis, he wore a goggle-like sunglasses and a fur coat and appeared to be fancy. When he saw Nami again, he grinned. 
if it isn't the expensive woman from before and her loser captain. How about it, did you change your mind yet? Soon, we'll have the gold you know. It's not too late to follow me. Ha ha ha. Nami's face went blank when she heard their laughter again and clenched her fists. Ha ha ha, ah. However, in the middle of his laughter, he suddenly coughed up blood. Sarquist touched his mouth and found. His tongue was gone. Lucas glared at Sarquist with killing intent. Is it this tongue that just insulted our navigator and captain? MMPPH. Everyone looked confused about how Lucas was able to cut his tongue without them noticing. The answer was a high speed and small water current to cut and retrieve it. It was easy to aim and time it with observation hockey. TCH, such a dirty tongue. As if disgusted by the tongue, Lucas dropped it to the ground and trampled on it a few times. NNGG. Sarquis was unable to utter a word. At the side, Bellamy finally appeared serious. This the guy you had the run in before, Luffy? Yeah. They don't look much. They're just pirates. Luffy shrugged as if Bellamy and the others weren't that far apart from those normal pirates in Mock Town. Sanji calmly lit his cigarette and puffed smoke. It seems they're here to steal the gold these guys painstakingly dove for. Seems so. Want me to turn the guests away, Captain? Zoro also had his hand on one of his katanas. No need. Luffy shook his head. He was pissed. When they were in the bar, he let them insult him since there wasn't any hard they could do and it was pointless to fight with them. But if these guys were to trample on a man's dream and hard work, he would no longer stand still. Bellamy grimaced seeing as it was Luffy who stepped out and not Lucas. He snorted and turned his legs into springs. Spring. Lunge. With the release of the spring, Bellamy shot forward at high speed. Still, Luffy stood there calmly and raised his fist. Without minding Bellamy's speed, Luffy brought his fist down hard. Gah! Luffy didn't even need to use his rubber ability for a small fry like Bellamy. It was an instant KO. Suddenly, a news coup dropped a stack of paper on the ground. The wind blew and the paper appeared right before everyone's eyes. It was the new bounty of Luffy and Zoro. Lucas looked at the papers in surprise. Surprisingly. Even he had a bounty now. Monkey D. Luffy, 100 million belly. Roranoa Zoro, 60 million belly. Lucas, 80 million belly. As for the rest of Bellamy's crew, they were all frightened. Sanji blew a mouthful of smoke and said. Pick up your captain and get lost. Hearing that, the crew quickly scrambled to pick up Bellamy and ran away. Lucas sighed and didn't bother with them. Instead, picking up his own bounty. 80 million Beliand where did they get this picture? I look awesome. Lucas wondered why those marine officers from before had even given him the bounty rewards of Blackbeard when he has already wanted himself. Well, those corrupt officers are probably not too informed. Zoro also picked up his bounty and grinned. Heh, not too bad. Woo. One hundred million. Luffy was the most excited. However, Usopp and Nami were scared. No good. There are three big criminals on our crew now. The marines are sure to chase us. At the side, Sanji lamented. Why? Why don't I have a bounty too? Don't ask for one. Usopp smacked him at the back of his head. Are you kidding? Three of them having high bounties is enough. You want to add more? Fufu, what do you mean only three? I also have a bounty remember. Robin giggled and Usopp's face paled even more. It's over. Half of the crew have high bounties. Lucas grinned and walked over to Usopp and handed his phone to him. Usopp, quick, take a picture of us as commemoration. Usopp weakly took a picture of Luffy, Zoro, Lucas, and Robin holding their bounties. But soon, it became some sort of photo shoot when Cricket joined in and asked for a picture to be taken as well when he heard of what the phone does. No one spoke about Lucas being from another world as if it was a tacit agreement. 
Only the straw hat pirates knew of this secret. After a while, they soon began to work on the ship and fit it to be able to travel the current of the knock upstream. Lucas held his phone and stared at the night sky in excitement. Sky Island. Here we come. Chapter 13. Wow. Amazing. Luffy stared at the new appearance of the ship with glittering eyes. Usopp's nose seemed to be longer as he introduced the ship. This is the S. S. Forward arrow mode. Mary looks like a turkey. At the side, Lucas smiled wryly. That's what you find interesting. After taking another group photo with the turkey going merry behind them, Cricket sat on the table and lit a cigarette. While everyone was excited to board, Lucas saw Luffy approach Cricket. Hurry and get on the ship, there's no time. Do you want to give up your chance to Sky Island for nothing? Fool. Cricket chided Luffy but he didn't mind it. Um, for the ship. Thank you. If you want to say thank you, say it to them. Cricket pointed at the Monkey Brothers. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I'll give Hercules to you. Really? We can keep it. You are a really great guy. Lucas heard it as well and nearly stumbled. When did Luffy find the time to catch a beetle? Anyways, we don't have time. Get on the ship. Or we wouldn't make it in time. We will lead the way, just follow us. Everyone was already on board except for Luffy. Luffy. Hurry. Yeah. Cricket watched Luffy's back for a moment before shouting. United Primate Armed Forces. Don't mess this up. No matter what happens, give it your all for these guys. Woo. Okay. Let's go. Everyone, set sail. All right. As everyone began to prepare and set sail, Cricket approached the ship and spoke to Luffy again. Kid. We will part here. Amen. Others might laugh at us for dreaming of the impossible, but that doesn't matter. This is. Romantic. It's romantic. Luffy asked. Yup. Don't crash, you guys. Shishi shishi. By Mr. Luffy grinned and waved goodbye. Soon, the three ships departed with going merry sailing between the two bigger ships of the Monkey Brothers. On the way, the Monkey Brothers tried to explain through the whole process once again but Luffy didn't mind them and simply played with the South Bird by trying to turn its head. Look. He turned south again. Ha ha ha. Cho. 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 The South Bird chirped angrily while Chopper translated. It said, I'll turn away from south and give you guys a headache. Ha ha ha. Go try it. Luffy encouraged the bird so it did turn its head to the north instead. However, soon, it felt uncomfortable and turned back to south. Yaha ha ha ha. He won't feel right unless he's facing south. Usopp and Luffy laughed at the bird. Seeing those guys fool around, the monkey brothers could only sigh and let them enjoy their time. Lucas smiled wryly as well. It's alright guys, just relax and go forward. The journey will still take a few hours so Lucas decided to spar with Zoro once again. Naturally, he was blindfolded. Three hours passed with Luffy and the others goofing off while Lucas and Zoro trained. Sanji was busy cooking and fooling around with Nami and Robin the whole time. In the distance, they finally saw the huge dense clouds. Night is about to approach again and they will be below the Sky Island at that time. The Monkey Brothers immediately issued orders to dive and find the stream. Lucas heard the ruckus as well and closed his eyes as he expanded his observation hockey, trying to feel the waves beneath. Suddenly, he felt something odd in one direction. Ten o'clock direction. Found huge waves. Quite likely a giant whirlpool. One of the monkey divers also said the same thing. That's it. Turn the ship to ten o'clock direction. That thing is the sign for the explosion. Follow the whirlpool closely. Don't back out. The waves suddenly become huge and the ships rocked back and forth. 
Everyone quickly held on to the nearest handles but Usopp and Chopper were a bit late so they've been flinging around the ship, unable to hold still. Lucas caught Chopper as soon as he was near him but ignored Usopp. Anyway, this guy would be fine. Nami. How is the log pose? Robin asked. It keeps pointing at that cloud. The waves become even stronger. Soon, signs of a whirlpool had begun to appear and the ship started to circle around a certain point. We will take you to the track of the whirlpool. And then. What do we do after that? Follow the current. Head to the center. Hearing Masaira say that, Nami's face went pale. You never said we need to get sucked in. Don't worry. I will protect Miss Nami and Robin Chan. This is my first time seeing such a huge whirlpool. No. No no no. Go back. I want to go back. Forget it, Usopp. It's too late. Somebody is already. Hyper. Hmm. I wonder if I can make such a thing in the future as well. Here I come. Sky Island. As the crew set off to the middle of the whirlpool while feeling various emotions, the swirling stopped abruptly. But this was the calm before the storm. Lucas can feel the waves churning below them, ready to be unleashed. Everyone hold on. Jaya. The sea is going to blow upward. Boom. From a distance, you can see a huge white pillar south of Jaya shoot directly to the sky as if it was struck by a spear. Nearby, the Monkey Brothers' ships were swaying from the blast but they both still looked up with a grin. Go, you guys. To Sky Island. If one can see the side of the giant water pillar, you could see a small ship with wings sailing on the sides. Luffy didn't know why this is happening but he was still excited. All right. If we go like this, we can get to the sky. Forward. S. S. Forward. However, just as Luffy is being optimistic, others weren't. The ship's beginning to leave the stream. Eh. If this goes on much longer, we will get bounced off. Everyone's faces paled as they keep seeing sea kings and other debris fall off from the stream ahead. Lucas acted quickly and was already on the main mast. Set down the sail. Lucas is right. Quick. We'll catch the wind coming from below. Nami noticed Lucas' intentions immediately and began issuing orders. Everyone quickly ran all over the ship to get ready. Just as the ship was about to leave the stream. It started to fly parallel to the stream. It's flying. I wonder what's on top of there. Entering the Millennium Cumulonimbus. Woo. As soon as the crew was out of the cloud, everyone began to gasp for breath. Not to mention the severe pressure they had to take in for launching themselves way up in the sky, they were also mentally exhausted from such an experience. After all, not everyone can just ride a huge stream upwards and land on the sky. Seeing as everything seemed to calm down, the crew looked around their surroundings. Damn. What happened? Is everyone alright? Hey. Look you guys. Outside the ship. Luffy was still as happy as ever. Lucas smiled wryly and looked out as well. As far as the eye can see. We're endless whiteness of. Clouds. What is this place? It's so white. Clouds. On top of the clouds. How are we sailing on clouds? Nami couldn't believe her eyes. Still, Luffy just laughed at her. Of course we can sail on top of it. They're just clouds. No. That's still impossible. Though everyone thought that. The truth's right in front of them. In other words. This is the sea of the sky. Nami looked at the log pose in confusion. But look, the log pose is still pointing up. Maybe this is only the middle part. We need to go higher. How? I have no idea. Nami felt helpless. After all that trouble with the knock upstream to shoot themselves to the sky. Only to end up midway. How can they still go a level higher? While Nami can be said to be an expert in the sea, this sea in the sky is uncharted territory even for her. 
Lucas sighed and just patted Nami. Well, we'll figure a way. For now, we should set sail. That's all we can do. At the side, Usopp finally woke up and started clamoring about swimming in the clouds. After he dived in, no matter how everyone waited. Usopp never came back. Just a thought. But is there really? A seafloor? You mean? Robin asked and everyone let out a cold sweat. Lucas heard this as well and sweats began to drip down from his face. Damn, I forgot about this. Luffy finally realized the situation and quickly stretched his hand downwards while Robin made her eyes appear on his hand to look for Usopp. It took a while but Robin finally found Usopp and pulled him up. However, as Luffy pulled Usopp up, sea creatures followed Usopp like bait. Something followed him. They want to eat Usopp. It was a huge octopus and eel. Zoro acted quickly and cut one of the tentacles nearby. But as soon as he did, there wasn't any blood that spilled. Rather. The tentacle. Popped. Like a balloon. Ha. Huh. Though everyone was shocked, Sanji, Luffy, and Lucas still moved in for the kill. Anyway, sea creatures of this size can still bring down their ship. It would be bad if their ship sunk in the sky. Oh, this is a weird looking animal. I wonder if this is considered a fish. That octopus was like a balloon. So there are animals in the clouds. What's this flat snake? It's a flatfish because it's flat. So this is a flatfish. The crew began their idle chatter as soon as they were safe. Suddenly, Usopp shouted. So noisy. What is it this time, Usopp? My pants. This was in my pants. Usopp pulled out a weird flat-looking fish from his pants. Seeing where the fish was located, Robin looked at Usopp in pity. Such a tough day for him. Sky Island so scary. Sky Island so scary. Robin picked up the fish and studied it. She came to the conclusion that the fish looked differently due to evolving or surviving in this sort of environment. Well, soon after, Luffy brought the fish to Sanji who cooked it. This is yummy. Luffy, that's dirty. Ah. Nami was also about to take a bite when Lucas suddenly said that. She remembered where they found the fish and looked at Usopp who was still in pain in his lower body. Instantly, Nami threw the food away. Ah. My fish. Why did you cook this? At the side, Chopper was looking for the Sky Island with a pair of binoculars when he noticed a ship. Hey everyone. There's a ship and. A person? Eh. What is it, Chopper? Luffy asked when he saw Chopper panic and drop the binoculars. Chopper, a ship? A ship is over there. No, um. There was a ship. But the ship isn't there anymore. What do you mean? Chopper tried to explain but he was panicking too much for anyone to understand. Lucas didn't mind him and was looking at that direction as well with a serious expression. Someone's coming. Sanji noticed as well when he saw a person wearing a bull-like mask seemingly. Ride the clouds. A human. He's running on the cloud. Lucas controlled the water vapors in the cloud to attack the man. The man jumped and easily dodged it as he came on board the ship. Eliminate. He wants to fight. He's got guts. Sanji and Zoro were ready for battle but were easily brought down by the bull-masked man. Luffy tried to help as well but was also beaten. Eh. What's wrong with you three? Nami was surprised at how fast Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji were beaten. Just as the bull-masked man was about to attack Lucas from the back, Lucas tilted his body sideways to dodge it in time. Lucas' face was pale. He knew that fighting here would feel different from the change in pressure and such but he didn't think it would be this difficult to move. Thankfully, he had the observation hockey and was able to dodge better. The bull-masked man was surprised that he missed but didn't pay it too much attention. He jumped up and aimed the huge cannon he was holding towards the ship. That's enough. Suddenly, from the sky. A person wearing armor dove in from the skies and attacked the bull-masked man with his lance. 
Nami was even more afraid of all these weird people popping up. What? Who is it this time? Ooh, I am. The Knight of the Sky. Chapter 14. Is he gone? TSK. This is so frustrating. It's like my body won't move as I command. Luffy, Sanji, and Zoro gasped for breath after being knocked out like that so easily. It was the first time they all felt so. Weak. Lucas sighed and explained. The pressure in this place is not something we're used to. And the air is thinner here as well. Hearing their conversation, the knight asked. Ah, to be saying those words. Are you citizens of the Blue Seas? Blue Seas? What's that? By the way, who are you? Nami asked as well. I would be the knight of the sky. All living beings under the cloud are citizens of the Blue Seas. In other words, did you come up from the Blue Seas? Um. Yes. It can't be helped then. This place is 7,000 meters above the Blue Seas, called the White Sea. Above this place is the White White Sea, 10,000 meters. Average citizens of the Blue Seas won't be able to stand it. Or so the knight explained, but Luffy and Zoro weren't convinced. Okay, I'm slowly getting used to it already. Yup, it feels much better now. Even Lucas sweated a bit. These guys are too much of a freak. Afterward, the knight continued to explain the situation in this place and handed a whistle to Luffy. Each whistle will cost you 50 million extals. Just blow from it and I will save you. Extals. I think that should be the currency in the Sky Island. Lucas explained to Luffy. The knight seemed to have realized something and was shocked. No way. You guys didn't come here through the top of high waste. Then you must have been to one or two islands right? Though the others were confused as to what the knight was saying, Nami was quite sharp and noticed. Wait. There are other ways to get to this sky ocean. Also. You said one or two islands. Isn't there only one sky island? Don't tell me you guys actually came using that monstrous stream. I never thought there would still be people this brave. So it wasn't. The normal way to get here. Nami was teary-eyed. All that trouble and there was actually a proper way to get to the Sky Island. Luffy didn't mind it that much though. We're here anyway right? We almost died. If we patiently collected more information, we could have used a safer method. Nami strangled Luffy. Thankfully, he was made of rubber, otherwise, the Straw Hat Pirates would need to have a new captain. The knight smiled and showed his index finger. One whistle. Blow the whistle once, and I will come down from the sky to save you. Usually, I would charge with fifty million extals but I'll give you guys the first one for free. He stood up and prepared to leave. Use the whistle to call me at any time. Wait. We don't even know your name. The knight smiled and introduced himself. My name is Gon Fall, the knight of the sky. And this is my partner, Pierre. A strange dotted bird appeared by his side and began to transform. I forgot to introduce my partner Pierre. Even though he's a bird, he has the power of the horse fruit. Which means. No way. It's a pegasus. That's right. Gonfall stuck a pose with Pierre who had now turned into a winged horse. Only, it didn't look quite right. What was supposed to be a cool-looking pegasus now looks like a joke. The spots even stuck to it making it looked extremely weird. Lucas thought it was still funny so he snapped a picture before Gonfall flew away. Wings huh? Without any reason, Lucas just thought how cool it would be if he has wings. Of course, not with spots. In the end, he didn't tell us anything useful huh? Yeah. Then how do we get higher? Okay, let's call Mr. and ask him. Luffy nodded and was about to blow on the whistle but his cheeks were pulled down by Usopp and Nami. Wait. Luffy. This is for emergency. If that weird mask guy comes again, what will we do without the whistle? It seems that these two had already lost faith in Luffy and the other's strength. Lucas sighed and noticed something in the distance. For starters. 
why don't we go to that cloud that looks like a waterfall? And so, the crew moved in that direction. However, they were soon blocked by a huge piece of cloud. It's floating on the sky ocean so it's probably another kind of sky ocean. Then what kind of cloud? If it's normal cloud. We can just sail through it. We'll know if we touch it right. Luffy laughed and stretched his arm all the way over to the piece of cloud. Wah! It bounced off. In a few seconds, Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper were already playing on top of the cloud as they bounced on and off. Nami was about to scold them again when Lucas patted her shoulder. It's fine. Let them play for a while. Fine. But while you're at it, find us a path. Roger. Usopp shouted in acknowledgement and went off to play. Lucas was itching to go play as well but saw Nami glaring at him already so he can only sigh and man the wheel. After a while, the ship finally managed to go past the huge clouds and arrived at the end of the waterfall-like cloud. When they reached it, they saw a huge gate with a sign on top. Heaven's Gate. Bad omen. It's like we're going to die. Usopp started shaking while sweating bullets. Zoro laughed at him and said. Yeah, it's totally unexpected. Maybe we're actually dead already. Really? If that's so, then this strange world can be explained. Hearing Sanji, Chopper was badly frightened. We're already dead. Heaven. Ha ha ha. So funny. We can finally get there through here. Luffy laughed like there's no tomorrow. As for Lucas, he naturally took a selfie first before anything else. If he can still post on social media, it would be even better. A pity that this is another world and he can't connect to the internet. Lucas looked at his phone and smiled when he remembered what his father said when he gave this smartphone to him in the past. Son, this phone is extremely special. I even asked Tony Stark to make it. Huh, sure dad. Whatever you say. Lucas didn't think much of it back then and simply thought that his father made up a story. Though the smartphone is indeed high-tech with how it can seemingly charge itself somehow, Lucas always thought that his father had been sneakily charging it when he sleeps or something. But now. Being in this world and this phone still at full bars. Lucas wondered just who his father was. It can't be that this. Is really made by Iron Man. Right? Lucas shook his head and smiled. Nah, being in One Piece world is already surreal enough. The Marvel world. Should be just comics. Just as he was contemplating on such things, he remembered something and headed inside the cabin. Right after Lucas went inside, someone appeared from the sides of the gate. Are you here for sightseeing? Or? Here to fight? An old woman with wings asked as she held up a camera and took pictures of the whole crew. Actually, it doesn't matter why you're here. If you want to go up, each person must pay one billion extal entrance fee. That's the law. Seeing a person with wings for the first time, Luffy was shocked. Angel. So that's how angels look like. She looks like dried sour fruit candy. One billion extal. How much is that when converted to belly? Ah. Uh, if we don't. Have money. You can still go up. Really? Usopp was confused. If they can still go up without paying. Then why bother paying? If you don't want to go up. It's okay too. I'm not a guard or a soldier. I just want to know your. Intentions. Then we will go. We want to go to Sky Island. Even though we don't have money, we will go granny. Really? Seven people right? No, we have EI. Nami quickly shut Luffy's mouth just as he was about to honestly answer. Luffy looked at Nami in confusion but Nami ignored him. Wanting to change the topic immediately before the old angel noticed anything, Nami asked. Um. How do we get up? Just as she asked this, a pair of pincer hands suddenly appeared from both sides of the ship. What? Something appeared. That's White Sea's special speedy shrimp. He will lead you up. Inside the cabin, Lucas felt the whole ship suddenly gain momentum and speed up. 
a cold sweat fell along his forehead. We're on the move. Don't tell me. They didn't pay. Lucas remembered that 10,000 extal is equal to one belly. The entrance fee is 1 billion extal per person. Which is about 100,000 belly. For the eight of them, it would be 800,000 belly. The money he got from Blackbeard's crew is enough for it and they would still have a lot left over. Though Nami will probably hate him if he really did hand over 800,000 belly, it would be worth it to enjoy the Sky Island without getting into any trouble so they can just relax. Well, seems he's too late anyway. The Straw Hats have once again illegally entered Sky Island. Lucas sighed. Anyway, what's done is done. He headed out and was just in time to see the entrance. There was a sign at the end. Godland, Sky Pia. There's an island. It's Sky Island. Yeah. The crew was so excited that they jumped to the shore as soon as they're near. Zoro was the only one cool-headed and went to grab the anchor. Hey. What about the anchor? There is probably no bottom in this sea right. That kind of thing doesn't matter. Hurry. Look. This beach is so soft. Doesn't matter. You. Zoro was speechless. Dropping anchor is one of the necessities when near an island yet Luffy just brushed it off. He shook his head helplessly and smiled. Anyway, this scenery is really amazing. It's like in a dream. Lucas grinned as well. Ha! It's the kind that makes you feel so excited in the heart. Cho! Hearing the strange bird noise, Lucas turned to see Nami letting the south bird go. Jeez! Forgot to let him go earlier. However, Lucas wasn't really minding the bird but Nami's outfit. Sure enough. Nami is really quite bold and sexy. Though she's wearing shorts, her top is only a bikini bra with a camouflage design. Robin also looks nice wearing a tank top with wavy designs. Hm, the scenery here is indeed. Amazing. Nami noticed Lucas look and grinned. Come on. Let's join Luffy and the others. Ah. Uh. Hey, wait. Nami didn't wait for Lucas and pushed him off the ship. It was fine since the cloud beneath was so soft but did she really have to push me off? Lucas can only smile and catch Nami when she jumped next. Meanwhile, Luffy was having a hard time holding it in anymore. Ha! What's this? This place is filled with the scent of adventure. Soon, everyone began to play and fool around. Lucas also took a lot of pictures as memories. After all, who knows how long will he be stuck in this world. He doesn't know how he got here, so it could also be that he would suddenly just appear back in his room. If that really happens. What are you thinking about? Lucas suddenly felt a different kind of softness from behind him. Nami. It's nothing. Just thinking of some things. Lucas cleared his throat and stood up. Ahem, right. I'm thinking of exploring the island a bit. Tell the others I'll be away for a while. I'll see you guys later. Ah. Uh, but. I'm just walking around. Don't worry. If I encounter any danger, I'll escape. Nami pouted. Humph, fine. Go away then. Lucas smiled helplessly and patted her head silently before walking away. Nami watched his back for a while before turning away. Stupid such a nice island. Can't we just relax together? The next scene was where Luffy and the rest met up with Konis, a kind-hearted citizen of Skypea, and would start to cause trouble. But Lucas didn't mind them. Though Enel is not a threat to Luffy, he is still quite an annoying enemy. Lucas wants to see if he can defeat him earlier than scheduled. That way, Luffy and the others can enjoy their time in the Sky Island more and relax. For the sake of relaxing more with Nami and Robin, Enel must be defeated. Er, no. I mean, for the sake of peace in Skypea, Enel must be defeated. And so, Lucas went to the one forbidden place in Skypea. The Holy Land, Upper Yard. Currently, in front of him were four gates. Trial of Swamp. Trial of Iron. 
Trial of String Trial of Orb Lucas didn't really have a boat but simply ran while controlling the clouds beneath him to make him reach here fast. It took him a while but Lucas learned that he can also manipulate the clouds by using the water properties that partially formed it. He looked at the four gates and thought for a while. In the original story, Luffy and the rest went to the trial of Orb first. Lucas shrugged. Guess I'll go with that then. Feeling that it was pointless to pick any, Lucas decided to follow the story and went in the trial of Orb first. Soon, he landed in a field filled with strange floating white balls in the air. Since those orbs are made of clouds, there was no issue for Lucas who can control them at will. Ho 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 ho. Welcome to my trial of Orb. Ho 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 ho. As Lucas was passing through, a weird fat guy that's shaped exactly like a ball appeared. This must be. Skypea's priest. Satori of the forest. Ho ho ho. Are you perhaps lost? This land is forbidden to enter. I'm not lost. I came here to meet Enel. Ho ho ho. You want to meet God? Have you come to die? Ho 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 ho. No. I came here to kick his ass. Satori stopped laughing. If so, then I must kill you here. Satori charged over and brought his palm forward. He grinned as he saw Lucas still standing with his palm nearing his face. Lucas knows there is an impact dial hidden in his palm which can inflict damage to normal devil fruit users, but he wasn't a normal devil fruit user. Not to mention. He also knows observation hockey. Lucas tilted his head to the side and sent a punch over at the same time. Satori's eyes widened in surprise as he quickly retreated to dodge Lucas' attack. You know mantra. Mantra. Is that what you call it here? Well, I guess you can say so. Lucas grinned and beckoned Satori with his fingers. This would be the perfect opportunity to further hone his hockey, Lucas didn't want to end it too quickly. Come. Chapter 15 Satori was angered at Lucas' carefree attitude. He hopped on top of an orb cloud and kicked it. Though it seemed as if he wanted to send the cloud to Lucas, it actually hit another orb cloud, then another, then another. In a few seconds, Lucas' surroundings were surrounded by orb clouds moving about unpredictably. Lucas knows that various things are stored in those clouds which could either be harmless or deadly. But that didn't matter as long as it doesn't hit him. He can simply will the clouds to move away but. Lucas wanted to train his observation hockey more. Lucas closed his eyes and began to feel his surroundings. The area he can sense continued to expand. At first, it was a measly two meters. But now. He can reach up to five meters around him. And it is still growing as he continued to train. Lucas grinned. Just as he thought. This place is the perfect place to train observation hockey. Satori being here just added more in the difficulty. As Lucas continued to dodge the orb clouds while his eyes were closed, Satori's face was grim. He didn't think that Lucas' mantra is so formidable. Even he can't keep up mantra for this long and accurate. Seeing as the situation isn't getting any better for him, Satori decided to attack as well. Lucas grinned when he sensed Satori send another palm strike at him and easily dodged that as well. Not only that, he grabbed his arm and smashed him at an incoming orb cloud. With Satori's mantra, he naturally sensed what Lucas would do and tried to dodge but it was as if Lucas still knew where he would dodge and still end up catching him. Satori's face fell. How come this guy is so adept at mantra? Lucas swung Satori on an orb cloud which exploded into flames. What's wrong? Isn't the survivability rate of this trial only 10%? Gur. You bastard. Orb Dragon. Satori was truly angered. Suddenly, a bunch of orb clouds stuck to each other and at the head of it, a dragon mask was placed. Lucas sighed and opened his eyes. Well, this is no longer fun. Ho 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 ho. How is it? Want to surrender now? Ho 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 ho. Nah. I just thought I'd end it here and proceed. Lucas waved his hand and the orb dragon suddenly switched direction. W.R. Goodbye, Priest Satori. 
hope you ascend to heaven or something. Boom! A huge explosion covered the forest. Lucas quickly guarded against it by controlling some orb clouds to shield him. After a while, the dust cleared and revealed a huge crater. At the center. Satori lay there unmoving. Lucas sensed him for a while before sighing. Well, guess he didn't die. Lucky him. He shrugged and continued on by following the cloud road. Lucas sped up and soon reached a huge clearing. All over the plain, there seemed to be stakes with skulls placed on top of them. This where the trial of iron should be. Is it you? The one who defeated Satori. A bald man with pointy sunglasses appeared and spoke to Lucas. Beside him was a big whitish yellow dog. Lucas remembered that this should be holy, a dog who knows martial arts. So what if I am? I am Om. And this is my trial of iron. You are met with bad luck. The survivability rate in this trial is 0%. Lucas grinned. Are you talking about your survivability? Impudent. Today, you will die. As he said that, something shot out from the ground in the area around them. Looking closely, what shot out where? White barbed wires. White barbed iron deathmatch. Ohm didn't waste any second and slashed his sword made from iron cloud. Eyes and whip. The sword bent like a whip and shot towards Lucas. Still, Lucas didn't bother to dodge much and simply tilted his body to the side. Truth is, Lucas didn't need to dodge as the whip would simply pass through his body but Lucas still wanted to use this opportunity to train in hockey. Seeing this, Ohm's expression froze for a second before returning back to normal. You know mantra. So that's how you managed to beat Satori. But that is not enough for you to leave this place alive. Ohm waved his sword again and it changed into a long spear that shot towards Lucas. Eyes and Florette. Woof. Holy, who originally didn't want to do anything, charged over from the side and sent a flying kick in concert with Ohm's attack. Lucas saw through both attacks and dodged easily. That's a nice sword you have there. It can even change shapes. He was actually quite relaxed. Lucas dashed forward and sent a punch at Ohm who still stood there unmoving. Eyes and back. The iron cloud changed form again and created a huge wall to defend. A pity. That it was still made of cloud in the end. A hole suddenly appeared from the cloud wall and Lucas' fist followed. Ohm's eyes widened and tried to quickly dodge to the side but Lucas was still a step ahead of him. He controlled the iron cloud and numerous spikes emerged and shot at Ohm in all directions. W. Watt. Ohm was no longer able to dodge. Lucas saw Ohm wounded and bloodied all over and turned to look at Holy. Actually, he felt a bit bad hurting this dog since he used to have a pet dog previously. As such, Lucas only knocked him out after fighting him for a bit. Lucas thought for a moment while looking at Ohm. It seems. I have grown quite OP. Or is it just that my abilities make me a really bad match to these guys who use clouds in their attacks? Lucas smiled wryly and picked up Ohm's iron cloud sword. This can prove to be handy. Though I have to ask Usopp to fix up the appearance since this looks weird. After deciding for a while, Lucas thought that it was time to get a weapon of his own. A changeable and hard weapon like this suits him just perfectly. Lucas then continued. As for this dome of barbed wires. It was pointless as Lucas simply passed through it. Soon, he reached the trial of string. Before him was a man wearing aviator clothes and a weird pointy mustache. There was also a big purple vulture-like bird beside him. This should be. Shura and his fire-breathing bird, Fuza. Shura held his lance and pointed it at Lucas. I don't care how you defeated Satori and Ohm. But your luck ends here. Shura no longer wasted on words as he hopped on Fuza and charged towards Lucas directly. Fast. But. Lucas already saw their move coming two seconds ago. Lucas held the iron cloud sword and swung it. Two flashes were made in that half a second they made contact. However. 
It was still Shura and Fuza who fell while their bodies were covered in blood. These string clouds you placed everywhere is very pointless to me. Count it as your bad luck for meeting me. Lucas shook his head and didn't bother to look back. The next trial was the trial of Swamp. A dark-skinned man with weird tentacle-like hairstyle appeared before Lucas with his arms crossed. M.M. M.M. N.N. M.N.N. I don't understand what you're saying if you don't open your mouth. Ah. Lucas knew who this is. Gadatsu. This oddest character in the Skypea arc. Frankly, his trial is also stupid. Survivability is 50% because. When it comes to it, it's just luck if you step in a swamp cloud or not. Lucas no longer wanted to waste any time on this idiot and quickly ended him. It was actually easy. He just sunk him in one of his swamp, and he dove deeper by himself when he activated the milky dial in his shoes. Lucas didn't want to stay here any longer as he may catch Gadatsu's idiotness. Like this, Lucas reached the altar of sacrifice which was surrounded by a lake. Just in time, a strange shrimp appeared seemingly carrying something and tossed it on top of the altar. What is this? Where are we? We should be somewhere in the upper yard. It looks like a sacrificial altar. There's a bunch of sky sharks beneath. Lucas blanked out for a while before smiling helplessly. It seems. That these guys were still caught in the end. Lucas stabbed the iron cloud sword on the ground and extended the length, causing him to propel forwards and onto the ship. Hey, I've only been gone for a few hours and you all got yourselves into trouble already. Nami, who was originally on the brink of collapse from her fear of the supposed god in this place, saw that Lucas had arrived and immediately jumped in his embrace. Lucas was surprised as he didn't think Nami would do that so he only stood there for a while. Inwardly, he was thinking how unlucky it was that Nami was no longer wearing her bikini top and instead, wore a shirt. Zoro didn't care about them and asked. You were here this whole time. Ah, uh, yeah. I was out exploring and came here. Though, a bunch of these priest guys attacked me. Hearing that, Nami quickly separated and looked at Lucas in worry. Priests. You met them. Are you okay? Yeah. As you can see, I'm fine. Look, I got this sword from one of them after I beat him. It can change shape at will. Isn't it neat? Lucas showed the Mom's iron cloud sword and changed its shape a few times. Chopper's eyes shone and exclaimed. Awesome. Hmm, this must be another form of dial that Coney's mentioned. Robin also looked at the sword curiously. Even Zoro looked interested as it is a sword. However, Nami's face was pale. Why you beat one of the priests? Hmm. Nah. Pfew. That's good. I beat four of them. We are so dead. Initially, Nami sighed in relief and thought they can still salvage the situation but Lucas' latter words made her cry. She had seen what this god Enel can do and she is utterly terrified of his divine punishment. Lucas knew what Nami was thinking but didn't know what to say so he simply teased her. Don't worry. Aren't we already in heaven? Needless to say, he earned a knuckle to the head. God damn it. This woman really hits hard. Next time. Next time I really will turn to water. Lucas sighed again. Right. Where are Luffy and the others? Lucas asked since only Nami, Zoro, Chopper, and Robin are here. They should be headed here to look for us for sure. But we can't just stay here and wait for them. Lucas, can you place the ship in the lake below? I can. Good. We should set sail then. Lucas waved the iron cloud sword and manipulated the shape in such a way that it scoops up the ship from below. Watching me work, Zoro raised a brow. That thing's very convenient. Right? Soon, Lucas was able to land the ship to the lake below. As for the sky sharks as soon as they surfaced to attack, Zoro had already cut them in half. Robin also broke their backs with her ability. When the other sky sharks saw how strong they are, they no longer bothered the ship and simply swam away. 
Before leaving, Robin asked to borrow Lucas' phone and took pictures of the wall full of engravings on the altar. This altar is at least 1,000 years old. Seeing such historical remains makes me quite excited. Ha, huh, well, who knows? We may even find gems or treasures here. Hearing that, Nami's eyes turned to bellies again. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Nami. But I thought you were scared. Chopper asked. We're exploring history. Though Nami answered that, her eyes were still full of bellies. Lucas can only shake his head and turn to Zoro. So, any idea where to go? God's on this island, right? I want to go meet him. And just why would you want to meet someone scary like that? Nami paled again when she heard Zoro's decision but Zoro just snorted. I dunno. That depends on him. Zoro is more arrogant than God. As they began to set off, Lucas froze. Everyone out. H. Huh. Nami and the rest were confused as to why Lucas would suddenly scream like that but there was no time. Lucas didn't care about their reactions and quickly sent them all away to the forest. L. Lucas. W. What are you? Nami. No matter what happens. Lucas didn't have the time to finish his sentence nor able to leave the ship himself. A bright light appeared from the sky and then. Boom. A huge pillar of lightning engulfs Lucas along with going merry. Nami and the others shouted. When the light subsided. All they saw was a huge hole and the head of going merry beside them which seemed to have flung itself towards them. Chopper's face went pale as he picked up the only remaining piece of going merry. No. No oh. Hearing his crewmate's tear-filled cry, Zoro gritted his teeth and clenched on his sword so tight that his hand bled. Robin was also saddened. She was still holding on to Lucas' phone when Lucas pushed them away. She looked at the phone in her hands and gripped it tightly. At the side, Zoro saw the weird sword that Lucas had also by his side. He picked it up and looked at the never-ending hole in front of them then walked away. Where are you going? Robin asked. I'm going to cut down God. Chapter 16 Soon, Luffy and the others arrived at the scene. When they all heard what happened, Luffy's face was as grim as it can be. A few distances away from them, there were wolves lurking about in their surroundings. Waiting for an opportunity to attack. Suddenly. An invisible wave of power surged from Luffy. The wolves' eyes rolled upwards. Soon, they all fell unconscious and foams started to appear from their mouths. If Lucas was still here, he would know that Luffy just used the Emperor's hockey. A pity that no one was watching at this time. Not even Enel felt it. Meanwhile, in the God's Palace, a man with long earlobes and a taiko drums attached to his back which formed a ring behind him was laughing as he ate a banana that was peeled by his servant. This was none other than God Enel. Yahahaha. You should have seen the looks on their faces. That white-haired brat has defeated my four priests, and he thinks I'll continue to let him be. Yahahaha. It is naturally divine retribution to those who go against God. One of Enel's subordinates was quick to flatter him. Yaha. Let's see. We have fifty soldiers, including me, that's fifty-one fighters. There are twenty Shandians coming here and seven citizens of the Blue Sea that's currently in the forest. Enel counted. So the total is 78 fighters. Now, this will be a survival game. Yahahaha. The question is, how many fighters will remain after three hours? Anyone want to guess? Enel looked at his subordinates and pointed someone with his foot. You, take a guess. Hmm, the militia is very strong so they won't fall easily. Though the enemies are strong as well, their strongest fighter, the one who defeated the four priests, is already dead. The rest should be a so-so. -a -so. I will say about fifty will remain. Yahaha. You think so? That is an optimistic guess. You seem to underestimate the violence of the upcoming battle. Then how does God see this situation? Enel's smile vanished as he made his declaration. 
I will tell you. After three hours, out of the seventy-eight fighters I counted. Exactly five will still be standing. As Enel laughed in his throne looking down on everyone, a certain white-haired person opened his eyes after a while. The moment Lucas opened his eyes, all he saw was the white clouds above him as he felt the wind from his back. I'm. Alive? Ah. I'm falling. Lucas blanked out for a moment before finally figuring out his situation. Looking down, he can only see the endless sea beneath. Shit shit. Ah. Even though he may think at the back of his mind that he will survive the fall, the intense pressure from falling made him feel mentally afraid. Besides, even if he did survive the fall, who knows where he will end up? He has to get back. He needs to go back somehow to the Sky Island. Lucas feared that if Luffy and the rest thought he was dead, that they would go directly to Enel. Luffy can probably beat him but the others may not survive. Since he defeated all the priests already, Enel might be angrier and would no longer play around. There would surely be many changes to the story and Lucas doesn't know if it would be good or not. Inwardly, Lucas regretted moving on his own. But there was no use thinking about it now. Arg. Fly. Fly. Damn it. In his mind, Lucas thought that if he had wings or other powers that can let him fly, it would be better. Lucas tried shooting high-pressure water beneath him to push him up but the speed of his fall is too great and he can't control the direction accurately. Gritting his teeth, Lucas shut his eyes and braced for impact while still thinking of wanting to fly. Suddenly, the momentum of his fall stopped. Confused, Lucas opened his eyes. I'm flying. Still confused, Lucas blinked for a while then looked behind him. There were actually a pair of huge white wings. W what the? How? Lucas is truly confused. Even more confused now. He thought his fruit ability was to counter any situation that was bad for him. Like when he was dried up from crocodile's sand powers, he gained the logia powers of water and the ability to heal. And when he gets exhausted, there would be this warm current flowing through his body and he would feel fine. As for why Enel's lightning didn't affect him. Maybe it was because of his water logia. He can control the sea's water to subdue devil fruit users, but his own body is made of pure water so electricity should just pass through it. But this sudden ability to gain wings doesn't really fit the counter ability. If it was a simple counter, then he should get the ability to control wind or something. Not sprout wings. The only reason Lucas can think of is that he thought of having wings at that moment. So in the end, just what is his real ability? Even though Lucas didn't know the answer, he knew there was no time to be dwelling on such things. Lucas looked up in the sky and looked a bit lost. This is the grand line. There is no such thing as a sense of direction without a log pose. But. Up should still be. Up. Right? Lucas gritted his teeth and flapped his wings, shooting him high up in the sky. His big wings are different from the small wings of the Skypea citizens and can actually be used to fly and support his body. Somehow, he can also control it perfectly as if it has been a part of his body his whole life. It truly felt weird for him but Lucas shrugged the feeling off as he felt restless from worry. Luffy. Don't do anything stupid. As Lucas arrived above the clouds, he looked around but saw no sign of the Sky Island. Lucas began to panic. Damn it. Where is it? Where's the Sky Island? Lucas flew around as he searched for the Millennium Cumulonimbus cloud. However, after over an hour of searching, he was still unable to see a shadow of the Sky Island. Lucas clenched his fist hard then released it. He closed his eyes and breathed out. Calm down. There's no time to panic. I need to calm down. Lucas calmed his breathing in a few breaths and opened his eyes. He thought for a while then stretched his arms high up. Gritting his teeth as he focused, after a while, the rain began to pour from the sky. He closed his eyes again and this time, focused on using his observation hockey and integrated to the raindrops. 
the rain cloud continued to expand slowly. With each drop containing Lucas hockey. Such an application of hockey is probably a first in this world. In fact, even Lucas didn't think that it would work but at this stage, he was truly grasping at straws. It was unknown if the water pouring from Lucas' face was the rain or his own sweat as he tried his hardest to maintain his concentration and focus for hours. Finally, just as he was about to collapse from the strain of expanding his powers too much. He felt it. One drop. Has reached the sky island. Lucas's eyes snapped open and his wings flapped in that direction at high speed. Skypea. What are you doing? Arrest that girl. Conies was driving a bull-themed waver as she dodged the attacks from the White Berets, the police force of Skypea. Fool. You can't get away. Arrest the criminal. The captain shouted at Conies who was attempting to enter the island. Just a while ago, a worker had escaped from Enel and risked his life to pass on a message to her and her father who happened to be in Upper Yard, waiting for the Straw Hats. The worker said that Enel was planning on destroying the whole of Sky Island. However, Enel was watching them. So he sent another pillar of lighting at the worker along with Conies and her father. Thankfully, Kony's father reacted quickly and pushed Kony's away, thus saving her life. She didn't want her father and the worker's sacrifice to be in vain. Which brought to this situation where she is trying to enter Skypea again despite being a fugitive. She needs to warn the others. Please move aside. Kony shouted but it was too late. Her waver had hit the captain of the white berets on his face. Captain. Wah. Since the waver is already out of her control, Conies jumped off but the waver still hit the captain again. Captain. It's the criminal. It's that blasphemous woman. The citizens saw Conies and started to shout at her but Conies didn't care. Please. Everyone, listen to me. Get out of here criminal. Yeah. You'll only bring us rubles. Go away. Conies gritted her teeth and endured the insults. When suddenly, one of the white berets charged at her with a knife in an attempt to attack her. Conies moved quickly and pointed the bazooka on her back at him. Hold it right there. Seeing the bazooka pointed at him, the white beret paused in fright. This is a bazooka. I will fire if you get any closer. Conies was no longer fooling around. If it meant for the citizens to listen to her. She doesn't mind taking drastic measures. The citizens also didn't know that Conies had it in her to do such a thing and they all took a step back. Conies saw that everyone was finally quiet. Everyone, please go to Cloud's End. Escape to the Blue Sea. What trickery is this, little girl? The captain of the White Berets finally stood up. The citizens were also confused. What is she saying? Conies continued. God Enel. Is going to destroy this country. We will die if we stay here. Everyone was badly alarmed. This was some serious accusation. Ah. What nonsense. What are you trying to do? Go away. God Enel will never do such a thing. Suddenly, one of the kids threw a rock at Conies. At this moment, a shadow suddenly dove in from the sky and caught the rock before it hit Coney's face. The man stood in front of Coney's as his huge wings expanded, seemingly shielding Coney's from the citizens. W who? Are you? Me? It doesn't matter who I am. But I think you should listen to what this lady has to say, else, forget Enel, would personally destroy this country. Lucas crushed the rock with his hands as he glared at the others. He was really pissed. The citizens and white berets froze under his gaze. Conies didn't know who the man in front of her is but she knew that he is at least on her side. She tossed her bazooka away and quietly faced the people. It's okay. As she threw her weapon. Arrest her. The captain shouted but Lucas glared at him and was about to attack him when he felt someone touch his arm. Conies looked at him and shook her head. When Lucas saw that, he sighed and simply sent a deadly glare at the captain instead. Naturally, no one made a move on Conies anymore. 
It was unknown if they were truly intimidated by Lucas or the fact that his huge wings made them confused. There was no one in Sky Island with such huge wings. Still, Conies took this chance to speak. Enel. Is not the true god. What? When everyone heard her, forget trying to listen anymore, they all tried to leave the place. What has she done? Quick. Get away from her. The judgment is coming. Everyone ran away, thinking that Enel would send a pillar of lightning to kill Conies. They didn't want to be included. Lucas was about to make a move to stop them from leaving but Conies stopped him again. Seeing her determined expression, Lucas sighed and simply crossed his arms. Conies closed her eyes and sat on the ground, waiting for everyone to come back. Sure enough, after a few minutes and seeing that Conies was not punished, everyone was confused. Actually, even Lucas wasn't sure if Enel would extend his mantra here at this moment so, with his recent advancement in the observation hockey, he made some sort of shield around them to prevent from others' own hockey. Lucas has no idea if it truly worked or not though, he just imagined an invisible dome around them made of his own hockey. Ever since he integrated observation hockey in the raindrops, he felt that there were numerous applications for this type of hockey and it seems to have a lot of subtypes but in the original manga, observation hockey wasn't fully explored. Sure, there are people like Katakuri who can see a few seconds into the future with this power, but there aren't too many applications showed other than that in sensing the surroundings. Lucas feels it is worth it to have gained observation hockey first so he can continue to explore its usages. As Lucas contemplated on such things, everyone slowly revealed themselves again. Huh. She didn't get punished. Why? She said such a blasphemous thing. Conies finally opened her eyes. I will say this even if it means losing my life. But the last words of the survivor of the gods militia Arskypea will be destroyed. He and my father were then killed by Enel. Everyone was shaken at the sudden revelation. The kid who threw a rock at Conies earlier was confused. Wouldn't God help us? His mother didn't know what to say and could only tightly embrace her son. Conies continued. There is no time. Everyone, please go to Cloud's End. Despite her urgings, the citizens of Skypea were still distressed. This was all too sudden for them. We've been in the sky all our lives. We don't know how to survive in Blue Sea. Are you saying you are going to sit here and die? But. Maybe there will be a miracle. Maybe Skypea won't be destroyed. Maybe God will change his mind. Everyone was thinking of countless excuses as they didn't want to live in hardship in the Blue Sea. Conies was pissed and shouted at them. If there is one thing I know for certain, it is that Enel is hopelessly powerful and cruel. A miracle will never happen. As of now, this country does not have a god. This is not the time to be praying. If we survive, everything will be different. We must choose. Dead or alive, our lives depend on this very question. Conies shouted with all her breath. Do we, or do we not? Give up on this country and run. Everyone fell silent. Suddenly, Lucas moved his hand and patted Coney's head. Confused, she looked back at the mysterious man. She doesn't know who he was but. When she looked at those huge wings that seemed to protect her from everything, she felt very safe. Lucas smiled at her. I understand that you don't have faith in Enel as your god. But that doesn't mean a miracle wouldn't happen. What? Do you mean? Lucas just grinned at her. Hee hee, even if he is god, I can still think of at least one person on this island that can defeat him. There is no need to evacuate. I will protect everyone. Lucas no longer mind them and flew high above the clouds. If he remembers correctly, the thing that will potentially destroy the Sky Island was a huge thunder cloud formed by Enel with the help of his ship, the Maxim. Thinking of this. If he can make a water shield around the city. It should be able to redirect the lightning currents away from the island. Well, he knows that Luffy will eventually stop Enel anyway but. Just a precaution. Above the Sky Island, Lucas extended his hands and controlled the surrounding waters found in the clouds as he extracted them and formed. 
a huge dome that surrounded the whole island. Konis and the others saw the water dome and were surprised. Is this a miracle? He must be a god. The true god has come to save us. Who knows who started it, but soon, everyone was shouting God. 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 So much that it reverberated throughout the island. Enel naturally heard this as well with his mantra and his face went black as he saw the water dome above. Who. Dares to challenge God. Besides him, Zoro, Sanji, Robin, and Nami were all badly bruised. But. When they saw the water dome, they all broke into grins. Hee <laughs> hee. I knew that guy's not able to die. Heh, just who said that he will cut down God for killing him? Shut up curly brows. What did you say Moss Head? Despite them being bruised all over, Zoro and Sanji still tried to argue with each other. At the side, Nami's eyes revealed a tear as she smiled. This damn pervert. Fufu. He is quite something, isn't he? Robin chuckled and moved towards the unconscious Usopp, Chopper, and Gonfall. The Shandian warrior, Wiper, also looked curiously at the water dome above and to the straw hat pirates who acted as if everything is fine now. Still, he refocused his sights on Enel who was gritting his teeth in frustration. At this moment, from the unconscious huge snake lying on the side, finally opened its mouth and revealed three figures. A strange spotted bird, a little girl, and a familiar man with a straw hat. I'm finally out. Chapter 17 When Luffy originally found out what happened to Lucas, he was mad. Not just because of Lucas. Even going Mary was destroyed. He didn't wait any longer and simply went ahead and charged to Enel's place once they discovered that the upper yard was actually a piece of Jaya in the past and deduced where Enel may be based on the description in Montblanc Norland's logbook. In the skull's right eye, gold is seen. The Skypea map, combined with the Jaya map, had formed a skull. Since this was the case, the supposed city of gold being found in the right eye of the skull should be where Enel is. This was their deduction since they thought that if they were God, they would naturally choose to have their palace in a city full of gold. But of course, this wasn't the entire truth. It was simply coincidence that Enel's palace was indeed at the top of that area where there was also a giant beanstalk that pierced the sky. During their travel to that place, Enel's militia has begun to fight them and they were all separated due to circumstances. In fact, Luffy was still eaten by a giant snake just like the original story along with the bird Pierre and the lowly Isa. Only, in this case, the last surviving fighters were Zoro, Sanji, Robin, Nami, Don Fall, and Wiper. Together with Enel, there were seven remaining fighters which were two more than his prediction. Naturally, Enel couldn't stand it so he tried to eliminate two more. After defeating Don Fall, Enel tried to make a move on Nami who appeared to be the weakest so as to settle his prediction of five remaining fighters. However, Zoro and the rest agreed that the one who needs to be removed was Enel instead. The remaining people tried to fight Enel while Nami hid behind the ruins and guarded the unconscious people. Wiper had used his reject dial once already on Enel and his body was having a hard time standing up. Zoro and the others also were in no shape to fight with their bruises and burns covering their bodies. It was at this moment when Lucas had created the water barrier and Luffy got out from the unconscious snake. Luffy looked up at the sky and his mouth curled to a big grin as he looked at Enel. Shishishishi. You're in for it now. Humph. What does it matter for one more of you? Those who oppose God. Will die. Enel was furious. But before he could attack, a figure dove in from the sky and hovered above them. You're no god, Enel. Lucas had moved here after comforting Konis and the other Skypea citizens. Though the way they were calling him was a bit unsettling for him. Even though he wanted to explain further and stop them from calling him god, he didn't want to waste too much time and simply flew here directly. Hey! You have wings. That is so cool. Luffy's eyes were already glittering after seeing the huge wings behind him. Skypea people's wings were too small so it didn't have much impact for them, 
but Lucas' wings were about twice an arm's length. Even Lucas thinks that he looks handsome. At this moment, the author regretted giving this narcissistic bastard wings but he can't undo it anymore since the chapter has been published. The author is also thinking of using Enel and kill this main character and end the story. But of course, this is only in his heater is it? Back to the story, Lucas smiled wryly as he explained. Sorry for the worry guys, his lightning didn't really affect me but... That move of his is so damn big that it destroyed the area I was standing on so. I fell from the sky. You fell. Yeah, I have no idea why wings suddenly appeared on my back though, but thankfully, it did. Otherwise, I would be lost in the Grand Line by now. Lucas laughed and waved his wings. His body is still that of a water Logia user, even with wings on his back, they are also a part of his body now. Naturally, they are made of water as well despite appearing like that of an angel's wings. When he waved his wings, feathers made from his water shot out and stuck to Zoro and the other injured people. The water enveloped them and slowly healed their wounds. Enel saw this as well and angrily charged at him. You think I'll let you? Gomu Gomu no. Whip. Humph. You think you see a, g h. When he saw Luffy's feet extend and attempted to kick him, Enel snorted and chose to ignore it, believing that his leg would only pass through him. But. He doesn't know what a rubber is. If he knew, then he would know. That electricity is useless against a rubber man. Enel's Logia Devil Fruit is powerful. Extremely powerful. Alas, he had met Luffy, his ultimate counter. Even as he flew off and hit a wall in the ruins, Enel was still confused and refused to believe what just happened. Seeing this, Nami exclaimed. Of course. Luffy's made of rubber. Which means. Enel's lightning doesn't have any effect on him. Zoro shook his head and smiled helplessly. Heh, so much for a god. To be defeated by a rubber man. I kind of feel sorry for him now. Sanji also laughed and started to relax as he lit up a cigarette. Enno still couldn't believe it and shot numerous lightning attacks at Luffy but. Luffy just stood there and pick his nose. Enno's face was quite amusing to look at. His mouth was open wide and his eyes nearly popped out of their sockets. There's even snot coming out from his nose. Lucas sighed in regret that he couldn't take pictures of Enel's face at this moment. This was gold. Thankfully, Robin seemed to know what he was thinking and took a picture. Lucas gave her a thumbs up. Seeing as his enemies have started to wake up and also fully healed, in addition, there's that straw hat wearing boy who can't seem to be affected by his lightning, Enel gritted his teeth and chose to retreat. His body changed into lightning and sped away. Hey! We're not finished here. Luffy shouted but Enel was too fast in his lightning form so he could stop him in time. Lucas patted his shoulder. It's alright Luffy. I think I know where he's going. Then let's go. Before that, Lucas looked over to Wiper. I know this is a cruel thing to say, but you are no match for Enel. It's best you stay here and protect your people. Wiper gritted his teeth and clenched his fists. He knew that Lucas was right. Even with the sea stone, he was still not able to defeat Enel. Earlier, he had already used the reject dial on Enel but. Enel could even restart his own heart with his electricity. Against such a person. He was unable to fight at all. Lucas saw him fall silent and sighed. He didn't want to say such a mean thing but it would be bad for him to keep on following as it would cost him his life and Lucas can't guarantee he can keep an eye on him the whole time. Lucas is indeed unable to be affected with Enel's lightning, but he still can't touch Enel like Luffy. The best he can do is assist Luffy or create an opening for him. After a while, Wiper sighed and tossed his sea stone infused skate waver. Go. This should still be of use to you. You better send that god to hell. Un. Leave it to us. Lucas nodded. Then looked at the sea stone skate waver. He thought for a while then decided to crush it into pieces. Zoro, can I borrow that iron cloud sword for a moment? Here, it's yours anyway. 
Zoro tossed the iron cloud sword. When Lucas caught it, he poured apart some part of the sea stone pieces on it and manipulated the sword in such a way that it holds the pieces on the outer edge of the sword. After doing so, he tossed it back to Zoro. Here, with this, you should be able to hit Enel. Ha, yeah, and here I was wondering how I could cut down a god. Thanks. Next, Lucas embedded the remaining sea stone pieces on the shoe part of the skate waver then gave it to Sanji. Wear this for now. Thanks. Now I can kick a god's butt. Luffy grinned and held onto his straw hat as he looked to the direction Enel had left. Mates. Let's go defeat God. Lucas smiled wryly at these three who were so eager to take on the supposed God. He turned around and was about to grab Luffy and the rest to fly when someone held his arm. Turning around, he saw Nami glaring at him. You better come back. I will. At the side, Robin also looked at him and nodded in encouragement. Take care. Shishishi. Let's go. Lucas grinned as well and held Luffy from behind. His wings stretched wide and Luffy's eyes shone again. So cool. Ha, huh, let's go. Luffy's arm stretched as he held Zoro and Sanji. Together, the four of them flew into the air as the wing brushed past them. Such a flight was a new experience to Luffy and the rest even though they technically flew their ship to the sky before. Flying with wings is still awesome. Not like the wings was his but it still felt great. They laughed as they flew. Suddenly, they saw what seems to be a ship. Flying in the skies as well. This is. Enel's ship, the Maxim. That's where Enel is. Whoa. That ship is flying. Get ready. We'll give God a proper greeting. Luffy laughed as he handed Zoro over to his left arm along with Sanji making the two fight and bicker again. He didn't mind the two as he stretched his free right arm as it twisted to the back while Lucas carried them to Enel in high speed. Gomu Gomu no. Boost. Both gritted their teeth as they both neared Enel. Enel grimaced when he saw the two of them and with his mantra, he knew what would happen next. Quickly turning to lightning, Enel blended with the huge gold face behind him. Just in time too. Lucas and Luffy's attack was about to hit him. Wing rifle. Boom. Despite missing Enel, the two of them managed to destroy the giant golden face on the ship, causing gold debris to start falling from the sky. Lucas can just imagine the look in Nami's face once she sees this. Thankfully, she wasn't here. The name of the attack was something the two came up with abruptly. Though Lucas already knew that Luffy was preparing his Gomu Gomu no Bazooka attack, he thought that since he's assisting him, he should also combine his own attack name with Luffy. Boost Wing A simple charge attack using the wind from his wing propelling him and delivering a heavy blow to the enemy. The high speed charge, coupled by the rubber's own tension. The result was quite devastating. Enel reappeared again. He looked at the remains of the gold statue that he made and his face paled. If that had hit him instead. Enno looked at the four who landed on his ship with a grim face. Who the hell are you? I'm Luffy. I'm gonna be the Pirate King. Pirate King. Humph. It doesn't matter if your attacks can hurt me or not. I'll show you that a god is still above that of a king. Enno's body turned into lightning as he traveled towards Luffy. When he reappeared, his staff was about to hit Luffy. If Luffy had been alone, that attack would indeed hit. But it wasn't just Luffy that's here. Zoro and Sanji were prepared and sent a sword and kick towards Enel just before he could hit Luffy. With Enel's mantra, he was able to notice them earlier but didn't mind since to him, only Luffy and Lucas was a threat. What he didn't know. Was that both of them now had sea stones on their sword and feet. G-U-H. When their attacks hit, Enel was flown back while spurting blood from his mouth. Luffy grinned. You may be a god. But you're all alone. As if on cue, Lucas appeared from behind Enel and swung his wings, releasing about a hundred of high-pressured water feathers at Enel. Piercing feathers. Enel gritted his teeth as he turned around and brought his arms forward in an attempt to block. 
Just as he was thinking that the water feathers would simply pass through his body as it is not made of sea stone or sea water, he missed to notice another attack was approaching him from behind. Gomu Gomu no. Bazooka. Ga. Luffy's attack forced him to solidify and the incoming water feathers was already nearing his body. At this moment, in Enel's vision, time seemed to slow down as he stared at the hundreds of high-pressured water feathers about to hit him. It's coming. Must. Move. No. -oh. Enel screamed as he felt as if hundreds of arrows had pierced his body. When the attack stopped, Enel fell down on his knees, his whole body was bloodied. Luffy, Lucas, Zoro, and Sanji all looked at him calmly without any trace of pity. Enel gasped for breath difficulty. A. Ark. Damn you. I was. So close. My plans would have worked flawlessly if it wasn't for you lot. Everyone would fear me. Worship me. Punks like you. Are no match for me. Enel stood up, a huge black cloud could be seen from above him. I am the Almighty God. Lucas looked up at the black cloud and started to hover. Look carefully, pirates of the blue seas. This island is doomed. Nothing can save it now. Shut up. Luffy was already fed up with Enel's bullshit and charged towards him. Luffy, wait. Lucas tried to stop him but Luffy was already in front of Enel. Enel saw this coming, he touched the golden face statue from behind and injected his lightning on it. Thunder alchemy. The gold seemed to have melted in his hands which he was able to freely manipulate to any shape. When Luffy's fist neared him, Enel manipulated the gold to surround his fist, creating a huge and heavy golden orb attached to his arm. Ah! Hot! Luffy! Luffy's face paled from the hotness of the gold that touched his skin. Yeah! Ha ha ha! Ha! Ah! I can't pull! It out! Enel laughed while panting. Ha ha! Rubber man of the blue sea! I have no desire to fight you. Let me go, you ass. You are dismissed. Enel ignored him and simply kicked the golden orb away from the ship. Naturally, with how heavy it was. Luffy was dragged down. Zoro and Sanji acted quickly and attempted to catch Luffy. GGH. With you out of the way, the world is mine, once again. There will be no one to stop me. There is still me. Lucas took the Iron Cloud Sword from Zoro and flew towards Enel. You! Enel glared at Lucas. He manipulated his staff to turn into a trident and attacked. The Iron Cloud Sword and the Golden Trident clashed. Suddenly, Lucas heard Luffy and the others screamed as they fell from the sky. Wah! Luffy! Zoro! Sanji! Where are you looking at? Damn it! Lucas hesitated for a moment before deciding to retreat and catch Luffy and the others instead. As Lucas grabbed the three, he flapped his wings as hard as he could but the golden orb was too heavy. Without much of a choice, Lucas can only soften their landing and redirect them towards the giant beanstalk where Enel is originally headed to look for the golden bell above it. The four crashed on the ground with a loud boom. Soon, Nami, Robin, and the others ran towards them. Seeing the huge golden orb, Nami's eyes turned to bellies once again. Gold. Luffy. Are you guys alright? We're fine. I'll head back up there, you guys find a way to get Luffy's hand out of that gold orb. Lucas sighed and flew back up without delay. By the time Luffy also got up, Lucas was already high up in the sky. He looked up, then looked at his arm, then to the giant beanstalk. There's no time to get this thing out of my arm. I'm going. Luffy didn't care about the heavy weight on his arm as he began to run up the beanstalk while dragging the huge gold orb behind him. Nami snapped out of it and pulled her waiver. I'll catch up to Luffy with the waiver, you all should go back to the city. She didn't wait for their response and drove the waiver up the beanstalk. Meanwhile, on board the Maxim, Enel looked up at the dark clouds and grinned. He started to gather up his electricity and shot towards the sky. Then. 
huge lightning started to rain down on the island. This is it. The party. Has officially started. Thunderstorm. Chapter 18. Yahahaha. The sky is God's territory. Neither man nor earth should exist here. They all belong on the ground. Enel laughed out loudly as he looked down on everyone beneath him. Suddenly, a figure appeared in the skies. The sky's my territory as well. Does that make me a god? Lucas glared at Enel but Enel didn't mind him. Ha ha ha. As I said, you all are too late. Nothing can stop this now. Not if I can help it. Lucas had set up a water dome a while ago, now, it can finally be of use. He controlled the water and started to compact it, all the while pushing the thunder clouds out of the dome while protecting everyone from the lightning inside it. Seeing this, Enel gritted his teeth in anger. But soon, he started to laugh. Yahaha! You may have stopped the destruction of the island for now, but this isn't over yet. Enel laughed as his body turned into lightning and disappeared. Come back here. Lucas chased up in the sky but when he disappeared in the thunder clouds, it was impossible to track him down. As soon as Enel went in the thunder cloud, the cloud started to form and compact and condense itself, creating a huge black cloud filled with lightning. Lucas' face was pale, something as large as that. His water dome won't be able to block it. Advent of Thunder As the black mass of thunder cloud fell down, Lucas began to move as well. The only way to stop something that big was to create something bigger. Lucas flew beneath the black cloud and expanded his wings. Water began to pour out of his body as he also started to gather the water from the water dome to create an even bigger water orb to trap the lightning inside. In the sky, the black and blue orbs clashed. Lightning began to expand in the water but was contained there, not able to escape from inside. With all the lightning contained, Lucas began to compress the water orb even more along with the lightning. When it was small enough, he quickly tossed it far away from the island. Boom! The destruction left by the explosion caused everyone's faces to turn as white as snow. If that explosion had hit the island. The Skypea citizens saw this as well and started to chant once again. God! 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 At the distance, Enel's face blackened. In his anger, he shot another huge pillar of lightning towards the citizens. I am your god. Not him. Lucas moved quickly and shielded everyone from the lightning pillar. I may not be a god. But you're definitely not one either. As the two of them began to fight once more in the sky, they noticed something shining on top of a cloud. That was. The Golden Bell. Enel's eyes lit up and quickly went that way but Lucas stopped him. You're not getting that bell. Our captain. Still needs it. Enel was truly angered now. Meanwhile, Luffy had reached near the top of the beanstalk together with Nami. Luffy. Get on the waiver. We're leaving. Nami tried to convince Luffy but he only shook his head. No. What do you mean no? This is. I still have something to take care of. The golden bell is here. Gold. I know gold is important, but we will die if we don't escape now. You saw it too, right? Even if you are immune to lightning, he can still destroy the entire island and you with it. Lucas can't possibly stop all of Enel's attacks all the time. However, Luffy was still adamant on finding the golden bell. You saw it down there, right? Saw what? The Golden City. The Golden City does exist. It wasn't a lie. That diamond head Mr.'s ancestor. Wasn't lying. I have to tell him that Norland wasn't lying. And the Golden City is here in the sky. Nami fell silent. She remembered the man who helped them find a way to get to the Sky Island. Montblanc Cricket. In order to prove that his ancestor wasn't lying, he kept diving the sea to look for traces of the Golden City. If I ring the bell really hard, I'm sure that he'll hear it. Otherwise, he'll keep diving into the sea trying to find this Golden City, and that's dangerous. Luffy. 
I can't let that bastard Enel get the bell. I have to ring it so loud that everyone in the blue seas will hear it. That's why I'm staying here. And ring the golden bell no matter what. Since Luffy had already said so, and looking at his determined face, Nami can only sigh and follow along with the captain's wishes. Nami took a leaf from the beanstalk and began to write something on it before tossing it below. On the ground, Zoro and the rest saw the huge leaf and the writings on it. There's something written. What does it say? It says to cut the beanstalk. And make it fall westward. What good would that do? Everyone looked up and saw the Maxim ship on the west side. Everyone understood Nami's intention. Zoro acted quickly and held his sword. Slash. In one second, he had slashed his sword two times, cutting a large chunk of the beanstalk on one side. However. It wasn't enough. Suddenly, the huge snake seemed to have woken up and banged its head on the beanstalk. W. Watt. But. The beanstalk only tilted a bit. It's still not enough. Out of the way. Wiper, shoved Usopp who was on the way and moved quickly as well. He jumped on the beanstalk and faced his palm on it as he gritted his teeth. Reject. Boom. A huge chunk of the beanstalk was blown away. While everyone was still surprised by the power of the reject dial, the beanstalk began to tilt to the west side. Above the beanstalk, Nami and Luffy noticed the commotion as well. It's tilting. Luffy. This is it. Okay. Let's go, Nami. I've never actually tried. Turning the jet dial to the highest, so. I'm actually not sure if I can control this when we. Nami was still feeling nervous as she spoke but Luffy didn't bother about the details and simply trusted her instead. I trust you. Okay. Vroom. The two drove towards the beanstalk with extreme speed. In the sky, Enel and Lucas both noticed the two moving their way as well. Enel was the first to react as he sent a lightning bolt towards Luffy and Nami. Lucas moved as well and swung his iron cloud sword to block the lightning. On the ground below, Wiper was looking upwards despite his bloodied body suffering from the backlash of the reject dial. Go get him. Brat. He fell on his knees as he was no longer able to stand still. But he never left his eyes in the sky above him. Ring it, brat. Ring it. Relight the light of Shandora. On the side, Gonfall was also looking up. Yes. My young friend. Please let U.S. hear the song of the island. Above the sky, Luffy had already pushed Nami away on top of a floating cloud so she wouldn't get hurt. As Luffy floated, the hand holding the huge golden orb was right behind him and his arm was twisted. Enel gritted his teeth as he glared at Luffy. Hee hee, hi again. This time, it's my turn to knock you off. You damned monkey of the blue sea. Now you have truly angered God. Enel's body expanded as he turned into pure electricity. Max 200 million volts. Amaru. Enel. Are you forgetting about me? Lucas moved in front of Luffy and also expanded his body, turning into a huge figure made of pure water. Neptune's wrath. The lightning and water gods collided. With one hand to block Enel, and another hand to support Luffy, Lucas gritted his teeth as he pulled Luffy towards Enel and manipulated the water such that three swirling spikes could be seen on the golden orb. Gomu Gomu no. Mizu Mizu no. Golden. Neptunes. Luffy and Lucas both glared at Enel. Enel also gritted his teeth as he could see what would happen yet unable to dodge. I am God. Trident Rifle. Wua. Rying. Together with Enel crashing on the golden bell and the golden orb in Luffy's hand finally destroyed, the golden bell. Finally rung. For the first time. In four hundred hundred years. The light of Shandora. The song of the island. Was finally heard once more. The golden bell fell off the floating cloud along with Luffy so Lucas flew down to catch him. All the while, Luffy was still shouting. Do you hear it? Diamond Head Mister. B. 
Big monkeys. The south birds began to cry out once more as they heard the familiar sound. The golden city. Does exist. On the ground, the others also looked up happily. He did it. What a beautiful sound. Wow. How nice. What's that sound? What's that sound? So this is what Norland heard back then. As the straw hat crew smiled, Don Fall cried tears of joy. I knew it. I knew this day would come. I knew it would. In the city of Skypea, Conies also looked up. This is. The earth. It is singing. Does God. Really exist. It's a miracle. After four hundred years of silence. The bell has finally. Rang again. Wiper closed his eyes in an attempt to stop the tears from flowing out. Do you hear it? Montblanc Norland. I'm sorry to be a little late. I only hope your descendant can hear this. Suddenly, the huge snake woke up once more and started to cry happily. Tsulalala. Back on the ground below the skies. Jaya. Montblanc Cricket and the Monkey Brothers looked up to the clouds. Though they can't see the sky island, they could hear the bell and also see something even better. Boss, is that? There's no doubt about it. Cricket grinned. Romantic, isn't it? They knew what this sound meant. His ancestor, Montblanc Norland was not a liar. The sound is. The proof he sent us from the sky. Cricket looked up on the clouds and saw two giant figures. A man wearing what seemed to be a straw hat. And an angel reaching his hands towards him. Hey kid. So the Golden City. Is all the way up there, huh? Thanks for telling us. The three of them grinned for a moment before Cricket suddenly groaned. Boss. Is there something wrong? Are you okay? The Monkey Brothers panicked, but when they saw the tears and the grin on Cricket's face, they smiled. I'm glad. You guys are alive and kicking up there. I was worried. Cricket was feeling worried if his actions of guiding them had actually killed Luffy and the rest. But now. They seem to be alive and fine. As such, Cricket was finally relieved from his worries. While Cricket and the Monkey Brothers celebrated, the Skypea citizens saw Enel's ship sank along with him. God Enel. Sank with the ship. Everyone fell silent. The sound of the bell. The proof of the ancient city's once prosperous past. The light of Shandora. It is also the declaration of truce. The song of the island. Though four hundred years late, it is also. The sound of a promise kept. No matter how long the journey of the floating island is. The memories of those in the past, are never forgotten. Using the sound of the bell as a medium of message, blessings, and hope is spread. To the corners of the world. We will. Always be here. That was what the sound from the bell seemed to have relayed to everyone who heard it. Luffy lay on the ground while Nami and Lucas watched over him. It rung. Yup. Think they. Heard it. Lucas smiled. I'm sure they did. As Luffy laughed, Lucas stood up. Come on. We should get down and check on the others. Shishishishi. After Lucas flew Luffy and Nami back down, they reunited with everyone else along with Konis who also came when everything settled down. Hey. Luffy. Miss Nami. Konis chan. Seeing everyone all fine, Konis began to cry. I'm so glad you are all safe. I was so worried, but. I couldn't do a thing. Oh, Konis chan were you really that worried about me? Sanji's body twirled crazily towards Konis. Stop acting crazy. Hey Konis, where's your father? Ah. He. Um. He. Tried to protect me. And Enel. Hearing the tone of Konis, everyone more or less understood what had happened and they all looked at Konis with pity and sadness. You mean. Konis chan. Konis. Seeing this scene, Lucas felt a bit weird. 
He looked around but didn't see Kony's father at all. He was supposed to appear here. Hold on, if I remember correctly, Kony's father fell to the White Sea. And was saved by the people who were escaping to Cloud's End. Lucas grimaced. In this version, he had convinced everyone not to leave so. No one is there to save Kony's father. Lucas sighed and patted Kony's head. I'll be back. Lucas didn't wait for anyone to react and flew away. He hurried towards the White Sea to search for Kony's father. Thankfully, he was still alive. Lucas saw Kony's father was injured and quickly used his water to heal him. At that moment, he seemed to feel a bit weak but just shrugged it off, thinking he was too tired from the battle just now. Who? You're awake. Come, I'll take you to your daughter. Ah. An angel? Am I dead? Wait, if you're taking me to my daughter. Is she dead too? Lucas felt it was weird to be called an angel by these Skypea people who obviously have wings on their backs as well. You're not dead. Neither is your daughter. I'll take you to her now. No longer minding his reaction, Lucas simply carried him away and flew back to where Luffy and the rest is. Kony saw that her father was still alive and well immediately jumped to embrace him. Father. Kony's. The two hugged for a while as they were watched by the others who had a smile on their faces. Nami was moved by the warm atmosphere and moved to secretly hold Lucas' hand. Lucas was surprised by the sudden touch and enjoyed the warmth of her hand. After Kony's and her father separated, she looked at Lucas with eyes filled with gratitude. Thank you. God. Ah. Uh, please stop calling me that. While Lucas was trying his hardest to dissuade Konis to stop calling him God, the ex-God, Don Fall, had just freed the people Enel had slaved away to work on Maxim. You have all been imprisoned here for the past six years. I. I am sorry. Fortunately now that the war is finally over, everyone can return home. With the ex-slaves finally reunited with their people and families, the Shandian tribe were also meeting their chief. Chief. Will the 400 years of anguish really just simply go away like this? Well. The god's militia is destroyed so. However, the chief remained silent, seemingly thinking of something. No one noticed that the maxim had once again appeared in the skies with Enel driving it. God can never be defeated. I'll come back someday. I will not allow anything in this world to stand in my way. Yahaha. Only I am worthy of this. The endless land like in a dream. Enno looked up and saw the huge moon that shone above. Go, Maxim. To the land that glows in the darkened sky. The endless land. Chapter 19. Where am I? Wiper asked as soon as he woke up to an unfamiliar ceiling. From the side, Gon Fall answered. You are in the ruin of Shandora. Gon Fall. You. You are also from Skypea. Wiper's face darkened when he saw Gon Fall and Konis. You can't move yet. Calm down. Don't try to push it with your wounds. Hearing the familiar voice, Wiper couldn't help but doubt his ears. That person who spoke was. The chief. But then, why would the chief and Gon Fall be in the same room together? However, there was still something else on Wiper's mind. Chief. Where's the golden bell? We still have to guard it from. Take it easy, Wiper. Just listen. The chief sighed and opened up the curtain revealing the outside to Wiper. In the past, the warriors had their reason for war. For generations, the sky is our home. Chief. Listen. The earth had never rejected anyone. It was us who rejected each other. Yes. Right now. Among us. There is not one person. Who desires the continuation of the war. It was only now that Wiper had heard of the noises from outside and saw the sight. There they were, Scipians, Shandians. All laughing and dancing merrily around a huge campfire. He could see the bright smiles of everyone as they sand and danced together, not minding anyone's identity. In the middle of it all was a young man wearing a straw hat. 
He was the one who smiled the brightest as he raised his arms to the sky. Party! Everyone cheered and laughed. Some were even competing in drinking. Lucas was holding Nami's hands as they danced together. Seeing her smile, Lucas' heart wavered. For a moment. He thought. Maybe it would be best. To stay in this world. Just like this, the 400-year war. Now ends with laughter from both sides. After a few hours of partying, Luffy decided to wake everyone up. Pussed, Lucas. Wake everyone up. Hmm. What are you up to now? Just now, Lucas is still enjoying the feeling of Nami sleeping beside him and even Robin is beside him for some reason but then Luffy slapped him awake so he was a bit annoyed. Luffy didn't care about that as he grinned. Let's steal all the gold and run away. Hearing the G-word, the orange-haired lady beside Lucas woke up instantly. Eh. Gold. Really. Stupid. Don't talk so loud. You're the one who is loud. While Nami and Luffy were shouting at each other, the others also started to wake up. Usopp woke up from the noise but was still half asleep as he blamed Chopper who was beside him and punched him. Be quiet. I can't sleep with all the noise. Ouch. That hurts. Soon, everyone else woke up as well. Is it morning already? Those citizens of Blue Sea sure party a lot. It took a while but Lucas finally managed to calm and quiet the crew down as they discussed what to do. When they were done planning, Luffy said. You guys got that? Make the best out of tomorrow. Don't forget to do anything and regret later. The next morning. Some shouted and alerted the chief. Chief. We found the golden bell. Oh. It's hanging on the fallen beanstalk. Now, everyone's getting ready to pull it back up. The chief smiled and quickly issued an order. Gather as many men as you can and head to the beach. As they were quite loud, Robin was able to hear them as well. The golden bell. A relieved look appeared on her face as she thought. Finally. The stone tablet of Shandora that bears the historical text is within my reach. I almost gave up on it too. Before having met Enel in the ruins, she had read some inscriptions on the walls and found that the thing she was looking for was on the golden bell. But when the bell had fallen, she thought that she would never be able to see it once more. Hearing that they had found it had given her a huge relief. It wasn't just Robin who heard about it as well. Lucas was there and saw the look on Robin's face. Lucas scratched the back of his head and sighed. Finally, he went over to Robin. Shall we go see? On. Anyway, it seems that the others are still busy and he had nothing to do. Zoro was training as usual. Usopp was talking with the engineers of Skypea and traded a lot of common goods from the ground with dials here. As for Luffy and the others, they are currently inside the giant snake's body as they took all the loot inside. Lucas didn't join them as he didn't really want to stay inside a snake's stomach for a long time. Since this was the case, he decided to come along with Robin. By the time the two of them got there, the Shandians and the Scipians had already pulled the golden bell up. We got it. Hooray. So that's the golden bell. It is marvelous. Lucas finally saw the bell in person. Sure enough. It is quite majestic when compared to seeing it in manga or in the anime. Despite the moss and vines covering most of its exterior, the golden shine and majesticness was truly something to behold. Though, it was too bad that one of the pillars broke off. At the bottom of the bell stand, there were square-shaped runic symbols etched onto it. There seemed to be some writings on it, chief. I cannot decipher the language on it, but... That is not important because... Just before the chief could start saying something profound, someone spoke. Before the heart of truth there is no need for words. Lucas turned to look and it was indeed Robin who spoke. We are the recorders of history. Existing in harmony with the sound of the great bell. The chief looked shocked as he looked at Robin. Where? Did you learn those words? I found them on a rock in the Shandora ruin. It also said that you are the warriors of Shandora, protectors of the text. 
Hearing her say that, the chief trembled as he asked. Can you really decipher that ancient language? Robin didn't mind him and focused on the text written on the bell. Lucas was a bit tempted to cut in and pretend to read it to impress Robin but decided not to. After all, he really can't read it. Ichem. The ancient weapon with the power so strong that. It was named after the god. Poseidon. An ancient weapon. We have such a thing here. The Shandians were surprised but Robin ignored them. She frowned as she continued to read the texts. Another weapon named after a god. It's just like the Pluton of Alabasta. Eventually, she sighed. What a waste of effort. This is not something that she wished to learn about. Lucas smiled helplessly as he knew what she was thinking of. Robin, can you look at that other writing at the side? Maybe you'll find something more useful. Robin looked over and her eyes opened wide. We came here, found the text, and followed its guidance. Joel D. Roger. After reading the text, more questions formed in Robin's head. The Pirate King. So he also came to the Sky Island. Furthermore, he also knew this ancient language. Roger, you said. Gone Fall interjected when he heard the name. Do you know him? Twenty years ago, there was such a guest on Sky Island. He said that he was a pirate of the Blue Sea. Can he be the same person who carved that message? Perhaps. So that means, the Pirate King. Already found the text twenty years ago. Those carvings are the proof. Lucas saw that Robin was talking to herself but didn't interrupt her thought process as he waited. It is said that there are two kinds of tablets that hold texts like this one. They are the tablets of clues and the tablets of truths. This one is probably a tablet of clues. Ichem. We came here, found the text, and followed its guidance. Followed its guidance. Robin's eyes lit up and a certain thought emerged which shocked her in the core. Can it be? That the true historical text is actually. Lucas smiled then turned to the chief. Chief. It seems that. This text has already served its purpose. Served its purpose? Robin continued. Yes. There are many tablet of truths around the world, and. One must link them together to get the records of the lost history. The true historical text is the combined result of these tablets of truths refers to by the tablets of clues. Surely, the pirate king has recovered the tablet of truth that this tablet of clues here refers to. The chief didn't understand what she explained as much but. He did understand one thing. In other words, we. No longer. His eyes revealed tears that seemed to have been held back ages ago. We no longer. Need to. Fight. So the wishes of our ancestors. Have long been fulfilled. That is correct. The Shandians celebrated with tears of joy. Finally. Finally. Now, they really did feel. That the war is truly over. Seeing them react like that, Robin smiled then looked back at the golden bell as she continued to think. This also means that I must follow the guidance given by the tablets I have read so far. To the ending point of the Grand Line. Raftel. However, there is one more thing that she was confused at. Her sights landed on Lucas who was smiling warmly at the Shandians who finally felt peace in their hearts after such a long time. Earlier, it was Lucas who pointed her to the note left by the Pirate King. And it was also Lucas who was the first to say to the chief that the text had served its purpose. All this wouldn't have been possible if. He didn't know how to read the ancient text himself. Well, the truth was that Lucas can indeed not read it. He held back trying to impress Robin but was unable to hold back completely as this was quite a historic moment in the story as well. It was at this point that one would know just how important these poneglyphs are to the story and that they weren't simply texts that points to weapons or something. Which was why he was excited and pointed the note of Rogers and also prompted him to speak to the chief. Of course, Robin doesn't know that. However. The way she looked at Lucas had certainly changed. It was not the romantic kind at all. 
but more on suspicion. Lucas. In the end, just who are you? Oh yeah, I heard that your friends also desire gold. Since in the Blue Sea, gold is more valuable than land. I cannot give you the bell itself, but how about this broken pillar? Yeah. That's a great idea chief. Take that as a symbol of our gratitude. Lucas heard it as well and laughed. Well, those guys are busy planning to escape with a few stolen treasures though. Then, Gonfall asked him. Lad, that boy wearing the straw hat. He reminds me of Roger. Are they related? Lucas smiled. His name is Monkey D. Luffy. Just wait, he'll become the Pirate King as well. D. I see, they have the same initial. Is that why they are so similar? Ha ha ha. Maybe. Or maybe. Well, the will of D is something that has been greatly teased and debated on the internet for so long that Lucas didn't know how to answer. After a while, Lucas and Robin went back to Luffy and the others with the golden pillar carried by the others following behind. When Luffy finally saw them, he waved over their direction and shouted. Hey! Robin! Lucas! Hurry up! We stole their gold! We need to hurry and leave! Luffy! Why did you blurt that out? Didn't you see all those people behind them? This isn't good! They have a huge cannon with them. Ah! So many people and a huge cannon. Usopp and Chopper panicked and they saw the large pillar wrapped in cloth and thought it was some sort of weapon. Lucas knew what they were up to and quickly calmed them down. Luffy! They are giving us the gold so you don't need to run. Ha! The golden pillar would be such a huge waste to not take. Lucas thought so he tried to stop the crew from leaving. Thankfully, this time, Luffy listened. Soon enough, he was staring at the huge golden pillar with shining eyes. How many meats can this buy? While talking about this and that, everyone arrived at the shore and found the ship ready to depart. Lucas sighed when he looked at going Mary still intact. Back when Enel had seemingly killed him and make him fall from the sky, going Mary was also destroyed and the pieces of the ship had scattered in the sea below. The only piece they could find left was the head. At the time, Lucas felt regretful. He knew that although they would replace the ship one day, the importance of going merry was still quite a big thing to the crew. Especially to Usopp. He even had a big fight with Luffy because of it. That was why. Last night. When he took the broken headpiece of going merry. He. Used his powers. He didn't know if it will work. He didn't know if his water's healing factor would help but. He tried. Just as how he was able to regain the life from the dead plants that Crocodile had dried up in Alabasta. He. Tried to resurrect Going Merry. Well, seeing as Going Merry is fine and in front of them now. Obviously his powers had worked. But what Lucas couldn't forget at that moment was. When Going Merry was whole again, he saw a strange. Shadow-like figure standing on the deck. The shadow seemed to smile and wave at him but when he tried to get near to get a closer look, it was already gone. Though Lucas knew that there was something like the ship's spirit that was teased in the original story, it was never actually explained and there are all sorts of rumors and speculations about it. Seeing that shadow. He looked back at going merry and smiled. Well. With you all healthy like this. I wonder. Just how much impact it would do compared to the original story. He was amused by the thought and figured that it would be quite exciting as well. Back to the present, Nami was confused why Luffy and them had come back while being followed by everyone else. She thought that they were escaping. When Lucas grinned and revealed the giant golden pillar, her eyes seemed to turn into gold itself. Needless to say. She has no objections. Still, it would be hard to bring that huge pillar on board the ship. So the Scipians and Shandians had made a long raft fitted with jet dials which is tied to the ship so they could simply pull it along with them. While being watched by everyone, the crew waved their goodbyes. Everyone. Take care. Thanks a lot Straw Hats. God. We will always remember you. 
Lucas coughed when he heard himself being called God again. Suddenly, they heard the sound from the golden bell once more. Luffy laughed. Shishishi. Sky Island. Farewell. Nami checked in on her log pose. All right, Captain, the log pose has locked on to the next island. Okay. To the blue seas. Yeah. Chapter 20. Boom. After being dropped from the sky, caught by some kind of balloon octopus, and dropped once more. Lucas' face was pale but he still tried his best to soften the landing as much as possible as the golden pillar was quite heavy. The water splashed a big wave as the ship hit the ocean. Everyone gasped for breath as soon as they could breathe properly. Cough. That was scary. Why did the octopus suddenly shrink? Maybe there's a leak. Phew. We're still alive. Thanks octopus. Luffy caught the octopus, now a small one, and laughed. Soon, they managed to have a good look at their surroundings. The sea. It's blue. Is everyone safe? Lucas asked while looking around, ready to heal anyone who might be injured. Sanji started to light up a cigarette and sighed. Well. That was one magical trip. Now that we're back down. That trip feels like a dream. Well, I got a lot of memorable pictures that prove it isn't. Lucas laughed. I wonder. If we will ever go back again. Maybe you will go there after you die. Or somewhere close. Hee <laughs> hee. Zoro grinned while looking at Chopper who wanted to go back to the sky. Zoro, are you sure that we'll go to heaven? Suddenly, Nami clicked her tongue. TSK TSK, if you can rest whenever you want in this sea, nobody would be afraid of it. Everyone, move it. Look, here it comes. While everyone was still confused, Nami turned around to look at the view from behind. All right, there was no view, only a huge wall of water created by a tsunami was headed their way. Ah. Full speed ahead. Lucas laughed and didn't bother with controlling the water to have the tsunami pass around them as he went and joined the crew set sail. After over an hour of bustling about and dodging the huge waves, the sea finally calmed down and Nami was able to try the waver on the sea as well. Yes. It works in the blue seas too. Luffy could only stare at her with jealousy as he also wanted to try riding it. While Nami was having fun with the waver, Usopp was testing a bunch of dials if it would still work here as well. Hmm. It seems everything except the cloud dial works down here. Hearing him say that, Lucas took out the iron cloud sword and tried to activate it. Sure enough, it was indeed not working. Lucas sighed. And just as he thought that he would have a unique weapon of his own too. Well, maybe it doesn't really matter much to him because of his powers. Finally, once everyone was done confirming their loot from the Sky Island, Nam started to check the gold and treasures they got inside the snake's stomach. Thank you for waiting. Now we will officially start distributing the loot. Each of these is worth a lot of money. Everyone cheered. Yay. Hooray. Let's buy a statue. I want a statue. Can I buy books? New pots, new pans, new silverware. And a few mousetraps. Time for some rum. Only Robin and Lucas didn't say anything. Robin probably doesn't need much money herself. As for Lucas. He was still thinking that they have too much money now anyway. And this doesn't even include the money he got from Blackbeard and that giant golden pillar. Nami smiled as she heard their requests. First of all, my share is 80% of these. Oi. Afterward, the crew started to debate on which things are necessary to buy or get when they reached the next island. Lucas fell silent as he listened and couldn't help but feel bad. After all, he had repaired Going Merry to look as good as new. None of them talked about repairing the ship anymore or getting a new one. Going Merry is indeed a good ship. But it isn't suitable for battle or sailing the Grand Line. Especially so in the New World. As such. He had to intervene. I think we should get a new ship. The room became quiet at Luca's suggestion. Then, Usopp glared at him with his fist trembling. 
Lucas. I know you were the one who fixed Mary back up again but. You don't have the right to say that. Lucas looked at him calmly and sighed. I did not say we should throw Mary. I said we need a new ship. Why can't we have both of them? You. Huh. Perhaps confused by what Lucas meant, Usopp was no longer glaring at him and looked surprised instead. Look, if I hadn't fixed Mary, it would already be gone. We're in the Grand Line. Who knows just what kind of dangers or enemies we will face. Maybe next time, we won't be so lucky as now and get Mary back. We can still keep Mary, but we also need a ship that is better equipped in these seas. Who knows, maybe make a big enough ship to fit Mary inside. By then, we could have Mary as some sort of scout ship or something in the future. Everyone fell silent again. Hearing what Lucas said, Usopp, Chopper, and Luffy started to picture something in their heads. The image of a huge ship and going Mary coming out from inside it. Suddenly, their eyes sparkled. That's it. Let's do that. Yosh. Let's go get a big ship. Lucas sighed in relief when he saw that the crew's emotions stabilize. He was still a bit worried that Usopp would act like in the original story and it would be problematic if his anger is directed at Lucas and not Luffy. Lucas isn't Luffy, he doesn't know if he would handle that situation well. After all, even though Usopp is. Well, Usopp. He is still an important member of this crew. Lucas didn't want his existence here to be the one who would destroy their relationships. Once they were done deciding, Lucas started to train in his observation hockey once again as he sat cross-legged with his eyes closed. He could feel another huge tsunami coming up so he controlled it to go around as he didn't want to be disturbed in the meantime. However, as he controlled it, it actually hit another ship near them. Luffy and the others also saw the ship. That ship. There's no flag and not even a sail. What kind of ship is that? Huh. They don't have anything. Why are then on the sea? I don't know but. The sailors look. Kind of strange. Usopp zoomed in on the sailors on the deck and saw they're all just sitting around and looking depressed. Luffy tried to call out to them to warn them about the tsunami. Hey. You guys, there's a tsunami headed your way. Turn around. Only now did the sailors react. However. None of them did anything useful. Some seemed to want to board going Mary and raid the ship instead. Some wanted to dodge the tsunami but there were no sails to use and also no navigators on board. Naturally. The ship was swallowed by the tsunami. Lucas could have helped but. He figured there was no point in doing so. Instead, there was a solemn look on his face. It would seem. That it is already this part of the story. Lucas sighed and got out. Soon. They reached an island. There's nothing. Right. It was a huge island with a seemingly endless stretch of plain field. Apart from the weirdly long and thin trees, there was really nothing visible on the island that would pose as a landmark or a city. Nevertheless, Luffy still looked quite excited. So big. So empty. It's an endless plain. It's plain all right. There's nothing to see. I wonder if it's inhabited. Well, they got their answers for that soon enough. After walking for a bit, they saw a tall and thin. Furry creature. Which is quite similar to a bear. They also saw other familiar animals that seemed to be stretched thin like a cheetah, or reindeer. Even dogs, or vultures. While Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper were touring the island, another ship arrived from behind. It was a huge ship with a fox headpiece at the front and a fox-like skull on its sails. Along with the letters Foxy. These guys are. The Foxy Pirates. Who are you people? Come on down and fight. What do you want from us? Come out, cowards. Zoro was pissed. Not only did they show up and block their way out, they spoke arrogantly as well. We are the Foxy Pirates. Don't be anxious. Our duel shall begin shortly. Lucas kept quiet and didn't pay attention to any of these guys. Instead, 
he was looking at the island with a serious look before leaving quietly. While the foxy pirates began their game with Luffy and the others to steal their crew and flag, he wanted to deal with something else on this island. There was no need for him to get worried with Luffy. He knows that they can handle these chumps. Anyway, they also still need to grow stronger both in their powers and in their characters. But. It is still too early for them to deal with the person on this island. Once he was far enough from the others, Lucas closed his eyes and extended his hockey to the whole island. Ever since their trip to Skypea, his observation hockey had grown by leaps and bounds. It would be no exaggeration to say now that. He can even rival Katakuri in terms of using it. Lucas smiled and opened his eyes. Found you. Akiji. Lucas extended his wings and flew towards him at great speed. As his body was made of water, his wings were also the same so he could will it to show up or not. It is quite cumbersome to walk around with huge wings on your back after all. Having arrived in front of a tall man who wore a white suit and a sleeping mask on his eyes, Lucas stopped. Huh? Who the heck are you? Akiji, what brings you here? Lucas didn't decide to humor him and simply asked straightly. Akiji smiled and removed the sleeping mask. Ararara, aren't you a member of his crew? Lucas. Was it? That is me. Akiji felt the tense expression of Lucas and sighed. Hey, just chill man. It's not like I was ordered to come here. I was only taking a walk. Perhaps. But there should be a reason why you are headed this way. Akiji shrugged and laid down on the grass relaxedly. I only came here to confirm the whereabouts of Nico Robin after the Alabasta incident. I thought she would be with you guys. She's with us. Now go back. I said confirm. I haven't seen her yet. Now, have I? Lucas' eyes narrowed. Is my word not enough? No. Then this conversation is over. Even though Lucas said that, he didn't make the first move and simply waited for Akiji to make his move. Akiji looked at him and sighed as he stands up. He picked a few strands of grass and threw them in the air as he blew on them with his freezing breath. The small blades of grass soon formed a long ice weapon. Ice saber. Lucas gritted his teeth and shot forward with extreme speed as his body turned into water and rotated in high speed as well. Boost Whirlpool. Oh. I heard about the reports. But I didn't think a water devil fruit truly exists. More so, a Logia one at that but. Lucas' eyes grew wide when he saw Akiji's fist nearing him. Ice. Beats water. Does it not? Ice started to form inside him that Lucas can't help but panic. He gritted his teeth and shot away in a hurry. Damn it. So it really won't work. Lucas thought that maybe his water wouldn't react the same way as so far, his abilities are quite weird but. Is there really no way of beating ice with water? Since this was the case. Time for plan B. That was. To move the fight on the beach. He needed access to the sea water. His body turned to water once more and expanded, turning into a large wave that would swallow a small boat. Still. Akiji stood there without moving and only stretched his arms. Ice Age. Meanwhile, back to Luffy and the others. Just like how Lucas had predicted, they had indeed gotten into a fight with the Foxy Pirates and are not playing the game called Davy Back Fight. On the first round, it was a race around the island where Robin, Usopp, and Nami had participated in and lost due to the other side's cheating. As a result, Chopper was taken from them and became a part of the Foxy Pirates. Well, on the second round, both Zoro and Sanji managed to win the round and get Chopper back quickly. Finally, it was the last round. A fight between the captains. Luffy vs Foxy. Both of them stood on the deck where Luffy was already looking pretty bloodied and bruised. While wearing an afro. Straw Hat Luffy is standing back up. Knock him out. Yeah. Finish it. Foxy grinned and started to unleash his attacks at Luffy who's currently slowed down with his Noro Noro ability. Megaton Ninetail Rush. Gah. 
Luffy collapsed from the attack. While everyone thought that he would no longer stand back up. Luffy. Stood up once more on his own two feet. Straw Hat Luffy stood back up. How is he still standing after that? Is it because of the afro? Foxy was pissed at seeing Luffy still standing after all the attacks that he made. He used his powers once more and didn't stop attacking. Noro Noro Beam. Megaton Ninetail Rush. From the audience, Usopp was angered as well. Damn it. That beam thing is way too cheap. Foxy didn't mind him and only looked at Luffy as he snorted. Heh, let's see you still STA. Before he could even finish his sentence, he saw Luffy. Still stand up. At this moment as well, on the fight between Lucas and Akiji. It could be seen that Akiji still looked the same other than the ice covering his skin but. The same couldn't be said to Lucas. Right now, Lucas' body is nearly frozen from the neck down as Akiji held him up. These two people. Luffy and Lucas, were both fighting different fights. Yet the same expression could be seen in both of their eyes that still burned of life. To save. My crew. To save. My friends. I will fight. Even if it kills me. Chapter 21 Akiji looked at the young man in front of him with an uncaring expression. Well, that is certainly an admirable notion. But after you die, I will go for your crew next. In the end, everything you do is pointless, no? G.H. I. Won't let you. Lucas felt the blood he coughed up quickly froze as well as he glared at Akiji. At this moment, he was no longer conscious of his thoughts due to the extreme hypothermia he is experiencing. His whole vision was blurry and he was having a hard time staying awake. Before confronting Akiji, Lucas thought he could win. He can control clouds as they have water properties in them. Using the same logic, he should be able to control ice, which is made of water, as well. Right? Well, that is certainly right. The problem is. Akiji can control the ice itself directly. Controlling the water is pointless when another is controlling the ice. Not to mention that Akiji's control over his powers had already reached an extreme level in and of itself. There wasn't even some kind of tug of war, it has only been Akiji pulling him along. Lucas knew that he had grown quite arrogant with his abilities and had taken it for granted. Especially when it keeps evolving and adapting when he needs it to. In the back of his mind, he thought that no matter what happens, his ability would kick in and he would be okay at the end of the day. How laughable. Lucas was angry at himself to the point of wanting to laugh. Who knows if he was still conscious of his own thoughts or not, but his eyes still contained some light as he glared at Akiji. Suddenly, Akiji heard sizzling sounds coming from Lucas. Ararara, using your body heat to generate hot water. Good move. But it's not still not hot enough. The sizzling sound stopped and Lucas was now completely covered in ice. Akiji looked at the frozen Lucas once more and shook his head. A cold white mist appeared from his mouth as he sighed. Just as he was about to turn and leave, he heard a sizzling sound once again. This time, it was louder and hotter than before. Oh. He was in no rush as he calmly waited for the outcome. Soon, Lucas' body was once more free from the ice. He gasped for breath while coughing heavily. His body seemed to have a hue of red as it sizzled and generated steam. Looking at his appearance, Lucas thought how similar he looked to Luffy's own gear second. However, the two of them are different. Though Luffy's gear second does generate heat as well, its main application is being able to move extremely fast. Lucas' current appearance, however, does not affect his speed at all. It really only turns his water into hot water. Lucas felt his own heat and looked back at Akiji with a serious expression. Not enough. This degree of heat isn't enough. If Lucas were to name and categorize this move, it would be. Burn. First degree, heat man. This degree of heat is enough to make someone wince in pain and burn their skin slightly. But it wasn't enough to fight an ice man. Naturally, Akiji could feel this as well which was why he still looked calm and relaxed. 
quite an interesting ability you have there. Akiji didn't mind that Lucas wasn't responding to him and instead fell silent, as if in deep thought. Finally, he nodded. How about we make a deal here? A deal? Right. Initially, Straw Hat Luffy by himself is not a problem. The problem appeared when Nico Robin joined your crew. We have to reassess the threat and danger you all now possess. This is the curse of Nico Robin. And then there's you. The devil fruit user who is said to command the seas and overturn the ocean. You may not realize it yourself, but you are the greatest threat in the Grand Line. Your powers is too big for a small pirate crew to bear. Your point. Lucas gritted his teeth. He can already tell where this conversation is going. Sure enough. He was right. Join the Marines. Become a Shichibukai. As it happens, there is one slot open. A fellow named Blackbeard was supposed to take over but then we received news that you had already killed him. In return. Us admirals will not directly fight the Straw Hats. In other words, everything else is fair as long as the admirals didn't make a move themselves. Why can't you give them complete immunity? They are still a threat with or without you. But without you, an admiral doesn't need to make a move. Lucas, for the first time since coming to this world, can't help but regret that he chose to follow Luffy and the others. If he had not been with them from the start, things would have been the same. They would still beat Crocodile. They would still reach the Sky Island. They would still defeat Enel. Even here. They would survive against Akiji. In the original story, Akiji was here solely because he wanted to check up on Robin and Luffy. He never meant to kill or capture them here. But with Lucas' involvement, the story had already progressed differently. Sure, some aspects may be the same. But the workings behind the scenes had already changed long ago. From Akiji's words, they seem to have been watching him closely since he revealed his water powers in Alabasta. This was probably the main reason for his bounty as well. If it was like this, maybe it would be for the best if he separates from Luffy. When Lucas thought of that, his fists clenched. Akiji saw that Lucas wasn't in a hurry to refuse, which meant that he is indeed considering his proposal. He smiled and turned to leave as he tossed a small Denden mushy to Lucas. The next island is Water 7. When you've made your decision, contact me. What is it you really want with me? You know. Even if I agree, my loyalty would still belong to the Straw Hats, not the Marines. You should know that I will do whatever I can to protect them from behind the scenes. So why do you still want to recruit me? Lucas asked as he was truly confused. The conditions that Akiji gave him was certainly enough to make him agree. But he can't understand why the marines would go to such lengths just for him. Akiji thought for a moment before answering. It seems Sengoku's planning something big. That's all I can tell you now. Besides, it's not like the other Shichibukai have no other agendas. Hearing that, Lucas was surprised. It can't be. This early. Are the marines planning on moving against Whitebeard already? But Ace shouldn't be captured this time around. So why? How? Seeing that Lucas was no longer asking him questions, Akiji left without another word. Lucas just continued to stand there, thinking over his options and figuring out the best course of action for him. He thought about it for over an hour. Then another hour. And another. In the end, he still can't make up his mind. It was already night time. The games and battles between the Straw Hats and Foxy Pirates have long ended with Luffy's win. Right now, they were preparing a feast to celebrate. It was only now that Lucas decided to come back to the ship to rest when he met Luffy and the others, already eating dinner. Ah! Lucas! You missed out all the fun. Lucas! Where have you been? If you participated in the first round, things would be easier. Hearing Luffy and Nami call out to him, Lucas paused. He wondered. If he should tell them about what just happened. No. Knowing Luffy, he will definitely be against the idea of him leaving and becoming a Shichibukai. 
he wouldn't even entertain the idea of the consequences if Lucas stays with them. Which is why. Lucas simply smiled at them. Well, I thought I'd have some quiet training for a moment. I trust that you guys can handle those pirates anyway. Shishishi. It was easy. What easy? You nearly lost you idiot. But I won didn't I? Lucas quietly watched them bicker at each other and wondered if he would still be able to see such a scene in the future. Lucas doesn't want to leave this fun and idiotic crew. But. He may just have to if he wants them to be able to be as strong as they were in the original story. He wasn't joking when he said that he wanted Luffy to be the Pirate King. So right now. What Lucas needs to do. Is pave the way for him. Anything that gets in the way. Kill. At the side, Zoro seemed to have noticed the change in Lucas' eyes. He looked at Lucas silently and decided to approach him when there's an opportunity later. He didn't have to wait long. Soon, Lucas had returned to the ship while the rest of the crew were still partying outside on the island. Robin noticed Zoro following Lucas on the ship and became curious as she saw Lucas' expression earlier. Silently, she waved her hand slightly and an ear popped out from Zoro's back hidden from sight. In the cabin, Lucas slumped down on the bed with a heavy sigh. Thinking about what happens in the future tires him out so he just wished to sleep it off at the moment. Just as he was about to doze off, Zoro entered. What happened? Lucas looked at Zoro and sighed once again. Guess I can't really hide anything from you, huh? Since he was here, Lucas figured it should be fine to tell Zoro instead. Unlike Luffy, Zoro is still more reliable when it comes to something like this. Are you aware about the Marine Admirals? Not much. Well, there are three of them. All of them are Logia Devil Fruit users. Akainu, who are the Magma Fruit. Kizaru, who ate the Light Fruit. And Akiji, who ate the Ice Fruit. All three of them are simply too powerful. Zoro fell silent. He knew how hard to deal Logia fruit users are. They were lucky with Enel being lightning as Luffy can counteract him. But what about the others? How were they supposed to fight a man made of magma? Or light? Or ice? However, Zoro was also confused about why Lucas would bring this up now. Akiji was on this island earlier today. After hearing what Lucas said, Zoro's eyes widened. An admiral. On this island. Isn't this too much? Right now, they should quickly get the crew ready to leave. Lucas saw Zoro panic and showed a weak smile. It's alright. He's gone now. Lucas. You. Did you defeat him? Far from it. I nearly died. This time, Zoro was truly worried about what happened. While they were goofing off and playing games with the foxy pirates, Lucas was alone fighting an admiral. He gritted his teeth in anger. Why didn't you tell us? We could have backed you up. We. Would have been dead. Seeing Zoro become agitated, Lucas coldly cut his words. Zoro froze. He truly has no way of refuting that. That's why I didn't tell you. I thought I could handle it but. He's simply too powerful. Even if I'm made of water he can still freeze me. Then. Then how come you're alive? Zoro asked hesitantly. If what Lucas said was true. Then why is he still alive now? And why did the Admiral leave? Lucas hesitated for a moment as well before finally sighing and spoke. It seems. That my powers are something the Marines need. He gave me a deal. Replace Crocodile to become Shichibukai. In return, the admirals won't personally deal with you guys. Just as he finished saying that, the door snapped open. Bullshit. Are you really gonna accept that? Sanji. Sanji was originally going to get ingredients in the kitchen when he overheard Zoro and Lucas speaking. Actually, he only planned to silently listen, but after hearing Lucas, he couldn't take it anymore. Lucas sighed. What am I supposed to do? You haven't seen what Akiji can do. As you all are. You can't beat him. But that doesn't mean you should accept his offer. 
Did you already accept? Zoro asked as well. I. No. Not yet. But I do plan on accepting once we reach the next island. Are you sure about this? Lucas. Once you do this. Luffy will hate you for it. Hearing Zoro's cold voice, Lucas wavered a bit but still decided. I am prepared for that. At least he would be alive to hate me. Zoro looked at Lucas in the eye for a while before nodding. Fine. Then. What's the real plan? Zoro. You can't possibly be. Eh. Plan. What plan? Sanji was about to lash out to Zoro as well for agreeing but then paused when he heard the latter part of what he said. Lucas smiled wryly. He really can't hide anything from Zoro. The situation is like this. From what Akiji said, the marines seem to be planning something big. I fear that they are going to war with one of the Yonko. Lucas started to explain his plan. From how he sees it, since the marines are willing to use him, they should also get ready to be used by him. Right now, Lucas has no idea if they really did still capture Ace or not. If they did, joining them would easily grant him access to this information. And based on what he will learn, he will take action himself or somehow relay the information to Zoro and the crew. After a while, Sanji lit up another cigarette and sighed. Fine. I won't say anything to the others for now. Damn, are admirals so free nowadays that they just leave their HQ to recruit someone? Lucas shook his head. It seems that he originally came here for Luffy and Robin as well. This was also why we fought. Hmm. I can understand Luffy since he's the captain and a troublemaker. But why Robin? Well, in any case, he only said that he won't personally get involved. So the marines might send someone else to take her away. You all should be careful. Lucas decided not to tell them about Robin's background as it was not his secret to tell. Plus, they would get suspicious about where he got that information. As such, he could only vaguely hint that the CP9 may get involved. Sanji grinned. Heh, don't worry. I wouldn't let anything happen to Robin Chan. As long as we're not up against an admiral, we can take care of it. Lucas nodded and grinned as well. I know. Otherwise, I wouldn't have easily decided to accept Akiji's offer. They are still underestimating you guys. While the three of them continued to talk about their plan, the ear that sprouted on Zoro's back silently disappeared. In the distance, Robin had heard everything that Lucas had said. Her hands clenched into a fist as she bit her lip. Her fault. It's her fault again. Once more. Will this crew also be destroyed because of her? The next moment, her expression returned to normal as she convinced herself. Survive. In the end, all that matters is she survives. Everything else. Doesn't matter. Even if it means using others. Suddenly, the bet she made with Nami resurfaced in her mind. Right. Since the bet, they have already visited three islands. The next island would be the fourth and last according to the bet. A helpless smile appeared on her face. It would seem. That none of them would win the bet. Chapter 22 The next day. Luffy found an old man stuck in a long stilt on the island. It seems the old man was stuck there for years and unable to get down due to the height. Thankfully, he was able to survive since the trees here were also tall and he was able to live from the fruits. Lucas' face twitched after hearing how ridiculous that was. He also thought how the hell did this old Gramps pee or take a dump and couldn't help but look warily on the ground. Anyway, thanks to the old man, they knew the name of this island was called. Long Ring Island. The name was like that because this plain field they were standing on is simply a part of the island. The whole island is shaped like a ring, with hills tall enough that it would look like a separate island and the water tide is high enough. The old man belonged to a tribe that would keep rotating their homes on these tall hills. One day, this old man decided to play on the stilt which grew quite fast and he was left behind. Since that was the case, Luffy decided to have the old man on board and they would set sail around Long Ring Island until they find his tribe. 
Lucas thinks this was pointless but didn't stop Luffy. He can still use this time to train. It took them four days to finally find the tribe the old man belonged to. During this time, Lucas was imparting all he knew about observation hockey to Zoro and Sanji. He would also to play with Luffy with the blindfold game from time to time to hone Luffy's skills. With his talent and protagonist luck, he should learn observation hockey fast. Somehow. Probably. He also had Usopp try being blindfold and aiming. Who knows, maybe this guy would also learn observation hockey somehow. As for Chopper. M. Lucas had hurt just remembering it. When he asked Chopper to try, Chopper was only cutely swinging a stick while going E.I. 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 Naturally, none of his hits reached anything at all. However, it was funny so he secretly recorded a video of it. Heh, it could be considered as watching cats on YouTube, he can use it to relieve stress someday. Then there's Nami and Robin. Speaking of this, Lucas had hurt even more. When he blindfolded Robin, she just waved her hands and an eye appeared on the blindfold. As for Nami, he had to keep betting with her just so she would agree. The bet was that if she could hit him once while blindfolded, he would give her one million belly. The result? Nami would suddenly show her cleavage or lift her skirt a bit. And then, each time. Would be followed with a slap. Lucas has no way of fighting back. If there's no bet, Nami would just pretend to try. Only Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji had real progress. Zoro and Sanji were serious as they knew that Lucas was about to leave, and they also wanted to get stronger. As for Luffy, he's just a natural when it comes to using his instincts. Robin also knew about Lucas' little plan but decided to feign ignorance. After dropping off the old man to his tribe, the crew once more set sail to the seas and onto the next island. The travel this time is surprisingly quite relaxed. Three more days passed like this quietly and calmly. In this time, Lucas continued his training and he even had Luffy try a couple of moves. Well, when he explained Gear Second, Luffy didn't understand it one bit so Lucas can only give up explaining using words. It is now the third day since they left Long Ring Island. Nami was wearing a one-piece dress and was relaxing on the deck. Mm. The weather is nice today. Nami I swan. Nami decided to ignore the fact that Sanji came over while swirling and twirling and looked at the plate he was holding instead. This is a potato pail, my newest invention. Would you like to try some? Nami took a bite and said. Mm. Delicious. I can die happy. Sanji faced the seas and shouted. For some reason, there were waves that hit the edge of the ship in the background. Suddenly, Nami took another piece and handed to the person beside her. Lucas, give it a try. Ah. Mmm, it's delicious. Lucas was surprised and just as he opened his mouth, Nami already fed him with the pail. Seeing Lucas being fed by Nami, Sanji was angered. Lucas goddamn you. Shut up, bastard. I'm trying to sleep here. Hearing Sanji shout nonsense again, Zoro woke up and snapped at Sanji. Shut it Mr. Cactus. My Nami Swan is being stolen from me. What's that, dartboard? D. What was that? Dartboard eyebrow. What? Lucas saw that Sanji's anger was redirected to Zoro and sighed. He looked curiously at Nami, seemingly hesitating something. Nami saw his look and only presented another piece. Want more? Ah, uh, that. Nami? Is there something wrong? Why is this orange-haired demon suddenly giving him free things? Something is definitely up. Sai, I'm not blind you know. Lately, you seem to be pushing yourself and everyone with this play training of yours. So you tell me. What's wrong? Lucas fell silent, before sighing and lying back down. He closed his eyes and said. It's nothing. Nami pouted. How is it nothing? Look at you. Look at how you're acting. How is it nothing? Nami was angry. She didn't care about his reaction anymore and pulled his ear along. Ah. 
N. Nami. W. 8. That hurts. Being dragged by the ear, Lucas winced in pain. Of course, he can just turn to water but he felt that if he were to do that. Then Nami will truly be angry. She might not hit him anymore, but the feelings and relationship between the two will never be the same again. Helplessly, Lucas can only follow behind her and wait for his judgment. On the way, they passed by Luffy and the others who looked at them curiously. What's this? What's happening? Lucas, you angered Nami again. You shouldn't learn from Sanji, Lucas. I didn't do anything. Lucas wanted to yell out but only sighed. Nami pushed the pail to Luffy to shut him up. Food. What's this? Pail. With potato. Don't let anyone near the cabin. Roger. Luffy. Just who is the captain here? Lucas stared at Luffy dumbfoundedly as he defends the door as Nami slams it close. Once they were alone inside, Nami threw Lucas to the bed. Confused, Lucas can only ask. Air. And Nami? Why does it feel like I'm going to get raped? Lucas sweated. Though in his mind, it is actually fine if it was Nami. But that's beside the point. Nami glared at him and got close. Lucas' heart skipped a beat seeing her so close. He can feel her breath on his face and her smell. Air, she still smells of oranges. You're going to tell me what's happening right now. Or I will yell rape. Damn. This is too savage. Just who is raping who in this situation? Lucas wanted to ask but didn't dare to. However, they were still in the ocean, Lucas doesn't know if he should really tell Nami right now. Who knows just what she'll do. It would only make things complicated and they still have to reach the next island for Lucas to leave and relieve the awkward air by then. Nami saw that Lucas still refused to talk and was about to yell. R-A-M-M. When Lucas saw that she was really gonna yell, he gritted his teeth and pushed his own lips against Nami's to silence her. Faced with the sudden kiss, Nami's eyes widened. She tried to let go but Lucas was quick, he held her head and continued the kiss. Soon, he went as far as sticking his tongue in. Nami went dizzy with the intense kiss but refused to be defeated so she responded in kind. As such, the two were locked in an intense battle in their lips. Nami's face went red and her thoughts became blurry. Somehow, she managed to separate the two of them but in the process, she pushed Lucas down. Their posture right now is quite suggestive. Not to mention that their faces are red and seemingly in heat. Nami looked down at Lucas for a moment. She could feel something rising from below her as well and remembered the incident in the past. The two stared at each other while heavily breathing. Both of them seemed to be waiting on the other to make the first move. Nami saw that Lucas was still hesitating and become angry again. She didn't care anymore and started to kiss him in protest. For a moment, Lucas decided to forget everything. Forget about his home world. Forget about Akiji and his deal. Forget about being a Shichibukai and leaving the crew. Lucas didn't let go of Nami's lips in fear of her screaming and moaning too loud. Nami wildly tore off his shirt and removed his pants while holding Lucas down. Soon, they began another round of a different kind of battle. Outside the cabin, Luffy and the rest couldn't hear any voices but they can hear slapping and thudding sounds. Wow! Lucas isn't even screaming after being tortured by Nami. Damn, hear how loud those slaps are. Is she gonna kill Lucas? Lucas, may your soul rest in peace. Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper all prayed for Lucas. Meanwhile, Zoro and Sanji let out a cold sweat. Since they also knew about Lucas' secret, they feared that the two of them will also be subjected to torture after Lucas if he decided to spill the beans. In their minds, they also prayed. Lucas. You damn better not say anything. When you die, we will explain to Akiji. So rest easy, and don't say a word. It was a good thing Lucas was too busy, and he also can't hear their thoughts. Otherwise, he may just cough out blood. At the side, Robin was curious about what was happening and summoned an eye to sprout behind the cabin's door. 
Soon after, she blushed. Okay Nami. This is your win you sure are daring to do this while the crew's all awake. After an hour of torture, the door snapped open and everyone quickly looked. They saw Nami's face red from anger and her clothes a bit disheveled, but she was stomping away angrily. Next, they saw Lucas weakly follow behind her. He was only wearing his pants. As for his shirt. It was already torn by Nami and the others can only see the various scratch marks on his body. Everyone instantly paled. God! Just what kind of torture did he undergo? There's even a red slap mark on his face. Robin, who knew exactly what happened inside, blushed heavily. God! Nami is too wild. However, she is confused why Nami is still angry. It can't be that she's dissatisfied. Though briefly, Robin had seen Lucas' thing down there. Naturally, Lucas doesn't know what she's thinking, but if he did, who knows what he'll do. Lucas sighed seeing Nami ignore him and remembered the incident a while ago. After the two tussled for an hour, Nami laid weakly on top of him. She asked. The two of us are already like this. Why won't you tell me if something's wrong? Lucas looked at her eyes which seemed to cry in a few moments. He gritted his teeth and finally came clean. She was right. Their relationship had already gotten to this point. It would be too unfair for her if he didn't tell her. So he told her about Akiji and his deal to him. When Nami first heard that he had fought with an admiral, she panicked and got worried. But after listening through the whole story and that he planned to agree, her whole body trembled. Why did you agree? It's the only way for you all to be safe. Don't give me that shit. What about you? Then, she gave him a loud slap and stormed away after quickly fixing her clothes. Lucas had to quickly pull up his pants in fear of others seeing. Though, he couldn't get his shirt anymore since Nami tore it. Sometimes, he can't help but wonder why Nami is strong at times, but weak most of the time. He also had to hurriedly clean the place with his ability as there were. Various kinds of liquids here and there. Lucas turned to Zoro. Zoro, can I borrow some clothes? Sure. While looking at him in pity, Zoro went to the cabin and got him a spare shirt. Though Zoro normally wears a white shirt, he still has other shirts. Now, Lucas wore a collared shirt with red and black stripes. AAS Zoro was handing the shirt to Lucas, he asked softly. Did you tell her? Yeah. Sanji was nearby so he also heard. The two of them instantly went pale. Ah. Everyone should be hungry. I'll go cook something. Air. I'm gonna go catch a fish then. The two quickly escaped. Lucas looked at them and was confused about why they were acting like that. Then, Robin walked towards him and gave him a weird look. You. No, it's nothing. Robin quickly retreated as well. Confused why everyone was reacting that way, Lucas sighed and shook his head. Anyway, he needs to deal with Nami's issue first. He only looked away for a moment and he can't see her anymore. After thinking a bit, he spread his observation hockey to look for her. Once he did, he looked up. Nami was there on the observation deck at the top of the mast. He made his wings reappear and flew. Nami felt a shadow block the sun and looked up. She saw Lucas, looking at her worryingly. Why are you still here? Just hurry and fly away. Lucas was silent. He extended his hand to her and said. Take my hand. Nami was still angry at him and didn't want to. But when she remembered that she may not see Lucas again, she gave in and took his hand. Lucas smiled and pulled her to him as he flew high up in the air. Ever since I got these wings, I've always wanted to carry you up here. It's beautiful. Nami watched the horizon divide the sky and the seas and can't help but wonder just how truly big this world is. I remember. You mentioned that your dream is to map out the whole world. Yeah. My dream is to make sure everyone I care about to be happy and live as they want. So I will make sure this dream of yours come true. One day. Someday. I will take you to see the whole world. 
Nami looked away from the scenery and looked into his eyes. Promise me. I promise. Suddenly, Nami's face closed in and gave him a long kiss. Nami smiled. I've sealed this promise. You can't take it back. Otherwise, you will have to pay with your life. Hearing this, Lucas gave his signature wry smile. I won't break it even if I die. Chapter 23 After sealing the promise, Lucas told Nami about the plan. To which, Nami agreed to cooperate. The two of them went back down to deck just in time for something to occur. It's a frog. A giant frog. Is swimming in freestyle. Luffy shouted in shock as he looked at the sea beside them. Usopp was still busy eating and didn't see the frog so he was dubious to hear about it. Dude. Luffy, frogs don't swim in freestyle. Ah. It does. Only when he turned around that he saw the frog. Was really swinging its arms as if swimming in freestyle. Lucas also saw it and can't help but think how weird the frog looked to be swimming like that. It was fine watching it in the anime but to see it for real well. It was quite a sight indeed. Everyone, let's catch him. Take out the paddles. Full speed ahead. Two o'clock. Lucas. Go and catch it. Luffy ordered Lucas when he saw his wings and suddenly remembered there was a guy here who can both fly and control water. Hearing Luffy's order, Lucas nearly stumbled. What the heck? There's no way I'm touching going anywhere near that. Thing. Usually, Lucas is fine with gore and such stuff. But he's no good with frogs. Naturally, there was a reason for it. Back in high school, they used to have a class about dissecting frogs. At first, he was still fine with it. He thought he can handle it. They were in pairs. And by some weird stroke of luck, he was paired with the beauty transfer student. When the time to actually dissect the frog came. Well, it was a hot classroom at the time due to some malfunction in the air conditioners. Lucas was already dizzy with the heat, coupled by the soon-to-be-dissected frog's image in his head, and the beauty's body sticking so close to him. He fainted. This had caused such a trauma for Lucas regarding frogs. But it wasn't to the extent that he would faint when seeing one. As long as he doesn't get near it, it was fine. At this moment, Lucas was even tempted to just drag that frog down to the depths of the ocean. Anyway, he had to change the subject fast. Lucas looked around and saw something in the distance. Ah! Look! There's a lighthouse over there. Hmm. That's true. Why is there a lighthouse in the middle of nowhere? I wonder who lives there. Nami took out a pair of binoculars and saw the lighthouse too. Just as Lucas predicted, Luffy was distracted. Hearing about the lighthouse, Luffy asked. Did you find an island? No, just a lighthouse. But the log pose isn't pointing to it. What about the frog? Where is it? Okay, I forgot Luffy's attention span is quite small. Lucas shouted. No way. The frog is going in the direction of the lighthouse as well. Robin said and saw Lucas glaring at her, she smiled teasingly at him and turned away. This girl. Lucas' face twitched and couldn't help but thought if he had offended her somehow. I don't even remember angering her, why is she going against me? Meanwhile, Sanji seemed to be preparing something in the kitchen while muttering. First, you wash the frog with white wine. Then you coat it with flour and fry it. There's no way I am eating that. This time, Lucas really paled. No. Even if it's delicious, I am not eating a frog. Lucas gritted his teeth and felt that he was facing something worse than Akiji. Actually, he wished that Akiji just kept him frozen as an ice sculpture, that way, he won't be facing this situation now. Luffy didn't care about him though. Full speed ahead. Oh. What the hell is wrong with all of you? Ah. God. Please do something. As if hearing his prayer, a familiar sound could be heard from the distance. It was getting louder by the second. This sound it was like the sound of a steam engine train. Ah. Uh. Hey. 
Hold up everyone. Do you hear a strange noise? Sanji heard it too and quickly asked everyone. Eh? What is that? Oh. The frog stopped. Jero Jero. Suddenly, just when the frog stopped in a certain area on the sea. A huge mass of metal blowing off smoke from a pipe at the front arrived with a fast speed. This is. Really a steam engine train. Wow. Something's up ahead. Back. Back. Turn 180 degrees. Lucas knew that they were about to hit the train as well and quickly controlled the water to turn the ship. Just in time, the steam train blew past behind them. Wah! Just like the trains from Lucas' homeworld, this steam train here moved extremely fast and they could feel the wind brush past them as the train sped off behind. What was that? Jero. Ah. Hey. Frog, get out of there. What are you doing? Luffy panicked when he saw the frog still not leaving and seemingly wanting to clash head on with the steam train. What's that big metallic thing? A ship. No. With its shape. It shouldn't be able to sail on the sea. Nami and the others paled at the sight of the fast and heavy looking steam train. This must be the first time they even see a train. Jero. The frog croaked and readied itself to clash with the train. And then. Okay, in fact, everyone knows what will happen. The frog obviously lost and was blown away. Wah! He got hit. As if it was nothing at all, the train just continued to move forward without minding what just happened. That ship was blowing smoke. Chopper's mouth was still open from his shock. Lucas looked back at the lighthouse and spoke. There's someone here. Granny. Granny. Pirates. What? Really, chimney. All right, hold on. Hearing the noise from the lighthouse, everyone started to become cautious. However, they only saw a little kid, a bunny, and a drunken old woman. Ah. What were you yelling about? I forgot. Hick. You're too damn drunk. Zoro and Usopp retorted. Zoro sighed and removed his hand from his sword. After everyone was settled, Sanji handed some more of his pail to the kid and drunk old woman. The little kid was called Chimney, while the drunk old woman was Kokoro. Oh, and the bunny. Which they called was a cat. Is named Gonbi. Luffy, being the way he was, introduced himself. I'm Luffy. I'm going to be the pirate king. Lucas brought his palm to his face when he heard that. What kind of pirate introduces themselves like that? Oh wait, he also introduced himself as someone from another world before. Lucas froze, then decided that there was nothing wrong with Luffy or him. Nami asked the two. Um. Chimney, that was a steam-powered boat, right? But with its shape, how was it able to float? You've never seen it before. I guess you don't see that anywhere else in the world. That's a sea train. Its name is Puffing Tom. Puffing Tom. The little girl grinned as she explained. It's a steam-powered car that moves on the railroad in the sea. Lucas raised a brow when he heard her explain. Judging from what she said. There are cars in this world. Lucas tried to remember if he ever saw a car in the One Piece manga but can't remember any. Oh wait, does Frankie General count? After thinking about it, Lucas decided that there are indeed cars in this world. At least, it's possible to have one with their level of technology. It's probably just not popularized as the Grand Line is mostly ocean. A railroad. Yeah. It's just beneath the surface of the water. The train moves from island to island every day, transporting between islands. Sometimes it transports mails and packages too. Everyone looked at the water and indeed saw a track just a bit beneath it. Lucas looked at it as well and thought what would happen if a sea king were to bite it off. Wow. There really is a railroad. Yes. And you sailed right onto the railroad. That was dangerous. But no matter how you warn, the frog wouldn't understand. Then you ram it flying. That was rude. 
Plus, he was our prey. Lucas sweated. Damn Luffy. I'm not eating a frog. Chimney saw the frog too and sighed. Ah. His name is Yakajina. He has been a nuisance for a long time. He likes to compete his strength with others, and he has been trying to beat the train. He wouldn't die from a crash like that. He will come back again. Lucas feels a bit dizzy hearing about frogs again so he decided to go back to the ship. Anyway, he already knows what they would do next. Might as well train some more. After a while, Luffy went back on board as well and announced their destination. Water 7, the City of Water. After Kokoro handed a simple map and a letter of recommendation, the crew started to set off. Let's go. Thanks for the info, Kokoro and Chimney. Get ready to set sail, crew. Lucas also moved to help set sail. This might be the last time he would be able to be with them, after all. Luffy was still without a care though. Let's go to the city of meat. Were you listening at all? Sanji grinned. Luffy, leave the carpenter search to me. I'll definitely find us the hottest babe around. Stupid. We need a super big man to be our mechanic. He has to be at least five meters tall. That's too much, Luffy. He wouldn't fit into our little ship. Lucas can't help but wonder if this was a foreshadowing of General Frankie. That thing is huge. Zoro shook his head. None of that matters. As long as he or she is a good carpenter, the main concern should be whether or not anyone will want to join a group of pirates. As for Chopper, he was still as optimistic as ever. It's so exciting. We're going to meet new friends. Yup. We were lucky too. We got a map to start us off. She said to go to the marked location to find someone called Iceberg. Nami opened the map that Kokoro gave her and nodded. Oh. I see. It's a completely useless sketch. The paper only had a simple hill, and an arrow at the left side. Lucas immediately retreated away from her, lest he is pummeled again for no reason. At the side, Luffy was still trying to convince everyone to get a five-meter tall carpenter. Lucas saw Robin watching them silently as well and sighed. It seems. Things will still go as what happened in the original story. The day passed by with Luffy and the rest goofing about normally. Only Zoro and Sanji seemed to be training themselves as they knew Lucas would soon be leaving them. They can't keep relying on his powers, they need to get stronger as well. Nighttime, Lucas volunteered to be the night watch to make sure they were still headed in the right direction. He was looking at the distance, seemingly lost in his thoughts. Suddenly, the door to the cabin opened up and he saw Luffy leaving drowsily. Luffy? What's up? Hmm, I don't know. I just woke up and can't fall asleep. Luffy tilted his head as he was also confused. Normally, he would be able to sleep so easily, but this time, there seems to be something bothering him but he doesn't know what. Lucas showed a wry smile and looked back at the sea. Since he can't fall asleep, Luffy joined him as well. The two just stood there quietly for a long time. Eventually, Lucas spoke up. Luffy. When I look at how big the ocean is. It makes me wonder how lucky I am that you were able to pull me out back then. Shishishi, that sure was a surprise, huh? Yeah. Seeing Luffy grin, Lucas also laughed and smiled. The two watched as the sun rose from the sea and marked the start of a new day. When all the crew woke up, everyone started to busy themselves as they should be arriving soon. As expected, they are now able to see the island from a distance. Hey, is that Water 7? Land ho! Land who? Everyone, start rowing. No, that's a waste of energy. Lucas smiled and controlled the water instead to make them sail faster. Shishishishi. Nice one Lucas. When they were close, everyone looked up with excited gazes. Wow! Fascinating. Woo! Pretty! Ho ho! Lucas also took a picture as the island truly looked beautiful. When one looks at the island as a whole, it looks like a huge fountain. 
There was even water coming out from the top and falling down like a real fountain. That's so cool. A giant fountain. Man. That looks like a metropolis. No wonder the sea train goes here. Nami then noticed they were already near but can't see the dock. Look, it says Blue Station over there. So where's the dock? Maybe it's on the other side? Then, a fisherman at the side called out. Hey! You there! Yeah! Pirates can't go in from the front like that. Go from the back. The citizens don't even fear pirates. Heck, he even advised them to go from the back. Okay. Thanks. Then, another person called out. Hey! You can't anchor your ship there. What are you here for? Robbery? No, we just want to find a carpenter. Did he just ask if they want to rob him? Head that way until you see a small peninsula. You can anchor there. Okay. Thanks. Soon, they reached the small peninsula mentioned and dropped the anchor. While they were preparing to head out, Nami asked. Why aren't the people here afraid of the pirates? That's probably because pirates only come here for repairs. Maybe they have very strong guys to fight any pirates if necessary. No doubt about that. There must be strong guys everywhere in a big city like this. Usopp was instantly frightened when he heard Sanji. For real. Then isn't it dangerous here? It should be fine since we're all customers. R. Really? Okay. Let's go. Hearing that there should be no danger, Usopp and Luffy started to run off when Nami quickly stopped them. Hold on. Luffy. Usopp. You're going to follow me. Where to? Being stopped, Luffy and Usopp pouted and asked. First, we'll take Kokoro's letter. And find the man named Iceberg. We'll ask him and see if we can have the new ship to be built. We also need to find a place to exchange our gold for money. Okay. All right. Enough talking. Let's go to Water 7. With Luffy on the lead, the three of them walked towards the city. Nami turned around and looked at Lucas one last time. Knowing that this may really be the last time. Lucas saw her look and smiled as he nodded in her direction. Nami sighed but also smiled back before hurriedly following Luffy. Soon after, Robin and Chopper also left to look around the city. Lucas' eyes narrowed and followed behind them. Before Lucas leaves the crew, he would see if he can resolve Robin's issue first. Otherwise, he would be too worried when he leaves. The crew may not need Lucas. But they definitely need Robin. Chapter 24 As the three of them entered the city, Chopper was in his reindeer form while looking around excitedly. Currently, they've reached the market district. The crystal clear water and sidewalk are all so nice. Chopper then saw a shop with a lot of masks. Wow! What's that, Robin? So many faces. That's a mask shop. Did Chopper think those were real faces hung on the walls? Didn't you see a lot of people wearing such masks pass us by? Ah. They were wearing masks. No wonder they looked so weird. Lucas smiled helplessly. This chopper really thought those were real faces. Robin continued to explain. One of the stops of the sea train is the San Ferrodo Island. There is a costume party taking place there. Eh. How did you know? Everyone on the street was talking about it. You noticed those things too. Robin fell silent for a moment before answering. It's a force of habit. I've been doing that since I was a child. You're so awesome, Robin. Chopper was just like a child, he didn't understand what Robin said truly means and simply thought it was cool. Robin was caught off guard as well and hurriedly distracted Chopper as she didn't know what to say. Dr. San, look. There's a bookstore. Really? Can I go see? Of course. Go ahead. Robin giggled as she saw how excited Chopper was. At this moment, a masked man passed by Robin and muttered. CP9. Hearing this word, Robin froze up and was suddenly covered in sweat. 
Right behind her, Lucas also knew of this and stopped the masked man from walking. Hold it. Lucas and the masked man glared at each other while Robin was still frozen in place. Meanwhile, Chopper still had no clue what was happening and was simply excited about the bookstore. Robin. Lucas. I'll go in first okay? Go ahead Chopper. Don't run too far. Since Robin couldn't answer in her state, Lucas answered instead without removing his gaze on the masked man. With Chopper gone, Lucas's grip on the masked man tightened. It's okay, Lucas. Let him go. Robin felt that things might escalate so she stopped Lucas. Lucas looked at her for a second before removing his hand. The masked man looked at Lucas silently before leaving. Robin paused beside Lucas. Go back to the crew, they need you more than me. That's where you're wrong. Robin no longer said anything and left, leaving Lucas behind. Lucas clenched his fist hard as he hesitated whether he should follow or not. After this, Robin would be going with the CP9 and shoot Iceberg, the mayor of Water 7 and also one of the two disciples of Tom, thinking that he had the blueprints of the ancient weapon, Pluto. Due to this, the Straw Hats were framed as everyone believed they were the ones behind the attack. Going against the CP9 at this moment with his current identity would be problematic. Attacking them would suggest that I refuse the deal to become a Shichibukai. But he also can't just ignore them. It seems I need to contact Akiji and see if I can bargain about Robin instead. Once Lucas thought of this, he sighed and went away. If possible, he wanted to buy a small den den mushi and hand it to Nami but that the marines have a way to intercept messages, so that's a no-go. Anyway, it doesn't matter as he had already told Nami and the rest about his plan. Lucas looked around to see if he can find a Viva card but didn't find any. When reading the story of One Piece, Lucas has always been curious about the origins of the Viva cards. It was said that a Viva card is made from a person's fingernail, afterwards, it is made into paper which can be torn and handed to someone so they will know your direction at all times. But how the hell does a fingernail turn into a paper? How exactly does one get their own personalized Viva card? Thinking about this, Lucas can only rub his temples and stop thinking about it. In any case, he can't find any, so no use was wasting time here. What he should do now? Is to say goodbye. Hmm. Oh yeah, at this time, Usopp would get beaten and their money would be stolen right? Well, I guess I'll beat Frankie up a bit. Lucas changed direction and headed to the location of the Frankie's family headquarters. A corner in Water 7, Northeast Beach. Scrap Factory. Lucas looked at the weird house with a huge crescent moon on its roof and the name at the front door. Frankie House. Yep, this is the place. Since Lucas decided to destroy this place like in the original story, he decided to take a picture of it one last time. What? Anyway, Frankie will still join the Straw Hats, so he can show this to him when he gets back or something. Maybe. Well then, guess I'll go knock first. At this moment, inside the Frank house. Wow. Five hundred million. Five hundred million. What do you think, bro? It's amazing. You guys did very well. Frankie laughed as he still wore a weird mask. With this much money. We can buy the thing that we always wanted. However, before they could even celebrate, there was a sudden loud explosion at the front door, followed by a relaxed voice. Boom. Knock knock. Appearing at the front door, Lucas didn't bother opening his wings and simply controlled a huge water pillar and had it directed at the door. Damn it. Who's that? Who dares to attack the Frankies? Hmm, I'll say this nicely first. Hand over the money. Else, I'll have to schedule Aqua Laguna earlier for you guys. Aqua Laguna is basically a huge tsunami that will sink this island once every year so they should be familiar with it. However, Frankie obviously didn't believe he could do such a thing. Humph. You think we're afraid of you? We wouldn't hand over the 500 million. 500 million? It wasn't 200 million. Lucas raised a brow at that. Guess they got more gold than the original. 
And that huge golden pillar is still not even included as it was too heavy to transport to the exchange. Seeing Frankie about to attack, Lucas sighed. If you want to blame someone, blame Oda for drawing your headquarters right beside the sea. Leviathan. At first, a thick water pillar rose up from the sea behind the house, then, the tip of the pillar started to deform, turning into a dragon's head. This wasn't just a simple shaping of water. Inside this water dragon, multiple torrents were spinning inside. Roar. The noise from the water made it seem as if a dragon was roaring as it devours the house. In no time at all, everyone apart from Lucas, now holding the briefcase of their money, was on the ground, unconscious. Lucas didn't kill any of them and powered down the torrents at the last minute. This should be enough to teach them a lesson for beating Usopp. Lucas sat on the broken crescent moon and saw four figures appearing at the distance. Chopper, Zoro, Luffy, and Sanji. Ah! Lucas! You already defeated them. Luffy saw Lucas and laughed while waving his hands. Zoro smiled as well and removed his hands from his swords. Sanji pulled out a new cigarette and lit it up. Chopper sighed before laughing as well. Amazing. Lucas. You took them out all by yourself. However, Lucas was still expressionless. He tossed the briefcases to Luffy and the others before finally speaking. I've decided, Luffy. I. Quit. Hearing Lucas' words, everyone's faces changed. Only Zoro and Sanji were a bit calmer as they were prepared for this situation. Chopper and Luffy, on the other hand, were completely unprepared. Luffy was silent as he was looking at Lucas, seemingly trying to figure out why he made that decision. Chopper asked while shaking. What? What do you mean? You quit. Lucas? Weren't we? Friends? I'm leaving the crew, Chopper. Why? W.Y. do you need to leave? Is it something I did? Just tell us. Don't leave, Lucas. Lucas didn't change his expression, but inside, he still feels his heart being torn seeing Chopper cry like that. The world government had scouted me to fill in Crocodile's spot as a new Shichibukai. I know you wouldn't agree to it, so I'm leaving. Shichi. Bukai. At this moment, Luffy spoke up. Lucas looked at Luffy while still expressionless while Luffy glared at him. Is this what you really want? Tell me. Tell me you really want to leave. I don't know what you're expecting me to say. But if you want to hear it again, I'll say it again, Luffy. Lucas opened his wings and flew in front of Luffy. I. Quit. G.H. Luffy gritted his teeth hard. Lucas looked at him a bit more, before walking off. But Luffy isn't the type to simply give up. Wait. Lucas stopped. I'm the captain of this crew. I decide if you leave or not. You think you can stop me? Fight me. If I win, you're not leaving, Lucas. I challenge you to a duel. Lucas' eyes widened. He didn't think. That the fight between Luffy and Usopp in the original story had actually happened to him and Luffy. It wasn't only him that was surprised. Zoro and Sanji panicked as well, this wasn't supposed to happen. Oi. Luffy. Stop it. Luffy. There's no need to fight. Shut up. This is my decision. Lucas gripped his fist so hard that it was about to bleed and his expression also hardened. After a while, he turned around and looked at Luffy in the eyes. Luffy. You look determined but. I hope you don't regret your decision later. This is what you want. Enough talk. Come. I'll beat some sense into you. Luffy began with a dash as his hands stretched backwards. Gomu Gomu no. Bazooka. Splash. Lucas looked at him with the same expression. His body was made of water, naturally, this kind of attack didn't affect him one bit. Luffy gritted his teeth. Gomu Gomu no Gatling. Numerous fists hit Lucas but the result was the same. Still, Luffy didn't give up. 
His leg stretched upwards. Goma Goma no stamp. Boom. Dust exploded everywhere and covered the two of them. By the time the dust settled, Luffy was heavily breathing while Lucas was still standing with the same expression. Lucas clenched his fist as it turned into water. Water fist. This was the same as Ace's fire fist, only, Lucas uses water instead. Luffy was thrown all the way to the debris of the Frank house. When Lucas saw that he was about to stand up, he flew towards him and sent another water fist to him. Boost water fist. Boom. This time, Luffy flew past the debris and landed on the sea. Zoro and the others panicked and quickly ran to save Luffy but stopped when they saw a water bubble lift Luffy up and land him on the ground in front of Lucas. Seeing Luffy gasp for breath with difficulty, Lucas wavered and kneeled down. Stupid. There's no way, that you'd win. Lucas laughed bitterly as he thought how their roles had reversed from Luffy's fight with Usopp in the original story. After a while, he stood up and turned around. Remember this, Luffy. If you can't master the power to deal with Logia users, you will never be the Pirate King. Lucas picked up the straw hat that fell off from their fight and looked at it for a moment before tossing it back to Luffy. Goodbye. Luffy. Thank you for picking me up. Chopper dashed towards Luffy immediately to treat him. When Lucas walked past Zoro and Sanji, he paused. Take care of them. Is it worth it? All this? It doesn't matter if it's worth it or not there's something you should know as well. Someone took Robin. They're from the government so I can't interfere. Be careful. These guys are strong. But I believe you all can defeat them. Got it. As he said this, Lucas no longer delayed and walked away. Without turning back. Chapter 25 As Lucas walked away, streams of tears started to flow uncontrollably from his eyes. On the ground, Luffy's face was covered with the straw hat, yet from the side, one can see tears flowing down to his cheeks. Damn it! Going merry! On the ship, Zoro and Sanji carried Luffy back on the deck along with Chopper who still can't stop crying. Seeing Luffy's condition, Nami immediately panicked. She didn't think that of all people, Luffy would be the one so injured. Luffy! What happened? Usopp also saw Luffy and tried to stand up with difficulty despite his own injuries. Luffy! Did those Frankie's bastard do this to you? Luffy didn't answer and simply walked towards going Mary's head and sat there silently. Since Luffy wasn't going to answer, Sanji sighed a puff of smoke and explained. It was Lucas. Nami was shaken. She didn't think. That it would end up like this. Usopp was also shocked. But more so confused. Why? What on earth just happened? S. Sanji. You're kidding right? W. I. Would. Lucas do. He's our free. He's not our friend. Suddenly, Luffy shouted to interrupt Usopp. Nami shook again. She knew how much Lucas had sacrificed for their crew. If their friendship were to be. She was too afraid to think about it. How hurt would Lucas feel? L. Luffy. Don't say such things. Lucas, he. Shut up. Luffy shouted again. I don't need to hear the reason. This is his decision. And that doesn't change anything. Nami, Zoro, and Sanji looked at each other and sighed. All three of them knew why Lucas did this. But now that they can't tell it to the others, it was up to them to cooperate with the plan as best as they could. The next day. No one was able to sleep at all. Luffy just sat there the whole night, seemingly thinking of something. At this time, Nami shouted. Hey! Did you guys hear? That iceberg guy was shot last night. Isasen was? Luffy turned to ask, before finally standing up to leave maybe he just wanted a distraction after what just happened. I'll go take a look. Wait. Luffy, I'll come with you. Worried about Luffy, Nami took off as well. On the other hand, Sanji looked at Zoro who just sat there with his eyes closed. 
Something about what Lucas said bothers me. I'll go and look for Robin, you coming? No. I'll wait and see what happens next. Though confused, Sanji didn't bother asking him anymore and left as he was worried about what happened to Robin. Shift Station, North of Water 7 In the lighthouse that Luffy and the others had visited earlier. Chimney was playing around outside as the wind breeze felt cool. Kokoro is still chugging on her wine. It's Karak, the south wind. The waves are rougher as well. As she felt the wind, she understood the situation pretty well. The sea train. Is gonna have to stop tonight. Chimney. Gonbi. Get ready to go back to the island. Okay. Kokoro drank again and grinned. The Aqua Laguna. Is coming. Back in Water 7, the speakers throughout the island had started to relay an announcement regarding the Aqua Laguna in order to warn the civilians to prepare. Still, there were a lot of people still loitering about outside of Galila's headquarters as they were worried about what happened to Iceberg. Nami and Luffy were also nearby. Wow. So many people. We can't get into the shipyard either. We're gonna have to meet with Isasen eventually for the new ship. Nami also agreed with what Luffy said so she turned to ask the others. Hey, excuse me, do you know how to get to the headquarters by any chance? Hmm. Ah, uh, yeah. But it's useless. You have to go through the dock one door, but only selected reporters may enter. Everyone's here hoping to get any news firsthand. They're just so worried. As he said, a lot of the people here respected Iceberg as their mayor, as such, they feel uneasy about what happened last night. Since it was like that, the two of them decided to stay and wait as well. Soon, the people in front started cheering. When those from the back heard why, they also started to cheer. Hey! Iceberg San woke up. Yay! Really? Wow! Nami sighed in relief as well with the good news. They still needed Iceberg for their new ship after all. But then, another piece of news arrived. Breaking news. Iceberg San has discovered who the attackers are. Spread the word, and let's round up these criminals. We must not let them escape Water 7. So, who are these people who attacked Iceberg San? Pirates. The Straw Hat Pirates. Suddenly, the people around Nami and Luffy turned to them. They stared at each other in silence for a few moments. Before finally erupting. It's them. They're the ones who tried to kill Iceberg San. Get them. Naturally, both Luffy and Nami have no idea what was going on either. Faced with a horde of civilians, Luffy grabbed Nami and stretched his arm to swing away. He has some kind of devil fruit ability. Quickly tell the people from Galila. The Straw Hat Pirates are here. On the roof of a tall building on the opposite side of the Galila headquarters, Luffy landed Nami down. I'll need to talk to Isosin and straighten things out. Let me remind you that we're being chased. So find Iceberg's room first, then enter when no one. See you later. What? Luffy didn't bother with Nami anymore and stretched his arms to the headquarters building and shot towards the window. Nami just realized what he was up to and tried to stop him. Wait. Crash. Well, it was too late though, Luffy had already broken through the window of the headquarters. Naturally, everyone noticed him and started to give chase. Hearing all the commotion from the roof, Nami's palm touched her face in frustration. This idiot captain. Nami waited quietly while worrying about both Luffy and Lucas who she has no idea where is now. After a few minutes, Luffy returned to her side. Luffy. Were you able to talk with Iceberg? He really did see Robin. He said that she was the one who shot him. Hearing that, Nami was shocked and confused. But why would Robin do such a thing? Luffy held on to his straw hat and stood up. I wouldn't believe it. The events that happened next were the same as what happened in the original story. That night, Luffy and the others infiltrated the headquarters again when they saw that some masked people had started to show up. At the end, they had a fight with the members of CP9. And lost miserably. 
Rewinding time for a bit, while all this was happening, Lucas had found a hotel and sat on the bed with a heavy sigh. He laid there and stared at the ceiling for a while before picking up the Dendon mushy that Akiji gave him. After some hesitation, Lucas contacted Akiji. I agree. Arara, I know you'll agree. You sure made quite the spectacle last night. Well then. On one condition. I don't want the CP9 to keep bothering Robin. For a while, Akiji was silent. Finally, Lucas heard a sigh from the other side of the Den Den Mushy. What is it with Luffy? That you and that Robin go through such lengths to protect them? What do you mean? Lucas frowned and can't help but think if he had forgotten something. Nothing. Anyway, you don't seem to understand your situation. You're not the one making the deals here. Now that you've accepted, stand by and await further instructions. Toot. Seeing as the call had already disconnected, Lucas sighed. Bam. Angered at his own weakness, Lucas punched the wall beside him. Marines. World government. Just you wait. You will regret ever inviting me to become a Shichibukai. Lucas stayed in his room and simply meditated. When it was night time, someone knocked on the door. Come in. The door opened and blonde slim woman wearing thin glasses and a black dress. This person must be one of the CP9 members working undercover as Iceberg Secretary, Califa. Despite seeing a beauty, Lucas' expression was stone cold. During this time as a Shichibukai, he would probably never smile again. Califa looked at Lucas for a moment before speaking. You must be Lucas. Don't ask if you already know the answer. Let's go. W.H. Lucas was already pretty annoyed from this morning and couldn't be bothered with her. Anyway, if she's here, then his task should be to escort them out to Eni's lobby along with Robin. As for Califa, she glared at the cold man who just ignored her but didn't say anything and simply followed. I'm an assassin, who cares what this punk pirate thinks? Califa tried to convince herself as they walked. Soon, they met up with the other members of CP9. The man with the rectangle Usopp nose, Kaku. The huge guy with bull-like hairdo, Blueno. And finally, the man with a top hat and a pigeon on his shoulder. Rob Lucci. Besides them, there was Robin wearing a hooded robe. Lucas only glanced at her for a moment before looking somewhere else. Blueno was carrying two sacks with their heads out. Kaku was also carrying a smaller sack. These two are. Frankie and. Usopp. Chopper seems to be here as well. Why is Usopp here? Wasn't he only caught in the original story because he left the crew and was stuck with Frankie? But Usopp shouldn't have any reason to leave the crew now. So why is he with Frankie? Actually, why is Chopper even here as well? What Lucas didn't know was that after he had left, earlier today, Usopp and Chopper still haven't given up on Lucas. They walked towards the area where Luffy and Lucas fought to see if they can find some sort of clue about why Lucas suddenly turned like that. However, the two of them both forgot that Frankie was also there. He just woke up and was very angry. Once he saw Usopp and Chopper, he immediately captured them and dragged them to his secret base under the bridge to try and lure out Lucas. Afterward. Well, CP9 paid a visit after dealing with Luffy and Iceberg and captured all three of them. Frankie aside, why is there a need to bring two of the Straw Hats as well? Usopp heard the familiar voice. He looked around until his sights landed on Lucas. Instantly, his expression turned into one full of hate. You. I heard what you did to Luffy you bastard. Chopper was different, when he saw Lucas again, he cried happily. Lucas. You're here. Help us. Still. Lucas' face didn't change and was still stone cold. Lucci glanced at him calmly and said. Their insurance. So you don't think of double-crossing us. Right after he said that, Lucas' wings opened as she shot towards him in full speed. Lucci attempted to use Soro to dodge but it was as if Lucas also knew where he would dodge as he turned and caught Lucci anyway. His hand turned into water as he held Lucci up while choking him. 
the others also moved fast and tried to act. Kaku and Blueno both held Yusop and Chopper while pointing their fingers at the hearts, ready to use Shurgan at any moment. Of course, Lucas won't let them. Streams of water shot out from his wings and knocked off Kaku and Blueno before they could do anything. Then, the streams of water caught on to all CP9 members as he held them all up. Only Robin, Frankie, Usopp, and Chopper was spared. Once Lucas feels that any of them would attempt to activate their fruits, he would control the water to go further down their throats to stop them. Listen up, I don't like being threatened. Akiji is one thing, but none of you lot are capable of dealing with me. So don't act like you can. Finished saying his piece, he threw them all down and looked back to Usopp and Chopper. Get out. And tell Luffy not to follow. El Lucas. Out. Usopp and Chopper bit their lips before finally leaving. Once they were out of sight, Lucas looked back to the CP9 members. Any problem? No. Good, let's go. Seeing Lucas back, they all looked at each other before following. What the hell? What's up with this scary ability? None of them even got any fighting chance at all. And from what it looks like, he was also a Logia user. How can any of them defeat him without sea stone or hockey? Thinking about this, Luchi and the others can only sigh and follow. Blueno picked up Frankie again as they walked. Meanwhile, Califa's face blushed as a strange. New. Feeling seemed to sprout inside her when she was held up before. She has always been the one holding the whip and stepping on others, being on the receiving end feels. No no. Califa shook her head quickly to dispel the thought. It was too embarrassing. Robin watched Lucas back silently. It was unknown just what she was thinking. Before they rode the sea train, Lucas looked around and stretched his observation hockey. Sanji. Doesn't seem to be around. It seems more of the main story has really changed. Lucas became worried. Luffy. You better not be stupid and follow. Just leave this to me. No matter what. I'll get back Robin for you guys. Chapter 26 In the back streets of Water 7 The rain has become fiercer and the wind stronger as well. At the distance, one can see a towering wall made of water. Aqua Laguna was about to descend. After being blown away by the CP9, Luffy was now stuck in between two buildings and couldn't move. Nami had been desperately searching for him and it was only now that she realized where Luffy was. Luffy. You moron. What are you doing up there? Nami shouted as loud as she could, hoping that Luffy heard her despite the heavy rain. The civilians at the upper level couldn't help but get worried for Nami who was on the lower level, trying to reach out to Luffy. Look out. The waves are almost on top of you. They screamed and waved at Nami. Give it up already, pirate girl. Run away. Nami didn't pay them any attention and only focused on Luffy. Luffy, still stuck in between the two buildings, was able to hear Nami as he called out. Nyo. Nyamai. You behind me. NGG. Jeez, hey, please listen to me. I was flun, I dat pigeon guy. And, show I flew and, kin a got stuck in the ish convenant tea plash. His words were so hard to understand due to his cheeks both flattened by the buildings. Normally, maybe Nami would have laughed. But as she remembered Robin and Lucas who had left them. Tears started to flow from her eyes. Don't joke at a time like this. While you were screwing around, Robin's been taken away. For all of US, Robin. She's going to die for US. Luffy froze, finally understanding the graveness of the situation. Nami screamed into the heavy rain, her voice nearly hoarse. Robin sacrificed herself for us. She protected us from being attacked by the government. Lucas too. He's there with her right now to prevent any of the marine admirals from attacking us. Nami's tears mixed with the rain as it fell from her cheeks and got carried by the wind. Inside the sea train, both Robin and Lucas suddenly looked out the window, seemingly having felt something. 
Despite Luffy's predicament at the moment, if one could see his mouth they would see it turn into a smile. So, Robin. And Lucas. Are still. Yes. Thank goodness. While the two of them were talking, the huge wave had gotten even closer. Look. That wave. What is that? It's way bigger than usual. The civilians on the upper level become pale as they looked at the huge wave at the distance. Previously, they thought it was near them already due to its size. Only to realize, it was so massive it only appeared that way, it was still far away at that time. The wave this time. Was simply huge. Between the buildings, Luffy struggled with newfound strength after learning the truth about Robin and Lucas. Don't worry. I won't. Let Robin. Or Lucas. Die. The people started to panic as the waves got nearer. Even though they were already on the upper level. They were scared for those guys below. While everyone thought Luffy and the rest were goners, suddenly. Just before it reached Luffy and the rest, the waves. Stopped. Inside the sea train, Lucas grimaced, his hand shaking he gripped it from the sheer pressure of the wave he placed his hand to his side, away from the view of the CP9, trying to hide it. Luffy. If you're still stuck between those buildings. Now's the time to get out. Even Lucas wasn't confident on stopping such a huge wave. More so, something that was a bit further away from him. He only managed to stop it for three seconds until it started to fall once more. Still this was enough. Ahitch. Luffy actually. Forced the buildings apart through sheer force. The two massive buildings tore apart on both sides with him at the middle. Wah. He broke the city. Luffy still had both his hands on the two buildings as he looked at the huge wave that had stopped for a few seconds, Luffy grinned again. Shishishi. Let's go, Nami. Taking advantage of the delay, Luffy jumped and grabbed Nami as he stretched his hand to the upper level. On the other side, Zoro was similarly stuck inside a tall chimney. Chopper wasn't there with him to help like in the original story, but Sanji was. Before he was blown away, he had dropped on of his swords in the fight, which Sanji had taken along with him. Once he handed the sword to him, Zoro. Sliced the entire chimney. Ituryu. 36 point phoenix. Wah. What the hell are those guys? The people watching couldn't help but drop their jaws. One guy forced buildings apart, another sliced off such a tall chimney in the house beneath it. Zoro, just having been released, saw the towering wall of water in front of him and was shocked. Wah what is this? No time to explain Moss Head. Come on. The wave was almost upon them, naturally, Sanji didn't care about Zoro and simply grabbed onto his shirt and ran away. Crash. Luffy, Nami, Zoro, and Sanji finally made it to the stairs leading to the upper level just in time for the wave to crash down on the entire lower ground. Pieces of buildings and anything not tied down near the lower level were washed away. They didn't waste any time checking the scenery and ran up, fearing that another wave would crash down on them. Once they were on the upper level, only then did they lie down and gasp for breath. Man. That was crazy. How terrifying. So that was Aqua Laguna. No, were it like that every year, this island would have been long gone. It's abnormally strong this year. Kokoro said as she continued to drink her wine. Luffy saw her and greeted her. Ah. Monster Granny. You're here too. Of course, if I'd stayed at sea. I'd have drowned and become fish bait already. Ngaga Gaga. Pirate Nii Chan was so cool. Naya Naya. Chimney was laughing without a care in the world along with her cat actually a bunny. At the side, Luffy also noticed Zoro. Ah. Uh. Zoro, were you down there too? Ah. Uh. I. He got stuck in a chimney. Sanji cut in and answered for him, leading to the two of them fighting again. What was that curly brows? Isn't it true Ma's head? Meanwhile, Luffy was laughing his ass off. You got stuck in a chimney. Ahahahaha. Zoro, 
That's so stupid. You're funny. You weren't any better. You're all idiots. Nami got pissed again and pinched Luffy's cheeks. Finally, Luffy became serious once again. Where's Usopp and Chopper? Just as he asked, two figures appeared. Luffy. Oh I I. You guys are safe. Naturally, these two were Usopp and Chopper. The two were running towards them. After being reunited, the two of them started to explain what just happened. Finally, Lucas said. To not follow them. What's there to think about? Let's set sail and go after them. Alas, Luffy didn't really listen to Lucas at all and still wanted to follow. Since the captain has spoken, no one had objected. There's no other way. Right, let's go. Luffy and the crew started to run towards where going Mary was docked. Only to find that it was missing. Where's Mary? Don't tell me. It got washed off by that huge wave. Lend us a boat. We'll find Mary and sail to Annie's lobby. Are you kidding? Look at the weather. There's no way you can make it out. Everyone tried to dissuade Luffy and the rest as it was suicidal to go to Annie's lobby with this weather. Seeing as Luffy was about to force his way and steal a ship, Kokoro finally spoke. Enough. Follow me. I'll start the sea train for you. They were shocked and surprised, they didn't there was another. In the sea train. Lucas stood up from his seat and walked out of the cabin. Seeing him stand, Khalifa asked. Where are you going? Lucas didn't even so much as glanced at her and simply walked away. As he sees it, there's no reason for him to answer them. His job was simply to escort them to Eni's lobby and ensure they don't go off the rails. Why you? Khalifa was angered but couldn't even say anything as Lucas had already left the car. Having left the CP9, Lucas went through the train cars to the 6th where Frankie was kept. He stepped inside the 6th car to see government agents inside the car along with Frankie. Lucas spoke in a cold voice. Out. Now. The agents looked at each other but didn't leave. Since they decided to stay, Lucas waved his hand and threw them all out the water. W R. You can't. Lucas didn't bother with them and looked at Frankie. It's you. That traitor those guys spoke of. W what do you want? Frankie thought of cursing Lucas at first, but then remembered how badly he was beaten before. There was no need to waste any more words on him so Lucas simply hit him hard enough to knock him out. Once he was unconscious, Lucas observed his body with this observation hockey to look for a certain thing. After a while, Lucas' hand moved and took it out from one of Frankie's hidden compartments in his body. As for where? Well, some things are better left unsaid. Lucas looked at the stack of papers in his hand and took out his phone to take some pictures. Not of Frankie of course, but on the papers on his hand. Pluton. Right. The thing in his hands right now. Is the blueprint for one of the ancient weapons, Pluton. Lucas doesn't know whether this thing will be of use in the future, but it was better to get a backup of it since Frankie was going to burn the papers. After taking the photos, Lucas placed it in a folder named Hades and encrypted it as well as hid it. Once he was done, Lucas placed it back inside Frankie and looked towards the back. Suddenly, his body turned into water as he moved out of the window and stood on top of the sea train. A huge wave. By this time. That Luffy probably wouldn't give up. Kokoro would also lend that prototype sea train to them. As he thought, Luffy and the rest were indeed inside the Rocket Man train and is headed straight towards a huge wave. The Frankie's family and Galila shipwrights were with them at the moment and tried to fire their cannons on the wave to make a hole but it didn't do anything. This wave was simply too thick. Then, Luffy and Zoro both stood on top of the train and started making a move. How much is 2 times 108? 216. What? But that's so hard to pronounce. Then just change it. Luffy and Zoro talked casually as they stared at the wave. Then 300. Fine. 
Having both agreed, numerous hands appeared around Luffy while Zoro had both his swords over his head while biting another sword in his mouth. Gomu Gomu no. 300 point. Siege cannon. On the sea train ahead of them, Lucas was similarly concentrating. Though he knows that Luffy and Zoro could get past that wave from the original comics, there was no harm in making sure. Open. Suddenly, a huge hole appeared in the middle of the giant wave, followed but the wave splitting in half, completely dodging the rocket man train. We. We made it through. Both Luffy and Zoro stared at the distance. Despite not seeing Lucas. Both of them knew. He's still trying to protect them. Luffy and Zoro laughed. Shishishi. Heh, did that guy even leave at all? Lucas sighed and retracted his observation hockey. His powers have been growing stronger so fast lately. And this weather is actually amplifying it by quite a lot. If only Akiji's ability doesn't counter him so much. Shaking his head, Lucas went back inside the train and grabbed Frankie as he walked back to the second car where the CP9 members were. Lucas tossed Frankie to the floor and sat again. Those people guarding this guy are all useless. I threw them out the sea. Well, this should be enough to explain my disappearance. Lucas sighed in his heart as he looked out the window. Since Luffy and the rest still decided to follow despite his warnings. It seems I need to change my plans a bit. Lucas used this opportunity in the train to calmly plan out his thoughts and what would happen next. Baited by, names are the bane of my existence. Chapter 27 Eni's Lobby Lucas looked at the island in front of him and the sky above it. Right now was supposed to be night time. Yet the area surrounding Eni's lobby was actually still daytime. So this is the so-called nightless island. Eni's lobby. Just what sort of physics is this? If the sun is already down, how come it's still daytime on that one spot? As Lucas and the rest of the CP9 had alighted from the sea train, they were greeted by marine soldiers. Nice work on the mission. CP9 has arrived. Shichibukai, Lucas has arrived. Take the criminals out. Luchi led the CP9 out, followed by Lucas who now wore the white coat that Luchi originally had. His reason being that it annoys him that Luchi was wearing it so he took it from him. Behind Lucas, Robin and Frankie followed. Though Robin wasn't too restricted, only a handcuff on her hands, Frankie had a huge chain around him. When a marine soldier took the chains to drag Frankie away, Frankie got pissed and bit the head of the marine. Oh whoa! How dare you treat me like this! I oughta teach you a lesson. Jaya! Watch out! He bites! Lucas only rolled his eyes at him and no longer bothered about it. Anyway, this is the marine's problem, not his. On the sides, some of the marines were discussing amongst themselves. The CP9 sure is great. They solved the government's 20-year-long problem, just like that. This new Shichibukai seems powerful too. I heard Admiral Akiji personally recruited him. Nico Robin. What? A beauty. When Lucas heard the last one, his face twitched and he shot a murderous glare at the marine soldier who said it. Damn it. Is Robin someone you lot can stare at? Eek. Seeing the angry glare of Lucas, the surrounding marines instantly looked the other way. Robin also saw this little action of Lucas and revealed a small smile which only lasted for a second before becoming expressionless once again. As they neared the huge gate of Eni's lobby, the doors slowly opened for them. As soon as they passed through the gate, Frankie shouted in surprise. Wow! I've never seen anything like this before. This is... A hole. In the middle of the ocean. What's up with this island? Just as Frankie had said. There was indeed a large hole surrounding the island of Eni's lobby. Lucas took a look beneath and only saw pitch black darkness. Just how far deep down is this hole? And why is there such a thing? After looking at it for a while, Lewis turned to look at the shadow behind Eni's lobby. A gate that seemed to stretch to the heavens. The Gate of Justice. Looking at the gate, Lucas wondered. 
just what kind of ship were these gates made for? As Lucas and the CP-9 went inside the main island in the middle, Luffy and the others also just arrived near the island and currently discussing their plan. Once everyone had agreed, the Frankie's family and Galila shipwrights got ready. Let's stick to the plan. We'll go in first. The plan was for their group to go in first to open the main gate and make way for Rocket Man and charge through to Eni's lobby. At this moment, Chopper saw that Luffy had disappeared so he asked. Un, where's Luffy? Huh? He was here a second ago. Nami looked at the spot beside her and was confused. Suddenly, she felt a bad premonition. Sure enough, her premonition was correct. Ah. It's Straw Hat. Everyone looked outside in a hurry and saw Luffy on the fence around the island already. What's his problem? He just left on his own. Did he even listen to the battle plan? Both the Frankie's family and Galila shipwrights were dumbfounded. On the other hand, the Straw Hat pirates acted like this was normal. It's useless. I thought he said, I got it, earlier. To wait five minutes isn't possible for him. That's true. Still, there was no point arguing about it now, so they decided to make their move. They would still need to complete their plan. Let's go. Follow Straw Hat's lead. While Luffy storms in and the rest of the Frankie's family and Galila shipwrights follow, the bodies started to pile up. Span Dam is currently frantically asking for the report on the situation. What's going on? Sir. The two giant gatekeepers are currently holding them off at the front gate. I don't believe there will be any problem. I see, have you captured Straw Hat yet? Span Dam sighed and thought that at least only Luffy has gotten in at the moment so he asked about his situation as well. Sir. Air. The estimate is. About four hundred. Four hundred. What are you talking about? It's the damage report, sir. Hearing that, Span Dam panicked. Ah. Damage report. Are you saying four hundred soldiers are down? Ah. No, sorry, I'd like to correct that. The agent reporting to Span Dam saw Luffy's fight and thought that another hundred or so was just knocked out so he needed to correct his report. Span Dam was relieved and scolded him. Of course. There is only one of him. Our soldiers aren't trash. We can't have that many down. If there is damage, report it correctly. Yes. It's 5 HNN. He was originally going to say 500 but then a marine that Luffy was fighting got blown away on his direction and knocked him out as well. On the other end of the call, Span Dam scolded the agent again. Five. Idiot. How could you mistake five for four hundred people? Span Dam sighed and no longer bothered with Luffy. So this straw hat Luffy is just running around the island, not fighting anyone. Of course, no one would face that many soldiers unless they were brain dead. It's only a matter of time now. Inside Rocket Man. Kokoro looked at the time and saw that it's been five minutes since Luffy and the others went in. It was time to begin the next phase of their plan. Okay, it's been five minutes. The two gates should be open now. We'll go one at a time. Samurai man, we'll leave the iron railing to you. Leave it to me. Sitting on top of the train, Zoro held on to one of his swords and was ready to cut. Inside Eni's lobby. Lucas looked at the time on his phone and judged that Luffy and the others should be here already. When the time comes. Lucas stared at the man sitting on the desk in front of him who wore a strange metal mask on his face. This annoying guy. Spandam. I hope you play along. If not. Don't blame me. Spandam didn't notice the look Lucas gave him and only greeted the others. Ah. You're back. Luchi, Kaku, Blueno, Califa. That's sexual harassment. By just saying your name. Seeing the expressions on the CP9, Lucas can tell that they also didn't like this chief of theirs much. Spandam looked at Lucas who had followed behind Luchi. So this is the new Shichibukai that Akiji mentioned. Lucas didn't speak and only coldly stared at him as if he was already a dead man. 
Span Dam got the chills when he saw his stare. Since the situation might escalate, Lucci didn't waste any more time and reported. Wanted for assaulting government agents in Water 7, eight years ago. The criminal, Cuddy Flam, now known as Frankie. Twenty years ago, wanted for attacking marine ships in O'Hara, West Blue. The criminal, Nico Robin. Both criminals have been escorted here. They're waiting just outside. After Lucci reported, the three members of the CP9 that was sitting on the couch greeted them. Lucas looked at the three and remembered who they were. Jabra, the wolfman. He had a pointy sunglasses on his head and his long hair was tied like balls behind him. Komodori, this guy's hair is really long and he looked like one of those kabuki things from Japan. Finally, there's Fukuru. He had a zipper for his mouth which he can open and close like a normal zipper. Long time no see, Luchi. Looks like that flat mug of yours hasn't changed much. Same goes for your stupid looks, Jabra. Kaku sighed seeing as Luchi and Jabra started to bicker again. Settle down, you two. We haven't been together in a very long time. Yoyoi. Don't fight, you two. It's been five years. Show some affection. Komodori added. Fukuru raised his hat to unzip his mouth when all of a sudden, Califa kicks him. Right after Califa, Bueno also gave him a punch, then Kaku, then Luchi. Seeing as Fukuru was nearing himself, Lucas knew their intentions but decided not to play along. He only stepped to the side and let Fukuru crash to the door. Once they were done, Califa spoke. Couldn't keep your mouth shut could you, Fukuru? Rokushiki Ryuji. T-Ways. This was a unique ability of Fukuru. He could judge the strength of a person once he's hit. If a typical armed guardsman is. Considered to have ten, Dariki, dot. Let's see, let's see. Then your strengths are. Califa at 630 Dariki. Blueno at 820 Dariki. Kaku. 2200 Dariki. Luchi. 4000 Dariki. 4000 Dariki. Hey, are you kidding? I've never heard of such a high number. Jabra was shocked. He always had some kind of rivalry with Luchi, now hearing that his strength is that much. He didn't like it. It's true. Everyone's gotten stronger. I've already measured Jabra and Komodori's strength. So everyone's ranked accordingly. Rob Luchi, 4000 Dariki. Kaku, 2200 Dariki. Jabra, 2180 Dariki. Blueno, 820 Dariki. Komodori, 810 Dariki. Fukuru, 800 Dariki. Califa, 630 Dariki. Seeing everyone's rank, Jabra got pissed again. I don't believe this. Forget about Luchi for a moment, you're saying I scored lower than Kaku as well. Kaku's gotten stronger too. Still pissed, but knowing that Fukuru's judgment is always correct, Jabra turned to Kaku instead. Damn you. Don't try to rub it in. All that T-Ways measures. Is your physical power. When we fight for real, I'll also use my devil fruit power. Then I'll definitely surpass you. Say whatever you like, I'm not interested either way. Kaku only rolled his eyes and didn't pay him much attention. Luchi agreed as well. That's right. You shouldn't bother with the barkings of a mad dog. Who are you calling a mad dog, Luchi? You wild cat. Lucas looked at these cat and dog and can't help but notice how similar they are to Zoro and Sanji. Only, in this case, Luchi is actually stronger than Jabra by a large margin. Zoro and Sanji had about equal in power. Lucas saw that the two had began to transform into a leopard and wolf, he decided to intervene. Bam! Two water pillars crashed onto Luchi and Jabra. They tried to escape with Soro but with Lucas' observation hockey, it was useless. Soon, a repeat of what happened in Water 7 was seen again. But this time, Luchi seemed unable to accept defeat so easily. Especially when he saw that Lucas had not participated in the Dariki assessment earlier, he had become even more confident. Rankyaku. 
His feet blurred and created a wind blade that shot towards Lucas. Lucas didn't even bother to dodge it as it simply went through him. These kinds of attacks are useless to Logia users. Luchi changed tactics immediately and used Rankyaku on the water pillar binding him instead. Splash. Once freed, he charged towards Lucas once again and pointed a finger towards him. Lucas saw his finger turn black and knew that his suspicions were correct. Luchi. Really does no hockey. But. This is still useless. Lucas isn't the same as before. Although he lost to Akiji, it doesn't mean that he was any weaker at all. Sure gone. The instant Luchi's finger neared Lucas, a hole appeared on his chest. However. Lucas' face didn't change at all. There wasn't the slightest hint that he was in pain. Luchi frowned and attacked Lucas once again with the same move. The same thing happened. Holes keep appearing on Lucas' body as he was still unaffected by Luchi's attacks. How? Haki should be able to hit you. Lucas coldly looked at Luchi. If Katakuri can do it, there's no reason why Lucas can't dodge the hockey attacks with his observation hockey's foresight as well. There is more than just armament hockey. Don't think that just because you know this little move, you can have the confidence to beat me. Lucas' arm started to rotate at high speeds, creating a spinning water current on his arm. He slammed his arm to Luchi who attempted to dodge with Soru but for some reason, Lucas was still behind him. The attack connected and Luchi flew to the wall, causing cracks to appear. Lucas looked at the other members of CP9 who were ready to attack. He closed his eyes and remembered the feeling of when he was fighting Akiji. Burn. First degree. Heat man. Shush. Lucas' body had a hint of red as sizzling noise came from his body, creating steam around him. The CP9 members were confused by the sudden amount of steam filling up the room, only to hear Lucas' voice. Do you know? Steam is still water in its gas form. Damn. Don't breathe it in. Don't worry, I wouldn't kill any of you just yet. Lucas knew what they were all thinking so he reassured them. Still, this doesn't mean that he wouldn't hurt them. Heat wave. Hot air exploded with Lucas at the center, causing everyone to be blown off to the walls like Luchi. The windows shattered and the doors were blown open from the blast and Marines started to notice the commotion. Robin and Frankie were standing behind the door and were shocked. What just happened? Why did they feel such a hot air when the doors opened? And? Why is everyone apart from Lucas knocked out? Seeing the situation, the Marines pointed their guns towards Lucas. Lucas didn't bother looking at them and simply waved his hands and shot high-pressured water bullets to incapacitate them. Suddenly, the Den Den Mushi from Spandam's desk spoke up. Sir. This is the main island defense. Spandam sir, please respond. It's not getting through. Did he leave the receiver off the hook again? No way. That's such a beginner's mistake. Hearing their discussion through the other end, Lucas felt that this should be regarding Luffy so he picked it up instead. Of course, he didn't forget to step on Spandam's face on his way. This is Lucas speaking, the chief is currently sleeping. What's up? S sleeping. At such a time. Stop wasting time. What's the report? A ah. Uh. Yes sir. Straw Hat Luffy has defeated half of our people. We request for immediate backup. This man. Can't be stopped. Lucas nodded. Un, keep up the good work. Eh. Kacha. Robin and Frankie's jaws dropped. What the hell? Just what is going on? Chapter 28 Eni's Lobby, Main Gate At this moment, the Rocket Man train has started its charged on Eni's Lobby. A sea train. What's going on? It's charging right at us. Are they trying to ram their way onto the island? There's no way it can get past the fence. Several marines that were injured from the earlier fight with the Frankie's family and Galila members were shocked to see a sea train with a pointed head that looked like a shark heading towards them. Standing on top of the train were Zoro and the frog Yokozuna. 
Zoro ignored the panicking marines and saw that the gate had been closed. He shouted. Hey, Granny. Hmm. What? Kokoro stuck out her head from the driver's seat and saw the situation as well. She announced to everyone inside with the intercom. Everyone, there's a change of plan. Hang on to something tightly. Eh. Confused, Sanji stuck out his head as well out the window to look for Zoro. Hey. Stupid swordsman. What's the problem? They closed the main gate. Surprised, Sanji turned to look at the gate at the distance and indeed saw that it has been closed. Hearing this, Nami, Chopper, and Usopp started to panic. Turn. Turn. Kokoro-san. Ah. What should we do? Oh no. We're gonna crash. However, Zoro was still as calm as ever. Don't worry, there's a way. He pointed at the fence and commanded. Push down the fence, frog. Jero. Bam. The steel fence was actually bent. Using this fence that now looked like a ramp, the sea train rocket man. Flew. No way. Going up the fence at this speed. Wah. Even Kokoro was frightened. On the ground, the marines watching the scene had their jaws drop at the unbelievable sight. No way. The sea train is flying. Inside the train, as expected, everyone was panicking even harder now. Oa. Oh, uh. We're all gonna die. Eh. We're going to die. Nami Swan. Push to my protective embrace. Idiot. Isn't there a huge pit behind that gate? Zoro. Did you consider how we're going to land? Zoro was as serious as ever. His arms crossed to his chest as he stood there calmly like everything was going just as he planned. Leave it to. Luck. Jero. Back inside Spandam's office, Lucas had just confirmed that Luffy and the rest had finally arrived. He was about to talk to Robin and Frankie when something beneath his foot spoke. D damn. You. Ah, uh, I forgot you were there. You're stepping on me. How can you forget? Lucas shrugged and kicked him away. G.H. You bastard. Wait till Akiji hears about this. The deal is off. Prepare to be hunted and killed by an admiral you bastard. Spandam somehow rolled away, took the Denden Mushy, and stood up despite his injuries. What a cockroach this guy is. Lucas looked at him calmly and made an expression as if he had just remembered something. Oh, right. That. Ha. Huh. It's too late to regret it now. Spandam immediately contacted Akiji to report while Lucas was simply waiting for him. The call connected and Akiji's voice could be heard from the other end. What's up? Akiji. The Shichibukai you recruited, Lucas, just turned against us. Spandam was about to further explain when a shadow loomed over him. He looked up and saw that Lucas was already in front of him. He panicked and was about to run away but Lucas still managed to grab a hold of him and took the Denden Mushy. This is Lucas. What have you done? Lucas' mouth turned to a cold smile. Akiji, how about we make a bet? Bet? That's right. If you win, not only will I fully listen to you, I wouldn't even mind if you give me a slave collar or put a brand on me. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Akiji fell silent. And if you win? If I win, the CP9 is disbanded, and you give me Water 7. In the future, Water 7 will be my exclusive territory. A neutral territory. No pirates are allowed to plunder or kill. And no marines allowed to make any arrests. Not even if the fleet admiral comes. At first, Lucas wanted to secretly help Robin get free, but with Luffy and the rest arriving here, he thought it would be best to change it. Plus, this will be beneficial for Luffy and the others as well. On the other end, Akiji understood what Lucas was trying to do. So in other words, as long as Luffy and his crew stay in Water 7, they are off limits. Is that correct? Well, certainly, if they don't ever leave, then that would be for the best. So you agree then? 
Lucas didn't bother correcting Akiji. He knows that Luffy would still leave after the new ship has been made. He just wanted them to have time to relax while the ship is being made and not rush things. The new ship will be big after all. It will take some time to make. It wouldn't be good if any marines were to cause trouble for them during the process. Though he knows that Iceberg can also help, it was still better to get extra assurance. Besides, he still has other plans for this island. What if we refuse? The smile on Lucas' face disappeared as he let out his murderous intent. Though Akiji wouldn't be able to feel it, everyone in the room felt it. Spandam started shaking and even Luchi grimaced. If you don't make this bet. Or if you change the rules in any way. I am going to sink this place down in the bottomless abyss. By the time you get here, I would be long gone. I wouldn't care about the consequences anymore. I'll even lift up Impel down and sink Marine Ford if I have to. And I will reach the top of the red line and start killing my way to the world nobles' homes. Do not forget, I have with me the person who holds the blueprints of Pluton and the person who can decipher it. For a while, the room went quiet. Even on Akiji's side, there were no sounds as well. Finally, someone with a different voice spoke. What's the bet about? This voice. Is it Sengoku? Heh, well, the bet is simple. Lucas mused with the fact that he's dealing with the fleet admiral himself as he explained the rules. There are two teams in this battle. The blue team, which are the CP9 members, marines, and the government agents on this island. And then the red team, which are the straw hat pirates and his gang of troublemakers. The blue team will be delivering the payload to the gates of justice. Once the payload reaches the destination in one piece and passes through, it will be considered as the blue team's win. On the other hand, if the red team snatches the payload and leaves the island, the red team wins. It can also be the win of one team if they manage to beat everyone on the other team. Isn't it simple? Naturally, I wouldn't be participating myself. You can have someone watch me to verify this. If you caught me helping one side, you can consider this as my loss. Sengoku frowned. No matter how he sees it, if Lucas won't be joining the fight, then it would definitely be the blue team's win. So. Just what is Lucas planning? Surely he wouldn't be betting on picking the blue team to win. Lucas knew what Sengoku was thinking so he reassured him. Oh, I'll be betting for the red team to win of course. Fine. What's the payload? Naturally, it would the reason why this whole thing started. The two keys who can revive the ancient weapon, Pluton. The payload that the blue team needs to deliver to the gates of justice are. Nico Robin, and Frankie. Everyone was shocked. They all thought that Lucas had planned for the two to join the red team and have some object to be the payload. Actually, Lucas thought the same at first but decided not to. Only this way. Will Luffy and the others' powers will grow. Luffy is the strongest. When there is someone he has to protect. Both Robin and Frankie were looking at Lucas in confusion. Only after a while did Robin seem to have thought of something inside. She naturally knows Luffy's nature as well. Since this was the case. I agree. Hearing that Robin agreed to be the payload, everyone turned to look at her. But I will make this clear. If I see a chance, I am escaping and joining the red team myself. Heh, yeah, if you can escape, then the blue team isn't worth much. Luchi and the other CP9 members were angered. They suddenly felt that this may not be as easy as it seems. Since Robin had agreed, coupled with what she said as well, Frankie also agreed. Well? Fleet Admiral Sengoku. Do you accept? All right. Hand the Denden Mushi to Luchi, I need to tell him something. Fine. Just so we're clear, if you were to kill the payload before the game finishes. I hope you have prepared yourselves for the consequences. Lucas no longer spoke and tossed the Denden Mushi to Luchi and went over to Robin and Frankie. The three of them went to a corner and talked in private. First of all. Robin saw Lucas stretch his hand on her head and was confused. A second later, she felt a sharp pain on her forehead. Ow. 
That's for starting this whole thing. Aren't you the same? I heard you made a deal with Akiji to prevent any admirals from chasing Luffy and the others directly. I'm different. I don't plan to die. Every time Lucas sees Robin, he had always had this feeling that she was going to sacrifice herself. And seeing her expression now, it seems he was right. She just tricked the government saying that she will help revive the ancient weapon when all along, she plans to kill herself. Lucas sighed and patted her head. Robin. It's not a sin to exist. Believe in Luffy. Believe in me. This world is better with you in it. I. Robin's heart suddenly faltered. She tried to say something but ultimately didn't know what to say. Is this what Nami felt? While Robin was still thinking about what she was feeling, Lucas had turned towards Frankie. Oi, you better not let anything happen to Robin. Otherwise, I'll kill you myself. Gadam it. What's with this difference in treatment? Frankie felt unresigned. But he knows this guy's powers is beyond him. He can only swallow his thoughts and grunt. Lucas thought for a while then patted Frankie on his shoulder. I may have beaten you up before. But I know you'll do the right thing in the end. It would still be best if Frankie burns the blueprints himself. If Lucas was the one to do it, everyone would start to question how he knew where it was, or why did he destroy it, or such troublesome things. Once everyone had finished their talks, the two sides talked once again. Right now, we can't afford to lose any firepower. Spandam will be watching over you. I hope you fulfill your end of the bargain. I swear. Good. Luchi, I'll leave the rest to you. Understood, sir. Kacha. Luchi didn't waste any time and started to give orders. I will be taking these two myself to the gates of justice. As for you all. Take care of the straw hat pirates. To Luchi, as long as Robin and Frankie don't escape, and with Lucas not participating. Then everything would be easy. As long as he himself guards over the two, then it's impossible for them to escape. And he can also allocate more people to deal with the straw hats. He has seen their strength. There is no way for them to win over the CP9. Lucas chuckled. Luchi, you think too little of Straw Hat Luffy. That man will one day become the Pirate King. Do you think he can't even beat someone like you? I already see what he can do. He's weak. Frankly, I don't understand why you used to work under him. Hey, don't you work for this weakling as well? Lucas pointed at the thing wearing a metal mask. That's different. Lucas shook his head and didn't bother commenting any further. Seeing as he wasn't going to get his answer, Luchi left while taking Robin and Frankie. Actually, he can just grab these two and run in his top speed to the gates of justice himself but. Something about what Lucas said bothered him. Can Luffy truly beat him? Luchi wanted to find out. Since this is the case. I'll walk to the gates instead. If that Luffy can't even reach here, then there was nothing to worry about. Even if he does reach here. I refuse to believe he can win. Luchi's eyes seemed to glow with murderous intent. Jabra saw Luchi giving orders to everyone and felt pissed off. But the fleet admiral had already given his orders, he can only bury his unwillingness and act as commanded. Back in the office, Lucas sat on Spandam's chair and relaxed his back. Spandam was annoyed seeing Lucas. Just earlier today, he was still an outstanding chief. And now. He was reduced to being a watchdog. He can't even command anyone anymore. Lucas saw how Spandam was looking at him so he sent him a glare. Spandam froze up and no longer looked. Using this opportunity, Lucas shot out a mass of water out the window. The water moved and picked up various clothes from the unconscious marines and agents. Eventually forming a shape of a man. A masked man with a hood and cape. Heh, I did say I wouldn't be participating directly. But only if you catch me. It's stupid of Sengoku to actually trust this work to Spandam of all people. Once Lucas made a water clone, he relaxed. With this, I should be able to help if things go wrong somewhere. After all, he had changed so much already. 
It would be bad if it had caused a butterfly effect and actually lead to Luffy's loss. It would be best if there aren't many changes before they reach the new world. Lucas had only read until the end of Whole Cake Arc when he was sent here so any future knowledge is useless. But right now, he can still make use of his knowledge as long as the overall plot doesn't change. Besides, he didn't want to really change too much before all the crew is gathered. There is still Brooke left. Outside the office, Blueno opened an air door and traveled to where Luffy was. No matter what, as long as they can take the captain's head, then this game is as good as over. Having arrived in front of Luffy who was now standing on the last gate, Luffy was surprised. Ah. You're the cow that was with the pigeon guy. Looks like our intelligence really messed up their information. Hey. What did you just do? That's so cool. Are you a magician? I figured the damage had to be more than five people but. Blueno ignored all of Luffy's nonsensical comments and spoke coldly. This is unheard of in the world government. A man that broke in all the way to the front steps of the government. How long do you plan on struggling? Luffy grinned. Until I die. And so. The game between the CP9 and the Straw Hatch has begun. Chapter 29 Luffy glared at Blueno in front of him and the building behind. Robin is in that building behind you, isn't she? Get out of my way, cow. It seems that all of you still haven't noticed. This sort of thing. Is a global scale grand offense. Though Blueno said that, Luffy didn't quite understand. After all, to him, the flag of the world government is just a flag. It wasn't the same as their own pirate flag. What are you talking about? In the oceans of this world, we boast influence in more than 170 affiliated countries. The gigantic organization known as the world government owns this island. When you invaded this island, it meant you decided to revolt against all of the affiliated countries. Blueno's tone was extremely grave. He was already pissed off that they can't do anything to Lucas, and now these bunch of kids show up and thinks they can defeat them. The government bears that dignity. You'd be marked criminals until all of you are caught. Then you'll probably be given cruel deaths. At most, there are ten of you. What a small amount of power. With Lucas not joining this fight. None of you stand a chance. Hearing Lucas' name pop up, Luffy stopped listening and started warming up. I just told you. To get out of the way. Whether or not I move, when you all entered the gates of Eni's lobby, all you did was seal your fate. Fighting is also useless against our Rokushiki. I think you could tell in the Galila mansion. The difference in our power. That's right. But, somehow, this time. Luffy's arm twisted backward as he dashed towards Blueno. I don't think I'm gonna lose. Tekai. Blueno sighed and casually performed Tekai. Luffy's expression became fiercer as he fully concentrated his power on his fist. Rifle. Gah. For a moment, Blueno's eyes whitened in shock as he vomited blood. He nearly fainted just now. What sort of power was this? When he fought Luffy back in the mansion. He clearly remembered that Luffy didn't have this much power. Seeing as his attack had caused damage, Luffy didn't waste any time and continued with his Gatling gun. Soru. Blueno dodged quickly. However, somehow, Luffy's eyes followed his movement and. With a twist, he sent a solid punch right at Blueno's chin. Bam. The wall crumbled behind Blueno as he laid there, still confused at what had just happened. Luffy held on to his straw hat and spoke. As for the ways of the world government, do whatever you want with them. We only came to take Robin and Lucas back. Blueno's face darkened. You fool. Forget Robin, if Lucas comes back to you lot. Then you will all truly be doomed. I don't care. Give my friends back. Inside the Tower of Justice, Luchi's room. Luchi had handed two devil fruits which Spandam had kept to Califa and Kaku. They can't afford to be careless and it will be better to raise everyone's strength for the upcoming battle. Be it against the Straw Hats. Or against Lucas. 
As long as they continue to power up, they wouldn't be forced into something like the situation earlier where one man can decide their life and death. Khalifa and Kaku looked at the fruits in front of them and hesitated. It's hard to think that this fruit comes from this world. I feel some strange power from it, like a gravitational force. It wasn't in my picture encyclopedia either. Kaku said. Well, that's normal. We can know the name of the fruit by the power it gives. But what kind of power we might get is completely up to luck. Khalifa also added. It must be a horrible life if you get some weird power. Plus, you become a hammer in water. But if this fruit can counter Lucas' ability. Kaku and Khalifa looked at each other. If their ability can somehow be of use to defeat Lucas. Then they won't need to play this stupid game. Luchi grinned. Regardless of the type of power, it all depends on how you use it. The chances of you weakening from it are very low. Besides, being a hammer isn't that much of an inconvenience. There are plenty of people who sail their entire life looking for a single devil fruit. By the door, Jabra spoke, clearly against the idea. Kaku. Khalifa. Don't do it. Nothing good will come of it. It tastes like shit, you know. Like shit. Jabra just doesn't want Kaku to power up. Envy and jealousy hurt a man's good name Yoyoi. Shut up. Think about it, you too. You could sell them for hundreds of millions. But one bite might mean a lifetime of problems, you know. Kaku and Khalifa didn't bother to listen to his nonsense as they both took a bite. Ichim. It would be fun. If it's a winner, I'll gladly welcome it. The instant they took a bite, their faces paled from the taste. Yuck. It really does taste awful. Still, the two of them managed to finish eating the whole fruit as otherwise, they wouldn't gain the power. After they were done, both of them panted, clearly still disgusted by the taste. H. Hey. Do something. What kind of power did you get? Ha. I don't think anything has changed. You'll realize the change in due time. This is the birth of more ability users. I'm looking forward to it. So get a hang of your powers at least. Depending on the situation, you might be in battle soon. Blueno. Couldn't wait around so he went ahead to the festival. Luchi smirked and went towards where he had the prisoners kept. It was time to move. Back in Spandam's office, Lucas stood up and watched from the window. He can see Blueno already fighting with Luffy. It seems that despite Blueno using Soru, Luffy still manages to dodge properly. Huh, did he awaken observation hockey already? No, it's close, but this isn't that yet. I guess I sped up his improvement with those games that I had him play. Lucas chuckled in his mind. Now, if only he knows how to train in armament hockey as well. No matter. Once he's a Shichibukai, there will bound to be records of it that he can access or people he can ask. Since he's going to be a Shichibukai anyway, might as well squeeze every advantage he can get. Suddenly, both Blueno and Luffy seem to be in a standstill. No one can beat the other and their strength seem to be equal. At this moment, Luffy bent down and held his knees as he pushed downwards. His legs started to contract up and down. It's finally, the inspiration he got that created his heatman mode. Luffy spoke. I have Nakamas who are not strong. But I still want them to be with me. So, I have to be stronger than anybody else. Or I'll lose them all. How foolish, you think you can surpass even Lucas. I have to. Otherwise, he'll keep on protecting us and sacrificing himself. I've thought of a way to fight with all my might. So I wouldn't lose anybody. So I won't ever have to lose anybody. Suddenly, steam started to appear from his body. Blueno looked shocked. This move was similar to what Lucas did earlier. But how? Luffy wasn't made of water like Lucas. You wouldn't be able to follow me anymore. What? All of my techniques will evolve one step. Gear. Second. What followed next was Gomu Gomu no. Jet Pistol. 
Blueno didn't even have time to use Soru. He was hit and thrown to the back as he spurted blood from his mouth. By the time he looked up. He's no longer able to see Luffy. Blueno looked around but just as he did. Luffy sent another fist towards him. Jet stamp. Gah. While Blueno is being hit continuously, a scary thought appeared in his mind. No way. There's no doubt. That guy. Surely. Straw Hat Luffy had learned how to use Soru. And just by watching him do it. This. This guy. He remembered Luca's confidence in Luffy and his face darkened. It can't be. That this Luffy is really bound to get even stronger than that monster. Even Lucas isn't able to learn how to move with Soru. If he continues to fight with Luffy. Who knows what other techniques will be stolen from him. Feeling a brush of wind from behind, Blueno no longer thought of anything and quickly used his air door to escape. Luffy stood there and looked around. He disappeared. Suddenly, another air door appeared right above him as both of Blueno's arms were ready to touch Luffy and use his door door fruit. However, Luffy was still calm and used Soru to escape quickly. When you moved so fast, as if you disappeared, I saw you kick the ground more than ten times in a moment before you moved. I got the hang of it and I'm so glad to know that there's a way to move like that. Lucas, who was observing the fight and using his observation hockey to listen in, faltered. Damn it, kicking the ground more than ten times. How is that something you can easily do? Truth is, Lucas also wanted to be able to use Soru as it is convenient but doing it is harder than it sounds. He wasn't like Luffy who had a huge battle potential at all. Most of Lucas' battle attacks rely too much on his ability only observation hockey could be said to be partially his own ability. I guess I'll train on it in my time as a Shichibukai. Having thought that, Lucas stopped thinking about it and continued to watch. Right now, it seems that Luffy's about to use his strongest attack against Blueno's strongest defense. Tekai. Go. Jet Bazooka. Blueno staggered a few steps back as he continued to glare at Luffy. Seeing as Blueno was still standing, Luffy sighed and bit on his thumb. You really are tough. Then, I'll show you something even more interesting. Watch this. Gear. Just as he was about to make his next move, Blueno's body swayed to the side. And fell. It seems. Blueno was no longer able to fight. That's one down. Then, he saw Luffy stand on top of one of the pillars and breathe deeply. Rubian. Lucas. I've come for you too. Oh this adorable idiot captain. Good thing that he somewhat knew what he was about to do and had his camera ready. On, when I go back someday, I'll show this to Luffy. At that time, I'm sure it would be funny. Lucas smiled. However, he can't return to them just yet. There are still things he needed to do. Hearing the shout as well, Spandam ran over to the window and looked. Is that? Blueno. He defeated Blueno. What the hell is Luchi and the others doing? Someone. Tell Luchi and the others to stop playing around and deal with the straw hats. Why yes sir. The marine station nearby saluted and ran out. Actually, he didn't have to give such an order, what with how loud Luffy was, Luchi and the others had already heard him and planned to move. Using Soru and Jeppo. The CP9 jumped out the window and headed to the balcony above. Luchi was holding on to Robin while Fukuru had Frankie. Seeing the CP9, Spandam laughed. Wahahaha. Glad you're all here, CP9. Oh. Our enemy is just Straw Hat himself. Yuyu. Even if he's alone, he came this far. And that's praiseworthy. Right, Blueno got owned. Jayahaha. What an idiot. I guess he's lost his touch. After being a bar owner for five years. Even if he lost his touch, would he lose that easily? He lost. All the remaining six of the CP9 had arrived. Lucas' eyes narrowed. It seems he still underestimated Luchi's arrogance. 
They actually took the time to get back here instead of going to the gates of justice earlier. Well, there's also that the envoy ship is still not there yet, so it's useless but. Anyway, let's see how this goes. So far, there isn't too much change yet other than Frankie is still tied up. Suddenly, the floor behind Luffy broke and three figures appeared. Chopper. Nami. And Zoro. Then, one more person broke the floor. Sanji. And then. Usopp came in flying. Looking at these bunch still at their own pace despite facing the world government is really. Lucas smiled wryly but didn't reveal himself yet. Luffy shouted. I beg of you, Robin. I don't care what you want. Whether you choose to live or die. But whatever you decide. Say it while you're with us. That's right, Robin Chan. Robin, come back. Seeing all six of them standing on the pillars as they faced against the world government, Robin's heart warmed. Now, leave everything to us. Chapter 30 Seeing so many pirates reach up to this point, Spandam was angered. You take oh pirates. Do you realize that no matter how brave you are, nothing would ever change? We have the full strength of an assassin group, CP9. We have the heavy gates of justice that human power cannot open. Moreover, I now have the authority to use this golden Denden mushy to trigger the buster call. The buster call. Robin's face paled as she heard this name and all sorts of memories started to resurface from her mind. As if to add salt to the wound, Spandam didn't shut up. That's right. Exactly. Twenty years ago. It's the power that obliterated your hometown, Nico Robin. The word O'Hara disappeared from the following year's map, didn't it? Lucas started to get pissed. This piece of trash doesn't know when to shut up. This guy is easily one of the most hated characters in One Piece. Thinking of this, intense killing intent let out from Lucas. One day. I'll find the time to kill this bastard. Spandam suddenly felt chills down his spine and hurriedly looked to where Lucas was. As soon as he saw his eyes, a deep fear emerged from within him. Hi. In his fear, Spandam slipped and nearly fell off the balcony. Fortunately. Or not, Kaku had quickly grabbed him and saved him from falling into the deep abyss beneath. Robin shot a grateful look at Lucas and turned back to Spandam. If you ask for the buster call now. You'll be blown up too. Along with Eni's lobby. D don't be silly. How could we be blown up by our own allies attack? What are you talking about? Twenty years ago. Just one attack took everything from me. As well as ruining the lives of many people. That is the buster call. Still, Spandam didn't believe her. Agitated, he pointed at the flag right above the Eni's lobby. The flag that bears the mark of the world government. Look at that symbol. That mark represents the unity of over 170 nations in the four seas and the Grand Line. This is the world. Luffy looked at the flag and nodded. I understand. Usopp. Shoot. That flag. Roger. This time, Usopp didn't wear the mask of Sogeking. But this only made his resolve and courage strengthen than before. Lucas was actually a bit worried that Usopp may not shoot the flag and had his water clone on standby and make an appearance if necessary. But seeing Usopp aim his kabuto, he knew that there was no need for him to worry. New weapon, the Great Pachinko. Also known as kabuto. Carefully observe its power. Usopp drew the string to the back and aimed. Ultimate. Firebird Star. Shriek. A blazing form of a phoenix shot forth and let out a cry as it sped towards the flag. Spandam and the rest were dumbfounded. Apart from the straw hats, the only person smiling was. Lucas. Taking advantage of the fact that everyone was still shocked, Lucas snapped a pic of the scene in secret and hid his phone from view. Ha! <laughs> Usopp, without that silly mask, you will truly become a legend in the seas this time. On the ground, the marines watching finally snapped out when the flag was completely burnt. They've done it. 
do they even understand the meaning of attacking that flag? They've really done it now. Pirates have declared war against the world government. Are you bastards insane? Don't you dare to even dream that you'd survive having the world as your enemy. Spandam shouted towards Luffy and the rest, truly angered this time. However, Luffy was unfazed as he shouted back even louder. I'd be happy to live with that. Robin. Lucas. I know you're there. If you don't come, I'll drag you over here myself. Inside the office, Lucas' hands shook. He turned around and took a deep breath to calm his emotions. After a while, he made his decision and flew outside. Luffy and the rest finally saw Lucas for the first time after separating. His wings were still as big as ever, seemingly stretching wide in order to protect everyone he cared for. Now, those wings were stretched in front of Spandam and the rest of the CP9. Lucas glanced at Luffy and flew up to the flag as he used his water to extinguish the fire and repair the flag. Just as he did with going merry. Time seemed to flow backwards as the ashes of the flag recollected itself and became whole once again. Lucas was still confused as to what the true ability of his fruit was. At some times, it can heal, then sometimes, it can also repair, like this. It can't really have to do with time right? Though Lucas had all these unanswered questions inside him, Lucas shook the thought away and focused on the matter at hand. Finally, he spoke. Luffy. You say that you want to save me? That's right. Now come back here. I saw your fight with Blueno. Gear second, is it? Suddenly, steam started to appear out of Lucas as his skin had a hue of red. Burn. First degree. Heat man. I. Can do that too. While holding on to the flag of the world government and releasing steam, he looked down on Luffy. Do you think you're now strong enough to save me? Or are you relying on your gear third? Luffy, you need to get even stronger. Much faster than in the original story. You need to be stronger faster if you want to protect those you fail to protect in the story I know. Lucas wanted to say this but he had to keep his act for now as much as it pains him. If he keeps on solving everything that comes in Luffy's way, then Luffy wouldn't ever become a pirate king. Lucas loved this story and the characters in it when he was in his home world. That's why, although he doesn't know how the story is going to end now, he can still make sure they all reach their ending. You can't even save Robin. You can't even defeat Luchi. Do you know how many times I've beaten that cat already? Sea Cat. Luchi's face twitched when he heard this, but he can't do anything to Lucas due to his strength. On the other hand, Jabra was trying hard not to laugh. Luffy couldn't care less about their reactions as he shouted. I'll save Robin. I'll defeat that cat. Then I'll save you. I don't believe I can't. Luchi became even more pissed. Now he really wants to pummel this brat. This was the effect that Lucas wanted. Only this way, would Luffy become more powerful. If he loses. Well, he has his water clone in standby. As expected, Lucas still didn't want them to die here. Beside Robin, Frankie was grinning. Ha ha ha. Well said Straw Hat. Suddenly, he took hold of Robin and his. Ass started to expand. Get ready now. Kuda. Boo. Boo. Lucas looked at Frankie's ass exploding as they flew over Luffy's side and sighed in relief. Un, I know I felt something bad was going to happen if I stayed there. Good thing I moved up here. He could see Spandam and the others cough from the smell with tears in their eyes. By the time Luchi reacted, Frankie and Robin were already halfway there. Jeppo. Luchi jumped on the air and tried to reach them. At this time, Luffy acted. Gear second. Gomu Gomu no. Jet rifle. Tekai. G.H. In an instant, Luffy had appeared in front of Luchi in midair and attacked. Surprised, Luchi transformed and performed Tekai, just narrowly avoiding taking the full force of the attack. Lucas looked at the scene and sweated. Ah, uh, how come the story suddenly differed right at the start? 
Unlike in the original, Lucas had already convinced Robin to go back with Luffy and the rest so there wasn't any of their drama. Well, it seemed to have been replaced with his own drama. And Frankie also didn't get to use his coup de boo before so he was able to use it now, leading to this scenario. With this. It became totally different now. Is it? Lucas scratched his head, thinking on how to best resolve this. After a while, he just shrugged. Meh, forget it. I'll leave it up to fate. Suddenly, the drawbridge between the two was lowered. The Frankie's family and the Galila shipwrights all looked up to see that Robin and Frankie already made their way here. We opened the drawbridge for nothing. Hearing them, Lucas coughed and looked away as he felt guilty. On the roof, Frankie and Robin just landed. Frankie's chains were easy to remove but Robin's sea stone cuffs were a bit problematic. While Luffy and the rest were trying to remove her cuffs, Frankie stood up and faced Spandam and the CP9. In his hands was a stack of papers with a word written at the front. Pluton. Is that? It can't be. The blueprints for the ancient weapon, Pluton. Frankie grinned. It's the real deal, can you believe it? Luchi, Kaku, you should know too, right? Frankie showed a glimpse to the two. Though they were quite far, their eyes are still top-notch. It was no problem for them to see it clearly. I can't believe it. You bastard, you were keeping it inside your body this whole time. Hearing their confirmation, Spandam started drooling. It's the real deal. Quick. Quickly get that for me. Frankie grinned as he took a deep breath. Whoosh. Fire spewed out from his mouth and. Burned the blueprints. Ah. Bastard. What are you doing? Damn it. I'm gonna kill you. The mission we spent five years on. Lucas. Quick. Do as you did to the flag. Restore the blueprints. In his panic, Spandam turned to Lucas but when he did, he only received a cold glare. Who are you to order me around? H. Hi. This is the fruit of your actions. I am not obligated to clean up your mess. Lucas snorted and went off. From here on, he will no longer show himself a hem, of course, the water clone is a different story. Back to where Luffy and the others were, they were still trying to get Robin's cuffs off. Damn it, I can't cut through them. We need a key. As if hearing them, Spandam laughed. Ha ha ha. So what if you got Nico Robin? The key is here with us. If you want to free her, come get it. Gur. Luffy. Forget the key. We'll figure something out later. Right now, we need to leave this island and head back to Water 7. Robin could tell that Luffy was still going to fight his way in despite her already being there with them so she had to explain. Lucas made a bet with the Marines. As long as we get out and head to Water 7, we'll be safe. If we lose here. Then Lucas would forever become a slave. Everyone was surprised. But after a while, Luffy just nodded. Un. In that case, there's no problem. Huh. Luffy grinned as he held on to his straw hat. I won't lose. What happened next was nearly the same as the original story. Only this time, when everyone else had split off to find the CP9 members and get a key, Luchi came to Luffy and Robin on his own to pick a fight. Frankie ended up facing against Fukuru while he was still looking for Cola to refill himself. Usopp found Jabra and before they started to fight, Zoro and Kaku fell from the floor above. Just like in the original story, Usopp was still an idiot and somehow ended up cuffing him and Zoro together, which led to Chopper looking for a number two key. Meanwhile, Sanji met Khalifa and they got into a fight. Well, as expected from Sanji who has zero damage to women even in games. Sanji lost immediately and was thrown over to where Nami was. Khalifa looked down on them from the upper floors and smiled. That guy is no use. I can't feel the same excitement as when facing that man. By any chance, that man wouldn't happen to be Lucas, would it? Nami's face twitched and there seemed to be a dark aura appearing around her. Oh. Hearing Nami, 
Khalifa's eyes narrowed and grew colder. Little girl. You're still too young for that. Old hag, I bet you're still a virgin aren't you? In the middle of all this, aside from Sanji who fell unconscious and Chopper who was innocently tilting his head in confusion. Lucas, who was observing everything from afar, felt chills down his spine. Women. Are scary. Back in the battle between Luffy and Luchi, Robin was still handcuffed and unable to join the fight. Suddenly, she seemed to have felt something but couldn't quite grasp what it is. Why do I feel like I'm missing out on something else? Chapter 31 The fights continued while Lucas watched on with a smile. Frankie won against Fukuru, knocking him out on the ground and went to look for Chopper who had now turned into a giant monster due to his excessive use of Rumble Ball. Lucas didn't bother preventing this as Chopper needed to get used to this form immediately. After flinging away Komodori, Chopper came across Nami and Khalifa fighting before going down to where Sanji was. Nami was worried about Chopper but she had to defeat Khalifa first before she can follow Chopper. With the new climb attack that Usopp had made for her using the dial shells of the Sky Island, she was no longer a powerless individual. Developing Fata Morgana, an illusory attack that can catch the opponent off guard, coupled by Thunderball, Khalifa was stunned. Angered, Khalifa attacked Nami, only to find that it was an illusion. This isn't the real body. The chance of a real body today is 20%. KH. Khalifa kicked another body one after another, leaving only one left. The real body. Today's weather is. In a stable atmospheric pressure, small black clouds that contain severe air currents will remain, and then lightning will eventually strike your heart. Nami smiled and created more illusions of herself. Please be careful, your heart might become numb. Dark cloud tempo. I managed to protect myself from your lightning earlier. So as long as I don't get caught off guard. Khalifa tried to convince herself but Nami shot her down. The weakness of such protection. Is that you cannot move. You seem to underestimate me quite a bit. Are you expecting me to break with your attack? Soap sheep. Khalifa's body was covered in soap bubbles which made her look like a sheep. I don't have to guess which one is the real body. I'll just swallow everything with the big wave of relax hour. Hitsujigimo tidal wave. Suddenly, a huge wave of soap appeared in front of Nami. I'll be finished if I get caught by that. After I swallow all of you, whoever is left has to be the real body. Nami connected two parts of her staff and threw it. Cyclone tempo. A burst of wind shot a hole in the wave. Nami and her illusions quickly ran to the hole to reach the other side, but thanks to that, Khalifa also got a hint on where the real body is. Sure gone. Ah. My. I thought it was an illusion again. Nami painfully grabbed her shoulder after it was attacked but seeing the black cloud behind, she smiled. Ha. Ha. You. Forgot already, huh? You should listen carefully to a navigator's forecast. Eh. Hearing the crackling noise behind, Khalifa turned to see the black cloud hovering there ominously. The thunder that gushes out from the black cloud to the climb attacked. Come. Thunder Lance Tempo. Ahitch. From the black cloud to her staff, a thick line of lightning connected with Khalifa in the middle. Smoke started to appear from Khalifa's mouth, as if her insides were just burnt to a crisp. If she were a normal human, she would have most likely died right here. Still, despite strengthening her body with the Rokushiki and being a devil fruit user, this attack was enough to knock her incapacitated for a long time. No matter how strong you are, my forecasts will never be wrong. Watching from afar, Lucas smiled. Un, this is how she should be. She's clearly strong, but she just keeps acting like Usopp most of the time. Then, Frankie arrived and said that they needed Khalifa's key in order to free Zoro and Usopp. Seeing as there wasn't any key lying around the room, Nami ripped off Khalifa's clothes. Both Frankie and Lucas raised a thumbs up at this. So fierce. I like. After a while, Nami and Frankie chased Chopper to where Zoro and Usopp was. 
Frankie used his coup de vent and threw Chopper to the sea below to deactivate Chopper's ability before jumping into the sea himself the next second. Lucas kept a close eye on this and made sure that the two weren't accidentally dragged to the waterfall and fall into the abyss. Meanwhile, Nami had already freed Zoro and Usopp with Califa's key. Seeing this, Kaku laughed. Fufu. You're finally released huh? Don't laugh, but regret. Because you'd never encounter another chance that good to befall me, world government. The next moment, it was time for the next round. Kaku vs Zoro. Jabra vs Sanji. At the start, it was supposed to be Usopp fighting Jabra, but Usopp is still too weak after all, after being tricked by Jabra, he was knocked out the next moment. Luckily, Sanji arrived just in time, else, Usopp would have died right there. Lucas stopped paying attention to their battle for a moment and turned to look at Spandam. Well, only three of the CP9 are left. It seems this game is ending sooner than I thought. G.H. You. Don't think that this is over. Spandam retrieved the golden Denden Mushy and slammed on the button. Ha. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha. It's over. You lose. The terms of the bet doesn't include that we can't use the buster call. Now, there's no way for you to win. Spandam laughed like a broken man, but when he turned to look at Lucas, he only see a cold smile. As if. He had wanted him to use the buster call. Lucas picked up a Denden Mushy and announced to everyone on the island. Ladies and gentlemen, a certain idiot chief has just invoked the buster call. If you don't want to die. Get out of this island. For a moment, the marines and agents didn't react. But when one man suddenly screamed and ran, it caused a chain reaction and soon, everyone was panicking as they tried to leave the island. Robin heard the announcement as well and can't help but be confused. Just what was Lucas planning? Doesn't he know the terrors of the buster call? Back in the fight between Jabra and Sanji, Sanji developed a move called Diable Jam though spinning with one foot and heating it up with the friction. Using this, his attack power went up a notch and he managed to defeat Jabra. As for Zoro's fight. Demon Spirit. Kuturyu. Azura. Even Lucas was confused how Zoro could have three heads and nine arms, much less Kaku who was facing him. Just what sort of sword technique is this? Is he spinning too fast or something? Still, Kaku didn't give up. Quite amazing. But it's too late. Those words. Are for you. You should only talk cheeky like that, after you avoid the strongest rank Yaku. A main dachi. As Kaku's a main dachi neared Zoro, suddenly. The wind blade turned to mist. He turned my rank Yaku into mist. Bring on the hardship, it's preferred in a path of carnage. Azura Ichibujin. Kaku couldn't even utter a scream as his whole body became bloodied. Zoro gasped for breath and removed the headband he wore. Ha! I have. One message from the Galila's young boss. You guys are. Fired. On the ground, Kaku revealed a wry smile as he heard that before finally losing consciousness. Back in Luffy's fight. Luffy tried to defeat Luchi without relying on his gear second at first, however, it only proved how weak he was without it. Luchi was just about to grab Robin when Luffy finally decided to use it. Jet Pistol. Bam. Being struck by Luffy's fist, Luchi was shocked. He didn't think that Luffy still had this much power. Robin was also surprised by the power that blew away the strongest of the CP9. When she turned to look at Luffy and saw the steam coming out of him, she remembered Lucas' own move. Luchi decided to get serious as well and activated his own devil fruit. Luchi charged at Luffy using Soro while Luffy faced him calmly. Using a Soro of his own, Luffy reappeared in front of Luchi and attacked. Jet Whip. K.H. Luchi gritted his teeth as a bit of blood dripped at the corners of his mouth. His expression turned graver by the second. Straw Hat Luffy, don't tell me you forgot the fact that. I stabbed you in this form. Ah, uh, that? It healed after I ate meat. No no no, how can that be possible? 
Meat don't just heal stab wounds that fast. Or at all. Lucas sweated while watching. He already knew that Luffy's body is absurd but actually hearing about it from the man himself is. Well whatever. As long as he's fine. No one cared about the crisis in Lucas' head as the fight continued. Luchi used Soru once again followed by Shurgan. When Luffy dodged using his own Soru and seeing him prepare for an attack, Luchi countered with Tekai. Jet Bazooka. However, Luffy's power is no longer the same as before. Even with Tekai, Luchi still coughed up blood from Luffy's attack. Just imagining the damage it could have done if he hadn't used Tekai made Luchi's face grim. He really can't afford to be careless anymore. I was careless. I didn't know you have this much power. But it seems that you're short of breath. Is it because of the steam coming out of you? As Luchi said, Luffy had been gasping for breath for a while now. Still, he never faltered. As long as I can defeat you, everything will be alright. I see. You are tough. Luchi grinned. It has been a while since he can let loose. Previously, against Lucas, he can't even put up a fight. But this time, he can properly show his full strength. Lucas stopped watching for a moment and turned to look at the gates of justice which has now fully opened. At the distance, the fence surrounding the island exploded. Everyone who saw it knew. The warships. Has arrived. Another round of explosions hit the Tower of Justice this time. Lucas stretched his observation hockey and was relieved that everyone had already left the upper floors of that building. Even Luffy and Lucci's fight was located at the ground floor as well. The next second. It started to rain. Once Lucas saw this rain, he smiled. The next phase of his plan had started. Actually, once Nami had freed Zoro and Usopp earlier, Lucas Water Clone approached her and handed her some instructions. It took some time but Nami was finally able to create a huge rain cloud for Lucas. With this, he can ensure that no one would get hurt by the bombardment of the Buster Call. The main reason why he wanted a Buster Call to happen was to provide Luffy and the rest with cover to escape. And he will also be able to use that as well. Suddenly, he heard another loud explosion. Only this time, it didn't sound the same as the bombardment. Gomu Gomu no. Gigant pistol. The entire building. Collapsed. Even in the distance, one can see a huge hand punch through the walls. And on the other end of the fist was Luchi. Luchi fell in a daze as if his whole brain was jolted from the shock. He spurted out more blood and was thrown all the way to the edge. Luffy wasn't satisfied and shot outside before unleashing another move. Gomu Gomu no. Gigant axe. The ground cracked under his giant feet. Luchi just barely managed to dodge with Soru. Seeing the two fight, Lucas shook his head. The way Luffy fights is really. Lucas no longer watched and focused on making sure everyone was safe. Even the marines and agents fleeing, though he didn't save them completely, at least no one died. This wasn't because he was sticking to his role as Shichibukai, but to make a point. That point being. Buster Call is nothing in his eyes. Califa woke up from the noise of the bombardment just in time for one of the artillery shells to nearly hit her. Suddenly, a thin layer of water seemed to appear in between which caused the damage and fire to lessen, leaving only the shockwave from the blast. While Califa was blown away, she didn't mind it much and was more focused on that layer of water that protected her. Ah! Lucas-sama! As if feeling something creepy, Lucas shivered at this moment. He looked around but only saw Spandam in a broken mess as one of the shells nearly hit him right now. Lucas didn't bother to protect this trash so he ended up quite injured. Kaku and the others of the CP9 had similar experiences and were all having mixed feelings. They know that from the bet earlier, this would disqualify Lucas as he is intruding himself. But the intrusion is protecting them. Should they call it out or not? Ultimately, they decided to keep silent as Lucas is the only one who can protect them now in this situation. Robin looked around to see the bombardment happening around her and a sense of deja vu overwhelmed her. In her panicked state, she couldn't move even when she saw one of the artillery shell head towards her. 
But suddenly, as if by some sort of force, the shell turned away from her. Even the blast that came out of it seemed to have lessened greatly as it neared her and all she could feel was a small wind breeze. How? Drip. Drip. Dazed, Robin looked up to see rain falling from the sky and remembered a man. Robin looked around once more and saw the marines and agents running about. When one of the artillery shells headed towards them, the shells would always veer away slightly and there would also be thin layers of water blocking most of the explosions. Everything finally made sense. Why Lucas would not mind the buster call. She stood up, no longer afraid of the buster call. At this moment, the rest of the crew appeared with keys on their hands as they all tried it out on Robin. Finally, Robin was freed using the number 5 key. As soon as she was freed, she spoke. Quickly. This is our chance to get away. What do you mean? We're lucky that no cannons had hit us yet. Look outside. This isn't luck. I'll explain later, right now, we need to leave the island. Robin's right. Let's go get Luffy and get out. Nami nodded as well. They ran over to Luffy's side and shouted. Luffy. We got Robin's key. Let's leave. Still, Luffy only gave them a quick glance before continuing his battle with Luchi. Go. I'll catch up with you guys. I need to defeat this cat pigeon guy and get Lucas. But. Go. Nami and the rest looked at each other and sighed while smiling. This Luffy. Really won't give up on anyone so easily. Lucas heard this and groaned while massaging his forehead. Sigh. This Luffy. Seems like I can't afford to meet them once this is all over. Else, Luffy would be hard to deal with. Since Luffy didn't go with them, they can only run and steal one of the warships in order to get away. We're ready to sail out any time now. We can set out as soon as Luffy comes back. Yeah. Kokoro, Chimney, and Gonbi had reappeared earlier and helped them ready the ship. While Nami, Chopper, and Robin waited in the ship to get ready, Sanji, Usopp, Zoro, and Frankie stood outside waiting for Luffy. Looking at the island that seemingly in a sea of fire from the bombardments and the number of warships around. It made them wonder just how would they get out of here alive. Suddenly, a voice from the Denden Mushy in the ship they took, spoke. Reporting from the northeast side of the main gate. Marines and government officials in Eni's lobby have been accommodated. Also, we've confirmed that approximately 50 pirates including some giants are at the main gate. That's. That's my guys. See. They got off the island, all right. I'm not worried about them. They will never die no matter how many times you kill them. Bastards. Gahahaha. <laughs> Frankie laughed but the next moment, his smile disappeared. We have completed the obliteration mission by means of fire. Death is confirmed for all of them. As it stands, it is impossible to have any survivors left on the main island. Frankie's face became grim. The number of survivors on the Eni's lobby main island is. Zero. Chapter 32. After hearing the announcement, Frankie continued to stand there in shock. Frankie. The shipwrights of Galila 2. Oimo. Kashiai. Yokozuna was probably with them too. Sodom and Gamara. Everyone. While everyone mourned for the loss of their comrades, Nami sighed. Can people. Die so easily. You cannot see humans. On the map. Robin spoke. They just erased an island from the world map. Without hesitation. That's what the buster call is. Frankie gritted his teeth and shouted. Hurry up Straw Hat. Your Nakama are waiting for you here. Bastard. I'll never forgive you if you end up dead. Naturally, Luffy didn't really hear Frankie but he was already doing his very best in his fight. Over time, Luchi had managed to get used to Luffy's jet attacks by jumping backward to decrease the impact of the hit. However, he was not the only one that's adapting better. Even with Luchi's high speed and moving through Luffy's blind spots, 
It was as if Luffy's grown eyes at the back of his head and he knew when to dodge when an attack comes from behind. It seems that the blindfold game really did help. In the original story, Luffy can already somewhat dodge and expect attacks like this on instinct, but Lucas can tell that he is doing better than in the original story at this point. At this time, the warships took notice of their fight and started to aim their cannons. K.H. G.H. Luchi and Luffy both stumbled from the blast near them. Luchi's face was grim. He knew what this meant. For the government that he had been fighting for his whole life. To finally turn on him like he was nothing and could be replaced. Meanwhile, they could hear faint shouts from the distance. Luffy. We're all ready to go. Defeat him and come back quickly. We'll get out of here alive together. Hearing their shouts, Luffy revealed a smile and he could feel a warm surge of strength washing away his fatigue. He thought of something and looked up to see the rain still falling down. He started to laugh. Shishishi. I don't know about you but. I really don't feel like losing. You think some kind of cheer can heal you? How absurd. Luchi was annoyed. He has just been thrown away, and this Luffy's comrades are cheering for him even with all the bombardment from the warships. Luffy just laughed. That's right. I. I am not alone. As long as my Nakama are with me. I won't lose. At the distance, Lucas smiled. Go, Luffy. Defeat him, and take another step closer to becoming the Pirate King. It was hard for Lucas to keep maintaining this kind of reign and control. But he won't falter just yet. While Luffy and Luchi continued on their fight, several marine captains started to jump on the ship that Zoro and the others were at. There is one that could turn his body into small balls and one that disintegrated one of Zoro's swords. Still, they continued to fight and hold the fort as they waited for Luffy. Luchi had Luffy tied up with his tail and both his fists were an inch in front of Luffy's chest. Roku O Gun. A strong shockwave hit Luffy from the inside just like the impact dials in the Sky Island. It ignored his ability and dealt a powerful blow that made him cough up blood. Luffy slumped down to the ground with this attack while Luchi panted. He waited for a while and was about to turn back, thinking that it was over. But. The next second, Luffy stood up once again. In Luffy's mind, he remembered what Lucas had told him. Stupid. There's no way, that you'd win. Do you think you're now strong enough to save me? Or are you relying on your dear third? You can't even save Robin. You can't even defeat Luchi. Do you know how many times I've beaten that cat already? Luffy gritted his teeth. Tekai. Luchi felt a sense of foreboding and immediately performed Tekai. Luffy poured in every strength he had in this one last move as he thought of every moment that he felt weak. Never. Never would he lose another Nakama. Jet. Gatling. A. Ah. Luchi had already lost track of how many hits he took. Eventually, the rain of fists ended and the wall behind him shattered into pieces, burying him under it. Luffy panted and was about to collapse but he held on. The rain gave him strength. After a moment, he was able to stand up properly once again. Soon, all the warships received notice of Luchi's defeat and they were all shocked. But while some guys were saddened, there were others who were happy at this moment. Luffy won. Got me scared for a moment. You finally did it, Straw Hat. Guys. Get on the escape ship now. We'll set out. Nami shouted to everyone fighting outside the ship. Now that Luffy had won, they need to leave as soon as possible. Suddenly, another voice rang out from the Marine Denden Mushy. Good job Straw Hat San. Eh. Frankie was surprised. He knew who this voice belonged to. I idiot. They'll hear us. It's okay, we're letting them know. It was evident that there were more than one voice at the other end of the Denden Mushy. Bro. Bro. Stop. If we ran away quietly, they just think we're all dead. Everyone finally knew who the voices belonged to. It was the so-called pirates that they had blasted off at the main gate earlier. 
Turns out they were still alive and kicking. At the cliff in the main island, the Frankie's family, Galila shipwrights, and the giants were holding onto ropes at the edge so they wouldn't fall. We're all safe here. We have a way to escape too so don't worry about it. I'll see you guys later, alive. Hearing they were all alive and well, Franey started to let out tears of joy. His speech was already nearly unrecognizable from his crying. Guys. Videoed. I would never worry about you quiz. Several marine officers started to ask their captains. Shall we head to the main gate immediately? Not now. This is more important. Don't take your eyes off straw hat. Still, there were some that were more brutal. Fire at their escaped ship. B but, that's also our sure, K.H. Before the officer could finish his sentence, he was already shot down by his own captain. This is the buster call. Even if they're our own ships, you need to prepare yourselves to shoot it down if necessary. Why yes sir. The other officers quickly saluted and started to prepare. Robin saw that there were some cannons aimed at them and quickly shouted. Run. With a wave of her hand, she summoned hands that threw the people on board back to land while she herself jumped off. Soon after, there was an explosion on their ship. No. Our escaped ship. Nami shouted as she saw their ship reduced to rubble. What the hell? We're doomed. That ship was our only way out of here. While they were panicking over the situation, Luffy had made his way to them. Unlike in the original story where Luffy was fully exhausted and unable to stand up, currently, Luffy right now is still as energetic as ever. Not just him, even Zoro and the others were all still energetic due to the healing properties of the rain that hit them. Lucas had to control it specifically that only the raindrops that hit them would be able to heal. Which was especially hard when they are in a group fight like this one. By the time Luffy arrived, he saw the ship explode and asked. What now? We still need to get Lucas. Worry about Lucas later. Right now, we don't even know what to do about ourselves. At this moment, Usopp seemed to have heard something and was looking around. WH who is it? Whose voice is it? What are you saying Usopp? Are you talking about the Frankie's family? No. Not that voice. It's been around for a while. Huh. Frankie was confused, but other than Usopp, there were more people who heard of this voice. Lucas blinked for a moment and smiled. He didn't expect. That he can also hear it. Luffy uttered. Below. Look below. Luffy. You can hear it as well. Right, it said to look below. It wasn't just them. Zoro, Nami, Sanji, Robin, and Chopper all heard it. Who? What is it? It said, look below. Finally, Usopp shouted. Jump into the ocean. Usopp. Idiot. Are you trying to kill yourself? Being desperate wouldn't save you. Zoro shouted and thought that Usopp was giving up already. But Usopp didn't give up. We'll survive. She came to save us. Shishishi. Follow what Usopp said. Jump into the ocean. Luffy didn't care about anyone's opinion anymore and stretched his arms to pull everyone with him as he jumped into the ocean. Ah! From the warships, the marines could see Luffy and the rest jump and thought that they've gone mad. The pirates are jumping into the ocean. Idiots! There's no way they can survive in the ocean. Have you gone mad, pirates? Fire! The warships fired on the island, but Luffy and the rest were already falling into the ocean. Right below, was a small caravan with a familiar sheep head. Get on board. The Mary. At this moment, everyone finally realized there was a small ship that had snuck past them without their notice. How did it manage to sneak in among the fleet of warships? Shall we fire at it? Do it. Fire. While under the rain of fire from the warships, Going Mary started to move on its own and dodged all the incoming attacks. Everyone on board were shocked. I can't believe it. How did this ship reach this place? Who steered her here? 
that's not important right now. Give the orders, we need to get out of here. Zoro quickly snapped everyone from their shock and surprise in order to quickly set out. Just then, he noticed a figure standing behind the steering wheel. Who? The figure was covered from top to bottom, wearing a hood and a cape. The figure thought for a while before pulling out a pen and paper from who knows where. He wrote and showed it to everyone. Mizuking. It's a hero. Eh. That's a hero. Of course. See the cape. Cape equals hero. Oh. Though Luffy had infected Chopper with his way of thinking, the others naturally knew who this was. Isn't this Lucas? While they were all starting to prepare, Robin spoke. Everyone. Thank you. Luffy laughed. Don't worry about it. Shisha shishi. Zoro was still as serious as ever. Talk nonsense after we get out of here. What do you mean by nonsense lawn hair? Shut up. If we die here, everything would be a waste. Apologize to Robin Chan, punk. Seeing as Sanji and Zoro started fighting again, and even Chopper joining in by biting Zoro's leg, Nami quickly broke them off. Sanji Kuen, go steer the ship, please. Okay, Nami Swan. Guys. We can't leave yet. We still need to get Lucas. While they were all bantering, Luffy still didn't give up on Lucas and thought they could get away from the warships first then get Lucas before going out. Everyone sweated. Isn't Lucas already on board? Is what they thought. However, Mizuking approached them and handed Luffy a letter. Luffy looked at it and saw it was from Lucas. Instantly, Luffy got pissed and tore the paper into pieces. I'm not reading this. I'm going to get Lucas back. However, this was no longer up to him. Going Mary had already started moving on its own since earlier and has been sailing away from the island. Mary. What are you doing? We still have an Akama left on the island. Luffy. I think. Mary is moving because of him. Nami sighed. Luffy finally understood that they were moving thanks to Lucas' power and was about to stretch his hand to a nearby warship to get off but suddenly, several hands held him down. He turned towards Robin and shouted. Robin. Let go of me. We still need to get Lucas. Robin couldn't utter a word and simply held on to him. Lucas. With Luffy's receding shout, the battle. Is over. An hour passed and just when the captains were deciding whether to give chase or now, Akiji had arrived. Admiral. We're still gonna go after them. We can't just let it end like this. No need. Akiji sighed and looked at Lucas who was giving him a cold smile. It's obvious just by looking at this fleet and the island. That this is our. Complete defeat. Right, Akiji? Lucas was in a good mood. Not only did Luffy and the others rose in strength, he also managed to one-up the world government and the marines. I hope you remember the agreement. Otherwise. Lucas' eyes narrowed and suddenly, a huge tidal wave that was equal to that of Aqua Laguna appeared and swallowed the now empty island of Eni's lobby. The marines watched on in shock as they saw an entire island disappear in a single moment. This can still happen in Marineford. Akiji sighed. Maybe it was a mistake to rope in this guy. However, this power will certainly prove to be useful in the upcoming battle. Water 7 is yours. And the CP9 will be disbanded. Akiji took out a piece of paper and handed it to Lucas. After looking through the paper, Lucas clicked his tongue. TSK TSK, not will be. After all, you guys already abandoned them on the island by firing on it indiscriminately isn't that right guys? An air door appeared behind Lucas and revealed all the members of the former CP9. Of course, Spandam wasn't included. Spandam himself is currently the only person who still have heavy injuries and is being treated somewhere. Lucci stood behind Lucas with his pigeon back on his shoulder. You're right. There's no use serving the world government now. We shall be following you instead. This time, Akiji was truly shocked. It turns out. 
This was his goal all along. What a blunder. To actually give out their strongest people to him. What's wrong? Aren't I a Shichibukai now? Isn't it normal for me to have my own pirate crew? I'm thinking of the name. Guardian Wing. How does that sound? What? Like some sort of guardian angel. I guess that's true in your case with the straw hats. Doesn't sound like a pirate though. Akiji sighed and accepted the fact that the former CP9 members had turned on them. Anyway, it should still be fine as long as Lucas remains a Shichibukai. Lucas just shrugged. What? You think Straw Hat sounds like a pirate? I guess that's true. Akiji scratched his head and yawned. Since things had already ended like this, there was nothing he could do so he left on his bike after giving his final orders. In about a week, someone will arrive in Water 7 to find you. That person will be by your side to monitor you at all times since obviously, we can't just have any normal marine do that. Lucas rolled his eyes and waved off. Fine, fine. Next, Lucas, Lucci, and the others rested in one of the warships as they escorted them back to Water 7. Once Lucas was finally in his own private room free from anyone's eyes, he staggered and coughed up blood. Lucas gritted his teeth. It seems he had really overused his powers today. Not to mention the intense concentration needed for the rain protection, just the Aqua Laguna wave was already a huge burden for him. It was a good thing they didn't recognize that he was just putting up a front. Soon, he collapsed on the bed and fell asleep. At this moment, Mizuking who was still in Going Merry. Dissolved back into normal water. Chapter 33 Aboard Going Merry, everyone saw Mizuking suddenly become a puddle of water and understood. This. Wasn't Lucas. No, to be more precise, this was indeed Lucas' ability, only he wasn't on board this whole time. Only Nami knew that it was a water clone since she already met it before. She sighed. All right Luffy, there's no need to worry about Lucas. He has his own plans. I'm sure he'll return to us on his own in the future. Still, Luffy pouted while grumping. Humph. I don't care, I'll find him and catch him. Two days have passed since the incident in Eni's lobby. Lucas had already woken up a day ago just before they had arrived in Water 7. After settling in and explaining to Iceberg, he's now currently in his own room inside the Galilaz headquarters. Lucci and the rest of the former CP9 didn't come with him here as they felt conflicted after what they just did. As such, Lucas directed them to a certain place. Lucas smiled when he remembered their conversation yesterday. I know you guys don't fully trust me yet, but that's fine. Go to Sabadi Archipelago. There, you will see just what sort of justice you guys have been defending this entire time. If you still feel the same despite seeing it. Then leave my crew. The former CP9 members looked at each other in confusion before deciding to see what he meant. If you still feel like remaining in my crew. Call me with this Denden Mushy. I'll tell you what to do next. Let's go. Lucci didn't bother saying too many words and left. Whether he will truly gain the former CP9 or not. Is still unknown for now. Though, once they saw how the world nobles acted, Lucas thinks there is a high chance. Despite Lucci's dark justice, it is still justice. And the world nobles are anything but justice. Lucas no longer thought about it and left it up to destiny. Anyway, he has done all that he can already, no use worrying about something he has no control of anymore. At the moment, Luffy and the rest are also staying in the same building, but Lucas hasn't appeared before them at all. Currently, only Nami knew that he was here as he asked Iceberg to tell her. Lucas didn't feel like keeping her in the dark too much considering their current relationship. Nami also understood that he won't show himself in front of Luffy due to the circumstances. Still, she was grateful that he had told her. At least, she can still accompany him at night. Just like this, three more days had passed. Lucas has been self-training in hockey and rokushiki during the day, and cuddling with Nami at night sometimes. About hockey, he asked Luchi how he trained with the armament hockey and was told that he needed a good foundation before he can learn it. 
Lucas is aware that his strength is really below average as he has only been relying on his abilities. In terms of strength, he should be just a bit above Usopp at this point. It can't be helped. Even before he crossed worlds, he was never an athletic person and would not bother with exercising. So aside from training hockey, he would start the day with some stretches and exercise. As for the Rokushiki, he also asked them to give him a manual about its training. Since Luchi and the others are no longer part of the world government or marines, there was no need for them to keep it a secret. Lucas didn't really need to train in everything, but there are some techniques that are quite useful. Right now, Lucas focused on learning Soru, Tekai, Rankyaku, and Shurgan. Though he doesn't really need Tekai and Shurgan too much, Lucas figured that it would be best to learn it as it is quite close to armament hockey. Lucas also handed a copy of the manual to Nami and told her to ask the others to learn as much as they can. If Luffy asked where she got it, she can just simply say that she stole it from the marines. He also made sure to have her tell Zoro and Sanji which techniques they can focus on. Sanji will learn Jeppo in the future, but there's no harm in having him learn it earlier. Soro and Renkyaku are also quite useful to him who uses leg attacks. Zoro should also learn Soro and Tekai. If possible, Jeppo and Renkyaku as well as it would further heighten his range of attacks. As for the others. Well, it would be good if they can learn any techniques as well since it will still be useful. Especially the devil fruit users. If they can learn Jeppo, then it would definitely be good. While thinking about the events that happened in the past few days, Lucas heard a knock on the door. Can I come in? The voice belonged to Iceberg, the current mayor of Water 7. Sure. Upon Lucas' confirmation, Iceberg entered and reported. The Marines have called, they will arrive by noon tomorrow. I see. Thank you. Iceberg bowed slightly and was about to leave when Lucas called out. Ah, by the way. You wanted to make this island float, correct? Iceberg was surprised. How did you know? Certainly, I've begun drawing the blueprints but... I've only told Frankie. Well, it's alright. I hope you achieve it. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, also. Can you pass a message to Nami? Tell her I'll be leaving tomorrow. Lucas wanted her to know as well as he wasn't sure if she will be visiting tonight. It wasn't like she would visit every night as Lucas isn't really telling her to do so to give her some space. Iceberg nodded and left the room. Lucas looked out the window and saw a huge unfinished ship in the distance. This should be Luffy's new ship. It seems that with the golden pillar they got in the Sky Island, and everything else, they were able to buy more materials which made the new ship even bigger than in the original story. It seems they even got a bigger piece of Adam Wood. Too bad I won't be able to see Brooke yet. Lucas chuckled and no longer dallied. He went back to training. That night, Lucas heard the door open without a knock. He knew that Nami had arrived. However. Why is Robin also here? Lucas didn't actually tell Nami to keep it a secret that he was here, he trusted that Nami knew what to do. Still. For her to tell Robin. Is there a reason? A strange idea formed in Lucas' mind which he quickly shook away. No way. That can't be happening. Right? Lucas coughed in an attempt to lighten the mood and asked. Robin, how have you been? Sorry I didn't stop the buster call, but it was the only way for me to help without anyone noticing too much. Robin smiled. It's okay. In a way, it helped me clear the trauma I had in the past. I know that you made sure no one would die in the process. Huh, I actually hoped that Spandam would die there. He was the only one I didn't protect. But that guy seems to have the devil's luck. He actually still survived it. Lucas shook his head. In the future, he swore to really find time to kill that guy. Robin chuckled. Fufu, that's alright. Maybe I'll see him again one day and break his neck personally. The way Robin smile and speak about snapping a neck is really. Even Nami can only laugh dryly, thinking that she was just joking. Well, since you're here, I take it that Nami told you I'll be leaving tomorrow? Yes. Un. 
if you are here to stop M. Lucas was just about to convince Robin that he won't change his mind when suddenly, he felt her lips touch his. Surprised, Lucas quickly pulled out and stared at her then Nami. Um. He didn't know what to say. From Nami's reaction, it seems that she already knew that Robin planned to do that. Nami sighed and explained. Before, we made a bet to see who you will end up falling for. The time limit was until we reached four islands. This was back when we just left Alabasta. What the hell? Wait, don't tell me that Nami. Only did it with me because of the bet. No, even Nami shouldn't be that shallow. Just so you know, I didn't do that with you because of the bet. This is my true feelings. Nami flustered when she saw Lucas looked at her weirdly and tried to explain herself. Lucas sighed in relief when she confirmed it herself. Un, I know. Thank you. A anyway. Robin was cheating. She didn't really plan on doing anything at all. In fact, she was even planning on leaving by then. So this bet is invalid. Then this situation is. Nami hesitated and looked towards Robin. Robin smiled and continued the explanation. We talked about it. I have already fallen for you as well. I don't mind sharing with Nami. SS is it sharing. Lucas' mind seemed to have crashed. He did not think. That someone like him could possibly have a harem. H hold on a second. Since when did you fall for me? Is it because of what happened in Eni's lobby? If it is, you shouldn't decide too quickly. Maybe it's just admiration that you are feeling and not love. I don't want you to make any decisions you may regret in the future. I don't want to hurt you. Lucas admits that he indeed likes Robin as well but. Having multiple relationships, despite being his dream as well, he knows that it is quite hard and oftentimes, someone would only end up hurt in such a relationship. He didn't want Robin to make any mistakes and end up hurting. Robin smiled. When was it? I think it already started back in Alabasta. That time, it was simply an interest in you, the man from another world. Then you continued to surprise me even more in the Sky Island. You're right, maybe this isn't love, maybe it is. But I'm willing to take the risk. If you'll let me. I. Lucas. Do you like Robin? This time, Nami asked. Lucas looked at her and hesitated. On one hand, he feels that Nami would be hurt if he said yes. On the other hand, he also feels that Nami will be hurt if he lied to her. Eventually, Lucas gritted his teeth and spoke the truth. I do. I like her. I see. Still, Nami continued to smile. It seems her smile is even brighter now. Well then, what are you waiting for? Nami, even if I like Robin, I don't want to lose you too. Lucas was prepared that if Nami says so, he will not do anything to Robin and will be with Nami instead. Even if it meant hurting Robin. No matter what, Nami was his first woman. He didn't want to wrong her. It's alright. We already told you that we talked about this. I'm fine if it's Robin. But let me be clear. During this time of you as a Shichibukai, I better not hear any rumors of you and other women. Why yes ma'am. Fufufu. Seeing the two act like that, Robin giggled and approached Lucas once more. Well then. Shall we start? Start. Gulp. Lucas gulped a mouthful of saliva as he was afraid he would start drooling. Still, he didn't want to jump to conclusions so he asked. Robin smiled and whispered three letters in his ear. Naturally, everyone knows what those three letters were. Instantly, Lucas went stiff. Seeing Lucas not moving, Robin made her move and started to remove his clothes. The night passed. Lucas woke up with Nami on his right and Robin on his left. They were both barely clothed under the sheets. It seems they were still asleep. It can't be helped. With the addition of Robin's abilities, the sensation for all three of them were on another level. Lucas remembered last night and shook his head. I need to stop thinking about this and start training. Kia. 
W what is it now? A loud explosion woke Nami and Robin up. Nami quickly looked around while clutching on the bedsheet to cover her body, thinking that someone had arrived. Seeing that the room was still intact, she sighed in relief and wore her clothes. What was that just now? From the direction of the sound. It seems to be where Luffy and the others are staying at the moment. Robin answered while wearing her clothes as well. Hearing that, Lucas smiled wryly. It seems that he's the guy that Akiji meant. Well, it seems that's my Quago back with Luffy and the rest. There's no need to worry, they won't be arresting anyone here. Un. Take care, Lucas. Nami and Robin gave him a peck on the lips before leaving and hurrying over to where the others were. At this moment, an old man wearing a marine uniform and a dog head appeared before Luffy and the others from a broken wall. You. Are the Straw Hats crew, aren't you? I brought someone I want Monkey D. Luffy to meet. Marines. Damn, I though no one is supposed to catch us while we're at Water 7. Sanji and the others prepared for action but Luffy was still fast asleep. Seeing Luffy like that, the dog-head old man was angered and gave him a punch to the head. Wake up. Luffy. Ow. Ouch. It seems the pain from his punch had caused Luffy to wake up. The others were confused though. Luffy was made of rubber, it shouldn't be possible for him to get hurt. Ouch. What are you talking about? It's a punch. It wouldn't hurt your rubber. Just as Sanji was asking, the dog head old man laughed and removed the dog head on his head. There's no way anyone can escape the fist of love. I heard you've been doing reckless things, Luffy. Gay. Gee Grandpa. What? Grandpa. Right. The person that had appeared was none other than Luffy's grandfather. Monkey D. Garp. Chapter 34 Luffy, don't you owe me an apology? Garp grinned while looking at Luffy who was in pain from his fist. At this time, Nami and Robin also arrived on the scene as well. When they saw who was the person that barged in, they were both shocked. No way, is this. Garp. The hero of the marines. Luffy. Is he really your grandpa? Sanji was also a bit shaken and asked Luffy. Yup. Don't mess with him. You'd get killed. Everyone was surprised by what Luffy said. From what they know, Luffy shouldn't be someone who would be scared so easily. I was nearly killed by Grandpa on many occasions in the past. Hey hey, don't say such scandalous thing, I pushed you over bottomless cliffs, threw you into the jungle at night, tied you on a balloon and sent you flying in the sky. All so that you could become a strong man. Everyone's faces paled as they heard that. Damn. What kind of parenting is this supposed to be? Now they seem to just saw the root of Luffy's endless life force. In the end, I entrusted him to a friend of mine and trained him with Ace. But as soon as I took my eyes off of him, this happened. Garp's face twitched and a vein popped in his temple. I trained you to be a strong marine. I always said I want to be a pirate. Nonsense. You're just under the bad influence of that red-haired. S.H. Shank saved my life. Don't speak ill of him. Are you telling your own grandfather what to do? Jaya. I'm sorry. The moment Garp was angered and raised his fist of love, Luffy instantly apologized. He didn't even try to fight against his grandfather. Suddenly, everyone heard snoring sounds. Eh. They fell asleep. Maybe the noise woke Garp, but when he woke up and saw that Luffy was still sleeping, he was angered again and started hitting and scolding him. Luffy. Didn't even bother to fight back at all. Seeing this grandpa-grandson skit, everyone finally gave up. Oh, just do whatever now. In the end, Luffy ended with a bunch of bulges stacked on top of another on his head. It hurts. Garp sighed and crossed his arms to his chest. Listen, do you even know what kind of guy that red-haired is? Shanks. Are Shanks and the others doing fine? Where are they? Whether or not he's doing fine. There are numerous pirates out there. However, 
he is now one of the four most powerful pirates alongside Whitebeard. We call those pirates who reign like emperors over the latter half of the Grand Line, the Four Emperors. Everyone quietly listened as this was a rare chance of getting any information about other pirates. The Marine Headquarters and the Shichibukai exists in order to counterbalance these four. Their power is so influential that should these three powers become unbalanced, the peace of the world would crumble. Hearing about this, Luffy didn't really quite understand but he took off his straw hat and smiled. I don't really understand, but I'm happy to hear they're doing fine. I miss them. Garp sighed and was about to speak again when they heard a commotion at the back. Hmm. What's going on? It's the pirate hunter Zoro. The one with a bounty on his head. I see. Luffy's Nakama, right? He seems to be doing good. Well, guys. Try to stop him. Garp grinned and spoke to the two young men behind him. Yes, sir. The young man with long hair and visor took out his kukri knives and charged to where Zoro was. Meanwhile, the one with the shorter hair wearing a headband and glasses charged towards Luffy and sent a kick to his chin. If it was before, Luffy would have gotten hit, but with the training from Lucas and the fight with CP9, he seemed to have grasped a certain power. Just as the kick connected, his head moved to the side and dodged narrowly. Garp's eyes flashed when he saw this but kept silent as he watched. When the kick didn't connect, the young man used Soru to dodge Luffy's counter. Still, Luffy is able to follow his movements and grabbed him before throwing him to the ground. Zoro's fight also ended similarly and is now holding two of his swords to the Kukri knife wielder. Bwahahaha. They're no match. Garp laughed when he saw the fight's end. The young man being held down by Luffy spoke. You are strong after all. Amazing. I give up. Luffy was confused why a marine would say that but still let him go on account of his grandfather. The young man stood up and dusted his pants. Luffy-san, Zoro-san. Long time no see. Do you know who I am? Who are you? It's me. Kobe. Don't you remember me? In Luffy's mind, there was an image of a small kid who looked very weak. This image didn't match the guy in front of him at all. Kobe. Kobe's my friend. But I only know the smaller Kobe. That's me, Kobe. I'm Kobe who was once a crybaby. For real. Both Luffy and Zoro were shocked. No matter what, a person can't possibly change this much, right? No one cared about the Kukri knife wielder, Helmeppo, at all as the three of them chatted. At the side, Garp spoke to the other Marines. Well then, guys. Go fix up this wall. Eh. How can you be so selfish? Why did you break it in the first place if we ended up having to fix it? Because it's cool to enter the scene like that. Don't break things with such a ridiculous reason. We'll fix it, but you'd better help us. Eh. Okay. Everyone sweated. What is this? Isn't he a vice admiral? But he's getting scolded by his own soldiers. And he's now also fixing a wall. A wall that he broke himself in fact. While fixing up the wall, Garp spoke. Oh yeah. I was speaking about the Shichibukai and the balance right? Remember Crocodile? The one you guys defeated is now in Impel Down. We have to choose another person as replacement. Speaking of which, where is he? Are you talking about Lucas? We don't know where he is. Luffy frowned. He didn't really like the idea of Lucas leaving them. Nami and Robin looked at each other but kept silent. Don't you know? That guy sure had the balls to make a bet with Sengoku. If you guys manage to get your Nakama and leave Ini's lobby, this Water 7 will be his territory now and no marine or pirate can cause any trouble. In other words, you guys are safe for as long as you stay here, no one will catch you. Luffy and the rest were surprised. Other than Nami, Robin, and Frankie, no one really knew the contents of the bet. Robin only spoke that Lucas made a bet with the Marines, but she didn't say the terms and conditions. Over time, they also forgot to ask this due to plenty of things happening. 
The only reason Nami knew was because Lucas told her. While the rest had sighed in relief knowing that they won't be captured if they stayed, Luffy continued to ask. And if we had lost? Apparently, he was even willing to bet his own freedom. If you guys lost, he would be a slave now. With a collar and a mark branded on him. This time, Nami was also shocked. That Lucas. He failed to mention this to her. It was fine that they won and all but. Nami grumbled. Stupid Lucas. Idiot Lucas. Baka Lucas. Robin saw Nami pouting and can't help but smile wryly. It seems Lucas is in for some trouble. Luffy fell silent for a while before speaking. We still don't know where Lucas is. If he's here, I won't let you have him. This is not in your control, Luffy. Lucas' powers are too much for your small crew. If he remains in your ship, you will be targeted by forces much stronger than the CP9. Even so. I won't give up on my Nakama. Seeing Luffy so stubborn, Garp was about to speak again when someone spoke from the door. You must be Luffy's grandfather. Certainly, you two really don't seem to know the word subtle. I can hear your racket from my room above. Lucas. Luffy was shocked. It turns out, Lucas was just one level above them this whole time. He was about to shout at Lucas and convince him but then he froze when he saw Lucas' left arm. Lucas continued to speak without minding them. As Garp said, this island is now my territory. You can stay for as long as you want and no one will trouble you at all. That is, if you already gave up on your dream, Luffy. I haven't. I'm gonna become the Pirate King. Garp's face twitched while Kobe was looking at Luffy with sparkling eyes. Lucas just smiled and walked to where Garp was. Then feel free to leave when your ship is ready. In the meantime, you can use this time to relax, rest, or train. I will be going now. Lucas walked past Garp and continued to walk away. Garp looked at Lucas then to Luffy. He didn't quite understand why Luffy would just give up but this is for the best. He also stood up and was about to leave. Vice Admiral Sir. The wall is still not fixed. Lucas heard them as well and felt that it would be too bothersome to wait for Garp to finish. He waved his hand and water shot towards the broken wall. The next moment, the wall was repaired as if it was never broken at all. Garp sighed when he saw this. Such fearsome power. Devil fruit powers that has the ability to heal or repair are quite rare. No wonder Sengoku values this kid so much. Actually, Sengoku didn't learn about this until much later when Lucas had fixed the burned flag of the world government. Garp followed Lucas to their ship leaving Kobe and Helmeppo behind to catch up to Luffy. On the ship, Lucas finally asked Garp. So you're the one they sent to watch over me? Hmm. Nah, they sent someone else. Right now, the marine headquarters can't afford to send someone who can beat you since it would be counterproductive. After all, us vice admirals and above can't possibly spend our time babysitting you. Then who? Oi. Lass, come out. Lass. Lucas frowned and looked to where Garp was shouting at. There, Lucas saw a pink-haired woman in a suit casually smoking while walking towards them. Hina is here. This is. Black Cage Hina. They're sending her. Garp continued to explain. We needed someone who won't be so easily swayed by you like the CP9 and join you. Also, they needed to be able to restrain anyone around you with ease just in case. Though she may be weaker than you, she is still the ideal person to monitor you. Plus, she volunteered. Hina needed to get rid of two idiots who keep following Hina. She's talking about Django and Full Body, right? I didn't know she hated them that much. Lucas was a bit confused. From the manga, it didn't seem like she minded them. But is she just looking for some excuse? Still, it would make sense that they weren't willing to send anyone too strong. They only needed someone to monitor Lucas, not beat him. Also, if they had sent someone with too strong a sense of justice like Toshiji, it may just backfire on them. Someone like that can easily be manipulated after all. 
On the other hand, Lucas doesn't know much about Hina at all. He truly doesn't know how to deal with her. I will say this once. The instant that Hina is unable to report once every 24 hours. Not only you, but the Straw Hats will also be chased adamantly and executed. Fine. Garp was glaring at him as he didn't want Luffy's life to end like this at the very least. Actually, there was another reason why Hina was sent. She was a woman. If they can rope in a guy like Lucas if he falls for Hina. Then that would be the best. Naturally, Garp didn't say this at all. If you understand, then get out. I hear you have your own ship, right? Garp tossed an eternal log posed to Lucas and gave the order. Your first job as a Shichibukite is to go there and regain the people's trust. It should be easy for you considering your ability and history there. Lucas raised a brow at that and looked at the name on the eternal log pose. Instantly, he understood what Garp meant and showed a wry smile. After all, the island's name written there was. Alabasta. Lucas scratched his head. He looked at his left arm and smiled. There was a tattoo he had asked to be placed there a few days ago. It seems. He would reunite with Vivi sooner than he thought. Back in the Galila headquarters, Frankie asked Luffy. Is that okay? I thought you won't let him get away. It's fine. Frankie was confused why Luffy would suddenly just give up. He looked at the others but they were all acting like this was normal. When Robin saw him look at her, she shrugged as she didn't know as well. Usopp laughed. It can't be helped that you guys didn't understand. But don't worry. Lucas left arm. Still has the sign of our friendship. Even if he's not here, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that our feelings are connected. Nami also added. However, from the way she said it, it seemed to have another meaning. Frankie was still confused but seeing as no one bothered about it anymore, he felt that it wasn't his place to say anything. After all, he wasn't part of their crew. At least, not yet. Lucas didn't stay to watch Frankie's brief get stolen. He walked to where Iceberg was with Hina silently following along. While the shipwrights were building the Straw Hat's new ship, Lucas also asked for a small ship to be made. With the money they got from the Straw Hats, they had a huge supply of Adam wood and the excess wood was placed in his small ship as well. Iceberg presented Lucas' ship to him. It was a white ship where the sides of the deck had a wing-like design. There was only one mast and a small cabin equipped with a bedroom, kitchen, and bathroom. The ship didn't have a rudder or a steering wheel as per his request. After all, he only needed to use his ability to steer it. This will be his own personal ship so it's small. As for a bigger ship, it was Iceberg's long-term project. He had handed him some ideas after looking through the images of the Pluton ship. Though he wasn't able to read blueprints, the images were enough to tell a few things. And based from that, Lucas made his own ideas to either copy a similar effect or counter it. As for what those ideas are. That will have to wait for the future. On the sail, there was a skull with wings behind it and is holding a shield, covering half of its face. There was also a black flag on top of it with the same logo. This will become his temporary pirate mark. The Guardian Wing Pirate. Satisfied with the ship, Lucas asked Iceberg. Does it have a name? Ma. I call it, Freedom Wing. This small ship, and your ability, can let it travel anywhere it pleases. Good, let's go. Hina hesitated for a bit but still followed along. It seemed she had to get used to setting sail on a pirate ship from now on. Just then, Lucas turned around and spoke to her. By the way, this thing only has one bed, that's mine. Unless you want to sleep together, go sleep somewhere else. Hina's face darkened but she knew that she was no match for Lucas so she can only snort and walk away to find a place to rest. Lucas just shrugged and no longer bothered her. He looked at the direction of the eternal log pose then set his sights on the horizon ahead. Time to set sail. Chapter 35 Alabasta Inside the royal palace, Vivi was looking through the newspaper with mixed expressions. 
she was happy to see Luffy and the others doing well, worried that they had caused such a huge scene, and also confused. The front page of the newspaper showed two things. Straw Hat Pirates Invaded Judicial Island, Eni's Lobby. Former Straw Hat Pirate Becomes the New Shichibukai, Guardian Wing Lucas. Lucas. What happened to you? Vivi muttered then sighed. She was about to put away the newspaper when a few pieces of paper dropped. These were. The new bounties of the Straw Hats. When Vivi saw these, she chuckled. They all seem happy. Straw Hat Luffy, 300 million belly. Pirate Hunter Zoro, 120 million belly. Devil's Child Nico Robin, 80 million belly. Cat Thief Nami, 16 million belly. Long Nose Shooter Usopp, 30 million belly. Black Leg Sanji Photo Unavailable, 71 million belly. Cotton Candy Lover Chopper Pet, 50 belly. Cyborg Frankie, 44 million belly. Like in the original, Sanji's photo was just a drawing as well. The only difference this time is Usopp's. Since he didn't go as Sogeking this time, his picture and title had differed as well. The title of Long Nose Shooter can only be blamed on Spandam as he used this description to describe Usopp. As for the picture, it was even worse. The agent taking the picture was hit by a rubble and by accident, he only managed to picture Usopp's nose. Unfortunately, that was the only photo they got of him so it was printed like that. Anyone seeing this wanted poster would give this a second glance. Is that a nose? Or? Naturally, Usopp stayed depressed for a week when he saw this. Other than that, there was no longer a wanted poster for Lucas as he is now a Shichibukai. Still, there was an image of him in the newspaper as well. It was the image of him holding the flag of the world government after he had fixed it. Behind him were huge white wings akin to that of an angel. This could be said to be propaganda of the government to make Lucas look to be on their side completely. The name Guardian Wing could also be akin to him being the guardian angel of the world government with this photo. Vivi looked at this image silently, it was unknown what she was thinking. Water 7. Once Lucas had left, Nami handed out the manuals he got from Lucas to everyone. Listen guys. When you have time, train on these. It should help increase our power. Now that we caused such a huge scene, no doubt, we will be chased all over once we leave this island. Hmm. These are. Usopp took the manual and was surprised. Rokushiki. The ones used by those CP9 guys. Yeah. Where did you get this? Zoro asked. Nami fell silent for a moment. She remembered Lucas saying not to tell anyone it came from him but. She was still mad from earlier. Anyway, it doesn't matter since he showed himself earlier. Lucas gave it to me. It seems that as the new Shichibukai, he is entitled to have his own pirate crew. He took in the former CP9 with him and they gave it to him. Everyone were dumbstruck. There seemed to be too much information from what Nami just said that they can't process it properly immediately. First of. When did Lucas give this to her? So she knew this whole time that he was here. Also, Lucas has his own pirate crew now. And he even took in the guys from CP9. Their former enemies. However, only Luffy didn't seem to read too much into it as he laughed. Shishishi. So those guys are gonna be our friends in the future huh? This guy is so optimistic. Nami just smiled. But it is as Luffy said. If all goes well, those strong guys will most likely become our future allies. Lucas told me that he planned to make a separate team who can back us up if ever the need arise and I agree. This time with Eni's lobby, we were lucky. Who knows what sort of troubles we will encounter from now on. Especially with our captain like this. I guess you're right. Hearing the last line that Nami said, everyone instantly agreed. After that, Nami told Zoro and Sanji what Lucas told her and they also agreed. Ever since they saw the Rokushiki, they had also wanted to learn a few things from it but didn't have much chance to do so. Now, there was the manual in front of them. And if it can increase their power, there was no reason why they wouldn't learn it. 
Robin also seemed to be interested in Shirgan and Renkyaku. Everyone imagined her arms and legs popping up all over and using Shirgan and Renkyaku. Suddenly, they shivered. Damn! If Robin manages to learn these two techniques. She would surely be so hard to fight against. Yash! There's still time before our new ship is built, everyone, start training so we can get even stronger. Oh oh you! While Luffy and the gang started their training as they waited for their new ship, Lucas was already on the seas and headed for Alabasta. Lucas stood at the front of the deck and closed his eyes as he felt his surroundings. The cold wind that brushes along his cheeks. The touch of the water that sprays on his face. And the vastness of the sea below. In the past, Lucas felt quite burdened watching over Luffy and the rest, making sure that they were safe and not have any accidents. Of course, this burden wasn't something he hated at all. In fact, he still liked the idea of protecting the Straw Hats. But now that he's separated from them and decided to let them develop on their own, it was like there's this weight on his shoulders that was lifted. He felt more free than before. At this instant, he seemed to have grasped some kind of power and he felt the ship turn into water. Shocked, Lucas snapped out of it and looked at the ship, only to find it return back to normal. Lucas blinked for a while. Was that awakening? But how did he activate it? Lucas tried to do it once more but was unable to turn the ship to water again. Eventually, he sighed and gave up. Then, he heard something splashing in the water behind the ship. It was Hina, nearly drowning. She must have sunk earlier the moment the ship turned to water and was unable to get back up when it solidified. Since Hina was also a devil fruit user, she is naturally unable to swim at all. Lucas sighed and controlled the water around her to lift her up and drop her on the ship. Cough cough. What? Just happened. No idea, I was just standing here you know. Why did you jump in the water? Hina didn't jump in the water. Hina isn't an idiot. Though she thought in her head, she didn't say anything and simply glared at Lucas. By the way, why do you always seem to refer to yourself in the third person? Are you an idiot? Hina is not. Well, anyway, Lucas doesn't care. Hearing someone else speak in the third person irked her for some reason. She snorted and simply went back to the cabin to rest. Lucas shook his head and no longer minded her. He sat on the deck and continued to train. A day had passed, at a distance, they could see a faint shadow of an island. This isn't Alabasta yet. Merely a pit stop on their way. When they got near, they could see a ship docked on the side with a black flag. A pirate ship. Seeing as the logo didn't seem familiar to him, Lucas looked at Hina who was monitoring him. Do I go and sink those guys? Yes, that's your job. Actually, that's your job. Fine, fine. Lucas sighed and knew he was being used by the government as propaganda, but this is something he wanted as well for his own plans. Since this pirate crew is unfamiliar to him, they must be some small-time pirates and it should be safe to remove them. It shouldn't cause too much issue in the future that he knows. Anyway, since he's going to do it, he might as well make it a show. His huge wings opened behind him and he flew right above the pirate ship. From the sky, he could see the pirates raiding and pillaging the village. Seeing this sight, he no longer held back. What he hated the most is the kind of pirates that acted like this. Lucas knew that Luffy is quite special and not evil so he was fine with him. But pieces of shit like these guys in front of him. There was no need to show them mercy. All of a sudden, a heavy rain fell on the island. When Lucas held his hand up, the rain. Stopped. Huh. What? What's happening? The rain. Both pirates and villagers alike watched the raindrops hover in midair. Suddenly, as if attracted by something, the raindrops combined and formed into spears. Once Lucas held his hand down, these water spears started to spin in high speeds and stabbed into every pirate in the island. Ah! Gah! It hurts! Lucas didn't kill anyone to give an image that he wasn't a murderer to the public. 
besides, he himself doesn't want to kill too much as well. As the villagers looked at him descending on the ground and the wings on his back, they all cheered. We're saved. An angel. An angel has saved us. On the way to Alabasta, Lucas performed similar actions and would clear the island of pirates. Soon, everyone got to know his name. The savior and angel of the people. Guardian Wing Lucas. Sengoku read the news as well and was satisfied. At least there was one guy in the Shichibukai that's actually doing his job properly. Whenever he recalled the other Shichibukai, his head would hurt and he would feel like he's grown even older. Days flew by as Lucas gets nearer to Alabasta. Lucas sighed as he stared at the island in front of him. Another island for him to work. Without Luffy in the rest, sailing. Is really boring even this work is boring. There isn't anyone who can fight him at all. The only accompaniment he had was an ice-cold block as well who wouldn't even respond to his jokes. If possible, he really wanted to toss her out in the sea and leave her be. Lucas also hoped if he could meet at least one of the so-called supernova pirates of the worst generation but he hasn't seen any of them yet. Why does he want to meet them? Actually, there wasn't any reason, mainly just to satisfy his boredom. After reaching the island, Lucas sighed again when he saw pirates terrorizing the place. There really is a lot of pirates in this era of pirates. He only took a glance and when he saw there wasn't any noteworthy pirates, he waved his hand and finished everyone off. Actually, even Hina felt it was too repetitive as well. At first, she was surprised by how powerful Lucas was. But after a few islands of repeated actions, she had grown numb and only reported back to the HQ to ask for people to send the pirates Lucas caught. Only in these times were her abilities was useful. Lucas didn't need to worry about anyone running away after she cages them one by one. With this, they didn't have to stay on the island and wait for the marine ship to take the pirates. Lucas and Hina were about to leave after calming the people down when suddenly, someone spoke to them. You piece of trash is not bad at all. Surprised with the sudden bad mouthing, Lucas turned to look who had spoken. What he saw was. A purple-haired woman holding a giant flag wearing a red top hat with goggles and curled horns at the side while smoking a cigarette. The problem was. This girl is wearing a red jacket and tie with the front completely open. If the wind blew a little to the side. I bet you can see pink cherries on top of those two twin hills of hers. Lucas blinked for a while as he tried to remember who this bold woman was. Was it? Bello Betty? One of the Revolutionary Army's commanders. Ha! Huh. But why is she here? Actually, before being sent to this world, Lucas had only read up to after the whole cake arc and just before the supposed reverie. He doesn't know what happens from that point on and this Bello Betty was only shown briefly as well. Naturally, her image led him to remember her. Who would forget a girl who wear clothes like this? But. Why is she here? From what Lucas can recall, she is. The East Army Commander. So. Doesn't that mean she should be in East Blue or something? Since he was confused, he asked. Why is the East Army Commander of the Revolutionary Army here in the first half of the Grand Line? Oh. Punk, you know who I am. Well, that huge flag kinda gives it away. The flag already has the logo of the Revolutionary Army after all. Dragon sent me to find you and monitor you. He wants to know what your intentions are. Intentions? Ah, he must be worried since the news has been making me as someone who had betrayed Luffy. Lucas thought so. Also, your abilities are better suited with us. Why don't you join the revolutionary instead of hanging around with this hag? Who are you calling a hag, you revolutionary exhibitionist? I'm proud of my body unlike you, marine hag. No one wants to look at a pile of meat, revolutionary pervert. Hag. Pervert. Watching these two women curse at each other with expressionless looks and smoking a cigarette, Lucas can't help but think. Aren't these two just getting along fine? Finally, Hina turned to him and pointed at Betty. Lucas, why haven't you beaten this pervert for indecent exposure yet? What do you mean? It's not like she's showing those certain spots. 
A vein popped on Hina's temple when she heard his excuse. She's a revolutionary. Get her. Hey, my job is only to restrain pirates isn't it? The revolutionary are your problem. Lucas shrugged. He didn't really want to involve himself with the revolutionary army. Might as well just walk away and pretend he didn't see anything. Seeing Lucas walk away, Hina stomped and glared at Betty. Lucas didn't care at all about their fight as he only waited in the ship. Finally, Hina returned with bruises followed by Betty who was in similar condition. They tied. No, it seems that Betty is in a better condition than Hina. Lucas wasn't really aware of Betty's overall power. Only knew that she had the ability to rally people or something. But there was one thing he was confused. Why is she following along? Hina can't get rid of her, and she insisted on following. Hina might as well monitor you both than let one get away. Lucas started to pity Hina. Just a little bit though. Hina no longer spoke to him and went into the cabin to rest and report to HQ. Lucas turned to look at Betty. Are you really not gonna button up your jacket? Do you want me to? Good question. Chapter 36 What? Marine Ford Several Marine cadets were running laps when they heard a loud shout from the main building and tripped. Was that? The Fleet Admiral shouting? Inside the Fleet Admiral's office, Garp was laughing hard while pounding on Sengoku's desk. Bwahaha. He actually sent Bello Betty to watch over that brat. This is blatant seduction. As expected from my son. Bwahaha. Garp. This is no laughing matter. If that guy turns to the revolutionary. Sengoku rubbed his temples as his head hurt just thinking about it. Why is a commander of the revolutionary even in the first half of the Grand Line? Are they planning something? You ask me, who do I ask? It's not like I know what that guy's thinking. Garp shrugged and said jokingly. Just send Momosaji then, that should balance the odds. Ha ha ha. You're right. Bwaha. Eh. Hold on Sengoku, I'm just joking. If she finds out that I suggested this, she won't shut up about it. Not my problem. Anyway, we can't send anyone admiral ranked, they all have things to do. And as far as I know, Momosaji doesn't have any critical assignments at the moment. Sengoku no longer cared about Garp's reaction and called Momosaji. Seeing as Sengoku was serious, Garp no longer stayed and left. It wasn't like he was afraid of Momosaji, but it's too annoying when that girl nags him. Sengoku saw this and sighed while shaking his head. Really, this guy is supposed to be the hero of the Marines. If Lucas knew about their discussion, no doubt, he would be distressed. Damn. Why do these people keep sending women to me? Do they really think I'm that kind of person? Well, Lucas doesn't really know about it so there was nothing he could do. On a certain island. A certain man with runic tattoos on his left side of his face looked around. This man was none other than the leader of the revolutionary army, Monkey D. Dragon. And. Where's Betty? Um, she just reported in. She said she's monitoring that new Shichibukai, Lucas, and is now sailing with him along with the marine captain, Black Cage Hina. A guy with a top hat and goggles answered. He had blonde hair and what seemed like a burn mark on his face. If Luffy was here, he would recognize this guy as his sworn brother that had died in the past, Sabo. The one who betrayed the Straw Hats. Why? That. She said she was just passing by and was about to help an island that was being terrorized by some rogue pirates when the Shichibukai appeared and saved everyone. She seems to think that she can make him join us. After saying that, Sabo hesitated but eventually asked. What is it with the straw hats that even you seem to pay attention to them so much? And this straw hat Luffy. Somehow. Seems familiar. At this point, Sabo hasn't yet recalled his past so hearing about Luffy, he only had this faint feeling inside him but can't quite put his finger on it. Dragon naturally knew Sabo's past with his son Luffy. He thought for a moment before deciding. Since that's the case, just let her be. I'm sure she has her own plans. 
But with her gone, Sabo, why don't you go to East Blue after the meeting? Well. Okay then. Also, it seems she already used you as her excuse anyway. Dragon turned to look at the rest of the commanders. Well then. Let's begin the meeting. In around two years' time. We will be launching an attack on the world government. Just like how a small flap of a butterfly's wing can cause a storm on the other side of the world, the calm balance of the world has. Slowly but surely. Started to waver. At this moment, Lucas has no idea just how much he has already changed the future that he knew. Currently, Lucas is in a dilemma. A crisis even. There was only one bed in this small ship. He was able to make Hina sleep on the couch but this Betty. I don't mind sleeping with you. You. Of course, just sleeping. Or were you expecting something else, you piece of trash? Lucas' mouth twitched. At the corner of his eyes, he can see Hina looking at him smugly. These two bitches. If he can master that awakening ability, he can just directly sink these two and be on his way. The author, you deserve this for taking away Nami and Robin you bastard. Lucas thought of simply pushing these two down and have his way but ultimately sighed and simply laid on the bed. He wasn't that kind of person anyway. The following day, Lucas was still wide awake. He wasn't able to sleep at all. He was a bit worried that Betty or Hina would suddenly pull a camera Dendon mushy from somewhere and take a picture of him and Betty on the bed together and use it to blackmail him. Of course, he can just refuse to sleep on the bed but this was his ship. He can't let anyone push him away from his bed. Thanks to this stupid stubbornness, he wasn't able to sleep a wink at all. And then, he thought. If he wasn't going to sleep anyway. Why did he have to put himself in that position? No way. Did I get infected by Sanji somehow? Achoo. Back in Water 7, Sanji sneezed inexplicably. Ah uh, I wonder which pretty lady is thinking about me. Zoro simply stared at the idiot for a moment then continued to train. Back to Lucas, after waking up, Lucas continued with his training. He did some push-ups and curl-ups with Betty and Hina watching over him. Being stared at by these two women, eventually, Lucas felt uncomfortable. Can't you guys do anything other than, you know, staring at me? Hina is monitoring this revolutionary exhibitionist too. Betty is staring at this marine hag too. Once again, the of them started to bicker. Lucas stopped caring about them and focused on training his body. Before, he can only do simple push-ups. But after a few days, he can do one-hand push-ups, then one finger, then handstand push-ups. Seeing that the push-ups had become easier for him, Betty started to sit on his back. Every time Lucas pushed up, she would talk trash to him, it was a weird scene. The next day, Lucas saw a faint shadow of an island in the distance. Looking at the eternal log pose, he knew that they had finally arrived at their destination. Lucas stared at Alabasta in front of him and sighed. He had arrived in this world and the first island he saw was Alabasta. Now, he is returning so soon. At the harbor, people started to clamor when they saw a pirate ship getting near. A pirate ship? Isn't it a bit too small for a pirate ship? You're right. Hmm. That sign. When the ship got near, they also saw the logo on the flag and recognized it. It's the Guardian Wing. He has arrived to Alabasta. Quick. Inform the king and the princess. After getting off the ship, Lucas was already greeted by a number of soldiers. All of which had their weapons turned to him. What a warm welcome this was. Even Hina was a bit taken aback. From what she remembered, his treatment shouldn't be like this. You're a traitor of the Straw Hats, then you are a traitor to Alabasta. Leave at once. We don't want you Shichibukai here. So it was their fault. Hina thought so as she watched Lucas' reaction, expecting him to be saddened with this situation but. She only saw him still calm despite seeing an entire nation he had saved in the past now hate him. Still, she knew that this was just a front. No doubt, he is hurting very badly inside. Suddenly, Hina snapped out of it. 
why was she so worried about what this guy feels? He's a pirate, she's a marine. There was no need for her to care so much. But what was this feeling? As if this situation feels wrong. Right, it was supposed to be Lucas' job to regain Alabasta's trust. Hina thinks he's not doing his job properly. No wonder Hina was so worried. After thinking that, Hina patted Lucas. Don't listen to them. You just arrived and they don't know your situation. Lucas turned to look at Hina in a confused shock. He lifted his hand and touched Hina's forehead and muttered. That's weird, are you sick? Hina's face twitched and her fist trembled as she tried to hold herself back from hitting him. This bastard. If only you weren't a Logia, Hina will definitely hit you in the nuts. Just then, a big duck ran over to their side while carrying a familiar blue-haired girl. Ah, Vivi, Kuro, are you both well? Lucas didn't mind the weapons pointing at him as he warmly greeted the two. Quack. Eh. Kuro, you seem to look tastier than before. Quack. Quack quack. The angry Kuro smacked Lucas in the head with his wing but Lucas didn't mind it and just laughed. He had truly missed these two. Vivi chuckled when she saw that Lucas didn't seem to have changed much at all. No, he had certainly changed, but the overall feeling she got from him was still the same as before. In fact, she doesn't really know if she had fallen in love with this man. She can only recall the fact that he, a person from another world, had risked his life to save her kingdom. And she could also tell at that time, whenever things went sideways, Lucas never really looked surprised. As if he already knew that things would be alright. I guess. Seeing that, I felt reassured as well for some reason. Vivi thought so. This was also the main reason why she wanted him to stay before. As if she could feel that if Lucas is with her, everything would be okay. Lucas gave that kind of vibe to her. Actually, this can only be blamed on Lucas' mentality. Back when he had just arrived in this world, he had no power. But he knew the story. He knew that even if he did not intervene, everything would still be okay. He was not needed in this world at all. But. There are still a few people who do need him. If it had happened like in the original story, there would be plenty of casualties in that war in Alabasta. The Sky Island will also be in even worse shape than it is now. All there are also the future victims of Blackbeard. All these people may be meaningless and unknown. But that's alright. Maybe Lucas thinks of himself as one of them. An extra. Back in his homeworld, he was a nobody. An extra, just like them. If he deserves a second shot on being something more, then those people also deserve this chance. Of course, this does not include those meaningless evil pirates. If he had unknowingly saved one, then he will just catch them in the future. Lucas knows he can't save everyone, but he can save as much as he can. This was not him having some sort of hero complex. This is him still figuring out what to do with this new life other than helping out Luffy and the others. Lucas is not some evil unfeeling bastard. If he can save someone, then why not? He has the power now anyway. Vivi smiled as she looked at Lucas. Seeing him now, she was no longer worried. She can feel that Lucas has his own reasons for leaving Luffy and the crew. Especially after seeing that mark on his left arm. In the past, they only used a marker to make that sign so naturally, it had faded after some time. For him to still have this sign now. It must have been tattooed. Ah, but it seems he added a design of his own as well. On Lucas' left arm was a thick X mark, and on both sides was a pair of small wings. Looking at his tattoo, even Vivi had an urge to have one as well. All right everyone, lower your weapons. These people are our guests. But. Princess, he. It's fine. In any case, he had come with a marine captain, they are guests. Now, go back to your stations. You understood, your highness. The soldiers saluted once and left to go back to their stations. Betty saw this and clicked her tongue. You piece of shit have quite a charismatic wife. Ah, uh, she's not. We're not really. 
Lucas turned to look at Vivi to see how she'll react but. Vivi seemed to act as if she never heard anything and simply walked away. Still, Lucas can see the back of her ears turn red. Lucas sighed. It seems. He is in big trouble this time. Because of that, the four people and one duck walked with an awkward air around them. Lucas glanced at Vivi and whispered. Shall we ditch them? Eh. How? Hee hee, hold on tight. Lucas grinned and took Vivi in a princess carry. His wings opened up behind him which he flapped as they flew to the skies. Hina wasn't able to react in time and only sighed when she saw the two already in the sky. She looked at Betty and Kuro then puffed a smoke. Maybe it was a mistake to volunteer for this mission. On the other hand, Betty looked at Lucas' wings and was curious. Just why is it that he has such wings? It's not like he came from a winged race. And he can also make it appear and disappear at will. Lucas probably isn't aware of it, but his image as an angel is quite impactful. If the revolutionary can rope in this guy, and together with her own ability. They can convert more people to fight with them. Betty licked her lips as numerous ideas formed in her head. Meanwhile, Kuro was also looking at Lucas' wings, then to his own wings. Quack. My role is being stolen. In the skies, Vivi's eyes dazzled at the sight of her kingdom below. When she was a kid, Pell would also carry her on his back as they flew across the kingdom. Later on, as she grew older, she was no longer able to ride on his back again and enjoy that sensation. Thank you, Lucas. It's nothing. After that, the two fell silent while slowly flying in the sky. Eventually, Vivi asked him. How's Luffy and the others? They're still the same. It was really fun. Sailing with them. What happened, Lucas? Why did you become a Shichibukai? Lucas sighed and recounted what happened, starting from Long Ring Island. Vivi didn't interrupt him as he told his story. After hearing what happened, Vivi was also worried. I didn't know that Miss All Sunday had that kind of past. But will they be okay? After they leave Water 7, won't the Marines be waiting for them? Ha, huh, they should be alright. They will have their new ship by then, I look forward to seeing it one day. Lucas remembered Thousand Sunnies coup de burst in the original story. With something like that, they should be able to easily escape the Marines. Vivi looked at Lucas and her heart skipped a beat. There it is again. That calmness. As if he really knows that everything will be okay. Vivi snapped out of it soon and they continued to chat about their journey. Some time passed, Lucas finally landed in front of the royal palace and met King Cobra who was visibly upset seeing him together with Vivi. Lucas cleared his throat in an attempt to smooth things over. Cough, I'm your majesty. Have you been well? How about I give you a massage? I don't need a mass. Age. Lucas didn't bother hearing his reply and quickly massaged his shoulders while using his healing ability. The result was naturally quite relaxing. It was so relaxing that King Cobra could only glare at Lucas and no longer spoke. Vivi saw this and thought she should also ask for a massage later. But thinking about it, it was quite embarrassing. At the side, Betty asked. Trash, give me a massage as well later. Can't this girl speak nicely at all? Lucas sighed and pretended not to hear her. Anyway, he's not obligated to listen to her. Oh yeah, I was meaning to ask, but these two are. King Cobra finally snapped out of it and asked Lucas as he looked over the two women wearing shades and smoking a cigarette. Are they sisters or something? Ah, the ice block over there is Hina. She was sent by the marines to monitor me. And that exhibitionist over there is Bello Betty. Apparently, she was sent by the revolutionary to monitor me as well. What the heck? Now that he mentions it, one is indeed a marine captain and they also saw her back when Luffy and the rest were here previously. She was the one attacking their ship at that time. As for the other. Upon closer look, the logo on that flag she's carrying. Is the revolutionary army. Revolutionary flag. That appearance. Bello Betty. 
Isn't she the East Army commander of the Revolutionary Army? Why the hell is she here monitoring a Shichibukai? Lucas saw their reaction and just waved his hands. Don't mind them. Just think of them as a statue and a pervert. Chapter 37 After briefly explaining the situation to King Cobra, Lucas was led to his room. Of course, Betty and Hina both got separate rooms as well. Never mind staying in his room, if those two are put together, they would always end up fighting. He laid there on his bed and was about to sleep when someone knocked on his door. Can I come in? Vivi? Come in. Lucas opened the door and saw Vivi wearing a light blue negligee. For a moment, he was dumbstruck by her beauty and was at a loss for words. Why would Vivi come into his room at this time wearing something like this? While all sorts of ideas appeared in his mind, Vivi let herself in and looked out the window. Seeing this, Lucas knew that she didn't come for that and was a bit embarrassed. He cleared his throat and asked. What is it? Can't sleep. Un. I've been thinking. About? Vivi didn't answer for a while, seemingly hesitating on something. Lucas didn't hurry her and simply waited. After a while, she spoke. You said. You were forming a separate crew. To back Luffy and the others when the time comes. Yes. Still confused, Lucas asked. Vivi turned around and looked at him in the eye. Lucas could see her determination as she spoke. I want to join. Vivi, do you understand what you're saying? I can't take you away from here, this is your kingdom. Lucas sweated. If Sengoku learns that he converted a royalty to be a pirate. Who knows just what he'll do to him. Actually, he couldn't care less about Sengoku. What he was more worried about was. Vivi's father, King Cobra. When he just took Vivi for a spin in the sky, he was already upset. If he took her to the seas this time. Lucas had hurt just thinking about it. While Lucas was having a dilemma, Vivi spoke again. I understand your worries. I have thought about it, and I still want to join. Lucas was about to speak but seeing Vivi's determination, the words won't come out from his mouth. Fufu, don't worry. I won't be joining openly. I just want to let you know, if the time ever comes, you can count on Alabasta to back you up as well. I see. Lucas understood her intentions and no longer said anything. He sighed and sat on the bed. Geez, you scared me for a moment there. I don't even know what I'll do if your father learns I snatched you and took you to the seas to be a pirate. Vivi giggled at that and she also sat beside him on the bed. Me aside, I think Koza might actually want to come with you. Koza? Vivi nodded. Un, after everything had settled, he doesn't have much to do other than help his father manage Yuba. You should try to ask him. Lucas remembered the former rebellion leader and Vivi's childhood friend. Koza had quite a charisma with him as well and he can also fight well. With some training, he would be much stronger too. Plus, Lucas also knows that he is very loyal so he would very much want him on board as well. The problem is. Will he join him? Lucas can still remember that Koza said they didn't want to fight before. Rather, they had no choice but to fight. Will he be willing to have a life of a pirate? Well, I guess it wouldn't hurt to ask first. Lucas thought so and stopped thinking about it. Vivi and him continued to sit there in silence. Eventually, Vivi asked. Can I? See your phone again? It's been a while since I played with it. Oh, sure. Here. The two continued to chat and take pictures. Lucas also showed her the pictures and videos he took. Vivi seemed to especially like the video he took of Chopper with a blindfold and trying to hit him as he go, E.I. 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 Lucas watched Vivi's laughing face lit up by the moonlight outside the window and was once again entranced. Vivi also noticed his look and blushed. Silently, she closed her eyes. Lucas took a gulp and his heart quickened both didn't make a move. Vivi. You should know. I'm now in a relationship with Nami and Robin. So. Vivi opened her eyes and smiled sadly. Hee <laughs> hee, 
I had a feeling that was the case. Seeing her smile, Lucas felt guilty. He wanted to apologize but felt that if he did, he might hurt her even more. The two fell silent once again. Then, Vivi asked. The two of them? Ah. Yes. At first, it was only Nami then, after the incident with Eni's lobby. She said she and Robin had a talk. After that. Well. Lucas scratched his head, embarrassed by explaining his love life with another girl who had feelings for him. Vivi started to mutter but Lucas was too embarrassed to focus on it so he didn't hear it. So they are fine with sharing. If so. Maybe me too if it's Nami, it should be alright. As for Miss All Sunday, Robin. I also forgive her already so it's also okay if Nami's okay with it. Hmm. Did you say something? Vivi pouted. This idiot. Suddenly, the door sprung open and they heard a familiar voice. Trash, I heard your massage is good. Let me exp. Lucas and Vivi started at Betty while Betty also stared at the two back. Then. She closed the door and left while leaving behind some words. You brats better not be loud. That virgin hag is right next door, it will be troublesome if she intervenes midway. Vivi stood up with her face still red. W.L. then, I should get going. Ah, uh, why yes. Good night, Vivi. Un, good night, Lucas. Lucas saw Vivi at the door but before Vivi stepped out, she turned around again and gave Lucas a kiss. Surprised, Lucas was unable to respond for a few seconds when Vivi finally separated. A kiss won't hurt, right? Vivi smiled and quickly left, leaving Lucas still standing there in stupor. After some time, Lucas shook his head. I really am in trouble now. Sighing, he went back to his bed and noticed something. Ah, uh, Vivi didn't return my phone. Lucas thought of looking for her but after what just happened, he shook his head and thought of looking for her tomorrow instead. Outside Lucas' room, Vivi glared at Betty and quickly escaped to her own room. Betty sighed and shook her head. TSK TSK, if you don't do it with him, don't blame me for stepping in first. Betty giggled and reopened Lucas' door. Lucas glared at Betty and asked. What are you here for? Didn't I say? Give me a massage. Feeling that this girl wouldn't shut up about it unless he gave her a massage, Lucas sighed. Fine. Betty smiled and laid down on his bed face down. Then, she removed her jacket. Did you have to strip? Oh. Isn't this how massages are? Lucas sighed again. Why is it that he always gets caught up with this woman's pace? Is this related to her power or something? Anyway, she's laying face down so he can only see her back. Though, her huge twin peaks are still somewhat visible at the sides. Damn you Oda. Why did you have to draw her so sexily? Lucas thought of Nami and Robin to stop himself from thinking anything dirty about Betty. The surface of his hands turned to water and he started the massage. MMH. Ah. Right there. So. Good. It's coming. Damn. This bitch is doing this on purpose. What's coming? Suddenly, the door slammed open once again. Bam. What the hell are you two doing? Hina barged in and shouted. When she saw the situation, she showed a rare blush on her face. Damn it. Hina thought that. Hina shook her head and sighed. Pervert, just a massage and you're getting horny. Virgin hag, you should try it, it really does feel good. You're the virgin. Who said Hina is a virgin? You're not. Hina refused to pay any more attention to Betty and finally turned to Lucas. And you? Why are you giving her a massage? Why are you suddenly angry at me? I didn't do anything. Lucas was speechless. Why did he suddenly attract this female boss aggro? Nevertheless, he was a bit grateful that Hina intervened. If she didn't, who knows what he might have done. He should be nicer to her from now on. Do you want a massage too? Inside Vivi's room, Vivi buried herself under the sheets and rolled around. Ah. 
I can't believe I kissed him. What do you mean a kiss wouldn't hurt? Stupid. That kiss only made things worse. How can I look at Lucas again tomorrow? Vivi stopped rolling and thought about it. Soon, she started rolling again while screaming on her pillow. Hmm. Ah, I forgot to return his phone. When she felt that something was still on her hands, she looked and saw it was Lucas' phone. After some hesitation, she decided not to return it to him tonight and wait for another day. Staring at the phone, she remembered the pictures that Lucas showed and opened the gallery app. She looked at the picture she took together with Lucas earlier. They were both smiling in that picture. Ah. I forgot I was still wearing my sleepwear. Vivi blushed and only now noticed that she was in her negligee when she visited Lucas. No wonder he was fidgeting so much. Ah. How can she approach Lucas again tomorrow? Vivi stared at the phone for a while. Subconsciously, her fingers tapped on the camera app. While on her bed, she started taking selfies in various poses. Only after some time did she think that she'll have to still return the phone. With a red face, she deleted every photo of her just now. Once all of her pictures were deleted, she sighed in relief. As if to satisfy some kind of urge, she started taking selfies again. Anyway, I'll just delete them later, might as well take a few more pictures. And, this one looks cute, I'll take a few more. Finally satisfied, she looked at the pictures one last time and deleted them. When she reached the last picture which she thinks is the cutest one, she hesitated for a while before deciding not to delete it. One picture should be okay. Right? Vivi continued to play with the phone and finally saw a folder named Treasures. When she tapped on it, it was asking her for a password. Treasures. Ah, it should be Nami huh? Vivi typed in Nami but it didn't accept it. After thinking for a bit, she continued to type in other words. On her third try, she typed Ilovanami on a whim and suddenly, the folder opened. Yes. Got it. Now, to look at the treasures. After seeing what was inside, Vivi went silent and started blushing. Wow. This Nami. So bold. Her pictures were even sexier and bolder than hers. Should I also? No no. It's too embarrassing. Vivi laughed to herself and continued to play around with the phone. Eventually, she had already fallen asleep without noticing it. The next day, Lucas woke up and got out of his room. Once he opened his door, he found Vivi passing by. Ah. The two of them silently stared at each other for a while. Suddenly, from the rooms beside Lucas, the doors opened at the same time as Hina and Betty both came out. What are you trashes staring at so early in the morning? Betty asked when she saw the awkward situation, totally not caring about the mood. Vivi blushed but didn't back down. Come on, breakfast is ready, let's eat. Well, let's go then. Lucas walked beside Vivi as they went to the dining hall with Hina and Betty following behind. Everyone seemed to have the same agreement of not mentioning last night. They met with King Cobra and the others who were exchanging looks with Lucas and Vivi, then to Betty and Hina. They felt like something happened last night. Chapter 38 Sabadi Archipelago Lucci and the rest of the former CP9 had finally landed in this place as directed by Lucas. When they first saw this place, they didn't quite understand what Lucas meant. From what they can see, this seemed to be a fun place with lots of attractions and novelties. Then they saw a world noble. He was wearing some kind of hazmat suit as if he can't stand breathing the same air as the others. The world noble was riding on some bloodied man walking on all fours and in chains. Behind him, he was also dragging on several women with bruises all over their bodies. Behind them, there was a giant who was also trailing along. There were collars in all of their necks. These are the so-called world nobles. Kaku raised a brow while Luchi just remained silent. None of them really minded what they saw that much. At most, only Khalifa looked uncomfortable. Jabra snorted. I guess this is what that Lucas wanted us to see. What a joke, he thinks that if we see this scene, we will turn to him. 
Luchi, what do we do? Blueno asked. Let's go. There's nothing to see here. Luchi turned around and no longer bothered with Lucas. The only reason they tagged along with what Lucas said was to get away from him and the Marines. As for going to Sabadi Archipelago, it was simply to satisfy their curiosity. Now that they saw it, there was no use staying anymore. Everyone else looked at each other and shrugged. Soon, they turned around as well and followed Luchi. Hold it. You lot. Hearing someone calling them out, they stopped. Why are you not kneeling? Can't you see I'm here? As the world noble had said, everyone around was on their knees. Only they were still standing at this moment. Damned snotty brat. Why would we kneel to you? Jabra was pissed. This was the first time some kid asked him to kneel before him. You. I'm Bevis. A world noble. You lot are just lesser people. Do you understand? I am your god. Why you? Jabra, don't. Kaku quickly held Jabra down when he saw that he was about to kill the world noble. The world noble seemed to have noticed something and nodded. On, that girl, give her to me. As for the rest, kill them. Especially that guy that's still not turning around. Yes. The giant behind him nodded and charged towards Luchi and the rest. Seeing the situation turn for the worse, Blueno quickly opened an air door and pushed everyone in. Ha! Huh. Where did they go? The world noble looked around but no longer saw them in the area. Pissed, he shouted at the giant angrily. Go! Kill everyone in the area. Yes. Everyone paled and they all quickly ran for their lives. Soon, the area was filled with screams and horror. After some time. There were only bodies and blood all over the place. Even his own slaves were killed as well. Luchi and the others watched this happen from Blueno's door dimension. These world nobles are. Just where is the justice in this? Suddenly, they heard a growling sound. Turning around, they saw Luchi had already transformed. Actually, he was already mid-transformation when Blueno had pushed everyone in his air door. Luchi pulled out the Dendon mushy that Lucas gave them and gave Lucas a call. Have you made a decision? Lucas went back to his room to get out of Hina and Betty when he got Luchi's call. Tell me, these world nobles. Are you going to kill them? I take it you already met them. Wait, you didn't go and kill them, right? I'm not an idiot. I know this isn't the right time. Luchi gritted his teeth. Actually, he was already about to kill one but there's no need to tell him that. Well, you're right. This isn't the time. If I follow you, will I get to kill one someday? You must really hate them huh? What happened? Lucas asked. At first, he thought that he won't be able to gain Luchi as this guy really only wanted an excuse to kill. At most, Lucas thought he could gain one or two of the former CP9 but he didn't expect the world noble to help him so much. If that world noble called Bevis or whatever didn't bother with Luchi, then this wouldn't have happened. After hearing the situation, Lucas was angered as well. Why wait for someday? Go kill that guy now. Everyone is already dead, as long as no one else sees you. Well, you get what I mean. What about his giant slave? I reckon after killing the world noble, he would ask you to kill him as well. If not, then take him with you when you return. Or, don't tell me you can't do it. Hearing Lucas' provocation, Luchi let out a menacing grin. Besides him, Jabra had also transformed. Let me do it. Let me kill that turd. How about we race for it? Luchi smiled. He truly wanted to try. And kill a god. Blueno looked at the two and sighed. He found a blind spot and opened the air door for them. The two disappeared from their view. In an instant, the world noble Bevis acting so haughtily before. Was sliced into ribbons. Luchi and Jabra reappeared beside Blueno the next moment and Blueno closed the air door again. As for the giant, Blueno already got him in his air door while Luchi and Jabra killed the world noble. Damn it. 
I was only able to slice the corpse. Humph, you were too slow. Luchi looked at the giant and asked. Live or die? Choose. Let me go. I will. Take the blame. For killing that bastard. Very well. Blueno opened the air door and released the giant who went to the world noble's corpse and started stomping on it. Once the world noble was reduced to minced meat, no one should be able to tell the cause of death. This should be enough to take the blame. The former CP9 members watched as the giant was found by marines and started to give chase. Luchi picked up the Denden Mushi once again. We're in. Luchi grinned. It seems. Following Lucas might very well be worthwhile. The others also didn't have any opinion, they were willing to join as well since Luchi has already spoken. Lucas hung up after telling Luchi and the rest where he was so they can meet up. Hina saw Lucas leave his room. What was that about? Achen. Luchi and the others called. They'll be arriving here after a few days. They should be able to reach Alabasta in a bit over a week at least. There should be eternal log pose for sale as well in Sabadi Archipelago so there's no worry of them getting lost. Hina's eyes narrowed. She felt that Lucas is hiding something else but she had no way to find out what. Lucas just shrugged and made his rounds in the kingdom. Helping here and there, making some rain. Those kinds of things. Eventually, the citizens did change the way they looked at him. In his free time, other than chatting with Vivi, he would train on his body in hockey as well. As always, Hina and Betty watched Lucas train on his own. One day, Vivi asked. Why do you keep training physically? Do you even need to? I mean, you can turn into and control water. Actually, they say that a human is mostly made of water as well, using that logic, can't you control the water in a human's body, then? Lucas looked at her and suddenly laughed, causing Vivi's face to blush. W.Y. are you laughing? Isn't that the case? Ha ha ha, sorry. Well, I actually thought the same when I first got this power. Unfortunately things don't really work that way. Lucas waved his hand and gathered the water vapor from the air to create a small water orb above his palm. Though I control water from afar, I can't do the same with the water inside a person's body. For that, I will need to touch the person and concentrate deeply to focus on the water molecules for it to work. It isn't really too practical and it's too much work. It's better for me to make a water spear, stab someone, and use the water from that to achieve a similar effect. Plus, doing that is too bloody and gross. Lucas remembered doing something similar to Blackbeard's crew. It was really too nauseous. But. How come that's the case? Hmm, well, I have a theory. If the water, or anything, comes into contact with a living being for a period of time, it will gain some sort of essence that shrouds itself from the devil fruit's powers. For example, there is another Shichibukai named Gekko Moria. He can control shadows with his devil fruit ability. If he can control all shadows at will, then wouldn't he be too powerful? After all, everyone has a shadow. If not the one beneath your feet, it would be under your clothes, hair, even inside your body. But he's unable to do that. He has to touch the shadow, peel it, and sever it from the host before he could control it. There's also Caesar Clown who can control gas. Even he can only take control of the air around the person rather than inside the person himself. I see. I think. I somehow get it. Vivi appeared to still be confused but nodded anyway. Hearing their conversation, Hina sighed in relief. It seemed she was also afraid that Lucas would suddenly control the water in her body and burst her from the inside. After sighing, she picked up her glass of water and drank from it. Ah, but if a person recently drank water, I can still control that. Cough cough. Hina glared at Lucas. You should have said that sooner. Lucas shrugged. Hey, if I wanted to kill you, you wouldn't be here now. Hina knew what he said was right. Still. She looked at her glass of water and placed it back on the table. Lucas ignored her and looked back to Vivi. Besides, that's just my theory. It could be something else, or something simpler as well. 
Anyway, the fact is that I can't control water inside a person's body from afar. I see. How about seawater then? Can't you simply carry them and use it to deal with devil fruit users? If that were the case, I would grab a barrel like Luffy and fill it with seawater. Alas, once the seawater is disconnected from the sea itself, it loses that effect on devil fruit users. Otherwise, even salt will be deadly to devil fruit users. Ah, uh, you're right. But there is a workaround to that. Back when he captured Blackbeard in his water prison, he left a thin water line connecting it to the sea which was why it was able to restrain Blackbeard. Naturally, there was no need for him to tell this with a marine captain present. Vivi continued to ask as if to satisfy her curiosity in Lucas' powers. Lucas smiled wryly but still answered. How about Akiji's ice? Isn't that water as well? Yes, but controlling water and ice are two different matters. What do you mean? Hmm, imagine two very powerful magnets. Lucas controlled the water orb above his hand to split into two smaller orbs. These two magnets are so strong that it's hard to pry them away from each other. The two small orbs stuck together and didn't budge. This is what happens to water's molecules when water freezes. I can control ice, that's fine. If it was normal ice. Akiji's control over ice is much better than mine as he has had his powers for years now while I only got mine for a bit over a month at most. So I thought, if I control the water molecules enough that they don't stick to each other and create ice, then Akiji wouldn't have control. If it was just two molecules, then it's easy, but do you have any idea how many molecules are there in a single drop of water? Um. A lot. A whole lot. It's easier to make the water hot to loosen up the molecules and create steam. Steam is very light when compared to normal water so it's easy to control. The problem is, Akiji can create ice faster than I can melt. This is why that Akiji is so damn annoying to deal with. He still needed to level up his heat man mode to burn even hotter. It would be best if I can learn armament hockey too. You already took our Rokushiki technique, don't even think about learning hockey from us. Hina spoke but Lucas pretended to be oblivious. What Rokushiki? I don't have it. Where is it? Ah, that. It seems a thief stole it from me back in Water 7. TSK TSK, how careless of me. A vein popped from Hina's forehead. What do you mean stole? You gave it away, didn't you? Hina could only think of this and not speak. Instead, she stood up to take her Denden Mushi and report this to Sengoku. Suddenly, they heard Betty finally speak. Trash, I can teach you if you want. Armament hockey, that is. Eh. Really? But you'll have to come with me to meet Dragon. Lucas was about to answer when suddenly, another voice shouted and came crashing in the training grounds. That won't happen. Betty's eyes narrowed and quickly dodged. After a loud boom, another figure could be seen standing on the spot where Betty used to be. It was a woman with black hair and long legs. She had a spider tattoo on her left thigh and a sword on her waist as well as a cloak of justice on her shoulders. Lucas tried to remember her but can't quite think of a name. Luckily, Heineman was nearby. Vice Admiral Momosaji. Hearing the name and title, Lucas finally remembered. What the hell? Isn't she supposed to be one of the admiral candidates? A potential admiral level officer is here. Seeing Momosaji, Betty clicked her tongue. Tisk, time's up huh? Lucas, think about what I said. I'll be leaving now. Come back here, revolutionary. Momosaji pulled her sword and started to give chase to Betty. After some time, Lucas snapped out of it. Huh, did she call me using my name just now? Chapter 39 After some time, Momosaji met with them once more in the dining hall. Judging from the fact that she's alone, everyone can pretty much guess that Betty managed to escape. With a stern face, she scolded King Cobra. Why is Alabasta letting a commander of the Revolutionary Army rest in the royal palace? It can't be helped, no one here can really beat her. Feeling that he has a point, Momosaji redirected her anger to Lucas. 
why is a Shichibukai not doing anything to capture her? The Shichibukai system is supposed to deter the Yonko, in other words, we only deal with pirates. The revolutionary is your problem. Feeling that he also has a point, Momosaji turned to look at Hina and was about to speak when Lucas cut in. Why is a vice admiral not able to capture one commander of the revolutionary army? I. Momosaji was speechless. Why was she the one being scolded now? The thing was. She has no excuse at all. Hina looked at Lucas and felt complicated. Should she feel grateful to him that she wasn't scolded or angry at him for scolding her superior? At the side, Vivi tried hard not to laugh at the situation. Momosaji glared at Lucas and wished she can cut him to pieces. Seeing the air becoming tenser by the second, King Cobra intervened. Well, calm down. Igaram, why don't you show Vice Admiral Momosaji to the guest room? Yes, your majesty. This way please, Vice Admiral. Fine. Momosaji snorted and left to her room. Vivi saw Lucas smiling smugly behind Momosaji and chuckled as she hit him. Stop that, anyway, she is still a Vice Admiral, you should behave. Fine. King Cobra saw the interaction between the two and felt a sense of foreboding. It can't be. My Vivi Chan. Lucas noticed his look as well so he quickly returned to his room to escape. When he laid down on his bed, he sighed deeply. Sigh, seriously. After one left, another troublesome one came. At least Betty was better to look at than this Momosaji chick. What? Missed me already, trash. You are. Be Betty. Damn, you scared me. Lucas looked at Betty who suddenly popped out from the window. Betty didn't mind his reaction and simply walked in and sat on the bed. Hmm. You're hurt. Lucas could see a few slashes on her body and she also seemed to have a few broken bones. After thinking for a bit, Lucas still decided to heal her. Thanks. If you want to thank me, start properly using my name. Thanks, trash. Betty smiled. I'm just joking. Thanks. Lucas. You're welcome. Damn it, what's with this woman acting all cute all of a sudden? Lucas cleared his throat and asked. So, how come you went through the trouble of going back? Our conversation was cut short earlier. As I said, if you want to learn hockey better, it's best if you go see Dragon. You don't have to answer now, but here. This is our contact. If ever you decide in the future, contact us and we will be there. I'll take this then. Anyway, it's good to have contact with them. Lucas had no reason to refuse. Suddenly, Betty gave him a kiss on the cheek before walking to the window. I'll be going now. Thanks again for patching me up. With a wink, she jumped off the window and disappeared. Lucas smiled wryly and scratched his cheek. He can tell that Betty doesn't really have feelings for him. That kiss was something like what an elder sister would give to her little brother. Lucas sighed and laid back on his bed. He took out the paper that Betty gave him and found that it was also a Viva card. I really should get me one of these. I wonder, if I asked Hina, will they give some to me? Morning came. Lucas went with his usual rounds before going back to training. Currently, he can now lift heavy dumbbells like Zoro. Naturally, he hasn't reached Zoro's level of strength yet. At most, he is only a bit below Sanji now. In Lucas' mind, in terms of power, Sanji should be below Zoro at the moment. Of course, if it's simply leg power, Sanji would be stronger. But for overall raw strength, Zoro still wins out. As he was training, a familiar visitor appeared before him. It was Koza. Have you decided? Lucas asked. After Vivi had told him about Koza, he went to find him the next day and ask his opinion. That time, Lucas can see Koza still hesitating so he gave him some time to decide. Koza coming to find him now. Should mean that he had made his decision. I've thought about it. And? I'm in. Lucas smiled. He finally had a trustworthy member in his crew. Good. But I need to know now, 
Do you want to be in the front lines or support from behind? What do you mean? Koza asked, confused by Luca's question. Depending on your answer, I will decide on your training and position. Koza thought for a while before finally answering. If possible, I'd rather not fight. Yet you still chose to join me. Yes, I've talked with Princess Vivi about it. And I've also given it some thought for the past few days. If I can be a part of your crew, it will also mean that Alabasta had gained your protection. This is an investment for a better future of Alabasta. Lucas was taken aback by his reason. You know, even if you don't join, I will still protect Alabasta no matter what. I know, but nevertheless, this is what I must do. Very well. Seeing Koza's conviction, Lucas no longer asked anything. In that case, you will be in charge of intelligence gathering and tactical support. From now on, you are my Vice Captain. Ha! Koza's jaw dropped. How the hell did he end up as the Vice Captain already? Lucas just laughed. Ha, huh, speaking about it, you can be considered as my first mate. Those bunch from CP9 don't really count since they're basically half-forced into joining. Plus, I can rest assured if I leave the crew to you, Vice Captain Koza. Really now? Koza sighed with a wry smile. He doesn't know it yet, but in the future, his name will also be known throughout the Grand Line. When one speaks of Lucas, they will also think about his right-hand man in his Shichibukai days. They say that this man has cards hidden in every corner of the world and knew every news before it even happens and is one of the hidden generals that supported the Pirate King. The Wild Card, Koza After accepting Koza to his crew, Koza said that some guys from the former rebellion group also wanted to come with. Lucas accepted them as well. With this, he now has a sizable crew himself. But now, he has another problem. His personal ship is too small and his real ship is still in the making. As such, he turned to Hina. Hina, lend Lucas a ship. Don't worry, Lucas will give it a paint job so it wouldn't look like a marine ship. A vein popped on Hina's forehead again. Hina felt she's being insulted whenever Lucas talks in third person as well. Hina sighed and ignored Lucas' tone. She called Sengoku to report. Sengoku heard Lucas' request and sighed as well. Fine, give him a ship. Anyway, it's good that he didn't turn to the revolutionary. Now that Betty had escaped, tell Momosaji she can return, there are more important things for her to do. Oh, and it seems Lucas has pretty much completed his mission. Tell him he can leave if he wants. But once he is needed, he better respond. Understood. In his office, Sengoku rubbed his temple and slumped in his chair. With the revolutionary removed from Luka's side, and Alabasta's trust in them again, Sengoku was already satisfied. Still, a lot of things seem to keep popping up that he can't catch his breath. At least he doesn't have to mind Luka's matter for some time. As for granting him freedom, it was a small thing. Anyway, Hina is still there to monitor him so he won't be causing too much trouble. It was more important for him to deal with the more important matters such as the murder of a world noble a few days ago. The entire Sabadi archipelago was nearly destroyed from the incident. Thankfully, they managed to find the culprit and was able to calm down the nobles. But even with that issue somewhat settled, another thing popped up. Sengoku looked at the newspaper and groaned. This guy. After so many years, he finally resurfaced again and did this. Just where has he been hiding all this time? Meanwhile, inside the Devil's Sea, the Florian Triangle. The Straw Hats had finally received the new ship and added in Frankie to their crew. They set off a few days ago to reach Fishman Island when they came across a barrel floating on the sea. The curious Luffy naturally took it and they opened it. As soon as they did, a flare shot up to the sky. Then, a storm arrived and pushed them to the Devil's Sea, the Florian Triangle, where they met a strange talking. Skeleton. This skeleton was Brooke. A person who had eaten the revived devil fruit which explained his appearance. But the strange thing was. Brooke didn't seem to have a shadow at all. And he also can't be reflected in the mirror. Soon, they found themselves trapped in Thriller Bark, 
the gigantic ship of Gekko Moria. At this moment, Nami, Usopp, and Chopper got separated from the group and found themselves in the mansion of Dr. Hogback. After receiving his hospitality, Nami asked Usopp and Chopper to guard the door while she takes a bath. Absalom, who had eaten the invisibility devil fruit, was already inside the bathroom, eagerly waiting for her to strip. Nami was about to remove her clothes when suddenly, she paused. She picked up her climb attack and started to make black clouds casually. Watching her make black clouds, Absalom was confused. Is that staff some kind of toy for taking a bath? But why does it look like a black cloud? Absalom thought about it for a moment but couldn't arrive at a conclusion. Eventually, he just ignored it and thought it was just a toy. Then, he heard Nami speak. The weather is. A chance of thunder and lightning. Nami casually walked to the door and left while flinging a thunderball to the black clouds. Lightning tempo. Jaya. Both Usopp and Chopper looked at the guy that suddenly appeared out of nowhere only to be struck by lightning. Their jaws dropped to the ground. Nami. Scary. Absalom had been hiding in the bathtub and was quite wet. So the lightning that struck him just now was even deadlier. Chopper. Why yes. Nami smiled at Chopper who suddenly straightened his back upon being called by the demon. Would you be so kind as to throw that trash? I'll do it. Chopper quickly turned to his heavy point form and ran inside to grab the unconscious Absalom. He opened the window and didn't care that this wasn't the first floor as he threw Absalom far away. Thank you. I it was nothing. Chopper returned to normal and dashed back outside the bathroom. After closing the door again, Nami sighed in relief. Ichim. Was that what Lucas spoke of? Observation hockey. For a moment there, I could tell that someone was here. Nami placed her index finger to her chin as she pondered. If Lucas was here, he would have been shocked. He didn't think that the before Luffy and Zoro, the first to actually gain observation hockey. Was Nami. Then again, Nami always seemed to have a powerful sixth sense with how she can easily feel the minute changes of the weather. She must have been one of those innate people who had this power from birth. It only matured when she grew up. Lucas must have triggered this innate ability of hers somehow. Nami fell silent and thought. It can't be because of that, right? I should confirm with Robin later. After deciding, Nami felt this new ability of hers. Now that I think about it. This mansion. I can see the whole place, even Dr. Hogback's lab so that's it. I knew that Dr. Hogback was suspicious. We should leave as soon as I take a bath. And, taking a bath is more important. Back in Alabasta, Lucas was surprised to hear that Sengoku agreed to lend him a ship and even let him leave Alabasta. Lucas sighed in relief. Finally, I can start gathering my crew. As soon as Luchi and the others, as well as the ship, arrives, we'll be setting off. Lucas said the same to Koza as well so he can start gathering those who will come with and prepare. Momosaji appeared in front of him and gave him one last glare before leaving. You better not cause any trouble. Sure sure, just go already. This damn brat. Momosaji was this close to slicing off Luca's head. After glaring at him, she left on her ship and started to sail. Lucas looked at Hina and asked. Is she always on her period or something? Hina pretended not to hear him. Lucas shrugged and looked at the sky. Seeing as it was about to get dark, he started to head back to the palace to rest. Seeing Vivi rush towards him with a worried look, Lucas frowned. Vivi? What happened? Are you okay? I'm fine. But. Vivi looked at the newspaper in her hands and passed it to Lucas. Confused, Lucas looked at the contents and finally understood why Vivi was worried. The contents of the newspaper wrote about several islands disappearing in East Blue. I heard that Luffy and them came from East Blue. Do you think? No, none of the islands that disappeared were their homelands. Lucas read the report and sighed in relief when he saw the list of island names. Still, he can't be too relieved just yet. He knows what this event signified. 
It's just that Lucas didn't think that this would also happen here. After all, this event only happened in the movies of One Piece in his world. Since even events from the movies can happen, who's to say the non-canon arcs in the anime will also not happen? If that's the case. Lucas' face became grim. Damn. I didn't pay too much attention to those non-canon arcs. It seems that Lucas had severely underestimated this world and the things happening in the background. Lucas stopped thinking about that for now and focused on the current issue. There was no telling that everything will happen just like in the movie. In the movie, Luffy and the others' homelands were not included in the island's disappearance but now. Lucas can't risk this chance. He turned to Hina and said. Tell Sengoku to hurry it up with the ship. And it better be able to travel the calm belt. You. You're really going to East Blue? Yeah. I'm gonna kick that Shiki's ass to the ground. And, long note below, but please read. TT. MMS Release. Woa. Chapter 40. When Sengoku heard Hina's report, he was surprised. He didn't think that Lucas would actively want to go against a pirate from Roger's era. Shiki isn't some normal pirate. This is the man who had cut off his own legs to escape. He was incredibly more tenacious compared to the normal pirate. This man had also stood alongside the likes of Whitebeard and Roger. Yet Lucas wants to deal him. Moreover, kick his ass to the ground. Sengoku thought for a moment before agreeing to his request. He made a few calls to have a ship capable of sailing the calm belt to be sent to Alabasta as soon as possible. Knowing the opponent he was about to face, Lucas stopped dallying and continued with his training as soon as he can. In fact, he even stopped making his rounds in Alabasta anymore and simply focused on training. The citizens didn't mind. Over time, they had already accepted him after he rounded up some pirates and criminals. He was also able to make rain without the use of rain powder so eventually, the people no longer hated him. Plus, the soldiers had explained to them that Lucas would be dealing with the pirate that caused the islands to disappear in East Blue so they all understood. Even though the matters in East Blue doesn't really affect them, they still wanted to feel safe knowing that whoever was behind it to be put behind bars. Watching over Lucas, Hina also didn't stay idle. She'll still be accompanying Lucas to the East Blue so she naturally should help as much as she can. Especially when it concerns a pirate like Shiki. Hina knows that Shiki isn't a normal pirate. She also needs to power up if she wants to be of some use. Vivi watched the two train and couldn't help but clench her fists. Despite being of royalty, in the face of truly powerful people. She simply cannot do anything but watch and worry. Koza was also pretty busy. He was ordering the people to stock up some rations and other necessities for their travel. Right now, he was simply too weak. The only thing he can do is to support Lucas from behind and make sure he doesn't need to bother about the small things. Five days passed, the ship finally arrived. Luchi and the others also arrived a day earlier and heard of the situation. Lucas gathered everyone on the deck of the ship. Listen up. It doesn't matter who you were in the past. Now, you are a part of the Guardian Wing pirate crew. For our debut, we will be going to the East Blue to stop a pirate. He is known as the Golden Lion Shiki, a pirate from the era of the Pirate King Roger. Thinking excessively, he is on the same level as Whitebeard. Thinking optimistically, he is old and has grown weaker. If any of you want to leave now, then get out. Lucas saw no one was leaving. He nodded. Good. Now, to your stations. We sail for East Blue. Aye. His crew quickly went to their stations to prepare for setting sail. The only ones not moving were Koza and the rest of the former CP9. Luchi chuckled. Whitebeard's level huh? I look forward to it. Seriously, never a dull moment. Kaku shook his head with a smile. Lucasama, do you want to take a bath? Hearing Khalifa ask, Lucas nearly tripped. What the? Lucas. Sama. Lucas looked at Khalifa weirdly. Um, no thanks. I'm fine. At this time, Vivi approached him. She seemed to be smiling, 
yet at the same time, not. Lucas come here. A ah. B B B, wait, stop bullying my cheeks. Vivi ignored his protests and dragged Lucas to the side while pulling on his cheeks. Lucas thought. Why does this situation seem familiar? When they were far from earshot of the rest, Vivi turned to glare at him before sighing. Here, your phone. Ah, uh, I was wondering when you'd return it. Lucas smiled and reached out to take the phone but Vivi suddenly pulled it back. The next moment, Vivi's lips were already touching Lucas. Lucas was surprised for a moment but eventually gave in and kissed her back as well. Koza saw this and scratched his cheek helplessly. These two are too bold. To do this in front of a marine captain and the king. Right, King Cobra was actually present as well as he wanted to see Lucas off along with Vivi. He didn't expect. Didn't expect. To see this scene. King Cobra fainted, seemingly unable to bear the shock. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. Hang in there. Ah. Igarim fainted too. Over here. Chaka and Pell also fainted. Hearing the commotion, Vivi quickly pulled away, her face still red. Um, I should go safe. Yeah. Lucas scratched his head embarrassingly. He really is in deep shit now. Vivi went to her father's side but before she steps out of the ship, she looked at Califa and stuck out her tongue. Califa's face darkened and she was on the verge of using Renkyaku to slice her off. At the side, Hina rubbed her temple in frustration. Sai, can't these two find a better place to do that? Hina feels like Sengoku's gonna give her an earful if she reported what just happened so she decided not to. Lucas looked around. The ship that Sengoku lent them has already been repainted to a white and gold color scheme. The preparations are also finished. It was time to depart. Raise the anchor and drop the sails. I. Standing on the port, Vivi watched on as Lucas' ship disappeared from her view. This was the second time she's seeing him off again. The next time they meet. Who knows when that would be. Vivi inhaled and exhaled deeply to calm herself. The next moment, she opened her eyes with a smile as she heads back to the palace. If she wanted to be of help in the future, first. She must become a great queen. On the other end of the sea, Lucas was also looking back until Alabasta was no longer in sight. Finally, he sighed. Hina saw this and asked. Miss her already? I guess. Lucas shook his head and no longer thought about it. He was worried what Nami and Robin would think if they knew. But that's still a thing of the future. I'll deal with it when the time comes. Somehow. Right now, Lucas needed to focus on the current problem, Shiki. From what he remembers in the movie, Shiki wanted to release a bunch of ferocious beasts that had evolved in a strange way onto East Blue due to his hatred of losing to Roger. In the timeline of that movie, he appeared before Luffy and the rest reached Sabaty and after they got Brooke. They got a newspaper of islands disappearing in East Blue when they met Shiki. Now, that news seemed to have come a bit early, he has no idea where in the sky Shiki is so he can only go to East Blue and wait for him to attack again. Since there is still some time before he reaches East Blue, all he can do now is train. Shiki was not shown to have used hockey in the movie, but someone from Roger's era can't possibly be that weak. The only good thing here is that he isn't a Logia user so it was still fine for Lucas not having learned armament hockey. Whenever Lucas thought about armament hockey, his head hurt. He really needs to be able to do this sooner rather than later. He tried to ask Luchi again but when he explained it, he didn't quite understand it at all. Maybe it is as Betty says, it's better to find a strong teacher. If possible, he wanted to go find Dragon and ask him to teach him but. Lucas turned to Hina. Nope, with this girl here, it would be troublesome. Plus, Shiki wouldn't likely stay put while he trains. Thinking that, Lucas stopped with his physical training for now and focused on strengthening his heat man mode. Just like this, two more days passed. They finally reached the calm belt. Captain. There is a ship sighted on the east. Lucas frowned when one of the crew knocked on his door to report while he was training. A ship? In the calm belt? 
Is it the Marines as well, or? Lucas stood up as soon as he thought of something and got out of his room. When the door opened, the crewmate was taken aback from the sudden hot air that was released in the room. H. Hot. Ah, sorry about that. I was training a bit. Lucas felt guilty so he cooled down the crewmate with his water. Ah, thanks. Rather than that, the ship. Our scouts had looked ahead, it seems to be a pirate ship as well. Pirate ship. Lucas nodded and went to the deck to have a look. He expanded his observation hockey to reach the ship that was at the distance. That ship and flag. Like I thought, it's the Kuja pirates. Which means? Lucas turned to Hina and asked. Are we actually near Amazon Lily? No. That should not be the case. Amazon Lily is nearer to the red line leading to the New World. Hina was also confused why the Kuja pirates would appear here. Lucas continued to look at the ship and scanned it. Boa Hancock isn't there. They probably went out for supplies or something. Lucas. Are we going to engage them? Koza asked when he saw Lucas on the deck. No, there's no time. Head straight to East Blue. Aye. Lucas gave them one last look before going back to his room. It was a pity Boa wasn't there. If she was, maybe he can ask her to train him. At the Kuja pirate ship. A short blonde-haired woman with a snake on her shoulders looked at the white and gold ship at the distance. A ship? That ship can actually travel the calm belt. It doesn't look like a marine ship. There's also a skull flag on its sail. Whose flag is that? It seems to be from the new Shichibukai, the Guardian Wing Lucas. I heard he's close with the Marines so they probably gave him that ship. What do we do, Marguerite? Marguerite thought for a bit. Seeing as the other ship doesn't seem to show signs of approaching them, there was no need for them to bother themselves. Ignore them. Right now, we need to get back to Hebeheim Sama. Back in Lucas' ship, they sailed smoothly in the calm belt for another two days before finally entering East Blue. Apart from meeting the Kuja pirates, the entire trip was so uneventful that Lucas thought. As expected, this is normal. It's Luffy that's weird for always bumping into strange scenarios everywhere he went. Though it is a bit boring, Lucas can't really afford to waste any more time. As they got out of the calm belt, Lucas looked at the peaceful sky above. So this is the East Blue. The sea where Roger and Luffy was born. I wonder if there is something special about this sea. Even Shanks visited it. He can't just visit without any reason right? He wasn't even born in this sea himself. Come to think of it, even Buggy is here. Well, he might have stayed when Roger was executed at that time. Lucas stopped thinking about all these things and started to give out orders. Koza, get men to visit every island in this sea and report immediately if there are signs of Shiki attacking. Understood. What about you? Are you going to remain on this ship? No, I'll be visiting some islands as well and see if I can recruit some more people. Hina raised a brow. East Blue is known as the weakest out of all the seas, do you really expect to find strong people here? Oh. Is Captain Hina worried for my pirate crew? Pissed, Hina snorted and no longer cared about this bastard. After deciding for a bit, Lucas decided to head towards Konomi Islands first, Nami's hometown, Kokoyasi village. He just wanted to make sure they are fine. Lucas gave his orders again and patiently waited. Since the climate and weather here isn't as extreme as in the Grand Line, it was quite fast to reach their destination. Seeing the pirate flag on his ship, everyone in the village immediately picked up weapons at the ready and hid their children. A man with scars all over his face wearing a hat approached Lucas. Leave, we don't want your kind here. Lucas didn't mind being pointed with a gun. He simply smiled and looked back without any malice. Please don't be alarmed. You must be Genzo, correct? Nami spoke about you. Nami? You know Nami? Genzo raised a brow and lowered his weapon slightly. Un, I used to be a part of their crew. She often spoke about her hometown when she tends to her orange trees. 
They were very delicious. At this time, a woman with short light blue hair appeared. It's good that she's taking proper care of those trees. How is she? You're Nojiko, correct? Nami's older sister. She's gotten stronger. There were plenty of times where she saved us just by navigating the seas. Lucas felt his pockets and took out stacks of papers. After getting the marine ship, Sengoku also lent various kinds of denden mushi and devices. He was able to print the photos on his phone by showing it to the specialized denden mushi. Right now, what he had in his hands were pictures of Nami that were taken in their voyage. Nojiko and Genzo looked at the photos with excitement. Finally, Genzo ordered the villagers to lower their weapons. Seeing as the situation has been resolved, Lucas decided to cut to the chase. As much as I want to catch up, I still need to make sure of a few things first. Due to circumstances, I am now working with the marines at the moment to catch a pirate who seems to be targeting East Blue. Genzo nodded with a grave expression. That's right. Several islands has already been hit, which is why we were so hostile at the start. I figure it is the same to every island. Everyone is worried that their island will be next. Nojiko looked at Lucas and Tahina who was wearing a marine captain uniform. Still. Is it okay for pirates and marines to be together? Ah. I know you have your history with the Arlong pirates and some bad marines. But you can trust her. Though she looks like a statue and can be annoying sometimes. Also nagging, and speaks childishly in third person all the time, she is still. Um. Good, I guess. Hina's face twitched multiple times, completely annoyed with how Lucas introduced her. Don't listen to him. Hina is tasked to monitor him so he doesn't create trouble. See? Speaks in third person. Nojiko and Genzo looked at the two and no longer bothered about it. Lucas cleared his throat and continued. Anyway, I will leave some people here to make sure you are safe. They will report back if there is any sign of trouble and I will immediately come rushing. How long do you plan to stay? Nojiko suddenly asked. Though Lucas was confused why she asked that, he still answered. There are still some islands I needed to visit so after a bit of rest, we will be leaving. In that case, come with me. You can rest over at my place. In the meantime, tell me about Nami. Ah, sure thing. Lucas nodded and followed Nojiko. When he turned around and saw Hina following, he immediately shooed her away. Go, go away. I wouldn't do anything jeez. Go somewhere else. A vein popped up in Hina's temple again. She glared at Lucas before snorting and walking away to report to Sengoku. Phew, that ice block finally left. It's really annoying being watched every time. Nojiko just smiled wryly at that and led Lucas to her house. After settling down, Nojiko gave Lucas an orange juice and asked. So, are you and Nami a couple? Buffet, cough. Surprised by the sudden blunt question, Lucas choked and nearly spat out the orange juice. He patted on his chest forcefully before looking at Nojiko. How? How did you know? Ah, uh, I was right. Actually, I was just guessing. Damn this woman's intuition. Sure enough, they are really sisters. Nojiko just smiled and placed her palm on her chin. Tell me about Nami. Fine. Lucas sighed and showed a wry smile. He then told her about some details in their time together. At the end, when he told her about Robin and Vivi, he was afraid that she'll scold him. Instead, there was no change in her expression at all. Which is even scarier. After telling him about his plan of making a separate crew to back the straw hats when needed, Nojiko nodded. I understand the gist of it now, thanks. Well. As long as you're happy. Then, this crew of yours. Let me join. Ha. Chapter 41 Lucas was surprised to hear that Nojiko wanted to join. Nojiko, you realize that this isn't a game right? Being a pirate is dangerous. All the more reason why I should join. After hearing your story, I know that Nami has become stronger. 
As her older sister, it won't be right if I remain weak. Besides, I miss her. I hope that I can support her in the future. Nojiko looked straight into Luca's eye with determination. Currently, Lucas is having a dilemma. He's worried that something might happen to her if he takes her to the sea. If that happens, Nami will hate him for life. On the other hand, if he doesn't take her with him, with that much determination, he's worried that she will set out on her own. That would be even more dangerous. What position am I even supposed to give you? Can you navigate? Can you fight properly? Can you shoot a gun? I can shoot. Phew. But hitting a target far away is another thing. Can you cook? Ah, whatever. I'll deal with the trouble when the time comes. Fine. But I won't take you in just yet. I'll come back for you after I deal with the pirate that's been causing trouble in East Blue. Nojiko pouted but still agreed nonetheless. She knew that she wouldn't do any good in the upcoming fight as she is now. Well. All right. You better come back, otherwise, I'll find a way to tell Nami that you took advantage of me. Damn. Those two are certainly sisters all right. To even use the same threat. After escaping from Nojiko, he rounded up his people and left, leaving a few behind as promised. On the ship, Hina looked at Lucas dubiously. You didn't seduce another girl, did you? I didn't. Sure. Hina believes you. This time, it was Lucas' face that twitched. This damn woman. Humph. What? Are you jealous? Hina is not jealous. Sure. Lucas believes you. While the two of them bickered, they reached the Gecko Islands. Usopp's hometown, Syrup Village. The instant his ship neared, they could already hear three voices shouting. Pirates. Pirates have come. Run. Hearing those voices, Lucas knew who they were. They were most likely the three kids who were with Usopp back then. Frankly, Lucas was a bit interested in taking in these three and train them but figured it would be troublesome as they all have parents here in this village. I doubt those parents will easily give their child and to pirates at that. Lucas' goal this time is the same as in Kokoyasi. To ensure that they were also fine. Other than that, he wanted to see if he can recruit Kaya as the doctor of their ship. He had an idea of letting her train with Dr. Kureha once they go back to the Grand Line as well if ever he succeeds. Plus, it would be nice to get her and Usopp together. I ship them. Lucas laughed in his head as he approached the village. Just like in Kokoyasi, the villagers were also hostile at first. But after some explanation and seeing Hina's marine captain uniform, they all calmed down. Yusup san At the moment, Lucas was already speaking to Kaya and told her that he was a part of the Straw Hats in the past. Un, he's mentioned you quite a lot you know. After hearing that East Blue might be in danger, I figured to drop by and made sure the people related to Luffy and them are safe. Eh. H he's mentioned me a lot. Lucas smiled wryly seeing Kaya start blushing and fidgeting when she heard that. Usopp that idiot. Bakasop. If he makes her cry in the future, I will pull him to the very depths of the ocean. Achoo. Inside Thriller Bark, Usopp looked around in confusion as to why he suddenly felt a chill. Ah, uh, Usopp san, are you cold? Yua. Damn it, Brook. Don't sneak up on me like that. Usopp shouted at Brook angrily. It seems Usopp was convinced that it was Brook's fault why he suddenly felt chilly. Still. I wonder when would Zoro wake up. Usopp looked at the people still lying down unconscious. It has already been days since the fight with Moria ended. Luffy woke up immediately after a day but for some reason, Zoro hasn't woken up for a while now. At the side, Sanji looked at the unconscious Zoro and clicked his tongue in a bad mood. This damn swordsman. To explain the situation, it all started a few days ago. Right after they got into Thriller Bark and got separated with Nami, Usopp, and Chopper. In order to rescue them, Luffy and the rest set out as well. However, due to Nami unexpectedly gaining observation hockey, she was able to defeat Absalom and lead Usopp and Chopper out of the mansion to meet up with Luffy. Nami. 
Are you guys okay? Yeah, we need to get out of here, this place is dangerous. Nami told them what she saw in the mansion earlier. Hearing this, Chopper's face was grim. He had idolized Dr. Hogback in the past. To learn that he was making zombies. Defiling the dead. He can't forgive him. Suddenly, Usopp asked. Huh? But Nami, we never went to his lab earlier, how did you see it? Ah, it's that hockey thing Lucas mentioned. Hockey? Nami saw the confused expressions of the others except for Zoro, Sanji, and Robin who appeared surprised. Oh yeah, Lucas never told it to them before. In fact, both Nami and Robin only got to know it after their pillow talk ended and they were simply chatting before falling asleep. As expected from my Nami Swan. I'm not yours. Zoro ignored the idiot cook on the ground and grunted. How come you learned it before me? You weren't even training on it properly. Air, that. It just sort of happened. How about you, Robin? Me? I'm nowhere close to learning it. Robin was confused about why Nami would ask that but still shook her head. So it doesn't have anything to do with that? No, in the beginning, it's ridiculous to even think that. What is it? This hockey thing you guys are talking about? Luffy interjected as he saw that Zoro, Sanji, and Robin seemed to know about it as well. Since the cat's out of the bag now, Zoro explained. Lucas explained hockey as some sort of ability that everyone can learn. There are two types that he told me. Observation hockey, and armament hockey. Nami nodded and continued. Observation hockey is the ability to see everything around you. In extreme cases, it can also allow one to see the future for a second before it happens. This is like the mantra that the people from the Sky Island can do. Lucas has already mastered this to the point of seeing a few seconds ahead. Ah. So that's why he's so powerful. I can learn this too. Luffy's eyes gleamed as he saw a chance to get even stronger. Zoro nodded. Yeah. Actually, he has already been training you for that before he left. Remember the blindfold plays you guys did? That was part of the training. I see. Luffy smiled. He never knew how much Lucas has been looking out for him back then. Sanji lit up a cigarette and continued the explanation. Then there's armament hockey. Lucas said that this will provide some sort of layer around a person's body or weapon to make it even stronger and harder. Not to mention, this is supposedly able to work against certain devil fruit users. Hearing that, everyone exclaimed. Usopp asked while still in disbelief. You're saying. That if you have this armament hockey thing, then you will be able to touch Logia users. Or even hit a rubber man. That's right. Don't you remember Luffy's grandpa? He could hurt Luffy with his punch. Ah. For a moment, Luffy went silent in realization. Then, he erupted. Ah. How come Gramps didn't teach me this hockey thing and instead throw me in the middle of the jungle? I would have been super stronger if that was the case. W.L., it's probably because you keep saying you want to be the Pirate King. Ah. Still, even though he thinks that they were probably right, Luffy still decided to hate Garp for not training him in hockey. Poor Garp has no idea how much his grandson hated him now. Robin chuckled when she saw Luffy still pouting in a bad mood. Fufu, well, it seems that this hockey is something that is common in the latter half of the Grand Line. Only a few people know about this in this half. You should use this time to train on it before we go to the New World. Yash. I'm gonna master this hockey thing. Ah, before that. Where's Frankie? Yusup asked when he saw that they seemed to be missing someone. Everyone looked around and found that Frankie has indeed gone missing. Maybe he went back to the ship. Ah. Uh. Suddenly, everyone heard a person moaning from the ground. When they looked, they saw a tattered arm with injuries and bandages try to claw its way out. Nami, Usopp, and Chopper's faces went pale in shock. Zzz. The next moment, Luffy walked to the zombie that just got out and pushed it back in the ground nonchantedly. Like I'd go back, you fool. 
Even the zombie was shocked to the point that he retorted. Luffy's face went pale as well and sweated a bit. An old man with a big wound. It's a zombie, don't you see? When the rest of the zombies got up as well, Luffy and the others easily settled them without much effort. Once the zombies were beaten all over again, they questioned them and managed to find out about a few things. The crew met with one of the remaining humans that was trapped in the island and finally knew who's the big boss in this place. Gekko Moria, one of the Shichibukai. Fearing that they may be too late, they split up to look for Frankie. In the process, Sanji encountered Absalom who just woke up after being electrocuted by Nami. When Sanji learned that Absalom had the invisibility fruit, he went on fire with jealousy. You bastard took away my dream fruit. Take this. Diable jam. Sanji spun on one foot, causing it to grow red from the heat generated by friction. Next, he jumped up and jumped again. Skywalk. Once he was high enough, Sanji swung his blazing red leg towards Absalom. Idiot. Like that could reach me. Absalom snorted and raised his hands, ready to fire his invisible cannons when suddenly, he saw a red blur heading towards him. Flambeage Saber. W. Watt. Ga. Sanji landed and looked at the unconscious Absalom. Like I thought, mixing Diable Jam and Rankyaku is indeed effective. Still, Sanji felt that this wasn't enough. He approached Absalom and started to kick him all over. Extra crushing death. Bahabebahogo. Finally satisfied, Sanji left to find Frankie. The zombies watching in the distance let out a cold sweat. How vicious. Meanwhile, Zoro had encountered Brook who was busy fighting his shadow zombie. When Zoro saw the sword being used by the zombie Ryuma, he grinned. Yash, I will be taking that sword. Yohohoho, -ho, quite the feisty one we have here. Zoro grinned and no longer spoke words. He was itching for a fight. With a powerful dash, he sent two sword slashes towards Ryuma who casually parried with a single sword. Oh bad coup droit. Ryuma stabbed towards Zoro who dodged just in the nick of time and even managed to deflect it. However, on the wall behind him, a hole was made. Brooke was shocked when he saw this. When it was him performing this move, it doesn't come out that way. The next moment, the wall behind Ryuma also exploded and revealed a slash. Yohohoho, -ho, I see you deflected it. Heh, yeah, the next time, it will hit you. Yohoho, -ho, we shall see. Prelude, Ofuru. Slash. Their weapons once again collided and Zoro saw what kind of move Ryuma did. A weapon-breaking technique. Zoro no longer dallied and attacked. Nijirai. Hiramiki Maguma. Gavat Bond Avant. Zoro gritted his teeth. Tekai. Nitoryu. Iai. Reshuman. Another explosion caused by the clash of swords. But from the exchange just now, it was clear that. Ryuma was on the losing end. Ryumu casually looked at his severed left hand and laughed. Yohohoho, -ho, what power! The clash just now also destroyed the walls around them so they had no choice but to leave and fight on the roof. Slash! The two didn't waste any time and clashed once more on top of the roof. Since the roof was triangular, Zoro had a hard time fighting on the slope. With one of his swords stabbed on the roof to hold on, he waved his sword with his other hand and swung his feet. Nitoryu. Torikiba. Ryuma was surprised to see him send a sword slash with his feet and could only barely dodge it. Then, with a leap, Zoro flew into the air and aimed at Ryuma as he landed. Tekai. Itoryu Hiryu. Ryuma looked up and knew that he was about to lose. But as a swordsman himself, he refused to go down without a fight. Hanada Sancho. Yahazu. Kane. Their swords clashed once more, but this time, Zoro was two steps ahead and managed to slash Ryuma. As he fell, Zoro noticed Ryuma's wound suddenly caught on fire. He was surprised as his move wasn't supposed to have that kind of effect. Zoro fell onto a platform next to the roof with on his back. I lost. 
the Meitu once carried by a legendary samurai. Shusui. With you as its master, this sword, too, should be satisfied. Ryuma sheathed the sword while his body is still in flames. Finally, he tossed the sword to Zoro. I have allowed this samurai's body to suffer defeat. I am ashamed. As long as you're ashamed, that's enough. You are a swordsman in mind and body. I would have liked to meet you when you were still alive. It was unknown whether Ryuma heard Zoro's words or not as a shadow left its body and returned beneath Brook's feet. Zoro smiled at the overjoyed Brook and looked back at his new sword. I'll take your sword. But let's pretend this match never happened. Samurai of the country of Ueno. Zoro was looking forward to the day he visits this country. While their fights were happening, Chopper was also about to end his fight with Dr. Hogback. Unlike in the original where they only nearly beat him up before escaping from Oz, this time, Chopper was able to properly beat him. Arm Point Tekai Kokudiai Rosio Though Zoro and Sanji were able to learn two of the Rokushiki, Chopper was only able to learn this one move. He felt that with this, his attacks would be stronger and his defense will also be strengthened. Then there's Usopp who is currently facing against Perona. Humph. Behold my ultimate move. W what is it now? Due to her negative hollows not working on Usopp, Perona has been very cautious when fighting against Usopp. Hearing he has an ultimate move, her face became pale. Rokushiki. kami -e. Suddenly, Usopp's body started to sway from side to side. Any attacks that Perona sent were all dodged in a weird way. That's right. Out of all the techniques in the Rokushiki, it was only this technique that Usopp managed to learn. The ultimate dodging technique. Okay, forget it. Other than that, Usopp is still the same Usopp. Though their fight ended much faster than before. Well, no need to focus on this fight. Other than them, Robin managed to learn Shurgan as well. Frankie learned Tekai to compensate with his weakness at the back. And Nami is the same as Usopp, she learned Kamii first. Her safety is more important after all. If Garp or any of the Marines were to learn how much they have progressed, they would no doubt sigh in regret. Why do these people have to be pirates? They would have made a great Marine. 